Well, everybody, it's a cool, brisk morning here in Los Angeles, but the atmosphere here at the Los Angeles Convention Center is anything but. It's Pro Tour time, everybody. The highest or one of the highest honors in the flesh and blood calendar on the line, along with $200,000. I'm Mitch Leslie here, joined by Sam O'Byrne. What is good, man? Great to be here with you. We are in for a treat. Three days of the highest level of flesh and blood competition you could ask for right here on your screens. Couldn't be more excited to be here. I mean, the ovation literally right before we went live that just went up from all the players <laughs> in the players meeting as the head judge went pro tour. If that didn't set the stage, I don't know what will. The meta we have before us couldn't be more unsolved. The players couldn't be more prepared and battle tested as they get ready for this pro tour. And I don't think I could be more excited. It's really hard to overstate the importance of this kind of event throughout the year for a flesh and blood player. Everyone, weeks, months of preparation have gone into this event. Many teams and players flying in weeks in advance to make sure they have the best read on what the competition is going to look like. And my goodness, that's a hard picture to paint right now. We are in one of the <laughs> most compelling and complex metagames that Flesh and Blood has ever seen. People have been throwing around the term golden age, and I, I think it's apt. I mean, we are looking ahead into just for this meta, something that people cannot be, cons it, it can't be considered solved, right? People are bringing all these different interesting decks along with these two top dogs that everybody's got their eyes on, everybody got the targets on the back of Dromai and KO. People are ready for those decks, but what the question is, what are they not ready for? Exactly. We hope to see many of those rogue decks as well, of course, as some of our, our darlings here in the metagame <laughs> of the next couple of days. Now, in the build-up to, to Pro Tour, we've also had our road to nationals. So a lot of players in their respective countries are preparing to compete for those national titles and also look ahead to Worlds. This has been used as a staging ground and a proven ground for many of the ideas that are starting to form in terms of what the metagame has brought us. Of course, with heavy hitters uh, hitting that set, releasing uh, a real renaissance for me uh, as a warrior player, we have seen the metagame shaken up quite drastically, right? Immediately low, it was very clear to see that Brute was probably the class that benefited from this set the most. KO, armed and dangerous, comes out of literally nowhere <laughs> to basically be one of the most feared decks in the metagame. KO is doing some crazy stuff right now. We expect to see a lot of people piloting that this weekend. Yeah, I mean, the just consistent value you get from the might tokens, the plus one on these cards that you didn't normally get to run as sixes for the cards that care about discarding sixes. KO's doing some crazy stuff. Can't count out Reinar and Leviah, especially Leviah. Such a high skill ceiling deck, but man, when it goes off, does it sing. But we can't count out these warriors like you're mentioning and these guardians also getting so much support from the new set, as well as all the classes that are benefiting, benefiting from those little drip drops of those expansion cards. Exactly. And, you know, if you've seen the pie chart at all from the Road to Nationals, you'll see that many different heroes are sharing spots there, right? It started off being KO, being by far the, the, the strongest. And in fact, I think the first week might even have been Kasai. She really popped up and people... And maybe Kano, right? No, exactly. Yeah, Week by week, over those sort of three weeks of Road to Nationals play, we saw a different hero rise up as everyone was jockeying for position. First, it was definitely KO, right? The deck... Um, is not only very, very good at playing this really in-your-face aggressive game. I'm going to keep all my cards. I'm not going to block you. I'm going to present a bigger number. But Kale also is very adept at mid-ranging. He can offer a couple cards per turn cycle to block and still come back with a, a, a very above-rate attack. Swing big, you say? How about <laughs> nine on that one? Bit of a might token here. Oh, I can... Just, you know, discard an Agile wind-up, get an Agility token to ensure that I have a, a wider turn with multiple attacks as opposed to just one big one. Each There are so many different axes you play on. KO seems to do it all right now. Ab but, absolutely. But, but Kano did make his appearance in week two, especially of Road to Nationals, and all of a sudden people were once again fearing the Drakai. Oh my goodness. When when you look at a Dark Horse deck, I don't. I think Kano has been a Dark Horse Eve all the way back since Pro Tour 1 when a couple of incredible players took that to the top eight there. And now, Kano, it's the ultimate respect test in an open meta. You want to be able to sideboard, put things in your inventory for all these different incredibly interesting decks. But if you're not ready for Kano, let me tell you something. He's ready for you. 
Absolutely. We have seen moments in, in Flesh and Blood history where players simply don't bring Arcane Barrier into their equipment sets. They don't have the room for them in their sideboard. And this leaves them exposed. And obviously a lot of, a lot of players who like to take notice of the metagame realize this and bring Kano in and try and, you know, some, make some magic happen. I, I want to use like, how oh, is it? Pro Tour Leal perhaps uh, was a good example of a, a metagame where Kano sort of was able to shine. Mm -hmm. There are some matchups uh, recently introduced where Kano does not feel good. So obviously Prism, uh, you know, uh, uh, now is very, very good and always was at dealing with a lot of that arcane damage. Spectral Shields can, can eat some of that up. That's not a great matchup for Kano, but elsewhere, it's pretty good. People do not have, or well, have not had the room in their sideboards to sort of account for that. So Kano had his rise up in, in Road to Nationals and, you know, as we expected, he always seems to appear as soon as people forget about him. <laughs> we, sh we do expect to see a number of Kanos represented here. The game plan being very much the same, right? generate a huge amount of damage through an Aether Wildfire and Blazing Aether combo with another sort of non-attack action in the middle and have a multiplicative blowout against your opponent in terms of damage. Hard to follow sometimes, uh, you know, on the table. There's a lot of numbers going around. We've got, of course, the right people here on your commentary team, of course, with uh, Package and, and Brian Gottlieb, of course, waiting in the wings to join us uh, a little bit later on. And let's talk about week three of Road to Nationals. Who was it in the end, Sam? That ended up coming out with the most wins at these events, and who is still a deck to be feared? A different Volcation. I don't know if that's the I don't know if that's the right demonym, but a, a different a different incredible hero from Volkai, Dromai Ash Artist, ended up really taking the crown at the end of this whole thing. Right, she was the one at the top at the very end with the most wins, which I, people, especially at the very beginning of the season, weren't necessarily expecting. But it just goes to show you the power of the staying power of those dragons. Yes, you can interact with them. Yes, you can throw some attacks and they don't got spectra but let me tell you three aether ash wings even though they don't got spectra they sure as heck are hard to get rid of and the, of course you know being able to develop permanence on board is something in, in flesh and blood that is less oft seen from a lot of other heroes and you know the value you can generate from those dragons has a lot to do for, with how long they sort of stay around and i hope you at home stay around for a heck of a long time because we're not only here for a good time we are here for a long time it's going to be a big day of games we are going to have four rounds of classic constructed three rounds of draft to round us out. And of course, we'll talk about tomorrow when we get there. For now though, the players meeting is underway. Players are getting briefed on their protocols and procedures, of course, for making sure we keep everything at the highest level of competitive integrity. So we'll be taking a break while round one gets paired. And after that, we'll be back to kick off Pro Tour Los Angeles. It's all going down here on the West Coast. So you don't want to miss it.
Welcome back to Los Angeles, California, everyone. It is time for round one of the Pro Tour. <laughs> My name is Sam O'Byrne. This is Pankaj Bajwani. Welcome to the booth. Thank you for joining me. How are you of feeling? Of course. Thank you for joining me, too. I am feeling great, Sam. I, I know you and Uber talked about this earlier, but how open this meta is, I am just so thrilled to be able to watch what the players have brought today. Absolutely. A little bit of a wild west out there, right? Mm -hmm. We're here on the west coast. Nobody really knows exactly what's going on. Mist has swarmed in from Mysteria as we look to part the mist veil in the future. But for now, all it does is obscure the meta before us. And we have got such a show for you all today. We got $200,000 on the line. We got 14 rounds of classic constructed and draft before we move on to the top eight. And we have got quite literally some of the best players in the world all in one room competing under one roof. So tell me, as you look ahead, mm -hmm. what are you most excited to see? I'm most excited to see creative deck building from our players. So we talk a lot about how open this meta is, and I think the best way to attack one of these metas is by finding those slots in your deck that come in for many different matchups. And I think that's going to be a skill that a lot of these players are going to be tested against for this tournament because they're going to be prepared for the Katsus, they're going to be prepared for the Chaos, they're going to be prepared for the Dromais, the KNOs, some Prisms here and there, just, oh, and all the Warriors, of course. So, so many matchups you need to be prepared for and finding, conserving slots by finding, by finding cards that fit into many different matchups is going yeah. to be the key to success for this tournament. Absolutely. Some of those toolbox cards that allow you to attack multiple matchups, not just the Arcane Barrier in case you run in to the scary wizard man. Now, you talked to the first couple here, as you mentioned. You said you got to be ready for the Katsus. Mm -hmm. you got to be ready for the Chaos. Yes. Why did why, you bring those two heroes up? Because I believe that's our first matchup, Sam. And speaking of really good players, our first matchup involves our previous Pro Tour champion, Michael Fung, going up against Taylor Crawford. Michael Fung on KO with Taylor Crawford on Katsu. So I think we should just go ahead and get down into the game. You guys have waited long enough for the Pro Tour. We've waited long enough to see some incredible flesh and blood in action. It is time for round one of the fourth Pro Tour in flesh and blood's history. It's Michael Fung, your last Pro Tour champion against Taylor Crawford of Mr. I believe, yeah, on, on team on hit over there. Rock in the Katsu deck a little bit. Of a, of a dark horse. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's quite literally, I feel like, the last maybe nine days that people have started to whisper about the Lord of Wind and his return. People forgot about Katsu. Tell me, what we, we, we'll, we'll break down Kayo. We know what to expect a little more as the dominance of this hero's early days has been well documented. But what is pushing people back towards this OG hero? So I love the fact that you brought up in the past nine days because to some extent I'm getting... Pro Tour Baltimore vibes and what happened with Lexi at that Pro Tour, mm. where a lot of people were talking about Azalea leading a Pro Tour, but in the last week before Pro Tour Baltimore, everyone was like, wait, yeah, is Lexi just broken? And it feels like a similar thing is happening for Katsu at this event. And I think a big reason why that's happening, Sam, is because of how a lot of the decks, well, the most prominent deck right now, which is KO, doesn't really block very well. And they are extremely vulnerable to Dishonor. And the other big deck in the format that we're thinking about right now is Dromai, also a deck that's very vulnerable to Dishonor, and of course Illusion is tradi traditionally not very good into Ninja. Absolutely. Now, Ko, one of the two kind of big boogeymen of the early days of this, or the early moments of this Pro Tour, right? Until proven otherwise, these are two of the top dogs of the meta, right? There's such consistent value you get out of the Might Tokens. The plus one on, in your pitch, <laughs> you know, in, in the top of your deck, in your hand, in your graveyard, that cannot be overstated. But why do you think you see the Pro Tour champ himself, Michael Fung, on this hero? Because Michael Fung is a man who loves numbers. <laughs> uh, we know it from his olden days. He loves just value math and turn cycles. And when you talk about value math of turn cycles, it is very, very difficult to beat what KO is doing right now. As you rightly pointed out, just the always naturally plus one value on my tokens. The new arms piece that they got in Heavy Hit is that math is five on the board to begin with. Because you block two, get plus one. Next time you block one, get plus one again. But the math on Scowling Fleshback, that one's a little harder to quantify, and that card is going to be very relevant to this matchup, by the way. Uh, but just cards like this puts KO's math on a turn to turn cycle very much above what other people are doing. And I think that's why the previous Proto Champ is on this hero. Absolutely. And I think the other, you know, incredibly important aspect of this deck is the consistency you get trying to, you know, actuate your game plan of these brute decks that can often be vulnerable to missing your six discard, right? You draw a five or a four and you're like, oh, oh I hope I hit this one. You draw your Blood Rush mm -hmm. Bellow. But because KO is giving plus one to all of these cards, un unless they're on the combat chain, all of these fives 
are sixes when you discard them. And the consistency of that deck, I think, is such a draw for these players. You don't, often in Flesh and Blood, you have to trade power or consistency. Do I want these big spiky turns, or do I want my deck to consistently do the thing it's trying to do? And KO, you kind of get the best of both worlds. Definitely. And I think the consistency problem with KO now, it used to be that, oh, you miss your six discard on like a Reinar or a Leviah and you take a bunch of blood dead or your turn just ends. But in KO, the consistency is more like, oh, you I discarded your blue when you wanted that to swing the claw. So what you lose out is just a, yeah, 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 a claw yeah. swing uh, rather than, you know, your turn ends or you took like 10 blood dead. Absolutely. And the players here are presenting equipment, they are presenting heroes and weapons, which means we are moments away from round one beginning here at the Pro Tour Los Angeles. The fist bump has been extended. It's time for both players to draw up. It's Michael Fung versus Taylor Crawford. Let's get down into the action. So let's start with analyzing the equipment pieces here. And I think one really interesting thing about this matchup is the clash of the head pieces. So Scowling Fleshbag says, oh, you lose one card on your most offensive pop-off turn, but Masculine Pouncing Link says, I'm going to gain one card on my most offensive pop-off turn. And that sort of mirror effect is a very, very interesting part of this matchup. Michael Fung needs to try and use his flashback on one of Katsu's, you know, pop-off Ancestral Harmony turn or like a Hour of War turn. Um, and on the other side, Taylor Crawford is trying to use his links around those turns to maybe threaten double dishonor on the same on the same turn, or maybe perhaps get off a triple bonds line, which is a sort of math that KO actually can't beat. Absolutely. Now, KO here, we, we talk about the consistency. Of course, Blood Rush Bellow allows for some incredible spike potential. But Katsu, is this deck with without the, the Mask of Momentum as part of the agreement here, as we're going to see a, a clash of agility be thrown down, it's another clash of agility and a Warmonger's Diplomacy revealed. So Michael Fung, even though he went second, is going to go ahead and start off with a go again on his first turn. That's a, some good tech there of the, sp of the clash of agility to start things off. Yeah, and that's one of the very tricky things against KO because they also run a lot of agile windups. So you typically do want to try and pressure them a little, even if you're the one going first, because you don't want to, you know, just give them the space to discard and get an agility. But when you attack them, you give them the space to play Clash of Agility, to block a Clash of Agility, make an agility, and also deal two damage to you with Reckless Swing. Look at this, you guys. Michael Funk. I don't know who won the die roll, but was able to go second. Not only is going to go ahead and start this game off with an agility token, but somehow also dealt two damage on turn zero of this game before his tunic even ticked up. We're going to go ahead and see him put that first energy counter as the agility pops. But if you're sitting in the Pro Tour champ spot, I don't know if you could possibly be feeling any better to start this game. Now, on the Katsu side, it is not all doom and gloom. It is very important to note that they managed to put a Fluster Fist in the graveyard, and that's very, very important for Katsu because Fluster Fist is one of the key targets for the early Bonds line. Like, before you start going for triple Bonds turns, you want a good Bonds target in your graveyard, and Fluster Fist is very much one of those because it's going to be a 0 for 4 once you pull it out from your deck with Bonds of Ancestry. Absolutely, and the runner-runner here, when it attacks, if it has go again, going to create the agility token on the back end. So for Michael here, not only did he start this with go again he's going to continue to chain these go again effects together something that fruit you know not always again this is the consistency we just talked about to start this game off able to put together wider chain links when in earlier days of brute gaming that was a little harder to come by looks like taylor's gonna go ahead and take that six heading down to 32. It is always very scary when a KO is representing that they're going to end the turn with an agility because one of the ways that pro players have figured out how to target KO is that when they're representing not ending a turn with the agility, that's when you just give them a whole hand and you make the KO play on a five-card hand, which without an agility can be very difficult to do. They might be forced into rolling scabs when they're not uh, running gambler's gloves. But Michael Fung with the rolling of agilities, I think that was why Taylor Crawford just took the six damage on runner runner because he's saying, okay, if you're going to end with an agility, I need to pressure your hand. And Michael Fung's like, oh, but... Here's the CNC. <laughs> yeah. If you're trying to pressure back, the last thing you want to see is a Command and Conquer threatening the Arsenal. That's six damage. Nothing to sneeze at, but the Arsenal disruption, destruct, the Arsenal disruption, destruction, uh, representing a hugely additional swing of value up to four or five in these Katsu deck. If that's an attack that would attack for three, four, or five and then gets destroyed, that Command and Conquer ends up actually dealing 10 to 11 points of total value and damage. And we spoke about how Fleshbag is a disruptive disruptive piece that Michael Fung has access to on the Kalsus pop-off turn. But what's very also important to note is that Michael Fung also has three CNCs and, uh, well, I guess we don't have his deck list, but three, <laughs> pro probably three CNCs and three send packings in the list, alongside the consistent might tokens that uh, KO tends to generate, especially with the new arms piece. It, that can be a very, very big problem for Katsu because CNCs and send packings coming in for seven is very, very 
proactive disruption alongside the reactive disruption that he has access to in the form of the Scowling flashback. On the future match. Can hear Michael just <laughs> gently exhale as he realizes, yes, we're all watching, my friend, because you two are some of the greatest players in the world. We are so lucky to get to watch your games, and thank you for doing it to us. Or thank you for allowing us to watch. I know you can't hear us, but you'll listen back later, I have to assume. It's going to be shipping on back to Taylor's turn. He did go ahead, go ahead and give two Bonds of Ancestries to the block. Once again, putting them in the graveyard so that a future Bonds of Ancestry can grab them out later as the Warmonger's Diplomacy is going to get pitched into the first harmonized Kadachi of the turn. The Warmonger's Diplomacy, of course, something we knew that was there because it was revealed off the Clash of Agility on that first turn. I do want to point out that there was a blue Bonds that was blocked with, and that is... You know, you rightly pointed out, having bonds in a graveyard is something you definitely want for future bonds to try and tutor. But the blue bonds is typically a one-off in these Katsu lists because it's a target for Mask of the Pouncing Lynx. So that can be a bonds that you can find from a mask. So with that one-off being in the graveyard, very likely a one-off in the graveyard, that is going to be a two-power attack that Taylor Crawford cannot find on Mask of the Pouncing Lynx. He'll have to default to something like the Dishonor we talked about earlier, or perhaps the new card from Heavy Hitters, Tenacity. And seeing here, looks like Michael just electing to take the damage from this turn because the Mask of the Pouncing Lynx so much differently threatening than momentum. Right there, Taylor would have been able to draw a card if the mask pieces were reversed, but again, in this new flavor of Katsu, the Mask of the Pouncing List rep representing these big, powerful turns rather than the consistent value you get from the Mask of Momentum. What am I seeing here, Pocket? <laughs> back to back runner runners off of a turn zero agility creation. Michael Fung is just having a really good start to his first round of this Pro Tour exam. So if you're in Taylor's position here, we're talking about Mask of Pouncing Links and what it gets you. What is the ceiling of this Katsu deck? Because this is looking really scary if you're Michael <laughs> Fung, but if you're Taylor here, and from what I understand, you're sitting pretty knowing that this Katsu deck can still go absolutely crazy. The ceiling? The absolute ceiling is probably somewhere in the 40s. <laughs> but the the... I want to say the average out of war big pop up from Katsu easily hits in the 30s. And I'm having, I'm feeling deja vu right now. I, I feel like, did, did we rewind the stream? What just happened? Well, no, something different has happened because now this oh. time Michael Fung has one floating. Oh, yes. Of La course. Last yeah, year yeah. he pitched and didn't have ah, any floating. So he is technically threatening an <laughs> illegal razor reflex here. Um, mm -hmm. However, this is once again a runner runner into a command and conquer. This is about as challenging for Taylor to deal with as they come in these Katsu decks. Michael Fung, you see him's got a little smile. <laughs> this is exactly how you'd like to start your Pro Tour off if you're either of these competitors, but Michael Fung going to be able to continue the pressure with these agility tokens for the next turn as well, and this Command and Conquer in a deck that's mostly raw damage represents something that Taylor absolutely has to respect. And remember, there's still send packings in the list as well. And this is exactly what Michael Fung needs. He needs to line up these disruptive turns early on, get the Katsu to a low life total where they're forced to start blocking. And we haven't even seen a Blood Rush yet from Michael, Sam. Look at this. We're going to go ahead and give a two block, the Breaking Scales, and a three block in the Whelming Gust Wave there. The Bee Like Water joining the red zone to get in and get on the defensive. So once again, Taylor having to protect that Arsenal piece, meaning you have to imagine, of course, you never want to lose your Arsenal. But in these Katsu decks, sometimes the Arsenal card is the key to 10 extra damage. Typically, the Arsenal card is something like an R4, very similar to Fi as well. And it's so, it always feels so bad when you have to put a two block and an armor piece in front of a CNC, but that is just simply one of the, you know, one of the things that Ninja does need to deal with. So, another Kadachi to start the turn for Michael. So, interesting to point out that Taylor Crawford just pitched a Winds of Eternity, which means he did have an additional three block in that previous hand, so he could have covered up the CNC with the Winds, plus Whelming Gust Wave, but clearly, you know, Michael Fung seeing that, oh, you had three block, but you decided to give me armor instead. Clearly, you're going to have something following up after his Kadachi, and here we go. He follows up with a Surging Strike. Surging Strike, this is as classic as it comes in Flesh and Blood, all the way back in Welcome to Wraith, showcasing the power of the Ninja Hero, one of the cards that, when I played it for the first time, really made me understand kind of the magic of this game. When I was going surging into Whelming, I was like, I am the Ninja. We're going to go ahead and clash once again, this time with Might, the send packing mm. going to go ahead and win the clash. Yep, that is the send packing that we were talking about earlier, one of the key disruptive pieces that Michael has. And Michael, for the first time in this game, actually creating a Might token, which is kind of funny <laughs> when, you, when you think about how it's been, it's turn four and KO just created his first Might token. Well, uh, please continue. But you have to wonder, with the Might token created, does Michael have another one of those six power Arsenal disruptive effects that is going to actually end up threatening the Arsenal? Choose to draw a card. Listen to that. One of the best mm. 
four words you can say, or five words. <laughs> Choose to draw a card with agility because you are going to be able to continue the turn. One of the, you know, oft maybe not overlooked, but under underappreciated effects of these agility tokens. Just the classic enlightened strike, draw a card with go again. All Taylor can do is look to the sky for aid as this turn is just going to continue to get worse and worse for him. Speaking of underappreciated effects, remember the previous turn, Michael Fung revealed what the top card was of the Clash of Might. Send we packing. know he drew send packing with that E-Strike. So oh. if Michael Fung decides to pick draw a card in the E-Strike and draws in a send packing, you have to, if you're sitting in Taylor's seat, you have to, you know, be prepared for send packing coming your way this time because Michael Fung probably wouldn't have done that if you didn't have the resources to send the send packing your you're, way. You're absolutely right. So in, in, interestingly, here for Michael, we have now seen three turns in a row of just twelve damage, right? Which is not, which is, which is pretty much exactly what you can expect from your hand in Flesh and Blood. Mm -hmm. But instead, he's going to go ahead oh. now on this turn and push the boundary a bit. It's going to be a Bear Fangs into a Yellow Bear Fangs, Yellow Bear Fangs, and Red Bear Fangs. A couple of non-blocks. We talk about consistency. Mm -hmm. If your deck can't consist consistently block, then you're in for a completely different style of game. But this is going to be an enormous attack here. Bearfang's coming in for eight here. Very interesting to know that Michael, for the first turn, has not presented disruption against his Katsu. And that is quite a scary place to be. Now, Michael Fong obviously sitting at a very healthy 35, sitting with the Sculling flashback still there, but Katsu putting Breeze Rider Boots on the Chania as a blocking card, that is a sign that some fireworks are about to go off, Sam. Absolutely, and it looks... As though Katsu here might be able to really finally put some pressure on his Michael for the first time. This is just going to be normal damage. Katsu does not have to try to protect that arsenal piece. Let's see what Taylor is able to string together on the back of this incredibly powerful hero. Looks like life totals haven't quite been updated yet. I believe Taylor Crawford should have should be uh, around the 13 range. Uh, now, of course, Michael Fung sitting a very healthy 32 with all the armor up as well. So that's, you know, an extra... A bunch of life right there, too. So Taylor Crawford has a bit of a hill to climb, but starting off with a red surging strike is one of the best ways to start climbing that hill. And so if you've never seen a Katsu deck in action, talk to me about why Michael might be checking Taylor's graveyard here. He's looking for attack reactions. So when you want to block surging strike, when you want to start blocking Katsu, and, you know, when you block Katsu, you kind of need to make sure you cover it up so they don't get to, you know, uh, trigger Katsu's ability. So... Attack reactions, I don't think I don't think he's seen a single Ancestral Empowerment yet. And I do want to point out, one floating here without starting with the Kadachi could mean many things. But one of the things that Michael Fung definitely has to be thinking about is Aura War. That one floating, if you didn't start with the Kadachi, you're thinking, ooh, it could be Aura War. Of course, it could also be, you know, a random descendant somewhere down the chain after a Surging Strike, because that's something you have to do to get multiple bonds off in a turn. But if I'm Michael, I'm looking at the one floating and feeling a little suspicious. Absolutely. We can check out the hand there. Looks like we got a riled up. We got an agile wind up, a wild ride, and I think just another E strike. And, you know, we spoke earlier about how ninjas sometimes struggle to block. Here we're seeing the KO side struggle to block. That was one no block in Michael's hand and a two block. Absolutely. His hand blocks for eight total. And when the Katsu is representing that they're about to pop off, eight block is not quite going to cover up what you needed to cover up. So the question here for Mr. Fung is, have you put enough pressure on that you can withstand some of this aggression? And because you've put the Katsu opponent all the way down to 13, utilize your own aggressive attacks to really go ahead and try to close this game out. We're going to get the Scowling Flesh Bag brought in on the Scourging Strike. On the defense, it's time to intimidate. But on, in response to the intimidate trigger, before that Art of War can get out of the hand, it's time to draw and plus one with an Art of War. Mm -hmm. So that means this Surging Strike is going to hit. Taylor Crawford is going to be able to trigger Katsu's ability, find a combo piece that he needs, and look that he did banish a Blue Whelming Gust Wave, which is, you know, a combo piece you can follow after Surging. Obviously, you don't really want to banish. You, you don't really want to put blues on the combat chain when you're on your pop-off turn, but it's very likely that he has some of the zero cost to go ahead and trigger Katsu's ability. Sure. Now, if you're, if you're Michael here, yes, the Surging Strike, is going to head and get uh, bumped up to an additional six. Yes, the Art of War is threatening the turn, but only two cards in hand here, right? And even though this is the big Art of War turn, that Scowling Fleshback has completely gotten rid of an entire card. How big of a turn can we still expect as Katsu's ability is going to get activated for the first time? That's one of the things where you're against Katsu and you say, oh, you only have two cards in hand, but then you recall that Mask of the Pouncing Links is a card on the field that is actually an, an attack action card in your banner zone. Bonds of Ancestry, each of them represents a whole and additional card. So if you're able to get two bonds off and you pop your Mask of the Pouncing Links, that's another three attack action cards you just suddenly 
vomited onto the combat chain. That, and it makes the, you know, you're only holding two cards, it makes it quite deceptive. Katsu here going to go ahead and discard a zero cost. That is a Warmonger's Diplomacy. So now it's time to go ahead and grab a Whelming Gust Wave from the deck. We're going to banish it, but can play it this turn. Whelming Gust Wave. We talk about classic combos in Flesh and Blood. The Whelming Gust Wave is going to come in, get the plus one from its own combo effect, get the plus one from the Art of War, and threaten to draw a card and already has the go again. And Breaking Scales is still on the field as well, so Michael does need to keep that in mind. You know, we spoke about how he took one card away uh, from the Scowling Flesh Bag, but if he lets his Whelming hit, that is going to be one card right back in Taylor Crawford's hand. With the, and the Breaking Scales is there. So Michael, if he wants to stop this on hit, needs to block six or you know be vulnerable to Breaking Scales. But if Taylor Crawford uses Breaking Scales, he won't have it for potential dishonor. And you, and you asked earlier about like whether you know Michael has the life total to weather the storm. If the Katsu just sends vanilla damage, sure he does. But Michael needs to be very afraid of dishonor over here. Um, Taylor Crawford can very easily... Uh, threaten a double dishonor. Oh, it looks like he doesn't have a dishonor in his graveyard, yeah, actually. He so he cannot threaten a double dishonor. On, yeah, and uh, that is a whelming gust wave, not descendant gust wave anyway, so dishonor won't be live. So it does look like it'll be mostly vanilla damage here, and I think Michael Fung will be able to come on this turn. You know, a little battered uh, armor gone, some cards in hand gone, but, you know, still feeling quite good. So the Bonds of Ancestry here, because there was a card with Gust Wave in the combat chain on the last attack, it gets go again. We're going to get to banish a card from the graveyard, and similarly to a Katsu effect, go ahead and grab a card from the deck. So that Fluster Fist you talked about way back at the beginning of the game is going to go ahead and represent, even though it blocked at the beginning, it now represents five damage thanks to the Art of War. And so only, yes, there were only two cards in hand there, but that ended up as a big old attack for 15 at the end of this Surging Strike. So that's a 21 damage turn from the Katsu through a Scowling Fleshback. And that's a very, very key piece because Katsu did not give up his yeah, piece, his head piece in the Mask of the Pouncing Links. And now Katsu gets to play a, what I call a post flashback game, which is incredibly liberating because <laughs> you know for a fact you, they cannot disrupt you on your own turn. All they can do is this is proactively disrupt you on their own turn with CNCs and send packings. However, we've already seen three of those copies, two CNCs and one send packing go away. Michael Fung just representing vanilla damage again. This could be Taylor's second pop-off turn. If, and if he can find it, we could see Michael Fung suddenly not feeling very, very healthy anymore. Absolutely, because even though this is going to represent a total of 10 damage, we can activate our tunic, we can attack with the Mandible Claw. This is going to get the plus one because of the Might Token generated on the last turn, so this Wild Ride does come in for seven, and because we discarded that Clash of Agility, we are going to go ahead and make another Might Token for our next turn, but that doesn't yet threaten lethal here for Taylor Crawford. He has the Breeze Rider Boots online, he has the Breaking Scales online he still has his heart and cross trap which would allow him to play a surging strike for free and the mask of the pouncing links grabbing these cards like dishonor like tenacity these new cards that can come in and just go crazy on the chain let's see if michael has enough life to survive what comes next and normally i would say it is a bit scary to go to into you know the three the two live total against brute because of a card called reckless swing however most KO lists are only on one of them right now, and we already saw the one reckless swing, uh, reckless swing for Michael Fung. So Taylor Crawford might be okay taking the risk here to go into the two life or the sub two life because he knows, look, if you already use one reckless swing, you probably, probably aren't running another one, and I can take the risk to have this full five card hand. Here comes Katsu. It's time to see how this deck can really go off and shine. Starting the hard and cross trap. Now, this is. As a Katsu, this is what you love to start your turn with. And there is no flashback on the field as well. So which means you save one card because you didn't need to pitch. And you also are not getting threatened one card because there's no more flashback on the field. Taylor Crawford has to be feeling pretty good right now. If we can take a look at Michael's hand to see how well he can block, uh, that would be, you know, that would be very useful information. Surging strike. Coming, to coming through right now, only for four. This is the yellow, and that Heart and Cross Trap is getting activated on this turn, meaning he did not have to pitch for it, so all of those cards are available to discard to Katsu to follow up with and continue a very large turn. Taylor Crawford headed down all the way to three to protect this turn right here. And yes, this is off the back of the four top cards of his deck, but Katsu's ability allows you to have such agency in sculpting your turns. Such a powerful effect in this game. 
And one really scary thing about blocking Katsu, especially when they kept their entire hand, is you don't know whether you're supposed to stop the Katsu trigger on the Surging Strike or whether they just naturally have the combo line because these Katsu lists typically are running, you know, six copies of Whelming Gust Wave, the three reds and the three, uh, three blues, and six copies of Descendant Gust Wave, the three reds and the three yellows. So uh, oftentimes they could just have the natural combo line that if you dedicate too much blocks on the Surging Strike, that means you won't have the blocks for the Dishonors that might come up might end up coming down later down the chain. So it is a very, very tough conundrum that Michael is in right now. You do have the option to put blocks in front of a card without combo because it does not allow for the breaking scales to be online. But when we look at Michael's hand here, I'm seeing a card called Blood Rush Bellow. It might be White Border, but that does not mean it does any less damage. I'm seeing a card called Bear Fangs that doesn't block, <laughs> which is kind of scary because KO, you know, we spoke about this earlier, how vulnerable KO is to Dishonor. Once you get Dishonored, suddenly your blue fives, they are blue fives. That would not be very good <laughs> if you're Michael Fung here. This Ancestral Empowerment is great for Taylor Crawford. Going to go ahead and not only give an additional point of damage that Michael has to take, it is going to also allow for Taylor to draw a card, which could power up the combos. And now it is time for both the Priest Rider Boots and the Mask of the Pouncing Links to be activated upon this attack hitting. We're in the resolution step. Let's see exactly how does Taylor want to sculpt this turn? Seeing all the armor come out from Katsu here when Michael Fung already used, you know, his most threatening armor piece and his calling flashback. Let's see how how big of a turn Taylor Crawford can string together here. And I have to point out that Ancestral Empowerment, if I see the Katsu use Ancestral on a card that, you know, doesn't have an on hit, I'm actually sitting kind of scared because normally you would save that for something like the Whelming Gust Wave to draw a card, something like the Dishonor, but the fact that he just used it right there tells you that he has a strong enough hand that he says, you know what, I'm just going to cash in this, cash this in for one damage. I know I have the guaranteed Katsu trigger regardless. I know the exact combo line I'm going to do. This Ancestral, you know what, I can just throw this away. Ponds of Ancestry going to go ahead and get grabbed from the deck, placed into the Banished Zone, which means it can come out and join the party on this turn. Michael Fung has navigated a position where his opponent is at three life. He is the Pro Tour champ. You have to imagine if you're Taylor Crawford, there's a little bit of that extra pressure as you sit across from the last champion of these vaulted events. But Taylor is sitting in an incredible position on this turn. Mask of the Pouncing Lynx also going to go ahead and activate and trigger. Now, we still have to resolve. We've already resolved the Katsu. We've grabbed the Bonds of Ancestry, but now what other card does Taylor want to grab to power up this turn? And like you said, there's some blocking equipment over there for Michael, but there's a card in the hand. That's a mm -hmm. pearl, baby. Ain't no blocking that one. <laughs> yep, just nine blocks from hand available to Michael. Yeah, he's going to need to rely on the armor. Now, we spoke about car, uh, KO's, you know, extensive armor suite earlier on as well, so, you know, that is still an extra three armor block he's got available, so he can total block 12, 13 if he also wants to cash in the tunic. Indeed, indeed. This Descendant Gust Wave going to go ahead and get powered up thanks to the Surging Strike. So it's coming across for five with the go again. Looks as though he's representing that the Mask of the Pouncing Links, he passed on the trigger. So the trigger always goes in a stack, yeah. and when it resolves, he chose not to destroy Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Assuming this turn might be good enough. Yeah. <laughs> and, he, and also, well, the attacks, any attack that hits, you are able to allow for the Mask of the Pouncing Links trigger to resolve. So he's just giving himself even more options on a turn where the paths branch out before him. There's a million possibilities. Mm -hmm. He has to find the one in which he wins. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Unlike Katsu's hero ability, which only triggers on a first attack action card that hits, Mask of the Pouncing Links is going to just continuously trigger every time an attack action card hits this turn. Five damage with go again. Not something to scoff at if you're the Pro Tour champion. Let's go ahead and listen into their discussion. Bonds, get bonds. <laughs> Some random card. There's hat. Okay. <laughs> so I, I do want to point out, you know, we spoke about how earlier Katsu in these lists kind of just naturally have combo lines sometimes, and that's exactly what happened here. We see that the search was not for the piece after a surging strike. He had a descendant in hand always. The search of the Katsu trigger was for Bonds of Ancestry, which is after the natural combo line that he already had, Surging and the Descendant. So Michael Fung, pretty heads up play by not blocking a Surging Strike, making the read that, you know what, I think you have the natural, at least second piece for sure anyway. I can't block out both of them. So, you know, just go ahead and have your tutor now. Let me have the information for what you have found so that I can do the slew thing that we just saw him do. Look through a graveyard, try and figure out, oh, what are you going to do? Bonds into bonds? There's hat. Okay. Trigger. Get 
We're going to go ahead and make a Might token thanks to the new card, Apex Bonebreaker, joining the fray, blocking with a six power attack. The question is, do we want a Breaking Scales here? The answer is no. So the attack has been passed on. Now it's time for a Bonds of Ancestry being attacked, which means yet another time we have the potential to go through our deck and go ahead and grab a, any card we like as long as we banish the same card from the graveyard. Looks like he might go ahead and banish another Bonds here. So I believe Taylor Crawford still doesn't have a Dishonor as Graveyard, so it looks like Michael Fung at least is going to be insulated from a Dishonor being threatened here, but I think I see a Gust Wave and another Bonds in Taylor Crawford's hand, which I means... I think it just, might be Whelming Gust Wave so, as well. Yeah, Whelming Gust Wave and Bonds, and I think that also tells us why he cracked the Breeze Riders as early as he did, because he needs a Whelming to get Go again. Obviously, he wouldn't have Go again unless it follows up a Surging Strike, but with the Breeze Rider Boots, it'll go, it's going to have Go again because it has Combo on it. So Taylor Crawford... Might be able to string together a triple Bonds turn. <laughs> this is exactly what you like to see round one of a Pro Tour. <laughs> you have one of the meta, the meta kings here in KO. Everybody was ready. Everybody was expecting for uh, was expecting KO to show up with force. And the Pro Tour champ clearly believes in the deck. But one of these more dark horse candidates joining the fray and really bringing a powerful new deck. Not new. This deck's been around for a long time. But a deck that did not have a lot of excitement around the meta game until recently. And we are seeing just the absolute power of this deck being showcased here. And I think not popping the Master of the Pouncing Lynx there was a very, very heads-up play by Taylor Crawford because of a new card called Tenacity. If you search up Pouncing Lynx and you put a Tenacity in a banner zone, Michael Fung is very incentivized to not block. But when you wait, you see how Michael Fung blocks. If he puts more cards on combat chains, one of your cards, if you're doing a triple Bonds turn, one of your cards is going to hit later down the chain. And then you can find a Tenacity then if you see Michael Fung has blocked with a bunch of cards. Or if he hasn't, then you find Salt the Wound. When the the sort of tension it puts on your opponent to try and play around both Salt the Wound and Tenacity, well, I mean, it is actually straight up impossible to play around both of them because one of them says <laughs> the, uh, deals more damage the more you have hit this turn and the other one says deals more damage the more the opponent has blocked this turn. A little bit of darned if you do and darned if you don't. This is just going to be three with go again because it wasn't Surging Strike before the Whelming Gust Wave, but the Breeze Rider boots really helping this turn get to its absolute apex. Michael might have the apex bone breaker, but we're going to see if Katsu <laughs> has the apex amount of damage on this turn to really go over the top. Now Michael has already committed a block. Yes, those two Might Tokens will really help on the clapback, and Taylor's at three. So if Michael is able to stay alive, those Might Tokens are going to demand blocks, even just thanks to the Mandible Claw, as long as Michael is able to keep just a single card. But we're not even sure if Michael's going to be able to do so, especially if one of those cards is a card that doesn't block and can't pitch into the Mandible Claw. Mm -hmm. Some fantastic wordplay there, Sam, on the Apex. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Three damage with Gogan coming across. This is round one of the Pro Tour. Everything still to come for these players. As we know from our good friend Pablo Pintor, nothing is over for either of these players if they cannot come away from this game with the W. But you, you're much happier leaving your first round 1-0 than 0-1. It's just helpful for the mentals. It's helpful for the breakers. And we're going to... I'm so excited to see exactly which hero is going to come out on top. Mm -hmm. And Taylor Crawford doing a very good job of even hiding the remaining, you know, threats that he has right now. Because this Bond's going to find out probably an Underwhelming Gust Wave. And then that's when Michael's going to think, oh my god, you have, you have the final Bonds in your hand. Um, so, you know, Michael Fung still doesn't really know the level of punishment that's still going to come after this turn. Uh, after this Whelming. Mm -hmm. Both players here. Taylor announcing the trigger and then resolving the trigger, so going to go ahead and grab a card with two or less power from his deck, and it's going to be Assault the Wound. Yep, at this point he's done the math. He said, okay, look, my Surging Strike hit, my hit, my Bonds of Ancestry hit, my Whelming just hit. That's three cards that have already hit. Assault the Wound is already coming in for five. I'm putting three more Chain Links after this because it's going to be Bonds into Gust Wave into another Bonds of... Sorry, is that four more chain links? It might be four more chain links. <laughs> not counting the salt, the wound. So, you know, Michael, you're in for a world of hurt here. And I think, Sam, you're right. I'm, I'm not sure whether Michael is going to see his next turn to be able to use those my tokens. We're going to have to wait and see. Yep. Here's, an, here's another three damage coming across. Wave. And can you go ahead <laughs> and grab another card. Uh, yep. And Michael's saying, are you finding Gust Wave? And he's, oh, he sees the Gust Wave in a banner zone now. Now it is quite face up. Uh, from Michael's side, once you see your opponent cards to find Gust Wave here, you know the last card in hand is a Bonds, which means after this Bonds on the, that's on the combat chain, it's going to be Gust Wave, it's going to be Bonds, that Bonds is going to find something else, likely a Fluster Fist, which will have Go again from Breeze Rider Boots, into the Salt the Wound. And a couple of turns ago, you oh asked me... Oh my gosh! <laughs> this, is, this is crazy! <laughs> a couple of turns ago, you asked, you know, the Sculling Fleshback, taking one card away from Katsu, how much does that really matter? And... 
I talk about how Bonds of Ancestry is a whole extra card each time you play, and this is exactly why sometimes just taking one card away from Katsu doesn't completely matter, because Bonds of Ancestry is two cards each. Was, and forgive me, but was the Surging Strike the card, was that the Arsenal card that was intimidated yes. from the Scowling? Wow, so, and that's really fortunate there if you are Mr. Crawford getting that starter intimidated so that last turn could still be very powerful. The send packing going to go ahead and jump to the block. The breaking scale is going to go ahead and get activated plus one power on the bonds, putting that point of damage over, really showing you that Taylor here is just trying to close the door on this game. Very heads up play that. Breaking scales is not just one damage, it's actually two because of the salt wound. Because now this is a bonds event, this is an extra chain link that has hit. So Taylor Crawford saying, you know what, I'm going to cash in my arm sweeps for two damage instead of just one. Absolutely. Three damage with the go again, thanks to the Breeze Rider boots. Have to put the Blood Rush Bellows in front and just take the one damage. Or no, sorry, Blood, yeah. blood Rush Box for three. Mm -hmm. But Bonds of Ancestry attacks for certainly more than that. Yep, and Michael's last card does not block. Now, Taylor Crawford doesn't know that, but we know that. So this is likely going to be four into four, and Michael can't block either of them out completely. Michael only has two block remaining between his hand and his armor piece. Taylor Crawford is going to have played or have access to play, depending on when <laughs> Michael Fung eventually sees the end here. Mm -hmm. Ten <laughs> cards. Yep. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten cards. And show me, is there any cards in the pitch zone? <laughs> zero. Absolutely zero because of a card called Heart and Cross Trap. No cards in the pitch at all? Mm -hmm. None. We're in for a long weekend. Mm -hmm. I'm getting a bit of chain vibes, to be honest. Playing cards from a banner zone, just having access to extra card draw here and there. Bonds of Ancestry going to go ahead and join the red zone and go ahead and get across. Michael falling down to four. Here's four damage. Michael has to just go ahead and put his armor in front of it, blocking for a total of two. The salt the wound. Let's listen in. This one was Yeah, this one. Yeah, two of them weren't. Yeah. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So yeah. it's plus six, right? Yeah, plus six. So coming in for eight. Your game. Okay. Yeah. And that is the game, folks. Round one of the Pro Tour goes to the challenger. Taylor Crawford going ahead and taking down the Titan. Michael Fung tried his best to go ahead and weather the storm, utilize those might tokens. But it turns out, even though those first turns were very disruptive, they were not close to the ceiling of what KO is possible to actuate in terms of damage. And he was not able to close the door on Taylor fast enough for Katsu to just take the game home. And that is the absolute strength of Katsu in this meta. You know, we come into this room and we're thinking it's going to be a lot of KO representation, a lot of Dromai representation. You know what? KO doesn't block very well. Two times when the Katsu went to pop off that turn, Michael had a no block in hand. And that is exactly the sort of hand textures that Katsu will prey on and will kill you for. And especially shows you a, a little bit of the perhaps disadvantage when you're playing a deck like Katsu when you're playing these yellow bear fangs. I mean, that's a that's a card that is, uh, you know, very powerful but doesn't block very well. And before we talk even more about that incredible game, let's go ahead and check up with our backup match because let me tell you, you want to talk about Titans? We have got World's Finalist Shing Sang versus Nick Butcher from Australia. This is a Dawn Blade Dory versus Anathos Victor. And we're jumping in right here with you, folks. It's 4-11 to 11 in favor of our World's Finalist. Let's go ahead and see how Nick wants to handle this, this Anothos coming in 4-6. We've got the sword-wielding warrior against the hammer-wielding horse over here. So. <laughs> <laughs> Cerinthia Ironsong, another hero that got so benefited from some of these new cards and heavy hitters, but the main discourse over these last couple days, talk to me about the Dawnblade and talk to me about some of these other weapons that we might be seeing later in the day. Don't you talk to me mostly about the <laughs> Dawnblade because that's what we're looking at, but Dory, yep. a lot of people excited about this hero coming in. Looks like Nick is going to go ahead and put down a hit and run. So Dawnblade, the Dawnblade weapon is historically at least a little better into the Chaos and the Dromais that we were talking about earlier because Dromai as well puts a whole bunch of dragons on the field, you get to farm counters off of them. And Keo, as we just saw against Akatsu, doesn't block very well. And turns out Dori is actually very, very good if you can't block her because she will be able to outraise the Keo because of the plus one damage on Dawnblaze just snowballing. Now against Victor, however, this is a matchup I'm sure Nick Butcher wasn't very happy to see. It is a bit of a tough matchup. Dory's him. Well, and fascinatingly, we're seeing Agile wind up get pitched, and I saw a Findall's Fighting Spirit on top of the graveyard there, as well as a Remembrance in the Banished Zone for Nick Butcher. So clearly, he's <laughs> working on a different axis than we've seen some of these most popular Dory decks played as a beautiful Command and Conquer comes ahead and joins the attack, tries to get in and destroy that arsenal. We're going to clash again. It's a Sync Blow and a Steel Blade Supremacy, so maybe one of the first times this game that Shing hasn't been able to win a clash, even though Command and Conquer, Findall's Fighting Spirit might give uh, Nick a little more 
play into this matchup as here we go. Eight with Dominate, Macho Grande coming across. Mm -hmm. Now, Nick, very, very disciplined in his armor so far because if you look at his armor piece, he still has, you know, both his chest piece and his arms piece are just completely unbatted. So this Dominate, you know, just going to uh, get those armor pieces from him, but, you know, Definitely not about to kill him, even though he's at four against a dominated eight. And it looks as though he's posturing to put a sink below in front of this, which means this is a full block and a full four card hand against Shing here. So even though it looks as though Nick Butcher's deck quite, quite low at this point, perhaps he's put himself into a position by saving the armor piece, by saving the defense react in the arsenal there to really put some pressure on. Now that Shing is just working off a four card hand, no arsenal for himself, even though let's look at Shing's equipment. Mm -hmm. Another very disciplined player himself, plenty of armor to work with as well. Mm -hmm. Interesting to point out that Nick Butcher actually could have block that without using the armor because he had a sink pillow in Arsenal. So him putting the armor that tells us that he's looking to be very aggressive this turn and we can see why. He's got Iron Song Determination and Steel Blade Supremacy in his hand. Two very, very good cards to start putting on the pressure. Steel Blade Supremacy into a Dawn Blade. Oh, this is fantastic. We're seeing classic heroes mm -hmm. versus the new new. We're seeing heavy mm -hmm. hitters versus Welcome to Wraith here. Steel Blade Supremacy going to threaten a draw if the Dawn Blade is able to hit and give plus two. Dawn Blade still would need to find the go again, however. One floating, two cards in hand. The possibilities are endless. I absolutely love the, the discipline and decision making that Nick Butcher is showing here. It really shows us how much he's practiced this deck. Not, not going all in on Iron Song Determination, even though he clearly has it and you do want to pair it with Supremacy, but he's saying, you know what, Ching, you still have all that armor up. Tell you what, let me save this Iron Song Determination for the following turn. And you know what, if you give me an, a, a Quicken token from the Civic Steps, then this Iron Song Determination will get even better. I love it. What a, what a call there. I love that you're my number two. <laughs> not, not even my number two. I love that you're my partner. This is going to go ahead and get a double block there. And Nick, not able to put any more pressure with any reactions. Maybe because mm -hmm. we look at the deck there, only one card left on top. And it is the card that was mm -hmm. just pitched. I don't know if there's even enough gas left with Shing all the way up at 11 and all that armor. Yeah, that uh, uh, Nick pocketing that Iron Song Determination there saying, you know what, I need you to use some of your armor before I can actually use this card. But Shing saying, yeah, I know exactly what you're looking for, Nick. I know you want my armor. I am not giving it to you. Yeah, and Nick there just going to go ahead and extend the fist bump. Even though there you know, are five cards left for him to work with, he is aware there is just simply not enough damage left. Even the Iron Song Determination, given that Shing has gone ahead and kept all of his armor around until the end point of that game, Nick Butcher going to go ahead and take the L there on that uh, First game of the Pro Tour, but again, two mm -hmm. incredibly prestigious players. And again, the Pro Tour is, is all the games are still to come. Pablo Pintor, the classic submarine story. If there's anyone who can do it, it's Nick Butcher. If there's anyone who can do it, it's Michael Fung. So what a couple games here for our heroes. We saw one Welcome to Wraith Hero take it down over heavy hitters, and we saw one Welcome to Wraith Hero go ahead and fall to some of these new Spice in the Heavy Hitters set. And just what a first couple of games, my friend. It's just the first two games of the Proto that we watched, and we've already seen four Titans on screen. I am just so extremely hyped up for what is going to come the rest of today and the next two days. Sam, we have three days of Proto Los Angeles to watch. I'm so hyped. So as we look, as we, as we parse through the hype and try to get a little bit into the weeds, what did we learn from these first two games, right? We talked about the, the Titans of the meta, the Dromais, the Chaos, the things people expect. And now we just saw two decks go ahead and win on stream that we haven't necessarily expected. And like, it's a long pro tour to come. But that Katsu deck looked absolutely disgusting at the end there. And yes, the disruption was quite heavy there from uh, Michael. And he wasn't able to get to the true ceiling of those KO terms, turns really ever. But if that doesn't show you what is possible when, from some of these decks that people aren't expecting as much, and Michael Fung is as practiced as they come. He knew exactly what was happening. We heard him throughout the game call out what was possible. But mm -hmm. at the end, it was just too powerful for him to be able to withstand. We are very much in a meta where the difference between the top deck and the second best deck is not very wide at all. Honestly, it is actually so slim that it's debatable what the top deck even is, and that's exactly what we're seeing here. The top two going into the room was, oh, people, there's going to be lots of Dromites, there's going to be lots of Chaos. But the difference in power level between those decks and the Katsus and the Dorinthias and the Victors isn't even that high. There's a point where, you know, any of those three could very easily just be a top deck as well. Turns out it might come down to a little bit of luck. Mm -hmm. A little bit of skill mm -hmm. and a little bit of magic here at the Pro Tour if you want to go ahead and take it down. Another thing I'd like to just point some attention to, there was, there was some discourse in the air, I, sh I, I would say, mm -hmm. about 
about the teams uh-huh. recently. Some right? vibrations. Some some vibrations mm-hmm. in the air. Team Blue Pitch got a got a wonderful call out from some of our friends over there I, uh, in New Zealand at LSS, and mm-hmm. we got to see one of their illustrious oh, members yeah. just win that game mm-hmm. uh, in the backup match. Sing sing over there, but on Victor Goldmain, high and mighty, the horse rides again. So <laughs> showing you that, again, this luminous, uh, this luminary team that has LSS's attention, bringing another deck that people haven't been talking about as much. Yeah, and on a very interesting build of Victor as well, because we did see Sink Billows in Shing's list, and we have to wonder whether that's just a sideboard card that he brings in against Dorinthia specifically, or whether that's something he mainboards, because remember, Victor does want to clash a lot, and having a lot of these cards that have no attack value on them, not... You know, it's a bit of a non bow there when you're trying to clash and you reveal a sink below the top that we saw happen to Shing right there in the final moments of the match. Yeah, so it shows you that Shing has other ways that he wants to utilize just the Guardian card pool and also some of those powerful specialization abilities of, of Victor, as well as you know he's still going to be winning mm-hmm. a fair amount of clashes. And it's time for us to go ahead and take a quick break. But before we do so, I think some people at home might want to go ahead and check out a little peek ahead at the next set. Let's go ahead and let's, I'm gonna do it, I'm so sorry. Let's go ahead and part the mist veil and look ahead at the future of Flesh and Blood. Before we're back for round two here at the Pro Tour, we'll be back bringing you the next round before moving on to our incredible co-casters. So don't go anywhere, we'll see you in just a second. Welcome, traveler. You must be starving. Please, come inside. I think we can satisfy your appetite. Anything you like. Intimacy. Or perhaps, ecstasy. (laughs) Come a little closer. I won't bite. Tell me, what do you desire? Pleasure is but the shallow illusion. Walk the true path, and you shall see clear. Those who seek may discover Formless, perfect, the serene, unchanging, infinite. Eternally present. Eternally boring. Why don't we play rough? Embrace the solitude. Embrace the sensation. Look within. Look at me! Just a breath. Just a taste. Enough! A tiger does not fall prey to the snake. The tiger walks its own path. Those who flow as life flows know they need no other force. The heavy is the root of the light. The unmoved, the source of all movement. The center is unbound and free. Walk the path. Seek the truth.
Welcome back, everybody, to Pro Tour Los Angeles. You were able to get a nice view of the floor there. That's one of my new favorite features here from the team bringing you the Pro Tour over at Savage Feats. My name is Sam O'Byrne, Pankaj Bajwani, and, and, and we just got a brief chance to go check in with the players before we ran back and made sure that this didn't come back to a completely empty booth <laughs> and uh, learned a couple interesting things. Dash IE, I talked to uh, Sam Sutherland. I talked to Anthony Pham, two incredibly powerful players. Both took down their round ones on just another classic hero. You know, screw and boost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sam Sutherland, definitely the extraordinaire himself when it comes to uh, OG Dash. And yeah, him taking it down round one, definitely not a surprise. I, do we know who his opponent was? Maybe It was a, a friend of mine, John Zapata, a very oh, okay. an incredibly world-renowned, I mean, I would say world-renowned. He's been all over the world for this game and is mm -hmm. a super, like, very legitimate player. Gets often... Yeah way up there in the standings, uh, was known for his Icelander play, has been tearing through our locals with Azalea, top eight at the last AGE Open with Azalea, but fell to Sam Sutherland's dash in the round one here at the Pro Tour. Yeah, and you know, we spoke a lot about how wide the meta is, and we spoke a lot about the KOs and the Dromais. We, you know, we brought Rokatsu as a bit of a dark horse-ish, and then Victor and Azalea, but we, we really didn't talk about Dash and Venta Extraordinaire very much, Dash IE for short. Um, and that's because a lot of them have been running a little scared of the KOs because of a card called Smashing Performance. And if you're expecting so many KOs around, you know, they're going to just put two Smashing Performances in the list and blow up your items as Dash IE. And that doesn't feel very good. But Sam Sutherland showing that, you know, this is very much a specialist meta, and him on his specialist hero, he can he's not scared of the brutes. He will take them down. Absolutely. So a couple more stories from the floor as we went out there and did our very best to scope things out. Got a couple heroes we've, we've learned about. Our friends over at Arsenal Pass, we've heard quite quite a long mm -hmm. time. Brendan's going to be bringing Kano for, uh -huh. for better or for worse. But Hayden <laughs> did go ahead and bring Dromai Ash Artist to the tournament. Excited to see if we can get him on the stream as well. Sounds like the card guys bring in uh, uh, Victor for, for a couple Victor, of them. Mostly Victor, Nathan yeah. Crawford on Victor, Ed Knight's on Victor. Unfortunately, they had a team kill round one. It was Ed Knight versus Nathan Crawford with Ed Knight taking it down in the Victor mirror right there. World's finalist, Chris Ayali. Viserai. Now, he brings spicy stuff. He you does, know, he does. <laughs> at World Barcelona, he was on Max. Which and he, lo he loved that deck, to be yep. fair. He loved that deck and, I, and, and, and did pretty well with it. Mm-hmm. And today he's on Visrai, and I believe it is the stack 20 to 30 rune chance and blow you up kind of Visrai, not the cash in royal Visrai of, you know, way back when. Yeah, 100%. I, he, he really likes the matchup into a lot of different decks. He feels good into a fair swath of the meta. I don't think Katsu is exactly what he'd like to see, but mm -hmm. a fair amount of other decks he feels pretty strong into on that list. I spoke to him earlier this morning. We'll see uh, how he does throughout the day. We'll see if he gets into some of those later rounds. We can feature the world's finalist on that spicy deck. I'm excited to see what we have for round two, and I'm excited to see what goes on throughout the day here at the Pro Tour. We've got three more rounds of CC to come, three more rounds of draft before we move forward into day two and continue to get a sense of the dark horses that are going to end up defining this metagame and the players that are going to put themselves in pole position at the end of day one to be the leaders of the pack, everybody else looking at their backs as they push forward and blaze the trail towards that top eight. And I cannot stress how open this meta is. You know, we've used the term Dark Horse a lot, and I do feel like it's becoming quite a bit of a buzzword because of how relevant it is for this meta specifically, right? It's so wide, it's so open, the top deck isn't that far above what the other top decks are, that you can have Chris Ali coming up on Viserai. We can have Sam Sutherland showing up on Dash IE. We have all these Victors running around. Blue Pitch is on, uh, is on Victor. Um, we just spoke about the card guys on Victor. And... Runaways is on Dorinthia. Well, the whole talk of the town has been Dromais and Chaos, and it's just... It's We're going to have lots of dark horses. A lot of dark horses. <laughs> it's a specialist's dream. And when you mm -hmm. talk about a couple heroes that have a lot of specialists, you might be talking about our round two. We got a couple incredible heroes for you, folks. We got Sir Bolton, Breaker of Dawn, 1-0. and and we have got the rune blooded himself. We have got Viserai coming in against Bolton, piloted by none other than Roger Bodhi. So let's go ahead and take a very quick break because that matchup is so exciting. We need just a moment to, <laughs> to decompress and set ourselves up. And then we will be back for round two of the Pro Tour. It will be Bolton. It will be Viscerai. It will be great. Don't go anywhere.
back, everybody, to the Pro Tour Los Angeles. It's time for round two, Sam O'Byrne, Ponkage Bajwani, and Ponkage. We have got Bolton and we have got Viserai. So if you're sitting down as either of those heroes, what do you have to consider as you look across the table? The really interesting thing about both these heroes is that they both have two very different archetypes. So when you're sideboarding against them, you have to try and guess what archetype they are. So mm -hmm. Bolton, of course, has the infamous Sabres combo you know, they would want to combo every time they're on a double, triple Lumina use, set up a Spirit of Arena. But they also have the Raiden build, which is a little more tempo-y, and it can spit out quite decent numbers as well. Now, similar for Visrai. We spoke about Chrissy Ali playing that build of Visrai that stacks up 20 to 30 rune chance, maybe gets a big looming doom off. But there's also just the old Visrai days of old that runs Royal Crown, plays Cashins, wants to go Modra Tide, Revel, and Runeblood. <laughs> so when you're sitting down against either of these decks, you need to... Try and hedge a little bit if you're not sure what they're on. And round two of the Pro Tour, you don't necessarily know what everyone is on yet. It is a fascinating part of this game that we also enjoy when you really do have to make sideboarding decisions beyond just, oh, I played this hero, so I played these cards. When the question moves on and grows more interesting or more complex to the point of, I play this hero, but what kind of hero, mm -hmm. what version of this hero, then you have to make some more decisions. And in the Pro Tour, you really want to hope you make the decisions correctly. Let's go ahead and jump down to the game board as we prepare for round two and we answer those questions for ourselves. It is time for round two of the Pro Tour. We have got Roger Bodie over there on Bolton. We have got Jordan Long on Viserai. We will get and we will get into the match in just a moment. Thankfully, all our questions about the archetypes these people, these players are on will be answered the moment they flip up the equipment. Obviously, if you see Raiden on the Bolton side, then you know they're on the Tempo-E Raiden plan. If you see they flip up Sabres, then you're thinking, oh, okay, they're trying to combo me. And from the Viserai side, you can look at the headpiece and the weapon to try and figure out what they are on. Now, the stack up rune chance kill you with a big looming doom or kill you in one on one turn is going to be running something like Reaping Blade. Whereas, you know, the more standard aggressive version could be running Nebula Blade as the, you know, the replacement to Rosetta Thorn. Ah, oh, Rosetta Thorn. <laughs> mm -hmm. And looking over at these players, this is round two. This is where this, it all gets more and more real as the day goes on. You look closer and closer towards that $200,000 total prize pool. The players are going to go ahead and get mic'd up for your entertainment at home, and we get ready to see exactly Sorry. what is about to go mm -hmm. down here. You can see them checking in with the cameras, checking in with the friends at home as we get ready to see exactly what they've brought for us here at the Pro Tour. Roger Bodhi sporting that goatee that he, you know, recently has grown. And I have to say, it looks oh, yes. amazing on him. I, I love that. Ah, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Big shout out to Roger Bodhi's goatee specifically. Yes, exactly. Just the goatee. The rest of the person, eh. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, big, big love to both yep. of these players. Roger, a pillar of the community in his own right, as it's time for the equipment to be presented. It's time for some questions to be answered. And it's time for round two here, Pro Tour Los Angeles. Both players here want to know, and let's get into it. What are you seeing, my friend? So both weapons showing up uh, tells us that both these players are playing for a more tempo, aggressive style. Roger Bodhi, obviously, with a Raiden plan. He's not flipping double saber. He's not trying to stack up double luminous. He's just trying to play tempo with Raiden. Um, and on the other side, we said a Nebula Blade, as we spoke about. Now, Nebula Blade, very, very interestingly, in this try, with the loss of Rosetta Thorn, they've had to find a new weapon. And the new weapon they've come up with is Nebula Blade, which costs two, you know, one more than Rosetta Thorn, which does change a lot of the Morven Skies math that people were used to when running Rosetta Thorn. It used to be Morven Skies into a two-cost attack, like a Spellblade Assault, into Rosetta Thorn, but now they've had to pivot into more one-cost uh, uh, one cost attacks, like uh, like Consuming Volition is, you know, one that I think we already see in Jordan's hand. And, you know, it just goes to show how these Vistrys have pivoted off after losing their very, very critical weapon. Honestly, I'm quite I'm quite looking forward to see exactly how these Vistry lists have adapted when they are on the more aggressive game plan, especially not seeing Cashin and the Royal uh, talent being added to Vistry, I think, to the Crown of Dominion, not being able to just draw two cards thanks to the cash in the non-attack that can then power up the Rune Blade cards for the rest of the turn and make a bunch of Rune Chants. I'm excited to see exactly what you're describing, how they've gone ahead and molded these decks as the Revel in Rune Blood is going to head to the Arsenal. Just a single Rune Chant created thanks to the Grasp of the Art Knight. Two cards being drawn, and now it's time for some charging, for some swinging. Talk to me about Bolton. So it looks like Roger Woody didn't have a great starting hand. That's a tenacity being pitched as well. That's one of those cards. You may spoke about how it's been very relevant for Katsu uh, from heavy hit as a very good inclusion for them. But also good in Bolton because, after all, it is a yellow card. And people do kind of want to block Bolton. You know, he can go pretty wide too, especially on those Lumina turns. You know, they want to block out your Raiden, which is both coming in twice. And you can tenacity the end of it. And it's a pretty... Pretty massive tenacity, but Roger Bodhi here, opening turn, not very strong, critically not even getting a piece yes. of soul in. And, you know, 
Bolton does have an additional resource mechanic in the form of that soul, and you really want to start building that up. Yeah, Bolton, when you can charge cards into your soul, just powers up not only the hero ability, but plenty of other cards in the deck. Even this Bolting Blade l looks a lot better if it costs anything mm -hmm. close to zero, but it looks as though the Viscerai player here is going to go ahead and not re respect that seven damage more than just saying, I will take it on the chin. Yep, and we know he has a Revel and Runeblood in his arsenal, so, you know, that could be... You know, a bit of an explosive card coming out from the Vistra, and we haven't seen that in meta for quite a while. You know, Vistra has been hiding in the shadows, as it were. And finally, we're about to see Rebel and Runeblood being resolved here at the Proto after such a long time. The Demonastery's favorite son <laughs> joins the fray again. The Rune Chant created on the last turn. Let's see if it powers up this turn for Jordan. Down to 33 after that Bolting Blade, but critically, Roger, not able to find any charge with a banneret in hand. You would have imagined he would have liked to find that Mavern Skies as classic as they come to open up the true game here for Jordan. Going to give the next attack go again, and if it hits, right. going to create three arcane, sorry, three rune chants that would represent three individual points of arcane damage. Happily for Roger here, though, this attack doesn't have a breakpoint. Yeah, but it is threatening Arcane, and Jordan does have the Consuming Volition still in his hand. So if Roger Bodhi doesn't block enough of the Arcane, that Consuming Volition can come in and force a discard from Roger Bodhi. Because, of course, Consuming Volition says if your opponent has taken Arcane damage this turn, they have to discard a card. Now Soulbound Resolve. Talk to me about what this does in the matchup as we're seeing it get implemented immediately on this first turn. So it, we see what Roger Bodhi is doing here. It's a very, very efficient block uh, because, you know, it does let you charge. Well, it fulfills two things. Let's do charge, and we spoke about how earlier Roger Bodhi was missing the key you know, charge piece on his first turn. So this lets you go ahead and charge, and you know, you get a point of value back uh, because of Soulbound Resolve effect. So you know, you get to fill up some soul, and it's not just a completely wasted card. You still got a couple of points of value from it. We're going to go ahead and break the chain here, keep things looking clean, before Revelin Runeblood is going to go ahead and create Five rune chants, as mm -hmm. we hear Jordan say. One thanks to Viscerai, four thanks to the effect. So there are six sitting over there. Welcome to power up whatever comes next. It is going to be the Amplify the Arc Knight for free, getting powered up by the cost reduction of all those rune chants. Twelve big ones for Roger to deal with. So Jordan electing to keep the Consuming Volition in his hand. Obviously, I think it's because Roger Bodhi has already blocked quite a bit. So he used two cards from his hand, you know, to block with. So Jordan's saying, if you just, uh, you know, I'm going to... Send the bigger number instead, and he is taking a bit of loss in value here because the rune chant that was created from Viscerai's effect on playing the Amplify the Arc Knight is going to get destroyed at the end of the turn because of Revel and Runeblood's effect. Mm. So taking this line does, you know, lose him the rune chant, uh, but he does get to keep an arsenal and keep the Consuming Volition for a turn where he feels like he needs to disrupt Roger Bodhi because this clearly isn't the turn when Roger Bodhi is blocking this much. Good point there as Jordan goes ahead and draws up. It looks like we're just going to be illuminating coming across for four. And if it hits, it's going to go ahead and go to Soul, powering up the future turns for Roger. And coming across at a break point, though, Mr. I has presented a fair amount of equipment block for this Rune Blade hero. And one critical thing I want to talk about uh, when it comes to Vistrai versus Bolton is that most of Vistrai's blocking cards at least are attacks. And that is something that Bolton definitely wants. Vistrai's non-attacks, you know, all block for two. Then, uh, well, most of them, I mean, this become the Arc Knight but, you know, and Modratide. But a lot of the times if a Vistrai is blocking, they're going to block with the attacks, which block for three. And that's exactly what Bolton wants, especially once they've built up some soul. Because, you know, you block with an attack, the, uh, the Bolton's attack gets pumped up, and now they can banish a card from soul to give the attack go again. So, you know, Roger Bodhi very much right now in the just setting up soul here, recognizing that, you know, when the Viscerai does need to start blocking, they will be blocking with attacks, and he'll get value from that later on. And it looks as though Jordan having to really give a think on this block, because even though he has plenty of equipment, all of those cards in the hand, nice and ruby red, mm -hmm. going to be very powerful, but not give you a lot of pitch, so he has to really consider how he wants to try to sculpt the turn, given that he doesn't have a card to really access that resource curve. Yep, and Illuminate's on hit, you know, seems kind of innocuous. Oh, it's just one soul. How bad could it be? It can be pretty bad because it, that can be what unlocks a bigger Lumina turn as opposed to, you know, a Lumina turn that sort of fizzles because you block the raid in and they don't get extra soul to get to continue getting going and the rest of the turn. So Jordan very much respecting the Illuminate on hit, and I really like that. I think it, it shows how disciplined of a play he is. Also, I really, it's just so exciting to see Viscerai with these two different styles like we've talked about, and Jordan clearly... Found some real success in that last turn because he went ahead and took down the game. Both of these players here at 1-0 with these uh, meta, these heroes that haven't been as talked about in the meta. But one damage going to come across, which means it's time for that Illuminate to head into Bolton's mighty soul. And the Tuna counter going to be very, very relevant for Jordan here. You know, you very correctly pointed out it's all reds in his hand, but Tuna counter is probably going to allow this Runeblood incantation uh, that's sitting in Jordan's hand to be to be played without pitching anything else to it. And that means the Swarming Gloomville is going to follow up with is going to get 
you know, the first two effects um, bumped up because a rune chant is going to be created by Visrai and the incantation has the aura itself. So Swarming Gloom Veil sees two auras, haven't played or created this turn, and it's going to get go again and the plus one. Yeah, it looks like the Runeblade Incantation might trigger tr triggers the start of the next turn, yes? Yes, the, but the card itself is an aura. Ah, uh, yes, 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 yes. Look at you. Mm -hmm. Look at you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's uh, one Rune Chant and the Swarming Gloom coming in. Jordan's still sitting with a Consuming Volition in Arsenal, and I like how he's keeping that, seeing how Roger Body blocks before he decides whether he needs more disruption this turn or not. There you go ahead. Looks like he's taken one. Yeah, he's Going down to 30 is Roger Body to Jordan Long's 32 Bolton deck. Facing down the Viscerai, he does the consuming volition. That's the spirit of arena in Roger Bodhi's hand. Viscerai trigger. One and four. Looks like a consuming volition being pitched to play the other consuming volition. And now, you know, Roger Bodhi, that rune chant, that one rune chant is saying, you kind of have to block me because if you don't, you're going to discard a card anyway. Yeah, what an interesting kind of predicament for Roger. He can pitch a card to see if he just wants to lose one card on the turn, he can pitch it, go ahead and take care of the. Uh, arcane damage and then not have to discard, but then you're certainly losing blocking value on the on the attack. You have to imagine. Oh, looks like Roger Boji electing to take the Runechan damage and saying, "Okay, you know what? I'll take a Runechan, but I'll block other Consuming Volition, so I don't need to care about the on-hit discard." Electing not to charge with that card. It seems as though so. Mm -hmm. Both players here preparing for Rogers. So Jordan, with the incantation on the field and one rune chant left over from that turn, he's sitting pretty good. That means he's going to go into this turn with two rune chants already. And we know he's playing these cost reduction effects like Amplify the Arc Knight and Drawn to the Dark Dimension, as I believe a card we also saw in his hand earlier. It might have been the blue one. So, you know, having two rune chants can actually bring a very significant cost reduction to the texture of his turn. Absolutely. The Spirit of War going to go ahead and charge up with the Spirit of Arena. But Bolton, seeing that necklace head to the souls, decides I'd like to wear it on my person instead. Go straight into into the arena upon the charge reg resolution. So now Lumina Ascension, go mm -hmm. ahead and gives action points every time you play it. Yep. And very critically, that means that you don't need to break the chain to play Lumina, and that can be very, very relevant for cards like V of the Vanguard, right? Because V of the Vanguard says it's going to buff up all the light attacks on this combat chain. So the fact that you can play Lumina without breaking the chain means you get to keep your V of the Vanguard, you know, power up effect for all the attacks. That is going to buy a block with the Runic Reckoning there, a good mm. non-attack action for the Viscerai to not allow the deck to be powered up. It's time for the Snapdragon Scalers to be deployed, which means just three more damage thanks to the Raiden here. Snapdragon Scalers on this turn early, Punkage. What does that make you think about Roger's potential future turns? That's a very aggressive use of Snapdragons, definitely. You typically want to use it, uh, you know, on, like, a turn where you're going to present some sort of on hits, like a Bolt of Courage or something like that. Uh, but Roger Bodhi's saying, you know what, I have two pieces of soul already, and that's the other piece of Sun Dragon Scalers. It helps you conserve soul, because you get to go again without needing to banish a card from soul. But he's saying, uh, uh, I'll just use it here, I have the two pieces of soul, and very critically, it could mean that he wants to banish a card from soul to send Raiden right now, and then end the turn with an on hit, something like a Snatch, something like a Bolt of Courage, potentially, after this. And that's something Jordan does need to... Potentially be afraid of. It looks like that's exactly what's happening. Archibody's banishing a card from Soul to give this raid and go again. Yeah, so three more damage to so the Snapdragon Scalers, allowing for the turn to progress far beyond just the Raiden, and this is just going to be another four points of damage from the Express Lightning. Roger really saying, you're playing a more aggressive version of the deck, you're off of Arsenal, so I'm going to threaten seven more damage thanks to, th thanks to the Snapdragon Scalers, rather than just Arsenal the Express Lightning for a later turn. And Jordan here has drawn one of those rune blade hands, Sam. It's a, it's a full non-attack action hand. However, there is a Sonata Arcanics in this hand. And that is, Jordan is thinking there, how much of a risk do I want to take? Do I just block out this turn and then arsenal one of my non-attacks and draw back up? Hopefully have a proper mix of non-attacks and attacks in the next hand. Or, you know, you're, Roger Bodhi, you're not sending too many on hits this turn. I'm going to take the risk. I'm going to play this Sonata and hopefully get the attack. You have to imagine for these aggressive Viscerai decks, Betting big on some of these more random mm -hmm. effects are some of the ways you can get yourself to victory. The Courage token going to be created here. And one other thing to point out, it's, so it's not just a Sonata line Jordan has access to. He also has become the Arc Knight in his hand. So he could use that to find the attack if he wants to, but that's a pretty you know, low-value play as far as plays go because you, know, you have to discard a card and then you're basically turning two cards in your hand into one card from your deck, which isn't too amazing, so it'll be... Interesting to see if he goes for Become the Arc Knight or whether he goes for Sonata. Looks like it's going to go ahead and be the Rune Blood Incantation mm -hmm. pitching away. Become the Arc Knight, so two floating. That looks mm -hmm. like it couldn't go ahead and power up that Sonata. 
or just a Nebula Blade. Nebula very, very disciplined, saying, you know what, I'm not going to take the risk on the Sonata, I'm just going to send the Nebula Blade, which obviously is going to be buffed up because he has played a non-attack this turn, and threatens a Rune Chant on hit. A lot of damage from the weapon here. Okay. Two damage from the Rune Chants being accepted by Mr. Bodhi, going down to 27 to Jordan's 25. Four damage, so taking a rune channel. That's a break point. Roger Bodhi was pretty aggressive with his armor use. You know, that uh, Soulbound Resolve is no longer there. He's got Wallband of Bologna, but I mean, that one currently blocks two. You don't really want to overblock the Nebula Blade. So Roger Bodhi saying, uh, I, uh, he's just going to cash that in. It looks like he's blocking with a Courage of Steel Hand as well. So it is blocking four exactly. So not overblocking the, the Nebula Blade. Warband of Bologna, what a beautiful card. Mm -hmm. And one of the cards that have really helped this Bolton deck. We talked about consistency in that KO deck. Uh, a match ago, and the Warband of Bologna allowing for charges to occur even when the hand does not want it to. But the Courage token that was created thanks to the Spirit of War now turns this Command and Conquer into an attack for seven. One of, a, one of the more powerful plays mm -hmm. thanks to these Might tokens, thanks to these Courage tokens that we've seen in some of these more recent sets. Yes, Jordan does have plenty of equipment here, but CNC for seven certainly demands more than just a two-card block. And you brought up earlier that Vishrai wasn't on the Royal Helm and wasn't you know, playing Cashins, yes. and because of that, he's got Crown of Providence. So CNC for seven actually going to be a lot easier for him to deal with than you know if he was on the royal plan. So and because Bolton doesn't really threaten CNC for seven as much as say something like KO does, Jordan knows that you know what if you're going to send CNC for seven, I can probably just cash in Crown of Providence here. Next time you send CNC at me, if you ever do, it's going to be for likely for six, and I can just block with two cards then. Only one block left on the Warband of Bologna, and as Jordan has shown. There are some on-hit effects that do need to be respected in this Viscerai list. Taking a look at the texture of his hand, we see a bunch of blues. Mm -hmm. We do see another Sonata. So is that two Sonata, one in the Arsenal, one in yes. the hand? Yes. So the Crown Providence could go ahead and you know get rid of the Sonata if he really wants to. Uh, and then he'll still have the blues to pay into the Sonata that's in his hand right now. But Jordan, very, very disciplined player. Let's see if he's considering actually just blocking out the CNC for seven, saying, you know what, this mostly blue hand, not really a turn I want to like give up armor for. Uh, I'll give up my armor for a turn where I know for a fact what I'm about to do. And that's one of the traps that you could fall into as a Visrai player when you're looking at Sonata in your hand. You're thinking, oh, this could get me, you know, this red attack that I really want. But you know, many times you might just whiff on the Sonata. Looks like we are going to give the Crown of Providence here and Spellblade Strike. Five block, two coming over, but the Crown of Providence is going to protect the Arsenal and allow for another card to be drawn, so Jordan will still be working with four cards on his own turn. Roger going ahead and creating an Arsenal for himself, and I think that's something we need to really keep an eye on, is which player is really able to establish and maintain a five-card hand that pushes them forward as they've just kind of been walking down life totals together. Definitely. In an aggro race, it really is who gets to string together more five-card hands uh, is the one who sort of typically wins the game and who gets the opponent down into a blocking position faster. Now, it looks like Jordan, from his Crown of Providence, drew into a red Spellblade Strike, which is definitely something he wanted to see because, you know, he only had a blue attack in the hand before he used the Crown of Providence, converted the Sonata in this arsenal into a red Spellblade Strike. Yeah, two blues, two reds, certainly much more what you'd like on a turn mm -hmm. where you're hoping to do damage mm -hmm. rather than just block out with the card that's a block three in that bottom right corner. Agency is on Jordan here. One and oh. Of course. At the yeah. door. Let's start with counter on Tunic. Incantation trigger. Here and here. Yep. I'm not sure so if I'm not sure if Roger just gave just gave Jordan, hey, remember your tunic, buddy. Yeah, I, 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 I wonder awesome. if that was really great sportsmanship being shown here at the second round of the Pro Tour. And one of the reasons, you know, you spoke about how Roger Bodhi won the pillars of the community. This is exactly one of the reasons why. He wants to play a good, clean game. If he wins the matchup, he wants to win not because the opponent missed the trigger or something. He wants to win because he won a fair and square. Yeah, Spellblade Strike going to create a rune chant as well as get go again. Thanks to the Mauverns guys, but first Roger has to think about the rune chants. Looks like he's thought enough. <laughs> Looks like the player's just trying to figure out the life totals here. But Jordan here, putting out Spellblade Strike with an on hit over here, already creating two rune chants on the back because one from Vistra and one from Spellblade Strike's ability. Now this Spellblade Strike threatening another rune chant on hit. It's not quite the red Marvin Skies, which threatens three, it's blue, only threatens one additional rune chant. But you could, because of that, look at this blocking Spellblade Strike for four. You could look at it as potentially blocking. When you block it for four, you've actually gotten five points of value because you prevented the third rune chant from being created. Looks like a player is just trying to figure out the life totals right now. And as they do that, 
Okay, looks like they've sorted it out. Roger Bodhi does end up taking the spell based strike. Looks like a third rune chant should be created. Okay. I'll make a rune chant on this. Thanks to the Mauvern Sky. So now three rune chants to power up whatever comes next. And the answer is going to be the Nebula Blade. So another Sonata Arcanics headed to the Arsenal. Mm -hmm. Jordan and hoping for a chance to actually play at this time rather than ship <laughs> to the bottom, facing down a CNC. And yet another four damage hit that's threatening a rune chant on hit. Okay. So. Jordan getting a lot of just incidental value from his cards over here. The Mormon Sky is giving go again already and then making the additional rune chant. Nebula Blade making additional rune chant, which sort of makes the weapon a two cost five power attack in a sense, which does match the value of Rosetta Thorn, which, you know, when Rosetta Thorn was lost, everyone was like, oh no, our one for four, it's gone. But Nebula Blade, you know, when it hits, does match the value of Rosetta Thorn, of Rosetta Thorn, and it is very difficult to block it out because it does come in for four when you have played a non-attack on that turn. And here's why we're seeing Roger feeling so good about taking all that damage on his last turn via the Vanguard coming across and going to power up whatever comes for Roger here. Yes, he's used some equipment. Yes, he's down nine life to Jordan here, second round of the Pro Tour, but V is going to go ahead and power up the soul with a light card. So now all the attacks on the mm -hmm. combat chain get plus one thanks to the V of the Vanguard. Let's see exactly what Jordan has to work with. Looks like two block in the Rebel and Rune Blood, a two block in the Lead the Charge, nope. and then a couple three blocks as well. Yep. Yeah. And you have to wonder whether Roger Bodhi has Lumina Ascension in the hand like this. You know, he took all that damage, and it's definitely going to be something pretty big. And sending the Raiden up at front over here kind of, to some extent, potentially telegraphs it. Oh, here's some way of, you know, finding a Lumina Ascension from Beacon of Victory. Um, and being able to play that instant speed, which is sort of, you know, a reaction because it is, it is going to pump the Raiden up to five uh, in the reaction step. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you're good, yeah. <laughs> Listen to the players discussing the blocks here. Mm -hmm. no blocks. Once again, Jordan, a little low on the resources in that hand, but again, very critical timing of the tunic coming up, potentially going to save that hand. Yep. Uh, right up. Yeah, yeah. Yep, cool. so the attack is going to get plus one. He's now going to be able to grab an action card. Mm -hmm. For one or less. I, I wonder which action card is I think it's going to be Illumina <laughs> Ascension. The mm -hmm. bolt and specialization is the thing that really makes this deck hum. Talk to me about what this card really unlocks for the bolt and deck punkage. So two things here. The Spirit of Arena, firstly, is going to get the action point back. Because note that this Raiden currently does not have go again. And Roger Bodhi used his last piece of soul on the Beacon of Victory. So he doesn't have the bolt and ability to give the Raiden go again. But Spirit of Arena allowing Lumina to be played at instant speed, gives Roger Bodhi the action point back because, of course, Lumina has go again. And critically, is going to make this Raiden put a card in his soul, and then now he'll have Bolton's ability for the next Raiden swing. Yes, so now this Raiden swing comes in for five, thanks to both the Lumina Ascension and the V of the Vanguard. Any attacks blocked on the chain are going to add an additional point of value for the Raiden, thanks to Bolton's ability, thanks to the charge from the V of the Vanguard, and one card left in hand and a card in soul, so you have to imagine something might be coming out after this Raiden. Yep. No blocks declared, attack, re uh, attack reaction to give go again, five damage coming across, so Viscerai, yes, got a five card hand, but it's now down to eight. Lumina Ascension into the soul here, off the Lumina Ascension mm -hmm. trigger. Let's see what the follow-up is here for Roger. And it's important to point out, Roger Bodhi took a bit of a risk there with that first Raiden swing, um, going down to yes. no soul when yes. it came in, because if he flipped a generic off the top, which maybe he's just running none of them, and so he was confident making that play, knowing he, he cannot whiff, but if he hit something like an E-Strike, which is a card that some bolt in this run, or maybe even like a Sink Below, that would have gone to the bottom of the deck and not gone into his soul, meaning that he wouldn't have been able to activate Bolt on a second Raiden swing. So, you know, he was playing a little bit with fire there, or he just knows he has no generics in his deck. Exactly, yes. And now with Jordan headed down Ooh. to three here and the Illuminate heading to Soul, And I believe a couple points of life gained as well thanks to the Lumina Ascension, which can't be overstated when your opponent has gone all the way down to three following your big turn. The question here as the players, I love to see, you know, the mm -hmm. good sportsmanship as they're taking a little bit of a laugh. The question is, how much do you think Jordan's potential clapback hinges on Sonata Arcanics? Ooh, it's a little hard to say without looking at the texture of his hand. But I actually, I think, looking at the texture of his hand, I think he's, this is going to be a Creeper's activation. Um, he's going to Mordertide play some attack. He's going to make a bunch of rune chants. And he has a Mordertide with the Revel and rune blood as well. So there's going to be a lot of rune chants this turn. And it looks like the Creeper is going to be used to get the action point back. Much like how Roger Bodhi just did playing Lumina Ascension at instant speed. Sonata Arcanic's going to go ahead and make more rune chants. 
And we've already hit two blue attack actions and a mm -hmm. non-attack, so resources to power up the hand, perhaps, and another point of arcane, as well as those five rune chants sitting in the back end, ready to come across with whatever attack. Well, looks like he's not going for Creepers and Sonata, so, you know, let's just let Jordan do the lines here <laughs> <laughs> and see what he's up to. But Revel and Runeblood on a moderate tight turn, that is pretty terrifying. You know, we spoke about a life deficit between this Bolton and Visrai right now. One thing when both players get to low life totals is that the Visrai asks a lot more questions of the opponent because now you need to start blocking rune chants and that never feels good especially if you're at one there's one rune chant coming in you have to give up a whole card to block the rune chant and the physical attack that's you know coming along with the rune chant whereas on the bolt side they're just sending only physical attacks and it's a lot easier to block around when you get a low life totals compared to someone who's sending split damage absolutely and roger there really just having to go ahead and see what's on the top of the deck as well with jordan and took a lot of damage, but was able to gain some life, able to threaten a big turn of his own. And the, the problem potentially here for Roger is, yes, you've gotten your opponent down to three, but Bolton's rather card hungry mm -hmm. to really do what he wants to do. Yes, we've seen some of those zero for fours, which can put in work, but that's only a one card block Crackles. for Viscerai here. And Jordan also has been very, very disciplined with his armor piece. That grasp of the arc mm -hmm. completely, you know, unbattered over there. Still has three block available there. Spellbound Creepers as well, especially if he activates it this turn. You're very incentivized to block with it after that because your opponent can just block Arcane and have it blow up. So that's another one block in the Spellbound Creepers. If he even uses a Tunic this turn, then he could even, you know, cash that in for a block because it's unlikely you're going to get a Tunic counter back. So Jordan, you know, he's at three on the board, but still uh, on the life totals, but still has quite a bit of armor, whereas Roger Bodhi only has one armor left on the wall band of Bologna. I'm going to... Let's see how he wants to continue. We are going to activate the Creepers. Here. Forty two. Yep. And this Rebel in Runebla is going to create so many rune chants. Um, <laughs> so it's going to be two from the Viscerai ability plus yeah. five from the Rebel in Runebla. It's going to be a total of seven extra rune chants going up to nine seven, here for Jordan. And Roger... The question is how much resources, how many resources does he have in his hand to combat? We saw him take the five on the attack previously, which does speak to perhaps some trouble dealing with a bunch of little pingy sources of arcane. Mm -hmm. A bit of a saving grace for Roger Bodhi here that his Nebula Blade doesn't actually have an on hit because of the Revel and Runeblood effect, obviously. Because, you know, even if this hits, you make the Rune Chant from Nebula Blade's effect, it'll get destroyed at the end of the turn because of Revel and Runeblood. So bit of a saving grace for him, but also staring down nine rune chants of which he blocks two. He had to block some of it because he was at nine, Sam, so... Uh, now yep. Roger here is going to be able to cash in the final block on the Warband of Bologna and a Command and Conquer. Yep. Only two resources from the Prayer of Bologna used to combat the rune chants, but now, like you said, the Revel and Runeblood going to go ahead and take away any final rune chants that Runeblood Incantation makes another pingy source of Arcane for Jordan's next yep. turn, and he was able to establish an arsenal. This is just going to be a Raiden, currently, <laughs> for zero. Yes, the the fabled, do I have Beacon of Victory in hand or not, to pump this up. But of course, Roger Bodhi, only two soul in, uh, with only two soul, Beacon of Victory won't even threaten lethal, even if he has it in his hand. So, you know, this is a play you always make as, as Bolton. You will just... Put the sword forward and just and just put your opponent in a little mind game state. You know, like, what do you have? What are you doing? Is this just a bluff or what's going on? <laughs> they say, oh, uh, we don't even have a zero damage dice. <laughs> Listen in on these players as Jordan has to make a critical block. Three to two here, second round of the Pro Tour. Now Jordan, with another runic reckoning in his hand, normally is it a non-attack that blocks three. Also, because of that runeblood incantation, it can immediately be played for free because he's going to start the turn with a rune chant. This is a very, very strong inclusion uh, for Viserai from the Dustle Dawn set. Absolutely. Non-attacks that block three against Bolton cannot mm -hmm. overstate their importance. Alongside the Moderate Tide as well. Now, with the opponent already at two, you know, Moderate Tide can be a bit of a... It can close the game out, but at the same time, it can also be... A bit of a win more card. We don't actually need it. You're sending enough arcane anyway. Uh, so we could have seen a block there, but Jordan just calling Roger Bodhi's bluff. Also saying that, you know what? It's not even lethal even if you have Beacon of Victory anyway. So. And then trigger. One rune, can rune blood incantation to the bin. One creating a rune chant, but sticking around as an aura on the field. Jordan's got a five card hand. Roger's at two. It is going to be a tall order for him to stay alive facing the barrage of arcane that these rune chants might represent. 
and we spoke about this earlier, when you have a low life total against Vishrai and it's getting split damage at you, it is just so much harder to block than if it's just physical damage, which is what something like a Bolton would do. Because you need to pitch, and also a deck like Bolton, you know, a lot of yellows, so even when you're blocking the rune chance, you're not really doing it very efficiently. We've seen Roger Bodhi, this whole game, hasn't pitched a single blue to stop rune chant damage. It's always been yellows. The previous turn, it was a yellow, and the first few turns when you were setting up soul, it was also yellows to get rid of rune chance. So, you know, it's just looking like a rough spot for Roger Bodhi over here. Let's see if he can survive this turn, at least. Lead the Tard into Mord the Mordred Tide, going to create just the one rune chant because the Mordred Tide hasn't actually resolved when the Viscerai trigger creates the rune chant. But now the Runic Reckoning, that's going to go ahead and get pumped up by the Mordred Tide, which means four points of arcane damage Amplify. joining the Amplify the Arc Knight. Viscerai trigger makes two. Mm -hmm. yep. Two rune chants from the Viscerai trigger, and of course, an action point being generated off the Lead the Charger. And here we see what we were talking about earlier Sam pitching yellows just never feels good, and looks like that is Roger Bodhi's entire hand yeah. <laughs> into Nebula Blade. And that's going to do it. That's going to close the game out. The Blade getting represented there for Jordan. Roger Bodhi's army of light falling to the rune chance as we see an aggressive Viscerai list. Listen, not all of those turns were incredibly exciting, but every single one of them put him in the position to get to the pop-off turn with the Mordred Tide, hitting the resource on the Sonata Arcanics, and taking care of the game. Mordred Tide and Revel and Runeblood, as potent of a combo as it even used to be before Vishrai, you know, fell off from the face of the earth. And I have to say, you know, we really love Roger Woody, but I have to say, a part of me is very happy to see a Vishrai doing well at a Pro Tour because it's... It was one of the decks I started the game with, and it's just such a treat seeing it come up here and perform well in a meta where no one's really expecting it. And this is one of the most beautiful things about these incredibly high-level split format tournaments, right? Is because if Jordan can just win in one, one more game, really, of CC in two more games, if he's really on a tear, then all of a sudden you put yourself in a position to take down your draft pod, and now... Your CC games on day two, that's just, once again, half the day, right? So these more dark horse candidates, these, these metagame heroes that are challenging the top tier of this Wild West meta with a split format tournament like these Pro Tours, like the World Championships, right? You put yourself in a position to really have great game into much of the field, even if your deck is not what people are expecting. And talk about some other decks that people aren't expecting. Let's go ahead and get to our backup match of the feature match table. We have got a Prism and we have got a Leviah for you. Ooh, Rhea Adams on Prism over here. Now, we, if you've been following her on Twitter or following her on YouTube, Rhea Adams has been very, very high on Prism. And you know, Prism in the hands of a very, very well-experienced player, a player who knows how to play that deck, actually very, very terrifying. And I am really looking forward to see what Rhea can do with this deck. Yes, you were talking to me before the day even started about what you believe to be the pros of prism and the cons of prism and please walk me through a little bit of that as the viewers at home might notice these players are really moving with some extra verve some <laughs> extra speed and alacrity it's because we're going at a bit of an additional speed on this game to ensure that we can make it all happen and come together before round three begins so we're going to be watching we're going to be trying to keep up as well with the rest <laughs> of you so apologies if we you know have to <laughs> talk a little quickly to make it all happen but talk to me about prism as these players are shuffling up here in the past so one biggest thing about prism is that not a lot of people have access to a good prism player to practice against and so because of that they think the matchup into prism is a certain way when the prism players have actually figured out actually it's the other way i think one really good example of this is dromai i think a lot of dromai players think that prism is a very good matchup for them when the really really good prism players the players like rhea adams the players like justin salmon when i spoke to them last night they were actually saying they feel very comfortable into dromai unless the dromai flips up you know like has a time snap push in the list or is playing time skipper boots it, they feel very very comfortable into dromai and and that's just one of the things that happens when you play a deck like this, a deck that not many people have practiced against, simply because they just don't have a lot of good prism players to practice against. So it's going to start the game off. If we know a good prism player when we see one, it's got to be Rhea, Mad Rhea Adams. She is the C tier queen, and she is taking <laughs> down this. She's trying to take down this tournament with a hero like that of her own in this prism list. It's going to be a beast within to start things off. Ray Adams, a lot of cards in the a lot of cards in the deck that don't block, but a lot of really powerful effects as well. Like this Soul Shield looks like it was her that went first and went ahead and established that arsenal, which she can now go ahead and deploy and get a card into the soul. This hand, rather clunky, no graveyard fill whatsoever from the Leviathan player to start things off. 
Rhea Adams, very, very disciplined in the first turn, not sending any attacks at Levi's way, saying, I'm not going to give you a chance to fill up the graveyard. You have to do that on your own. And as you pointed out, a very, very clunky hand from a Levi play over there, because not only did they have to send a beast within, they had to arsenal another beast within two, Sam, and that just never feels good. Beast within, not a card you want in your arsenal at all. You always want it in your hand to potentially discard it. Hello, Luminaris at home. We have got a big old Herald with Go again. This is a Herald of Triumph giving attack action cards. Minus one while defending, so no poppers in play here. Going to go ahead. Uh, oh, the Endless Maw. Yeah, still still only a six, right? Well, there's a swing big right oh, under I, that. I couldn't see it where the bottom <laughs> card was, yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, Il... I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce that, but the Leviathan player over here, you know, being very disciplined over there, blocking with a popper, but also blocking a little more. And there's two things to that. One saying, if Rhea Adams plays something like a Celestial Reprimand to make it not a popper anymore, he's still blocking a little, a little more, but also filling up Graveyard. Critically, something that he needs to do before he can start really putting on the pressure on Rhea. Very, very astute point there. The send packing is going to go ahead and be taken care of by a couple blocks. Looks like I saw briefly a Merciful Retribution. I don't know where it went. Mm -hmm. uh, and this card, which was banished from the sand packing, and now it's on the combat chain, Herald oh. of Judgment over here. Very, very strong into Levia. Now, not right now at this point when they have, you know, nothing in their banner zone anyway. Uh, but later on, you know, this card is can really, really trip a Levia up. And Ray Adams was talking to me yesterday how this is a tech piece they've yeah. added in for Levia and also for Katsu. Because remember, just cards can't be played from a banner zone at all. So very, very spicy piece of tech coming out here from Ray Adams. Yeah, Ray, they're getting that card popped by the Writhing Beast Hulk in that graveyard. Now, all of a sudden, a bunch of sixes ready for this Levia deck to come across with. The Levia deck has to be one of the most exciting decks in the tournament, one of the highest ceilings. But again, such skill required to play both of these heroes, and lucky for us, we get to watch it very fast. <laughs> <laughs> now, one thing we haven't spoken about yet is the choice of chess piece from Rhea Adams over here. Now, there's two sort of philosophies with Prism, or, you know, two chess pieces they sometimes have access to in the sideboard. One's a Vestige of Soul, and the other is uh, Empyrean Rapture. Now, when you see your Prism opponent flip a Vestige of Soul, that should tell you they're going for a bit more of an aura-based game plan. They want to get a Genesis in the field, get value from the Genesis, uh, because that's going to pump up all their resources for the turn because it's a Vestige, and they want those extra resources to play like Heart Light Sentinels, and really just swarm the board with auras compared to Rapture, which is when they want to try and hit you with Heralds. And the turn there from Ilias, a big old swing big off the back of an Art of War go again, banishing a six, so the Blood Debt Drain has started. But it looks like before he actually goes to end, because a card has gone to Soul in that Soul Shield, Rhea here able to pitch just a single blue thanks to the Vestige of Soul like you just talked about, drawing three cards instead of four off of a single blue. Yep, and that basically effectively made Rhea's turn blocking six with one card because the Tome just drew cards back. And critically on the Leviathan side, they have started playing to Blood Dead. Now, this is a bit of a turning point in the match. At this point, Levia player is saying, okay, I've got enough graveyard. I have the space to start setting up, uh, to start, you know, building up Blood Dead and using that to put pressure on you. So that Art of War banish put a Graveling Growl in the banner zone. That's Blood Dead counter has started ticking up. Understood. So, Prism, Awakener of Soul, if these Heralds hit, able to go ahead and tutor up a Figment, Figment's becoming powerful angels that attack. No go again, but again, Luminaris can help with that. Such a powerful weapon. Mm -hmm. She's come back from beyond. This is going to go ahead and be a Mandible Claw coming in right now just for three, but this is, this is one of the more face-up <laughs> plays in professional flesh and blood these days. A Mandible Claw coming in for three when a KO discard of an Agile Windup can go ahead and, or a Mighty Windup, can go ahead and give go again if need be. Let's go ahead and discard the Agile Windup, mm -hmm. make an Agility, make a Might, and give the Mandible Claw go again. Yellow Agile Windup, definitely one of the like one of the standout pieces from Heavy Heaters for Levi. Levi didn't, you know, got some sand packings. I think we we saw sand packing earlier as well. But Yellow Agile Windup, definitely quite an MVP because not only does it help the Levi get action points when it's totally needed, it is also a graveyard fill, like a free graveyard fill of number six, which can be uh, of a number six attack, which can be really good. You know, when you're forced to go first, or when you're forced to go second, um, and of course, a agility token on top just added bonus. There it looks like Levi did take one point of blood that there from the Graveling Growl they banished to the Art of War the previous turn, and finally able to get that beast within out of the graveyard but ray here only able to to kind of establish the passing mirage draw up with three cards in hand so even though that doesn't feel good clearly valuing the power of the specter on that passing mirage enough that she's willing to go ahead and take the risk yep. of, of you know not having a full four card draw Yep, and Passing Mirage honestly effectively going to end up blocking three on Rhea's own turn because you can totally expect that it's going to get clawed down and that'll be three damage that's not going to your face, it's instead going at the Passing Mirage.
Two hits and a miss into the graveyard, thanks to the Dread Screamer. This is going to be six with go again, two cards in hand, but you have to imagine that Passing Mirage has a big old target on it. The beautiful art you can see there is basically just a big target for a Mandible Claw. Two cards going to be put in front of the Dread Screamer, and now time for a Mandible Claw to take care of the Passing Mirage. So a couple cards to work with here for Rhea. I know we're moving quickly, so you, it, mm -hmm. it's hard for you to have time, but how do these players each want to win this game? What, as we're on Rhea's turn here, how does she win here from here? She wins by spitting out a whole bunch of auras, uh, and she does that by triggering the Vesters of Soul, drawing a bunch of cards from Tome of Divinity, spitting out a whole bunch of auras, some of them being an ELS, which basically means a Levia player, well, unless they get lucky on scab skins, can't really put too much pressure on the Rhea, uh, on Rhea and then Rhea continues just generating value off of those auras that she's established. Now, I as I was speaking to her last night, she did say Levia is one of the harder matchups for Prism, so it'll be very interesting to see how she navigates this. Hungering Slaughter Beast going to come across and just banish three. Keep that Blood Debt Train from being too painful for Ilias here, our German representative of this second round, taking on the American in Rhea Adams. Mm -hmm. Going to go ahead and banish a six, so the Blood Debt is off. Bonebreaker Bellow, a card that is really quite good and limited, but showing up here is a blue three block for this Leviathan deck. What do you make of that? Yeah, that's a very interesting inclusion. I don't believe we've seen many Leviathans run that, so I'm curious to see. I mean, blue three block on a non-attack is very, very strong, especially if you're, you're expecting Bolton. Yeah, if you're expecting we watch a warrior, then it's that. But then there's also, you know, it is a card that you can fill your graveyard with. Now, there's, of course, alongside Smashback Alehorn as well, but I don't believe we've seen that yet uh, from Ilias, so I wonder maybe he's opting for the block 3 in the Bonebreaker bell Bellow rather than the block 2 on something like a Smashback Alehorn. Halo of Illumination going to go ahead and be activated here. Just a random, common, limited card, it felt mm -hmm. like, from Monarch, but has been so powerful in these Prism lists because it is a, an immediate card to soul, it's an immediate card draw, and mm -hmm. an immediate Tutor for a figment. What are we looking at here? Is that the area edition? So, uh, yes, it is the figment of area edition here. It's going to go ahead and create a ponder, which tells us Rhea is expecting to use their whole hand this yep. turn. And when the prison player pops Halo, it's very, very akin to when a wizard player pops Striders, in a sense, where this is going to be a massive power turn. Now, of course, Prism isn't going to kill you on this turn, but this is this is the power spike. You, when you play a post-Halo game and a pre-Halo game, it is very, very different when you're opposing a Prism. When they no longer have the Halo, they no longer have the tricksy things they can do where they find a figment of triumph in response to a Phantasm trigger, for example. So... Ilias, on one hand, happy to say Halo go right now instead of in response to something that he's doing that'll just shut down his yeah. turn. At the same time, got to be a little nervous to see Rhea so aggressively pop the Halo. What is going on here? We have to imagine it's going to be some sort of tomes or some sort of drawing cards with a Herald of, uh, with a Soraya Angel of Erudition. Yeah, now look at this. Four damage with go again, thanks to the Luminaris and thanks to the trigger off of, is it Soraya is the, fig, yes. is the Herald? Soraya, the Angel coming across for four damage, but also critically banishing a card from Soul and drawing two cards and one floating, even though that's just a yellow in pitch. You might be like, how? Vestige mm -hmm. of Soul is how. Such a cool card, a card that I never got the chance to play with. But when these prism lists started popping around, even pre Rob Catton making it look uh, incredible over there in England. I got one of those cards pretty quickly because mm -hmm. I was like, a little extra card every time I pitch? Or a little extra resource? Yes, yeah, sign me up! Yep, very, very strong card, especially when paired something like Halo, paired with something like Genesis. It's what is, is, it is the card that kind of makes Genesis as much of a powerhouse as it is because of all the extra resources you're going to continuously get while you have the Vestige of Soul. Now, Rhea Adams, probably, uh, let's see what they can follow up. Okay, follow up with Arclight Central. No more card draw on this turn, so probably not too happy about the way this turned out. Maybe didn't, you know, have a tome, didn't draw into a tome, was really hoping to draw a tome from the Soraya, uh, because, you know, there's still going to be a ponder, so you do want to make sure you um, do empty your hand. Looks like Rhea is playing another aura. So here we go. We have the ponder. We have the Merciful Retribution. When the ponder pops... Mm -hmm. <laughs> does it deal a damage thanks yes, to the merciful? it does. It is That's well, fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's one of the really strange uh, interactions, you know, when Ponda pops, or, you know, back in the day when, like, Frostbites were a yeah, thing that's as awesome. well. Frostbites <laughs> pop and it just deals damage to the opponent because <laughs> it's technically an aura that was destroyed. Uh, so Rhea Adams here with quite a decent board state, Merciful Attribution, Arclight Sentinel, and Soraya. Let's see how the scabs goes. Uh, and this is... <laughs> oh, wow, look at that. I didn't even realize that yep. Rhea had the Gambler's Gloves mm -hmm. activated in response to the Scapskin Leathers hitting there. But unfortunately, even though these, the Gambler's Gloves were activated, still hit the double action point on the turn. It did Ilias, so this Arclight Sentinel is not going to be as impactful. And that's one of the reasons, you know, this matchup can be pretty difficult for Prism. What Rhea was talking about yesterday was that, you know, Ilias didn't even bring up Gambler's Gloves, so he's not really, you know, super respecting uh, the Prism matchup. But, you know, Scabs itself is just such a strong card that, you know, it can really 
put a dent in what Rhea is trying to do, and to the point where Rhea needs to bring in Gamma's gloves uh, to try and stop that. Now, of course, her responding to the first Arclight Sentinel being destroyed with another Arclight Sentinel. Which, does that make you think that she's really valuing keeping Soraya around? Soraya. Yeah, because yeah, the uh, card draw is so powerful. And the Merciful Retribution as well, when these cards get destroyed. Little pingy points of Arcane. Definitely. And, you know, we spoke about no Gamblers Gloves on the side of Ilias. Also no Arcane Barrier on the side of Ilias. So sure. this Arcane damage, pretty much unpreventable. Um, yeah, and the other thing that, that potentially could have done was to force Ilias to take a bunch of Blood Dead. Because, you know, a lot of the cards say when you attack with this, you banish. But obviously into Spectra, you don't get to attack. So you don't actually, you know, banish the cards. But Ilias with the Mark of the Beast there going straight to a banish zone. So still, you know, not taking a bunch of Blood Dead. So Ilias, honestly, still feeling kind of good. And this is one of the differences in the modern day Prism versus the Prism of old. Was when they use Arclight Sentinel on your turn you're actually pretty okay with it because they usually go back to their turn not doing very much. Four damage with the go again. Looks as though I believe we're still on blocks from Ilias here as he's giving a think. This is, yeah, because those two points of pinging arcane damage brought him to 32. Mm -hmm. No blocks. He's going to head down to 28, so still got a healthy life lead, but Merciful yep. Retribution, not a card you'd ever like to sit across from. Two arc-like sentinels never feel good. Now mm -hmm. big old Herald. Is that another one of Triumph? Yep. Coming across. Coming in for five. Now, Ilis, of course, still critically very much has that husk still in play. Now, this Herald does have go again, but Rhea, with only one card in hand, no resources floating, Ilias pretty much knows that the worst that can happen after this is a blue aura comes down or just an arsenal. Looks as though, yeah, Ilias representing the Phantasm trigger, but still blocked out. So, regardless, can I go ahead and. Uh, representing the might trigger, but uh, uh, sorry, no, no might trigger because of the minus one. So, there's no Phantasm. Oh, it was just going to bring a block. Oh, oh yeah. interesting. Dread Screamer now coming across. Six with go again. Yep. And now Ilias is sitting quite tight. I mean, we spoke about the pre-Halo game, uh, pre-Halo game and the post-Halo game. Rhea Adams with no Halo on the field anymore. Not really a super threatening board state, just a Soraya, which Rhea has to protect. Remember, that Angel has ward, yeah. so she cannot take a single point of damage if she wants to keep that Angel around. So, yeah, it looks like she's saying, I can't block you, so I'm just going to let the Angel die, just cash it in for for life. And... Ilias has to be feeling really good right now. There's barely a boss state on Rhea's side, and there's no longer a Halo. Now, we haven't seen Rhea take down the damage, so I wonder if the Dread Screamer actually just went into the Angel. It just di directed the attack at the Angel itself. Oh, that yeah, that potentially could have been it. Or maybe the players haven't updated life yet. Bit hard to tell. And that's the other thing you can do. You know, when your opponent doesn't have Halo anymore, you can actually directly just attack the Angel because... Uh, because they can't, you know, halo and find the Figment of Ravages to kill the Angel in response. So it's very safe to attack the Angels, and maybe that's what Ilias went for, saying, you know what, this is a Soraya. Um, I'm not going to risk that you have maybe an uh, Arclight Sentinel, and maybe, you know, you get to cash in the draw again. He's saying, I'm just going to be disciplined and just kill it right now. Big Heralds being swung across by Prism here. Looks as though Phantasm going to go ahead mm -hmm. and trigger. Yep. But uh, the Phantasmal Footsteps being activated, so that means a big old War Tune Herald can join the fray as well. So that's the thing about the Herald of Triumph, you give the minus one. Levi, part of the reason it's a hard matchup, so many cards with greater power than six. Yep, that red hungering slaughter bees, those three swing bigs. So definitely putting Rhea in a bit of a tough spot here. But that one, another Slaughter Beast going to join the fray. So both Heralds meeting their fate against yep. the demons of the Demonastery. I mean, one thing we haven't even spoken about, huh, what a flavorful matchup we get to see as the mm -hmm. Deadwood Rumbler is going to go ahead and draw and discard here. Which, yep. if I'm not mistaken, means Blood Death's not off on this turn. Well, so Deadwood Rumbler's effect lets him banish a card uh, from oh, any graveyard. Hits, yes. so, yeah. so he can go ahead and he looks like he's banishing a Red Dread Screamer. There's two things over here. That's a very strong card if you ever flip into Blasma Fed uh, Leviathan Consumed. You want that in your banish zone yeah. so you'll be able to play it. And turns off Blood Death for this turn very, very critically. Looks like Ilias is going to end and Rhea's deciding if there's anything she wants to do before we move back to her turn. As the Titans of Light and Shadow do battle for us here at the Pro Tour. This is round two. Both players 1-0 on these powerful Monarch decks. Mm -hmm. And by Monarch, I do mean one of them is from <laughs> Dust Till Dawn, but you know what I mean. Yes. Herald Very Edition. This one doesn't, Rhea doesn't want to see popped. We haven't seen any representation of these angelic Celestial, Celestial Celestial Reprimands. Reprimands. That's what it yep. is. Yeah, yep. the, the minus three power. And it, Rhea doesn't have it there, so the Herald just going to get popped and a big old endless mock coming across. Most likely, nine damage to Rhea's 16 life.
Yep, threat. and critically turning off Blood Dead and arsling a Blood Rush Bellow, which means Elias is setting himself up to have a Blood Rush Bellow turn on a five card hand. He still has Flashback and still has Husk available to you know maintain a five card hand should he choose to do so. So Elias setting up to be in a very, very strong position right now. Now, I do want to say it is not all doom and gloom for Rhea. Now, remember, there is still one Arclight Sentinel left in the deck, and something Leviathan needs to continuously do is turn off Blood Dead. An Arclight Sentinel, very, very strong card that Rhea has access to that can potentially say, oh, you played a Blood Rush Bellow? Here's an Arclight Sentinel, and you haven't turned off Blood Dead. If you don't have that Mark of the Beast, you're going to take a bunch of Blood Dead damage, and that's how it can come back to the game. A Endless Ma here being considered... I'm going to take this, is what Ray is saying. Going all the <laughs> way down to seven, which means she's got a powerful five card hand of her own that she wants to develop. And like you said, perhaps if it's not in the hand here, we're going to get five cards closer to an Arclight Sentinel. Mm -hmm. Four cards left in the soul. I'm super excited to see what Ray Adams puts together on this turn, facing down the Leviah, still at 28. And as we know here at home, Big old blood rush in the arsenal. It's going to be a Genesis pitching a couple cards in and a passing Mirage, which are two very scary cards. But the question is, will she be alive to see their value? So one thing we haven't really spoken about is, you know, that play from Rhea looks like it was a very aggressive line. At the same <laughs> yeah, time, a lot of cards that don't block. <laughs> a lot of cards that don't block. <laughs> so I saw Reprimand in the head and a Genesis. Passing Mirage only blocks two. So Rhea kind of forced into, you know, just playing out a double aura turn and saying, okay, hopefully this is good enough. Maybe these auras take some damage away from my face. This is, this is so sick. You described exactly the play that might be about to transpire. Rhea has drawn an Arclight Sentinel, but... Mm -hmm. Able to fish for it is Ilias by playing out the barraging beatdown. So now he gets the agent to decide if he even wants to deploy the Blood Rush Bellow. Now that he knows he has to face down an Arc Light, what an incredible, like, like perfect response from Ilias for the potential for Rhea to get back in this game. Yep. So, uh, ooh, oh. I was mistaken earlier. Bonian Marauder does not say when you attack with this. It says as an additional cost to play this. So this actually will turn off Blood Dead. Uh, despite the Arclight Sentinel, because it, is not, it doesn't care about when it's attacking, it cares about that it's just been played. So Ilias actually sitting quite pretty, not needing to take any blood dead despite the Arclight Sentinel being resolved there and saying, all right, I'm not going to risk a gambler's roll. I'm just going to turn off my blood dead, let you have your auras. You are doing nothing on your own turn because you played four cards. And that's your last Arclight Sentinel, Rhea. Now I can blood rush without any fear. And we are playing in a post-Gambler's world. Apex Bone Breakers cashed in uh, for one of the blocks the Gamblers used for Ray. You have to imagine back on that turn, things would look a lot different because there were two Arclight Sentinels on the turn that Ilias was able to hit two separate four-plus scab rolls. This could have been a very different game with just a little bit of dice roll luck going in Ray's favor. But she's fighting. She's got the Genesis and the Passing Mirage. However, how does Ilias want to try to just string together as big attacks as he can. Elias was counting the amount of blood that he has, and yep, this is exactly why he has got a doomsday that he wants to resolve. Definitely has the six blood dead in his banner zone to be able to resolve this card, making an ally of his own, saying, you know what, Prism, you make little angels. Here's a big old demon for you to deal with. <laughs> yeah, Blasma Fett. She's used to, you know, we were used to seeing her consume Levi and become the hero itself, herself, themselves. <laughs> However, Blasma Fett here is just joining her demonic companion as we see Levi and Plasma Fett here and the god in the sky coming down with an Art of War. Going to go ahead and banish to draw and most uh, likely give go again. I, I don't even know if Rhea has the potential to stay alive on what a powerful turn this is going to be. Yep, and that is still a Blood Rush in Arsenal as well. Looks like Ilias drew into Smashback Alehorn, so didn't want to risk uh, playing the Blood Rush and discarding that. Just saying, I'm just going to swing big with go again off the Art of War. And these resources have lined up perfectly. Yeah, so look at this. Claw <laughs> and then finish off with a Demon and just have Blood Rush in Arsenal for the follow-up. Six points of block being put down in front of the 10 mm -hmm. from this swing big. Potentially a Herald is joining the fray as well. Taking one, going down to six is Rhea here. Yep, one off from getting that Quicken token that, you know, Prism sorely needs a Quicken token, doesn't she? Unfortunately, <laughs> we'll see if a Quicken token would have even mattered. Two damage coming across, and now Blasma Fett can join the fray. Six points of damage coming across. We can put the Vestige in front of it, but that is it. Levia has taken down the round here. Round two, headed to Ilias Karamanis from Germany. Rhea Adams, one of the best Prism players in the world, but unfortunately, even one of the best Prism players in the world cannot face down the incredible value that that Levia deck was able to string together, the powerful value 
value that the Scapskin Leathers were able to actuate, and Leviah took it down. What an incredible couple of games we got to watch here at the Pro Tour. And you spoke about the thematic and the flavorfulness of that matchup. The fact that it ended with the demon coming oh into Prism gosh. and just finishing <laughs> off that little soldier from Seoul, I guess, um, just absolutely flavor, big flavor win there for the Leviah player. Big flavor win and a big win for Ilias. Congratulations to our winners from the round, uh, Jordan and Ilias. We're going to go ahead and take a quick break before, gosh, do we have a treat for you. We have got a meta breakdown coming up, and we have got just two of the very best in the business. Oh, yeah. We've got Brian Gottlieb mm -hmm. from Legend Story Studios, and we have Mitch Uber Shouts Leslie, the 2023 eSports Broadcaster okay. of the Year. <laughs> and I cannot wait for you guys to all get a chance to watch them do their thing. Don't go anywhere. We will see you in just a second. rounds in here at Pro Tour Los Angeles and already we're starting to paint a vivid picture of an extremely competitive and varied meta game. Welcome back to the booth everybody. I'm Mitch Leslie joined here by Brian Gottlieb. Great to be back with you last time. It was the Goliath Gauntlet now on the big stage. Yeah. Fantastic. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great man. Absolute pleasure to be working with you. Huge Likewise. And for years just awesome to share a booth with a legend like yourself. Hey, thank uh, you very I know, much. I know Sam's your biggest fan. <laughs> I'm gonna try and like 
you know, joust, jostle around for that number two spot. Okay, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll just settle for, for having homies around me, that's for sure. Excellent. Uh, again, we've, we just saw Roger Bodie, of course, who uh, is no stranger to sharing his opinions on whatever platform is, is available to him. We knew he'd be coming in on a Bolton uh, strategy, and he runs up against something a little unexpected. Uh, that Viserai list, this was a Nebula Blade Viserai, and there's been a couple of those going around, but something that presented a bit more of a standard mid-range package. Now, that's a hero we sort of kind of wrote off in this metagame, but hey, Mordred Tide still very good card. It's not bad. I, I, look, I hesitate to do this these days. Internally, uh -huh, okay. Viserai gets a lot of respect, sure. and I, I, I am a little surprised that it hasn't really translated to the real world. I, I do recognize Viserai has some weaknesses, some flaws, but when you come to a pro tour, there's a lot of benefit to making some kind of more polarized choices, really trying to pin down that metagame. And look, this is an open metagame. We're going to get very into the details of the metagame in just a second. It is an open metagame, unquestionably, but there are some targets at the top. Absolutely. I think there are some heroes that stand out. There are KOs, Dromais, that everyone knew would be a huge feature of this weekend. So you figure out those matchups, you think maybe some of these other matchups aren't prepared for me, you can find yourself with a Pro Tour Top 8. I mean, this is a great time to talk about that a little bit more. We do have a metagame breakdown here for you after two rounds of Classic Construct and Play. And this is a thing of beauty, Brian. No surprise to see KO is the most represented deck. Talking even to Brendan Patrick down on the floor, he says, like, man, it just feels really hard to go away from KO right now. There are other great decks, but it feels like you take, like, a 5 to 10% clip on win rate in order to play something else, and it's hard to justify that. Dromai as well, coming out on top in the RTN season, the winningest deck. No surprise to see you here. I've got to say, seeing my girl in third, though, Dorinthia, 29 players represented. That's incredible. This has got to be huge for you, Mitch. You've been a warrior stand for absolutely ever. And Dorinthia is one of those heroes that just hasn't had her time in the sun yet. We all knew it was coming someday. And Dorinthia showing up, not by chance at this tournament, a huge contingent of players from Team Runaways representing this hero. They think they've figured something out with their Dorinthia build and feel like they have a very, very good deck for the field team. There are three distinct ways that you can really play her right now. Dawnblade, Decimated Great Axe, or a dual wheel build that you know favors that high value of course off like Hatchet of Body and Hatchet of Mind. Hopefully we get to delve into that a little bit later. Victor here as well, still highly represented. Yeah, I, I think mean, that was a huge question coming into this weekend. How much Guardian would there actually be? I think Victor's stocks have kind of cooled a little bit in recent weeks, uh, but still very much a threat in this metagame. And we saw uh, Sheng Tseng in our first round representing Victor, many of the folks from Hong Kong playing that hero today. That deck has gotten a lot leaner. Uh, the focus of Victor, of course, on accruing you know, more value than your opponent over the course of the game is still present, right? Being able to draw a card when you generate a gold token and having so many ways to do that and also having extremely efficient blocking in those sort of mid-range matchups makes it very powerful. I guess the one issue that players can sometimes have is that Victor cares much more about the value then evasion, right? Forcing that damage through is something that he doesn't do as well at unless you have some builds that feature, you know, pummel or, or other ways of getting around it. But that can affect your clashes. It's, it's such a great question, though, Mitch, because it, it comes down to, like, this open metagame, and we talk about open metagames a lot of times in terms of heroes. It's not as simple as that. As you mentioned, three distinct builds of Dorinthia. Uh, also, pretty distinct builds of Victor. And the difference between pummel and no pummel it's actually worlds different. You have to approach the matchup very, very differently. And we heard some people even talking about is Bravo, the Guardian, we're supposed to be playing right. into this metagame because it can close games maybe a little bit more effectively than Victor. But I think these Victor lists are getting refined. They're getting very, very good pieces of technology to close up some of their weaker matchups. And I think Victor is a hero to watch absolutely this weekend. Bravo, a little bit further down the list there, still represented at 15. I think players are really favoring the ability to force disruptive effects on decks that rely on setup. KO is a great example of this. Dorinthia also struggles to deal with those big dominate effects. And looking further down, like Dash Inventor Extraordinaire, still heavily represented. She's still incredible at what she does. And Katsu, that is massive representation for this Katsu deck. Why have we seen this burgeoning uh, sort of move towards the Wanderer? This, this is what I love. I, I, I'm such a nerd for this stuff. I could talk about metagames all day, but Katsu makes so much sense into this metagame. And it starts with the top. You go back to that KO, that Dromai representation. And that KO sitting at about 19.5% of the metagame. So... Hey, yeah, just do that in your head. That's yeah, pretty yeah. sick. Oh, yeah. I'm a, I'm a math whiz. <laughs> I, I got out my calculator. <laughs> uh, but 
when you know one in five matches in CC could be played against a KO, you can start leaning in certain directions. And if the second most represented deck in Drill, my 14.3%, that one I made up. See? Okay. That one I made up. I, no one good. would have known. No one would have checked your math. Uh, yeah, I should probably just... And you could have just held that. should have just let it roll. But anyway, Katsu plays well into both of these decks. Really, really strong matchups. KOs don't want to defend all that often. No. And I actually think that's gotten a little bit more true for this tournament because we're talking talking to a lot of folks who are off cast bones they just don't want to play that card anymore interesting the replacement yellow bear fangs a lot of the time okay so when you shift to even more no blocks in the ko deck katsu's going to pop off they're going to do their combo thing and we saw in one of our feature matches just what a katsu can do against the ko that isn't ready to defend so there's your metagame breakdown here i think this is really going to form the basis of our conversation and, and sort of how the story of our Pro Tour here in Los Angeles develops over the course of the coming days. Remember, $200,000 on the table uh, for our top 64 players. And of course, and I've walked the floor. I have run into so many people that I have admired from afar. Serious players, Team PCG passes there, the card guys, blue pitch, you know, runaways, all of uh, you know, those top teams are present, but so few of them within those teams have decided unanimously on a list. There is so much divergence there as well, which has uh, been really interesting. So, yeah, we can, uh, we can sort of move on. We'll bring that maybe back up when we need to. Great to see Prism brought back as well. I'm sure it was with uh, a great sense of satisfaction that you unleashed Luminaris Angel's Glow uh, back into the wild and allowed Prism players to live that endgame fantasy once more. I would have been more satisfied if the, if the first Luminaris worked, <laughs> but it's okay. You know, we'll, we'll correct our mistakes, we'll move forward, and I'm happy to have Prism as part of the metagame again. And I think, you know, our own uh, Pankaj Bajwani, very high on that deck, yes. believes that Prism, perhaps underrated, because not a lot of good Prism players out there, and it's very different playing against a good Prism. This is something I've experienced a lot as we went through the development process with Prism. Playing against a great Prism is terrifying. Absolutely. Terrifying. That hero feels like it can beat almost anyone, and like, the boogeyman has always been Dromai for Prism. I'm not even sure that's true anymore. Right. I actually think like Prism built to counter Dromai has a very real chance of taking that deck down as well. And I wonder if some of those Prism players have cracked the code for this weekend. Uh, yeah, I mean, they, you know, I've talked to a couple of them. They feel a little bit better about that matchup. It reminds me a lot of Icelander versus Dromai, mm. where many Icelander players felt that if you see, uh, you know, a number of Ashwings get on the board, rate the, rate the Embers get resolved a number of times, it is very difficult to deal with these tiny little one ones that are going to come at you one after another all about rake the embers always it's, that's yeah. always the card that defines these matchups yeah i mean we we have an incredible matchup uh, coming up by the way just as we got into that conversation speaking of icelander the one that really took her into the spotlight michael hamilton will be uh going up against alan lau i think of team blue pitch these are two two o's on the board and i think we're gonna take a quick break so we get that game set up so don't go too far the mitch and brian podcast talking about a metagame and all things flesh and blood will return right after these messages
Round three here at Pro Tour Los Angeles is just around the corner. We are neck deep in our classic constructor competition for today. We will have three rounds of draft a little bit later on for those limited fans out there to see exactly what our pros are wielding when it comes to heavy. Limited fan. Limited That's fan right, right here. Limited I'm ready. fan right here. Let's jump into this one. We have, as I said before the break, Michael Hamilton versus Alan Lau. This is a clash of heavyweights in a KO mirror. Michael Hamilton, of course, uh, recently, I mean, he had an incredible uh, you know, run definitely last year. He has continued that. This guy is the real deal. I mean, going back to 2021, winner of calling Orlando, calling Indianapolis, back-to-back -back callings, of course, world champion in 2022. And Alan Lau of Team Blue Pitch has always been on the cusp of these Big top eight finishes, Brian. Never quite able to convert, but he's well positioned here. Two O on KO. Yeah, Alan Lau with a ninth and a twelfth place finish at Worlds. Always right there in the mix, looking to finally get that breakthrough through performance, get that Pro Tour top eight. Going to have to take down a very, very difficult opponent in this round three KO mirror. But Mitch, I feel like you buried the lead here. This is Wolfpack versus Blue Pitch. This oh, is the yeah. Team battle everyone's been looking for. I think all 462 members of the Wolfpack will be watching this with bated breath. Absolutely. I mean, they are accounting for a vast majority of our viewership, but all you have to do is subscribe, and we are going to be. I mean, it's basically an infinite money glitch. You know, you, you help me, I help you. We, 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 we're, we're taking this to the stars, everybody. Team Blue Pitch, uh, you know, there was a, obviously a, a lot of discussion recently in social media, in the Twitter sphere, about the best team in flesh and blood. And while, again, uh, we can talk about quantity in terms of the Wolfpack, quality is definitely something that Blue Pitch boasts. Many of their players, uh, you know, make it into top cuts at big tournaments, worlds, callings, you name it. Uh, and again, the Hong Kong scene really sprung up very quickly. And if you're a fan uh, of blue picture you like what you've seen so far one of my favorite things to check out every time a new set rolls around is an exhibition match between team blue pitch and the card guys yeah they play like five matches regardless of the result of mostly new heroes or showcasing new cards from that upcoming set it's a fantastic watch head over to the card guys on youtube to check that out but we are to talk about this matchup ko is the most represented deck here at pro tour los angeles for a good reason but we're starting to see some divergence in how these lists are being built for this event. Yeah, and I think it's a big question. You can't beat everything when it comes to Flesh and Blood. You have to tailor your deck towards your expected metagame. And I think by the time we reached the start of this Pro Tour, everyone was leaning towards KO being the most played deck. I think it was a very, very safe pick for what you're going to see here. So that begets the question, what do you do in the mirror match? How do you get an edge here? Is it about cast bones? Is it about just efficient attacks? What are these players going to do to differentiate themselves from the other? All right. Well, speaking of uh, how we differentiate, a good start here is a wild ride. Again, you know, giving a brute the opportunity to filter their hand on the first turn of the game can be a scary prospect here. But wild ride, of course, will give go again. Will allow Michael to potentially go a little bit wider <laughs> if he wants to do that here on this turn zero. Might be looking to filter a non-block out of his hand as well. Plenty of reason here to send this one in and getting rid of the Bear Fangs. This might have been a card that Michael would have liked to pocket for a little bit later. Yeah, Bear Fangs, I think the most efficient attack in the entire deck. You really love just getting those clean two for eights. The damage stacks up very, very quickly. Uh, kicking things off with a wild ride here, completely fine. I wonder how many bricks these players have in their decks. It, it is rare, extremely rare. Much more bricks. rare than for Reinar, right? Absolutely. But when it happens, or is it determinative? It can absolutely change your plans in a moment. So both these players wanting to fade that dreaded brick for sure. So blocking here with a blue smash instinct and a skull crack is Alan. Maybe able to yeah, send away some of those cards he's not as excited about. I think I see a I see a runner runner in hand here for Michael Hamilton. I think I just spotted another bear fang. So plenty to go on with here, but over to Alan. He'll open up with a wild ride of his own of the yellow variety. Yeah, and that's an Really interesting point, Mitch, because we have to see how deep these players delve into these yellow pitch strips. I know we're talking about blue pitch, but actually I'm more interested in yellow pitch strips for this match. How many of them are looking for redundancy in their effects like Wild Ride, like Bear Fangs? Obviously, there is a trade-off at that point. You lose some of your output, but just having more of these effects, very, very important for these KOs to get the ball rolling, get those mites stacked up, and just represent those good, hardy numbers turn after turn. Okay. The wild ride here again, obviously being able to take a firepower attack doesn't hurt you in a deck that wants to discard six or more because KO is one of KO's abilities is plus one to all those attack action cards when they're not on the combat chain.
And I've got a big spot here already, Mitch. It, it is a yellow bear fangs in Hamilton's hand. So we, we go in deep. Yeah, both these players already dipping into those yellow pitch strips, wanting more consistency of those best effects. I, I will go ahead and comfortably call them the best effects. Absolutely. Now, however, there is downside, right? You get a no block in your hand. And I think that's going to be the question. Who plays a defensive role here? Who is willing to commit some cards to the defense? And who is just trying to absolutely pop off? On Allen's side, we see a very, very big card contributing to those pop-offs. This Blood Rush Bellow in hand. Perhaps going to save that for a future turn. Let's see how he wants to navigate this situation here. Has resources ready. One resource floating. He's thinking about it. Going to go for it here. Blood Rush Bellow, one of the most powerful cards available to any brute being deployed here, and again... Any hero, Mitch. I, I think <laughs> one of the most powerful cards in the game, unquestionably. Beast Within discarded here. Oh. Going to pick up Cast Bones. No, pass on that one, but Wrecker Romp. Going to be the ad. Okay, so we will be sending that Cast Bones away, but a blue off a of Blood Rush definitely doesn't hurt if you want to go a little bit wider on this turn. Remember, Blood Rush is going to be giving all of Alan's Brute Attacks plus two this turn. Um, Looking for reds now is... Alan has the blue at the ready. There you see the Wrecker on pitched. It'll be a claw for five here, and so it is. Yeah, with a six discarded, Mandible Claw has go again and benefiting from that plus two effect of Blood Rush Bellow. Normally you expect to see Blood Rush at the start of the turn here, but again, sometimes the variance it can introduce can mess up your plans and mess up your hand a little bit. So now Michael might consider getting a bit defensive. Yeah, nothing wrong with getting a little bit more information from that wild ride first and hiding a little bit of information from Michael at the exact same time. Alan just sorting out the hand here and found quite a nice one. Ah. Leverage. And it looks like we're already seeing the scowling flesh bag move forward, Mitch. This is a big moment in the match, Absolutely. actually. Absolutely. And this can really mess with an opponent who has high aspirations for a turn that features multiple attacks on the combat chain. When you block with scowling flesh bag, you intimidate a card out of your opponent's hand. So depending on what this hits, this could really throw, uh, you know, a spanner in the works for Alan Lau. That runner-runner also put in front is, you know, I don't think there's a lot of value to be gained there uh, without an agility token in play. But here's the intimidate. What is Alan left with? Does he have a play? That is the question here. Is it a one-cost follow-up? I think this is Arsenal. Yeah, it's the blue riled up. So yeah, not going to work. Has to throw back here. I think it might have been even been a Savage Fetal Bear Fangs. I think it's a Red Bear Fangs. Yeah, so that was Man. the card that was supposed to be the follow-up there. It would have been quite, quite so high. So that flesh pack is worth how much value? Ten? More than I can count, Mitch. I, I, I lie about my ability to do math, <laughs> but I don't actually do it. My goodness, yeah, that gets uh, so much value. It's not just the two block on the flesh bag that matters. It's how much more damage after the fact that was prevented. Michael oh, will absolutely. never know, but, I mean, we do, and it's a lot. Here's another wild ride. We're going wide once more from Michael. Yep, going to come in 4-7 with the help of that might. I also want to focus in on that cast bones in the banish zone for Alan Lau. Cast bones actually becoming a hotly debated card in these KO lists. Uh, some players choosing to actually just give up on the card, which is kind of absurd because I've also heard players calling for bans of this card. It's that <laughs> polarizing. You've heard it all, though, because they tweet at you, oh, Brian. You have no yeah. choice. You cannot filter that out, my right. friend. I get a lot of noise. <laughs> oh, dear. So with that might token there, the wild ride coming down with seven go again, the swing big hitting the graveyard, though, for Michael off that random discard, which you know, might make him a little disgruntled. I think following this up with a swing big would make for a really nice turn. I do think there's another wild ride in hand. And what is that, a... Savage Feast, perhaps, or another Bear Fangs? So it's another Bear Fangs. There's a follow-up to this attack regardless. Alan, though, in the tank. Does he get defensive now after presenting five damage and getting some cards from Michael? You know, it's really interesting. Obviously, we saw Alan's turn absolutely wrecked by that Scowling Flesh Bag. At the same time, though, the Scowling Flesh Bag's gone. Like, that's a really big deal for these mirrors. It leaves you with a lot of certainty. When you finally do find your pop-off turn, your next pop-off turn, I should say, you have a lot more clarity as to whether it's going to actually succeed and whether you're going to go ahead and hit those ceilings of damage that you're always searching for with KO. Yeah, and I guess as far as the story of the game goes, Michael is bouncing off that scaling flesh bag, using it to pivot to become the aggressor in this matchup. That's what this turn is, and that's why Michael needs pretty solid draws here. Look, a wild ride into a mandible claw is not a bad turn. I think maybe sending that swing big for the follow-up might have been a little nicer. So Alan keeps much of his cards here. And so that bounce off of the, uh, the flesh bag may not have been what he's looking for. We're just going to open with a bear fangs here. We're looking to discard a six, and so we do. That's going to power up this bear fangs even further. We're looking at nine with that might. Nine, not bad. And 
look, that's why these players are drawn to this hero. The numbers are just extremely, extremely good. And it's funny, you, you obviously know Michael Hamilton from not only his play of, but his innovation. His philosophy. Icelander, yeah. Bolander in particular, very much rooted in the idea that numbers are what matters many, many times in flesh and blood. Yep. And you see a hero like K.O., you go, oh, this is a, a brute, an aggro deck, very different from Michael. I actually don't think it is at all. Nope. I think it's exactly in Michael's weirhouse. Michael wheelhouse. doesn't see card art and borders and classes. He sees zeros and ones. Uh, and again, his yes, take on the game basically revolves around, around the idea that if he can gain a couple of incremental points of value in advantage over his opponent each turn cycle, he will ultimately win the game. There's a sense of, you know, deterministicness about that. So, uh, you know, Michael, the way he developed that Icelander deck was always about efficiency, presenting set break points on his cards, a, you know, two cards, seven or more. And <laughs> KO can definitely do that. We're blocking with an Apex Bone Breaker here, and that's going to give Michael a might token. You're looking to get five value out of that piece of equipment. It's pretty easy to do. And uh, yeah, the Wrecker Romp in blue also being put in front. So, Again, a bit of a mid-range matchup here. Plenty, yeah. plenty of respect being offered by both sides, and no one's really going hell for leather yet. Slow and steady has been the story of this thus far. Despite a Blood Rush Bellows being deployed, it's still just, you know, business as usual, doing <laughs> KO stuff, wild rides all ride over once the place. More. How fitting being out here in the West, as it were. Okay, this, though, is going to be buffed by two Might Tokens at the start of the turn, so we are eight power, and we are looking for go again here. So Michael is... Hoping to randomly discard a six. Uh, you know, hearing the stories from the Wolf Pack, a, a lot of decks on the table, and I, I jest about the Wolf Pack. That's an incredibly talented team. I have all the respect in the world for them. I think they are absolutely elite at deck building, at playing, at all forms of flesh and blood. And as they are wont to do, explored many, many options throughout their testing period. But what I heard was nobody could beat Michael Hamilton on this deck. This KO deck, he just rinsed everyone all the time. And that ultimately led the team to almost wholesale adopt this approach. And again, that is, uh, that's basically how humanity managed to develop civilization. You know, a large enough people, a number of people agreeing on this. You could basically fill old Babylon with uh, the wolf pack at this point. So. so you're saying all it takes to fix the current state of the world is Michael Hamilton just beating us at everything constantly? Michael Hamilton will explain to us that averting global warming is mathematically the most okay. optimal option and all of a sudden we will ascend. I'm talking Acropolises. I'm talking flying cars. We are the Jetsons, baby. Look, I'm out of other ideas, so I am down to try <laughs> to let Michael Hamilton figure it out at first. He's the antidote to nihilism and, uh, and the end of the world. Okay, we have a command and conquer here and oh, let's get that equipment in front. So we're blocking with an Apex Bone Breaker. Scabskin Leathers also giving two block here to Allen, so definitely protecting the card in his arsenal. Those targets are often the very efficient attack or a blood rush bellow. Allen is priced into keeping his card in his arsenal and not allowing Command and Conquer to send it packing. Yeah, and we see that Cast Bones committed to defense. So interestingly, Allen not seemingly prioritizing keeping that card around, just go ahead and happy to defend with it. And it is a nice piece of defensive options for KO. It is going to be pulping the follow-up here. Hoping needs to be blocked by uh, two or more non-equipment cards. Otherwise, uh, it will have go again. And again, if we draw and discard a six, which we have, it's a blue assault and battery, I believe. We have dominate. Eight dominate. You best block me with two cards uh, that are non-equipment, by the way. Not possible here unless you have defense reaction. So this one is going wide again. You know, Mitch, I, I have a bone to pick. Back in the past, when the Brute Lobby would often give me a hard time, they were so upset about our use of these no-block cards. They hated it as an identity for Brute. They didn't want to see any more no-block cards. <laughs> I revealed Smashing Performance, and uh, my inbox was filled with hate mail all over the place. How dare you make another non-block no card? Yeah. We don't want to see these cards. And now they've gone back, and they're playing all these old non-block cards. They're yellow pulping now, yeah. Brian. They have gone into they're the bulk box. desperate for non-block. Fish them out. And are making them happen here. That's right. Yeah, Brute's obviously a big part of that class identity is to not block and send more efficient, more frightening, more dominant attacks just like this one. Looks like Michael has just shipped all of this damage. So he might be priced into keeping as big a grip as possible. This might be where we start to speed up. But that is yeah. the, about the best follow-up you could ask for. Bear Fangs with the six. I, I've got a better follow-up for you, Mitch. Oh. How about Beast Within coming off the top as well? Just an absolutely perfect, perfect turn there for Allen. Huge output. Going to be able to maintain an it's arsenal as card. well. And it's Huge a good card up. to put in your arsenal as well. 
This, this charting beast within is mental. This is a really interesting spot because Hamilton looked positioned to maybe go ahead and take some damage on this turn, clap back. Now he's taking damage, and it looks like he's going to be facing another consecutive good turn from Allen in the future. Only has two cards of his own as well as that Arsenal to clap back with. So I think the momentum's starting to swing slowly in Allen's favor right now. I'm never going to count Michael out, though. Let's see what he's got for this turn. Again, I mean, Alan, yeah, he takes a life for that extra card he gets for my goodness. Here's the swing big. This is about as good as it gets off of two cards. It's a two-card nine. Swing big, obviously, offering a quicken token to the defending player if they can block the attack out. But KO has enough mechanisms to go wide to gain that go again that Alan's probably not priced into giving three cards or more to stop this attack yeah i think alan's got plenty of options here it looks like he is going to do some defending though and that's fine ko is happy to go back and forth like this put a couple cards uh onto the arena in defense clap back with these effective two card nines with Just. even more effective output than that potentially should the cards line up right so I, i'm very very fine with the way both these players have chosen to approach this matchup thus far again michael it turns out he wanted to keep his cards for that pulping but after the fact, he was actually in a decent spot to hand some of these over. So another Smash Instinct and a Swing Big being offered here. So Swing Big, obviously a three block in Brute. Pretty rare for those very cornerstone attack actions that they have. So can give you a lot of value both on offense and defense, which is not a given with these big Brute attacks like we just discussed. Some don't block at all. So again, we are mid-ranging, very much so. That's a good way of putting it. And let's see what the mid-range turn is here. It hey. is going to be that clean bear fangs coming in for nine, we assume. There's the buff. Two card nine. That's what we're doing here. It's two card nine, two card nine, two card nine. Then occasionally look for that big pop-off blood rush bellows type turn. But you have to navigate these turns carefully, protect your life total, and then get to a state where you can find a way to close these games out. And I think a huge point of advantage that I do not want to ignore is that scowling flesh bag on Alan Lau's side. Essentially, Michael Hamilton is priced into popping off twice at right. this point if yeah. that scowling flesh bag succeeds in disrupting the turn effectively. In order for Michael to present that big turn, keeping a full hand, he has to take damage. And that big turn, even if he takes said damage, can still be heavily disrupted by scowling flesh bag for Alan targeting the right card. Michael had his chance to pivot off of his own flesh bag. He has a middling turn. It gets one, maybe two cards out from Alan who still keeps his foot on the gas. Definitely feels like advantage currently sits with our player from Team Blue Pitch from Hong Kong here as these two KOs. I mean, they, they leave it all out there. We are hammers, tongs, and kitchen sinks being thrown across the table. So interesting. Agility thus far playing no role in this matchup. We just haven't right. seen an agility out. And it, it just shows how multifunctional KO is. It, it is very, very possible to go ahead and make good turns out of your wild rides. And that's why we see players starting to dip into things like yellow wild ride and doing so very effectively. Yeah, again, trying getting go again just from what is printed on the attack actions themselves as opposed to discarding, for example, an agile windup like the leftmost card there in Michael's hand. So this turn is interesting. He has... Yeah, it's not it's not compelling uh, at all. He obviously has a command and conquer there in his hand, a reckless swing, a defense reaction that he'll deploy now, which can do damage to your opponent. Yeah, I think just looking for the best numbers here once more, reckless swing, trying to get some uh, defensive output, and then maybe looking to go back with just a two-card hand, hoping to keep one of those resource cards. Probably wants to keep the command and conquer, is my guess. And again, this is not uh, a block four. This is, I mean, this is a fair bit of value. It's a six or more that you want to sort of be discarding here. Uh, Reckless Swing can actually get you seven value because you can do two damage. You can also create a might token from the discard. Uh, so more than just the four that's printed on the card, it's become much more efficient now in a deck that generates those might tokens. Yeah, I, I think Hamilton just gambled a little bit and won. Uh, yeah. Essentially, that Command and Conquer on this turn puts him in a far better position than any of those other cards would have. He's now offering disruption to Alan. Alan can't just ignore this, clap back with a five-card hand. He did not just cut a six, though. That Agile Windup is a five, so this could have been a CNC for seven if a might token was generated on that turn, a break point with a very disruptive effect. Um, my token only on your turn, Mitch. Oh, that's true, of course, yep. yep. Not in your... Uh... I'll give you a little secret, though. There was a period where it was on both turns. <laughs> oh, my goodness, that would have been, that would have been crazy. It was not that's fair. right. And I mean, and discarding an Agile Wind-Up on your turn also uh, can turn on those Mandible Claws for you, so uh, that's also quite crucial. If you can do it at instant speed as well, you can catch your opponent off guard. 
Yeah, I love that play. One of my, especially in Heavy Hitters Limited, just that instant speed discard mandible claw. And it was very effective at the world premiere in Queenstown. It has become less effective since it is a little telegraph sometimes, sure. but it's still a very satisfying play to make. So while this is not a seven power, because there's no might token generated, this is still representing a arsenal disruption effect and would need to be respected with a two card block here potentially. I see the reach for the scowling. That would be an odd time to use it here, but I think we're doing some math here now, as many KO players love to indulge it in. It would be an odd time, but there's something to note. You could potentially put one card and three pieces of equipment in front of this Command and Conquer if you believe that card in Arsenal is going to allow you to put Hamilton in the danger zone. We have not seen this deployed, but this was the this Arsenal card was the draw off the beast with it, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I, I think it's a red pulping, if I recall okay. correctly. So, and now you see exactly why Alan is debating. He does in hand have that blood rush bellow, uh, okay. so so critical. To going ahead and representing a huge amount of damage, and man, like, like I mentioned, Hamilton gambled a little bit on that last turn. He won. This was the perfect card for this turn, and it's going to claim all these pieces of equipment. Wow. So this is a counter gamble on the part of Alan Lau, going to really lean into the idea that he wants to get this cracking. I mean, and you read that really well, like that Alan might opt for the flesh bag on a turn like this. Again, you don't get the value of the Intimidate because Michael Hamilton was playing with an empty hand. So it's just two value off that card, which is not exactly high rolling that piece of equipment, but hey, it's a blood rush bellow time. We have a a wind-up discarded here. That one is of enough power. That should be a six on the yellow. So we have a might token. Blood Rush Bellow, of course, is going to be powering up those brute attacks by two. Big draws here. We get two, to draw two cards. Two resources already floating, though. That is huge, having that blue to start the turn off with here. And again. Scary turn for Hamilton. Getting go again, not an issue. Those Mandible Claws now have go again with the six or more power card being discarded and plus two. And of course, another plus two, because we have two might tokens. We have a plus two bonus from the Blood Rush Bellow. It's a seven power claw for two. Not bad for a beast with one arm. <laughs> Making very effective use. And we see another blue in hand as well as, what is that red card? I didn't quite catch it. I, be I believe it's a runner runner. Okay. That's an interesting one. Yeah, look, I mean, runner runner, obviously creating an agility token, if you have one, is great. It sets up multiple turns. This, though, is just going to represent a beat stick being uh, levered across the table here. So a nice big eight damage. That doesn't suck at all. We're going to get, uh, ooh, a Blood Rush Bellow put in front to block with an ace Scabskin Scaleless block here. Michael Hamilton is getting a little juiced. Down to nine HP. He's going to have to find a way to try and bounce off this. Alan is absolutely in the driver's seat. I agree, but you see why that Blood Rush Bellow was committed to defense. It is a second Blood Rush Bellow, and this is Hamilton's chance. I think needs a big draw here. We're looking for sizable output on this turn. Again, critically pitched to the blue. The blue. What are the pickups? Looks like a pack call. And a Savage a Savage feast. feast, okay. What can we make out of this, Michael? What's in the arsenal to add to the mix? That's the pulping here. So red pulping comes out. Draw and discard a six, which looks extremely likely at this point. This may be another bit of a gamble, hoping to maybe hit a blue on that draw, get the needed resources to carry Whoa. this turn up, but it's going to be a beast within, That's huge massive. reveal, and it's going to turn blue? into a blue riled up. That's about as good as it gets. Not only wow. does this pulping have dominate, and very likely to have go again, you've drawn, you've, you've been able to draw up a blue resource card to power the rest of your turn for some potential big attacks here. I'm starting to see why no one can beat Michael Hamilton on this deck. These are some very, very impressive gambles thus far, just finding exactly what he needs in these scenarios. Yeah, Alan Lau just going to be forced to take eight from this pulping, falls down to 15. And again, Savage Feast, if it discards a six, you're drawing a card. You can continue to fuel this turn. We might be three wide on attack uh, attacks this turn. Mandible Claw first. Let's get out that, that out of the way. Go again and coming in for five. Following this up with a Savage Feast, oh man, Michael might have a choice of uh, of Arsenal here at the end of this turn, and Alan now is starting to feel the pinch. He has to feel that Michael can present easily something after this Mandible Claw. He can, but I think this is what Alan is calculating right now. I think he's asking, can he kill me? Can he kill me? Like, yeah. can I just keep whatever I actually want to keep? And I think the answer is no. I don't think Alan is actually in range of dying right now, barring some very spectac spectacular fireworks, which have happened, to be fair in Michael's favor. Uh, but I, I, I do think like 
there is some incentive to just play this a little bit more safely. You're in a still pretty good position. Don't leave yourself any vulnerability. And that Savage Feast is going to go ahead. Come in for eight. Block, block. Alan happy to put two cards in front. And now Alan's at the point where he can demand cards from Hamilton over and over and over again. There is a little bit of equipment block left. I expect Alan's going to cross that threshold where Hamilton will just have to commit a card here. Going to go ahead, pitch a reckless swing. And there is that pulp coming from Arsenal. Dangerous now. We get a six power discarded. That would be extremely uh, problematic here for Michael as that dominate effect makes it hard to avoid this damage. Seven power pulping coming through. Yeah, seven dominate looking pretty clean here. We know some defense is going to have to be made here. Hamilton with the option to maybe give up all the equipment, but with that tunic at the ready, that's not what I'm looking to do. Blue smash instinct, not always the card you want in the brood deck because it's five power, but KO makes it six, guarantees that this is a dominating attack and you must give up the equipment. Blocking, only being able to block with one card from hand here means that you need some extra block from somewhere else. We are three, four, five block on a seven dominate attack. That is going to have go again. Yeah, cr critically though, another might picked up here for Hamilton's turn, but this mandible claw going to look to step in Will and we? offer a bit more damage. Hamilton going to commit another card. Okay. Michael Hamilton now being forced to play off these two card hands, giving so much to block here. Six life deficit between these two. Pulping with two might tokens is definitely not something you want to face when you are trying to stay in the game. We are down to three. Michael Hamilton now, I think he might have just a single efficient attack action to send, but Alan does not have to respect it. Alan may be able to opt just to not block it and come back with a full grip. Yeah, uh, Hamilton has a banger card in hand for this situation. It's a bear fangs, and it's exactly what I want to see. The problem is it offers 10 right now. Alan's at 11. It's just shy of exactly where you want to be on this turn cycle. You would like to at least demand some of that equipment, but I don't think Hamilton's going to be able to put it together. It all depends on what's in that arsenal, or maybe Hamilton can find a little bit more magic with a random draw once more. We did see a red pack hunt on the past turn cycle. That's what's sitting in arsenal right now, so... Options fairly limited here for Hamilton. Again, uh, yeah, you came out, uh, Michael did not flip the card he drew off of Savage Feast. Uh, there, you so. are correct, Match. I was mistaken. Uh, we, I think the arsenal is unknown at this moment. Now, in a position like this, sometimes a brute player might consider trying to gain extra action points, go wider, but Michael doesn't have enough cards to fuel a turn that features more than one attack action, most likely. The Scabskin Leathers... A roll of the dice there probably isn't even necessarily viable. Look at through that graveyard. You're seeing just chock full of efficient attacks. But Alan has been throwing plenty of those across the table himself. Michael is asking. Haymaker is back and forth for sure. How do I get enough cards out of Alan's hand so that I can stay alive for another turn cycle? We have a final spring tunic counter up. That is a pretty big deal, especially in a situation when you are lacking resources. You've been forced to use cards to block. Now, of course, what is the previous world champion going to opt for here? For all the talk of these powerful new tools that KO has access to, I actually think Beast Within has been the absolute all-star of this match <laughs> thus far. It has changed the course of both players' fates. He's doing it! It's time for a roll. It's time for the Scabskin roll. All right. We are going to half the number oh, around. He offers, it to, he offers it to Alan. Alan <laughs> says, no, you roll it. I don't want any part in this. Oh, it's off the table. We don't see it. Looks like two action, two action points, points generated. Okay. okay, we can go for this. We can we have a tunic counter up and a blue. So we have the potential to go for two separate attacks here. Here's Bear Fangs. It's going to be pumped up. Bite plus two and then plus two. We got two might tokens on the board. And that was a six. That's a 10 power attack. Yeah, coming in for 10. Mitch, that was a massive roll of the dice. Hamilton just unlocked this hand. And now Alan is almost certainly going to be facing lethal on yes, this turn. Michael can present it. Even if it's just a, uh, you know, a mandible claw follow-up to this attack. But having two resources, or resources available for another brute attack action potentially is massive. Alan knows it too. Look at those right. pursed lips. He knows he's under pressure here. Question for Alan is what is in that arsenal? Am I facing two from Mandible Claw? Or am I facing something unknown, even scarier? Down to just gonna four. commit one card here on the block, so falls to four. Does Alan? Mr. Hamilton. The floor is yours. Take a tunic counter. Go to two resources floating and send that pulping, pulping. in. Huge, huge card to find in that spot. It is going to be turned on. Six dominate is the offer here. Now again. 
It isn't going to kill Alan Lau. You can block with a card from hand. You can also put some equipment in front here. Looks like a skull crack. Oh, the tunic also being committed. We are preserving yeah. as much life as humanly possible. That one's not coming back around, Mitch. That's, that's <laughs> an end for the tunic. This game is on borrowed time at this point. Not many more turns to go. Ready to go ahead and get that defensive value out of the spring tunic. And Alan is priced into trying to block as much of this damage as he can without giving up too many cards from his hand because he wants to make Michael do the same thing. Make your opponent block heavily enough so that they can't represent strong attacks or a big turn on their side. Line them up, baby. That's one, two, three, four, five are the looks of things on the block. Yeah, and then we're expecting Alan to just come back with a single salvo on this turn. Demand hopefully a few cards, but... You know, Mitch, this one has been back and forth. I think things are slightly back in Hamilton's favor at this point, Ooh. especially after seeing this wild ride. Not the card we're looking for there. It is going to have go again, but unlikely to be able to leverage that in any meaningful way. It's asking for a card uh, here and potentially that tunic, of course. Wild ride being pumped by the might token. Otherwise, it would have been just five. But a three card hand to threaten your opponent. And those dominate effects now become extremely relevant. Brian, no blocking equipment left for Alan. If we see another red pulping, from Michael? It's a problem. It could be chalked. It's an absolute problem. You know what else is a problem? Oh, reckless swing. swing. That's a big problem to worry about. You Two cards committed to the defense. Clean block here, and Hamilton just going to be able to come back with what looks like swing big, and this is one of the best oh. cards to have in this scenario. It's going to keep that tempo going. You cannot go to two life against a brute because reckless swing can kill you on the spot, and we've pitched it out on Lau. Yeah. Probably a sigh of relief there, but this is nine power. Brutes don't exactly block the best. If Alan has some non-blocks in his hand, he might be priced into giving an extra card on block. Yeah, just three cards at a bare minimum going to be committed here, and we do see Alan moving them forward, and that means the next turn unlikely to be all what that do you do with one card? Yeah, at best, Mandible Claw. And look, Mandible Claw, when your opponent's at three life, is usually okay. Hamilton does still have that tunic ready, though, so he gets to play to one? a four-card hand if he wants. Obviously, that opens you up to Reckless Swing. I think it's more likely he defends, but still, things have soundly turned in Hamilton's favor at this point. Quick and Token is relevant. Unlike Agility, that does not pop at the start of your turn but rather when you make an attacking action. It does here because the Might Token turns this into a break point. Mandible Claw is for four. So Michael would still have to respect this with a card. Yeah, and I, th I think you have to give the Tunic here as well. You do not want to leak this one damage and fall down to two. I, I think you just play it safe, give up the Tunic, and assume <laughs> that's okay. Hamilton, we know, though, going to be meticulous about his decisions here. Where are the Pulpings at, gentlemen? Michael knows if he gives a Tunic on this block, that Pulping could be... Lethal coming from the other side of the table, especially as they're often pumped fair by enough. Yeah, fair enough. tokens. It's a scary spot. I, I think oh, it's a beast with it in his head. Oh, my goodness. Both these players playing on a razor's edge right now, both fearing so many cards from their opponent. This is why we play high stakes flesh and blood. This is what it's all about. Michael is trying to check his graveyard because he probably wants to understand how many of those win conditions he still has available to him in his deck and what the likelihood is that he might draw them off a random draw discard effect or how many bricks are remaining? How many cards would actually ruin his plan by maybe not being six power, uh, like a Blood Rush Bellow, for example, that could maybe stop him from getting go again or getting that extra power on a Bear Fangs or something like that. We are, we are, there's a lot of mass happening in this game. Yeah, when you talk bricks, it's interesting. We haven't seen a cast bones from Hamilton yet. Yep. Honestly, not sure if it's in the deck, may not be. Uh, we have seen some Blood Rush Bellows, so there are potential bricks out there. And you're going to see two cards committed here for Hamilton. And I think that says a lot about the texture of the hand. It'll be interesting to see what the clapback is here on this next turn. But does not want to give the tunic yet. It's very respectful block. Yeah, respecting the pulping for sure. I mean, maybe. I mean, one more turn cycle, and Michael can benefit from that tunic counter here. So can you, again, keep Alan low? Keep him on a small hand? Pack Hunt comes out. This card is going to intimidate. And Alan will have to part with one of those cards for blocking purposes for the remainder of his defensive turn. It's going to be the one on the top there. Random happenings have been breaking in Hamilton's favor at this point. Uh, you know, who knows what the banish was there from the Intimidate. Was it a critical card? We can block. A clean block. Both players desperate to cling to that three life total. Okay, no arsenal for Alan, of course. So again, playing off just the two cards represents just a solid attack. And that will it's be wild right again. Uh, like draw this card. It's it's okay. It's not the worst thing that could happen. The draw discard is nice, but there's so many better options in this spot. Something bigger you can hit. I, I think the card you really want to hit is swing big. And I actually think Alan's out. We've saw yep. seen most of them at this We've point. Seen block quite a lot here as well. Yeah, absolutely. 
Wild Ride just represents five here. It still uh, still re requ requires a two-card block. Bear Fangs, That's here we one. go. That's Here's those efficient attack play. actions. Pulping, drawn, and discarded means Bear Fangs is buffed by two. This now is where it gets scary for Alan. To block this out in his entirety leaves him extremely thin on cards to mount any sort of offensive, and that's what opens the window for Michael to come back on a later turn cycle with a tunic counter available yep. and a full grip of cards. This is a pivotal moment in the late game. I think both these players were desperate for an eight, and it's Hamilton that finds it first, offering up Bear Fangs, demanding at least two cards, and then are you just rolling the dice? Are you saying, all right, I guess <laughs> it's time to see if I can fade the reckless swing and look he's pulling out the beast within's counting the beast within's left in deck one in hand so he knows that's safe does not have to worry about getting beast within juiced if he falls to one it's funny ko eliminates a lot of the variants that brew has suffered from but it still exists right we still see it in the leathers we still see it in beast within it can still get you mitch allen has red pulping in hand oh my goodness Red pulping for this next go around, pulling out those blood rush bellows now, making a count of those. Yeah, he needs to make sure that he can discard a card of six or more power randomly for that pulping. Now again, Michael's still sitting on a tunic. He won't get to use that counter, but it might be very necessary to get in front of that pulping and block as Alan Lau falls to a singular point of life. A lot of questions on this next turn. A lot of things to be faded. A lot of points of concern. There's the pulping. There's the reveal. It is going to be a pack call. All right. That means this pulping coming in for seven dominate. Does Hamilton have the answer? I don't think he can block this out in his entirety. I don't, I don't see it, Mitch. He has four points of block available between the tunic and a card from hand. This might be it. Is this dominate going to be good? Has Alan Lau found the window to sneak through with this final pop? Oh, yes! he's and got he him! Handshake. Your third place, a calling Taipei in 12th place at world champion Barcelona, Alan Lau chalks up a massive W. I mean, Michael Hamilton's looking for a reckless swing in that hand or any way to take less than three damage. And Alan gets there. That's about as close as you get in this matchup. Both players throwing haymakers and Michael Incredible ambassador for the game. Always a smile on his face. He's loving being here. That one is still going to sting. Look at the sigh of relief on Alan Lau's face. Just an absolute flush of emotions in that moment. And if you want to become an elite player, and look, Alan Lau is very much in the conversation for elite players, does have those huge, huge finishes. But if you want to break through, you want to get that world championship, you want to get that pro tour championship, what better way than to kind of kick the monkey off your back than by taking down Michael Hamilton yeah. in the KO Take down a previous rounds. world champion and decorated player in Michael Hamilton. And Alan Lau continuing to further the narrative of this team, Blue Pitch team, being armed to the teeth. In this case, literally with this KO deck coming into this tournament, being 3-0, getting towards that first block of CC, you've got to be feeling very, very good going through the day. Of course, though, we still have draft happening later on. And that's where, frankly, anything could happen. We've got another game. Uh, ready for you guys. Love it. Backup Love the constant games. Let's played. keep them going. Let's jump into yet an, another one. Uh, of course, it will be Justin Ku, of course, from the Philippines, I believe, uh, who's a champion in Manila, one of the first winners on Victor, uh, up against Julian Sniffen here on Kano. Yeah. Uh, Justin took down a, a battle hardened, a blitz battle hardened with Victor, but Justin is known for being the first person to get a calling victory with Azalea, an absolute Azalea master, uh, one of the participants in that just absolutely bustling Philippine scene. Uh, a great group of players. I got to spend some time with Justin and, and Carlo from the Philippines uh, as we were leading into this event, just speaking with them about their passion for flesh and blood, about their passion for building a rich, robust community in the Philippines. They absolutely want to step out on this world stage this weekend. Meanwhile, taking on Julian Sniffen, a Kano master, just straight up. One of the best Kanos out there. Maybe hasn't gotten that same level of notoriety yet as some of the other uh, Kano folks you may have seen on the scene, but very much deserves it. A battle-hardened champion with Kano in the past down in Florida. And again, this is an interesting matchup, right? There are, you know, are some natural arcane barrier options for the Azalea player. Uh, you want to try and burn this Kano down as quickly as possible. Both players here really looking to just blast. 
And again, Kano can get off to a great start, right? It really depends on, you know, turn order here. Ultimately, the Kano uh, hoping to assemble the combo, Aether Wildfire, followed by another Wizard non-attack action that represents, you know, one to three sort of damage in the middle, and then a Blazing Aether to get that multiplicative damage blowout against your opponent. This, though, will require Julian to poke Justin down a little bit. He will need to present some arcane damage that Justin, honestly, he may just opt to ignore because giving cards up to pitch to Arcane Barrier will prevent him from having maybe the degree of lethality he needs to pressure Julian Sniffen. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting, Mitch. There's, there's always this question of respect when it comes to Kano. But sometimes the best way to respect Kano is not to respect them at all, to just try and Race kill them. them. Yeah, to leverage the disruption that Azalea presents and hope that it's just enough to keep Kano off that key turn, buy you the one more turn you may need to do some damage to that reduced life total. A couple key cards in this matchup. I mean, I want to highlight uh, Lace with Inertia, for example. Kano wants to find a, a Aether Wildfire and usually sit in Arsenal for a bit until they're confident they have a Tunic counter up and they have the resources ready to force enough damage. Inertia says when you're, infl or when you're afflicted by Inertia, at the beginning of your end phase, you have to destroy Inertia, and then you put all cards from your hand and Arsenal on the bottom of your deck. So Julian cannot just pocket a Wildfire, sit on that, and then sculpt the hand he needs to sort of deploy that with uh, as much ferocity as possible. So got to respect that. Bullseye Braces here, of course. Uh, the, the pick now is that that card has made a return after Lexi's departure. It looks like Justin is first up on the docket. Yeah, and we asked the question about respect. How much respect are you going to give to Kano's output? It looks like the answer is very little. We go fast. Very little. We're trying to kill this Kano. Going to kick things off with a take aim here. Ooh. A little bit of a reload. Ah. Yeah, got that Azalea hit, and this is a nice way to start things off. A little dominated action on that infecting shot. And again, infecting shot is important because it represents more than just the damage on the card. It may as well be a one for seven. Uh, because of the Blood Rot Pox token that it can uh, inflict on the opponent. With a take aim buff, it's a nice 8 power with 2 damage on the back side here if Julian doesn't pitch 3 resources in order to uh, eat up that Blood Rot Pox token. So this is how you race. This is probably one of the tallest attacks you can send right Great now. start. I, I think one of the best possible starts for Justin, just in terms of, like you said, putting forth one of the tallest possible attacks, also being able to hit for dominate on your first turn. Oh, that's beautiful, right? And that reload effect on take aim fills your arsenal up even though you're going first. You know what I mean? That, that always is very helpful yep. while con conferring that buff as well. So we are canoeing off the top here uh, in response. Julian, probably not going to be <laughs> blocking too heavily this turn. We are seeing a lesson in lava here banished. Yeah, there's also an ether flare below that. So pretty ah. effective canoeing thus far. Uh, look, when it comes to Kano, I leave it to the Masters. I let them see what they want to whip up, how they want to put this together. I try not to be too predictive because there are so many branching paths they can take. There's so many points where they can say, okay, this is when I, what I wanted to accomplish for this turn. There's so many points where they can say, let's push farther, see if we can actually combo here. I'll leave that in the hands of the Masters, and we'll see what Julian wants to do. It looks like we're going to start things off with this Aether Flare, offering three points of arcane damage. This is a scary one if you're in Justin's spot. Yeah, absolutely, because then the next card that J Julian plays this turn with an effect that deals arcane damage will be increased by the amount of damage that Justin takes from Aether Flare. It's a card that confers a increase in damage on all of the subsequent uh, wizard non-attacks played that turn. So it can get out of hand. It has an Aether Wildfire-esque effect, I guess you could say. And Justin choosing to take that three arcane. So this next salvo from the Kano also going to be juiced up quite a bit and it is going to be looks like that lesson in lava converted to a bit more damage six damage headed the way of Justin so Justin offering some unpreventable damage on turn zero Julian says powerful. I'll do the same thing why not yeah being able to present that amount of damage on turn zero in a race matchup is ex wait did that just come off the top from a Kano effect? That is the lesson in lava okay. reveal. So right. it, it's coming. We know it's coming in the future. And that's something that Justin has to be very concerned about. Yeah, Never I mean, want to see that Aether Wildfire at the ready. Seeing that lesson in lava comes in means that the Kano, once they do that damage, can tutor a card out of their deck anyone they want, uh, with a cost, obviously, equal or less than the amount of damage that lesson in lava did. Six, by the way, means you can get whatever you like from your deck. And so now the Aether Wildfire is going to be sat on top. Uh, we know that Julian can grab that can pocket it, yep. store it away until the moment is right. And so, yeah, he just says, I'll take all of your damage, sir. I got what I came for this turn. Yeah, set that Aether Wildfire in Arsenal. Go into Justin's turn with a five-card hand. And Justin has to fear dying from this point forward. He could literally die at any point 
and he knows that. He has to respect what Julian is capable of. He probably only gets a couple more turns to really try and push through that damage, looking ah. for disruption desperately. So this is the action point uh, by Julian being used here to draw two off the Tome of Aetherwind. And now using Kano, pitching an Eye of Ophidia, which is great. If you Kano that card off the top, it can absolutely ruin your turn. What? The, this is this is scary, Brian. Oh, and this there is, is so Ether good. Wild. We may be going for it right here, Mitch. Like, this could very much be the end. A huge, huge series of hits for Julian thus far. What okay. does the damage going to be? Ether Wildfire, Ether Wildfire, of course, not on on your turn. You have to wait for your opponent's turn before you get that buff. But there is quite a bit of damage already represented out here for Julian. And I think what's more likely to happen is a nice chunk of damage here. You follow it up on your opponent's turn and look for the kill. Okay, here it is. Aether Spindle coming out, uh, getting buffed by the Crucible of Aether Weave, meaning that Julian, depending on how much damage he does with this, he can opt five. So we can basically choose to top or bottom the, t the next five cards of his library. And this is how you create the perfect hand, or at least eliminate cards that you don't want to see. This is... I mean, it doesn't get much better than this for this Kanon game. This is... I love this spot. Terrifying. Yeah, uh, it's absolutely fantastic. If Julian has another resource card in hand, can pitch it to follow up with that Aether Wildfire. Just represents four, but that's fine. That's completely fine, because this is five, followed up by four. You're looking at Justin going into the next turn at a life total of approximately 22. Can maybe go to 24 if he wants to pitch a card here. And then you have Aether Wildfire in Arsenal with your opponent at that life total. As we said, you can just kill your opponent, especially if you go ahead and Aether Spindle and set those top cards of your deck and know exactly what you're playing into. It could become almost academic for Julian at this point, should the right cards be on top. And again, Justin has some natural Arcane Barrier in his equipment, right? On the Skullbone Crosswrap, they have AB1. Of course, on the Bullseye Braces uh, as well, there's some Arcane Barrier. So he can prevent this damage, but it's extremely inefficient for him to do so. And he, Justin, needs to attack. He has to put pressure on Julian, but doing so means that he is divesting resources from his hand in order to attack that could otherwise be used to prevent this arcane damage coming in. Now, seeing your opponent get to... Look, if I allow my opponent to resolve a full power Aether Spindle, uh, you know, five power, I'm feeling extremely bearish about my chances in that game because they virtually get to, yeah, just to sculpt the top of the deck here. And there's already like a, an Aether Wildfire there. Julian already kind of got the two to cars out of his deck here. He, and nominally... You can present 32 damage uh, with a sort of a wildfire combo, uh, pretty straightforward. There are some situations in which you could double wildfire and really blow that number out here. But Justin is well below the threshold for quote unquote killability for this Kano. And that's why Julian here has assumed a very comfortable posture. And uh, Justin is absolutely in the think tank. Yes, yeah, slow and steady here for Julian. All the pieces lining up thus far. And Justin committed to not using resources to defend his life total on this turn. And I kind of get it. You kind of want to save those to go ahead and put towards the Aether Wildfire and prevent that multiplicative effect down the road. I, I think that's smart. Even if I said one of my cards was redundant, I'd still rather just carry that forward into my next turn and try and stop my opponent from killing me on the spot. The problem is, what if they don't? What if you don't offer lethal and your opponent just further sculpts? And look, there's been some immaculate sculpting thus far from Julian. A lot of key cards already found out. Of course, Aether Spindle for five. So you expect things are well set up for a potential kill should he want to. But that's the problem with playing against Kano. They can play it either way. They can either pressure you or not. And you're kind of always on the back foot. In my experience, like games in which Kano can sort of send six to nine arcane damage at me on turn zero when I'm attacking, I don't win many of those, yeah. I find. Uh, that is like, that basically puts us at even life total kind of before I uh, attack, essentially. So, um, you know, obviously Kano starting with less life than, you know, basically every other hero in the game can feel like a handicap, but that's, then you see what Kano can do and you realize, uh, I think that is pretty reasonable to dock him 10 life for what he can do very quickly, kind of out of the blue. Yeah, Kano having 30 life, certainly a decision that predates my involvement with the design of the game, but I am thankful for it every day. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt about it. And this is the thing, as Azalea, naturally can bring more Arcane Barrier into this matchup than some other heroes can afford to do based on the limitations of their sideboard and just the number of cards that they're able to register. Having AB2 here is... Many nice. decks, many decks nice. that don't respect Kano is a, uh, AB1. Uh, you can have AB3 and still get absolutely blown out uh, by Kano. Because you cannot afford to spend the game pitching your cards to stop this Arcane damage when you need to mount a game plan of your own. Now, as alias is skewer this skinny wizard as quickly as possible. But even the blood rot pox, I mean, Julian's completely ignoring that token for the time being. 
here comes that wildfire. Here we go. Yeah, just a clean four here. In fact, not active, of course. Yep. But four is good. Four represents a lower life total when things come back around, when those storm striders are available. And now Julian at 20, unlikely to be killed on this turn. We don't expect Azalea to go that hard. Has a near perfectly sculpted hand here. Another take aim in Arsenal. We are checking the top card with our Skullbone Crosswrap. See, we reveal our Arsenal in order to do that. Now, something that Azalea can struggle to do is to present multiple arrow attacks here from her Arsenal. Bolton Shot is a key part of that. Falcon Swing in some lists. Uh, Bolton Shot, being able to reload your Arsenal on hit is very important. For those less familiar, Azalea can only deploy these arrow attack actions from her Arsenal zone. And normally, you cannot fill that Arsenal until the end of your previous turn. So finding extra ways to get those arrows flying is very, very important. With your opponent at 20, there are very few arrows in the game that can <laughs> threaten that level of damage. Yeah, those are, those are Lexi numbers. Those aren't Azalea yes. numbers. Azalea is good at offering evasive damage, disruptive damage. but And tall, right? Tall damage. Like you can yeah. play multiple pump effects from your hand, not unlike this take aim here, to add, you know, extra disruptive effects and extra damage to, uh, you know, to your shots here. Uh, I, I don't hate sort of, you know, Deadeye, for example, with an aim counter is pretty annoying in this matchup because you can look at your opponent's hand, have them discard one of those cards, um, you know, disrupt your opponent's plan to some degree. But the take aim here definitely implies to me that you know, Justin is trying to reload quite often. This is not an auto-include necessarily in these Azalea lists. This definitely feels like a bit of Justin's own flavor. Uh, and he knows he needs to go wide. He needs to go fast. Yeah, it looks like going to leave that card on top is Justin. It was not an easy decision. Is looking to resolve okay. knock the death whistle here. So going to go ahead and reset that top card. Looks like it is going to be a sedation shot. Trying to get some inertia out there. But I worry, is it too late for inertia to actually have an impact on this game? I mean, the inertia effect is only going to happen at the end of Julian's turn. Correct. What Julian wants to do if he has a wildfire base plan is to deploy that card and the disgusting amounts of damage that come along with it on Justin's turn. That means like kind of right about now. So putting that sedation shot to the top means that we, we can pop your arsenal to the bottom. You get the sedation shot that now has dominate and we're pumping it up with a lace with blood, blood rot here. So we are getting multiple of those nasty little token effects. We are getting multiple instances of, you know, increased damage here. Uh, I don't believe sedation shot has an aim counter on it. No, I don't no. think so. And it is just going to be coming in for eight here, offering blood rot and inertia. And Justin is holding one card back in hand with one resource floating. This is normally the window that Kano will try and end the game if he has the capacity to do so, because your opponent doesn't have a lot of resources to be pitching to that arcane barrier, and 22 is a very, like we said, reasonable threshold, reasonable threshold to try and go for it. And here we go. We are pitch, pitch, into a Kano activation. But if you're Julian, it's very predictable what Justin can do in yep. this spot. You know exactly how much AB he has to offer. You just ask yourself, can I win through two instances of AB2? And I, I think the answer is likely to be yes for Julian here. I think Justin just needed those first two turns to be a little bit weaker from Julian. Maybe the setup to go not quite as well to get some of that disruption rolling. But now it feels like the ball is in Julian's court as he sorts out just how much damage he can offer on this particular turn. Julian overpitches there to make sure he satisfies the condition of Ragamuffin's hat, only having one card in his hand. He basically gets to, you know, uh, before the Kano ability resolves, he gets to put a card from his hand on top of his deck, uh, which means he gets it to be whatever the heck he wants. And now we see there is that Storm, Storm Striders. Striders. Crucible of Aetherweave, going to juice that up. We can expect a follow-up here. Open with the Wildfire in most cases. There it is. Wildfire going to go ahead. Get deployed. Metacarpus node also sunk into that. So now we expect AB2 to happen at best here for Justin. And, and Julian is, is playing around that, right? He's that's entirely why he's... aware of it. Yep. yep. And, and there is that AB effect. It's actually with a red. So that's going to be the only AB. Going to go ahead and crack that threadbare tunic. Going to activate Kano. There's the Lesson in Lava. Oh, that's going he's... to offer more damage. There's no way you survive this. Lesson in Lava now. Getting buffed by four. You can get anything. Yep. can throw it on top. Has the Kano activation floating. There's the Blazing Aether. Yeah, Justin He's, says, that looks like a large number. And I agree with you, Justin. That is a large number. That's going to get the fist absolutely bump. Absolutely toasted. Do you want fries with that? 
Absolutely nasty stuff here. Julian Sniffen gets it done. The classic uh, Kano combo here. Remember, Blazing Aether here does X amount of damage, where uh, X is the amount of damage you've already done this turn, but it also gets that plus four from Aether Wildfire. The math is complex. Let's just say it is more than 22, much more than 22. And Kano uh, doing Kano things. Like, this is exactly why you choose to bring this deck. And look, it was not a huge portion of the metagame. There was a lot of talk around Kano leading into this event. Oh, you know, we expect the field to be absolutely flush with Kanos, Kanos all over the place. And sure, they showed up. They showed up maybe more than any Pro Tour in the past. What's going to be interesting to see is that they get to the late rounds of this tournament. How much respect are they going to run into? How many counter matchups? And it's hard to full counter K Kano, but I think things like Dorinthia, like Katsu, are very conscious of the Kano matchup. Very They're so. very aware of how they need to play. The hatchet's build? packs a lot of arcane barrier. Yeah. The Dawnblade one has to rely on Oasis Respite, for yep. example, for much of that protection. So we've seen a lot this round. The KO Mirror, that was, I mean, that is perfect. I mean, nothing really yeah, banger is match. more emblematic, I think, of the power of Brute right now than a game like that. Uh, you know, shout out to Alan Lau. Great performance there. And of course, the Julian Sniffen putting it together awfully quickly against Justin Koo is and all the threatening on hits that Azalea provides. We're just getting started. Round number four is just around the corner to cap off a classic constructed portion of the day. So don't go too far. This is Pro Tour Los Angeles. $200,000 on the line. The very best flesh and blood pros in the world going at it for all the glory and all the marbles. We'll see you after this.
It's no, hold, no holds barred here, excuse me, at Pro Tour Los Angeles after three rounds of classic constructed play. Welcome back to the booth. I'm Mitch Leslie here joining Pankaj Bourjwani. Mm. Pleasure, man. Great to be here with you. You've already got to preside over a couple of these classic constructed games so far. Anything stood out to you here? Because the field is looking a little bit different than maybe what we had first anticipated. Mm, anything stood out to me? Where do I start, <laughs> Uber? <laughs> we've seen Bolton, we've seen Viserai, we've seen Prism, we've seen Leviathan, we've seen a few KOs, we've seen Katsu, we just saw Kano and Azalea. You know, we talked about open meta and we spoke about Dark Horses to the point of Dark Horse being a bit of a buzzword, but we are really seeing that this, you know, during this first few rounds of the tournament and going into our last round of the CC, of the CC rounds for today. And you know what's beautiful to me is that not only are we seeing a wide range of different heroes represented, within those heroes, we are seeing a wide range of different strategies coming out, right? Obviously, Dorinthia is one of the three most, uh, you know, represented uh, decks here in the metagame. Let's actually have a look at the breakdown here of the metagame, and I can sort of walk us through it here. That was, sorry. No, please. That was not on my bingo card, that Dorinthia being the third most represented deck. Everyone going into his tournament was thinking Droma and Ko are the top two. That was pretty much going to be the case. But Dorinthia as the third most played deck? I don't know how many people were expecting that. With three distinct approaches to the game as well, we have the Dawnblade Purists bringing out, of course, that, that singular weapon. We've also seen the dual wield hatchet build pick up a bit of steam. We saw the battle hardened over in Kiel, out there in, in Germany. And, of course, the Decimated Great X builds that really look to drag the game out, play such cards as, like, Sigil of Solace to maintain a good life total, and make blocking math really complicated. Even the Viserai, with six represented, we've already seen a couple of different strategies. On stream, we saw one of them, right? A very standard mid-range Viserai. But I hear creeping out there in the darkness as the shadows start to close in upon those top tables, we're seeing this almost one-turn kill-oriented Viserai decks that build up a large amount of rune chance and attack from that arcane damage axis more than, than anything else. So with six of those represented, we're seeing a, a ton of variation there as well. Obviously, a lot of ways to play Dash. Uh, I spoke to Peter Bedensik, who uh, is on Kano as always, and he told me, I got hit with a triple Oasis respite turn by my Dash opponent, who was playing a fatigue-based oh. Dash strategy. And he had the perfect pitch attack, he says. Uh, he's going to hate that I'm bringing this up, but he loves talking about his bad beats, actually, so it's fine. Um, yeah, he had the perfect sort of triple wildfire that got completely mm -hmm. shut down. So there are just a multitude of different strategies. In the Prism decks, we are seeing like the Luminaris Angel's Glow approach. We're also seeing a couple of players still going for an Iris of Reality game plan out of the sideboard. There's still enough room in those Prism lists to have like that more aura focused package, as well as that aggressive heralds flipping figments and getting angels on the board package. So. I don't know about you, Pankaj, but it's a bloody good time to be a flesh and blood pro, especially if you love diversity at the highest level of the game. I definitely agree. And going, speaking more on diversity, even within classes, moving on to our fourth most represented hero here in Victor, a lot of pro players have been, you know, there's been a lot of debate between whether Victor or Bravo is the better guardian. And at least for today, we're seeing the Victor representation being a little higher, very notably a lot of blue pitch members on Victor here yes. today. But Bravo is still there. So still, you know, total 43 guardians showing up. So really in terms of classes, that is the third most represented class coming in today. And Victor and Bravo, as you were talking about, very different strategies between both those decks as well. Victor, a bit more on the, you know, kind of better numbers than Bravo has yes. because of free card draw, but Bravo with the better disruption, with the specialization cards, and more of a closing power with the on-demand dominate. Absolutely. And there's a sense with, with Bravo, if you give him tempo, uh, you know, sometimes Guardians can struggle to make use of a full hand, but if you allow Bravo to come at you with four or, God forbid, five cards, it could be a wide turn. You could open, you know, with like a zealous belting, arouse the agents into another attack action, or he can spend those resources to dominate a guardian attack to force a disruptive on hit against you. And many decks here suffer with that game plan, right? Azalea doesn't like being disrupted. Kaya also would prefer to play off like bigger hands to try and go wide, multiple attack actions, but has the option, of course, to play, you know, singular tall attacks and get away with it. I'll tell you right now, Dorinthia hates disruption she needs a full hand she needs a lot of resources to deploy like her game plan properly uh and she does not want to sort of face that kind of thing down the katsu representation i pulled you aside we had a quick chat uh sort of when you flew in last night i said who's your pick to win this all i don't know if you would stick to that prediction now but you said i think katsu has a real good chance of being highly represented at the top tables I still definitely agree with that and that is because if you look at the top two most represented decks Ko and Dromai Katsu 
historically pretty good into both those matchups. I mean, we saw in our first round Katsu take down Michael Fung, previous PT champ, taking down Michael Fung on KO on what is considered the meta pick, and Dromai as well, Ninja into Illusionist. You'd rather be on the Ninja side rather than the Illusionist side. So I still think Katsu is very, very strongly represented and is still my pick to win this entire event. However, we spoke about Guardians being the third most represented. Yes. Bit of a tough matchup for Katsu, but, you know, if Katsus are showing up here, they must they must be prepared for that matchup. Do you think Victor uh, specifically has, like, the requisite level of disruption to mess up a Katsu? We know that Brava can provide that. Victor is a bit more value-oriented, though. So one thing about the Victor list is that there is still a lot of discrepancy between a lot of them. It's very difficult to say... There isn't a homogenized Victor list for us to right. go off of. And the card which I really want to specifically call out is Red Disable. Okay. So some Victor lists are on Red Disable, and that is very, very critical if you're expecting to face a bunch of Katsu. But, you know, if you're a Victor list without a Red Disable, then I think you're absolutely correct. They might lack the disruption that Bravo has and that they really need to combat a Katsu. Attack the arsenal, right? Just make, you know, force Katsu to part with some of those cards. And some Guardian builds, of course, we've seen that, you know, favor playing a final spring tunic for that extra resource to threaten a command and conquer and a pummel, right? Again, which features arsenal disruption and hand disruption. That kind of play is still one of the most powerful things that you could do in flesh and blood, and it is really hard to come back from it. The funniest thing about that, what you just pointed out, CNC, Pummel, and Final Spring Tuning, is that they are all three generic cards. Yes. But we really only see Guardian <laughs> anyone play. Anyone can do it, really. Yeah, anyone can do it. It's the strongest thing available in the game, and anyone can do it. But really, it's only this Guardian's doing it. Yeah, we are moments away uh, from our next match here in the feature match area. We have been scouring the top tables to try and bring you the most compelling, the most interesting matchups. I mean, uh, you know, a walk through the top tables by our good friend Sam O'Byrne has shown that there's a large number of Dramai, Azalea, there's Victor, Katsu is there. There are two of them at the top tables. Kasai, two Viserais in a mirror, by the way. It was John Ho versus Chris Ayali, uh, previous world championship runner-up Chris Ayali. They were on very different plans. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, one on the mid-range strat, one on the sort of combo base one. There's a Dash IO up there. Uh, yep. A Reiner, which Pablo Pintor, by the way, is piloting. So we're starting to see uh, a bit of Reiner crop up and a healthy smattering of Dorinthia as well. So we hope to see a little bit more of that later in the day. Let's jump into our next match. This is round four of Classic Constructed, everybody. Nicholas Tran at 3-0 on Dromai will take on the Menace of Viserai, one of the most prolific Viz players in the world. It's John Ho, also at 3-0. So John Ho, from what I've heard, from the rumors I've gathered, he's on a more traditional Viserai plan, not the Chris Yali, you know, build up a stack of rune chants and kill you in one turn. He's on a more Morven Skies. However, with Reaping Blade as a weapon of choice, rather than the Nebula Blade that we saw Jordan pilot earlier against Roger Bodhi. Now, Reaping Blade means he's more along the lines of playing the two cost attack actions, like Shrill of Scarform, like Spellblade Assault, to pair together with that weapon. So you've got a bit more power on the attack actions, with a bit less power on the weapon, compared to the Nebula Blade builds, which are running the one cost attack actions, but they make up for it in having slightly more powerful weapon. John Ho uh, has results. Uh, back in 2022, placed seventh at the Calling Charlotte and also has featured at times in at AGE Open PTI events that happen here uh, in Southern California. So uh, no slouch by any stretch of the imagination. I've also seen him at Battle Hearted in LA. John will make the moves uh, and make some you know travel plans to get to those big tournaments and has always truly stuck to that Viserai game plan. And we want to talk about the matchup a little bit here because uh, obviously, uh, you know, having instances of arcane damage that you know, can be targeted to some degree seems pretty powerful against Dromai, who wants to develop a board of permanence of dragons to really try and overwhelm her opponents. So, bring up the arcane damage point, very, very, you know, great point to bring up because Dromai, historically, you know, mostly reds, very, very red line list. Honestly, a lot of them don't even flip up arcane barrier, you know, naturally into this right? They're probably just trying to depend on some ash wings. But when you try and pitch reds to stop a stack of rune chants, you feel really, Ooh. really bad. So, you know, in this sort it's of One race, card for one damage prevention. <laughs> yeah, pretty bad value when we, you know, when we talk about value. And the other thing about the dragons is that they are prime targets for Morven Skies on hits. And you know what that means? That means more rune chants on the follow-up attack. Exactly. Morven Skies, really important card that confers go again to a, uh, a rune blade attack and also generates rune chants on hits hit and you cannot stop your dragons from being hit you cannot defend for them we're looking at diet of carapace here saying hey what is this <laughs> card diet of carapace of course uh, a more recent addition here giving uh so oh, sorry that's a, that's either iron weave so sorry mm -hmm. uh again so this is a card that john can actually pop for resources 
Yep, and so that tells us what John's game plan is. He wants to end this game quickly. We saw Jordan earlier today flip up the final spring tunic, and that's for a bit more, you know, I'm going to activate this a couple of times. This matchup is going to go, you know, more than three turns, going to be maybe six to nine turns. I'm going to get more value from the tunic. But John's saying, I want to kill you <laughs> before you get to develop too many dragons for me to deal with. So I'm going to run Aether Iron Weave, a bit more of a burst damage card. Absolutely. It blocks just for the one and stays mm -hmm. around after the fact due to Battle Worn. But John needs to be weaving non-attacks and attack actions in uh, especially if he wants to activate that iron weave but getting two resources off that is is obviously very very important here grass of the arc knight here on turn zero simply uh pitching a blue to it is john to generate a rune chant token and it looks like nicholas tran here um Activating Seeker's Mitts over here, so doing the opt, very critically, this means this is one card out of his hand right now, and John Ho can still come in with an attack, yes. should he choose to, after the Seeker's Mitts resolves. And let's see what the John Ho does that, knowing that, you know, Nicholas has already committed one card away. That was a blue on top of the deck here for Nicholas Tran, opting mm -hmm. to send it away. Again, Ash is very important to generate here for Jeremiah. Pitching Reds will allow you to generate that Ash, and that's what allows you to develop Dragons. So having an equipment, a piece of equipment like Seeker's Mitts allows you to get off to the races with Reds in your pitch zone and an Ash on the board to start. And as we pointed out, no Arcane Barrier on Nicholas Tran's side, so he needs to you know, resolve some Ash Rings at some point. Now, he does have an Uvia in hand ah. to help with that, but until he develops those Ash Rings, he's going to have no defense against his Rune Chan. It's going to be unpreventable damage. Does that Ravenous Rabble in hand tell you anything about what Nicholas's game plan is or what kind of archetype of Dromai he's on? So both the Big Dragon and the, you know, quote-unquote Empress list do run Ravenous Rebel as a very strong, you know, 0 for 4 chain starter because even the Big Dragon list want a way to give their whole board go again. Ravenous Rebel you is You need to one. play a red card to get go again with your dragons. And very critically, it doesn't consume any ash. You know, something like an Asvali, a Chromai is a 0 cost that consumes an ash to give go again to everything. Rebel just sends 4 and it's Phantasmless, which is also very, very important and just gives your whole board go again. Mirror Guy developed here already. So a dragon hits the board and, of course, Crucially, it says your first dragon attack each turn loses and can't gain Phantasm. There are some six power attacks in John Ho's deck, or more, if you look at mm -hmm. Ninth Blade. Uh, and again, you can have your turn pretty badly disrupted by one of those six powers uh, that gets sort of thrown in front of you. So, Mirror Guy first. And we're up to three Ash already, so no shortage of that here for Nicholas Tran and already getting a permanent resolved. Let's see whether John, who has a Morven Skies, really take advantage Sonata. of this body on the field for him to get Rune Chance off of. Looks like he doesn't quite. He does have a lead the charge, though. Okay. So resolving, putting a ninth blade in his hand. Unfortunately, not enough Rune Chance to try and, you know, resolve that in an efficient manner. Yeah. Uh, so, might likely just be a pitch card for us this turn. And as and I do want to point out the equipment on John Ho's side, particularly the headpiece, Balance of Justice, new card from Heavy Hitters that we haven't seen today on stream, funnily enough. Uh, but against Dromai, very, very strong because, of course, most Dromais these days are on Crown of Dominion and running Tomb of Imperial Flame. Critically, it draws them two cards, turns on Balance of Justice. Yeah, it evens up the playing field a little bit against a lot of decks right now that are drawing extra cards on their turn. Balance of Justice says you can destroy this if an opponent has drawn, well, two or more cards this turn, right? And you mm -hmm. can get one back yourself. So even the playing field, Snarder Arcanics uh, deployed there with no pitch. So it's uh, X is zero. So he's looking at the top three cards. We got the ninth blade from that. And a second Snarder Arcanics coming down once again. We are hoping for non-attacks and attack actions both to be represented. You can choose, of course, that attack action we get a deadly duet. Yeah, and this time John Ho hits an attack that you can actually play because his hand right now before the Sonata was two ninth plays of the Blood Oath. Very, very, a bit of a clunky hand from John Ho there. So the second Sonata really bailing him out. And that was a bit of a heads up play by John Ho to not pitch for the first Sonata. He could have pitching the leader charge in his yep. hand, but he's saying, you know what? I have this other Sonata in case my first Sonata breaks or doesn't draw me something useful. So this will be my fail safe instead of committing pitch to the first Sonata. So he's rewarded here getting Deathly Duet in his hand. Interesting card, of course, Deathly Duet. Sort of, uh, you know, it gets plus two if you pitch an attack action card to play, taking it up to six. And it creates two Rune Chant tokens if you pitch. Uh, a non-attack action card to play. Both are possible. But pitching two reds doesn't always feel amazing, but mm -hmm. that's a pretty full grip of cards here for John. And I also see a Revel in Runeblood in that hand. Very, very scary card, as we already spoke about, against someone who has no Arcane Bearer. So that's going to represent straight up five extra rune chance because of Visteride Trigger as well into a hero that has no Arcane Bearer. So let's see whether John is able to string together this turn to resolve that this turn. Again, you need to turn on Revel in Runeblood by paying an attack action and a non-attack action in the turn prior, which is now done. We have mm -hmm. our Deathly Duet deployed here. And the rune chance are being activated here. 
Mm -hmm. Most definitely Jurette will create two in the back. Two in the back, plus one from Visrai and the rune chance. And this is one of the beauties of Visrai into Droma, is you can send attacks at dragons, but you are still sending damage to the face because the rune chance trigger and target the opposing hero. And that is one of the things that makes Visrai very, very happy in a matchup like this. Not only is Droma unable Reapers? to stop the arcane damage, but you're able to deal with the board while sending damage face. So Deathly Duet doesn't have go again, but at instant speed, if you can play a card with go again, you can get your action point back. That is... Oh my goodness! Okay, Revel of Rublai creates his five rune chants, and that means, remember, Ninth Blade is reduced in cost by the number of rune chants you have. This is disgusting. A nine power attack, but also with eight rune chants coming at you, that's 17 damage in total. And Nicholas Tran is priced into taking every bit of it. 17 damage after already sending two damage phase and clearing out the mirror guy. John what Ho is earth? has made... A, a really good turn out of what started off very clunky with two ninth plays in the same hand, only one rune chant to support them. He, <laughs> you, he got turn. that off Sonata and you said he's probably pitching that card. <laughs> Not wrong, he pitches one of them, but getting to deploy one here, unbelievable. The combination of Deathly Duet and Relevant Runeblood working wonders for John Ho over here and definitely keeping a Spellbound Creepers around because he's just definitely dealt a bunch of arcane this turn, Uber. Okay, Nicholas. Looking at nine damage. So he takes the rune <laughs> chance because there is no way to prevent that arcane damage with no Aether Ashwings on the board. And now you need to answer this question. Nine damage coming at you. Would you like to go to almost half of your starting life total after one turn or not? One tiny piece of silver lining for Nicholas Tran here is that one rune chant left over from the Vishai trigger is going to get destroyed at the end of this turn because of Rebel and Runeblood's effect. That's right. So, you know, John Ho, at least currently representing starting next turn with zero rune chants. Um, just the smallest of silver linings for Nicholas <laughs> Tran here. You know, we, we, we got to give him something. Okay, <laughs> we're going to block with two attack actions here. We have an Enlightened Strike and a Nourishing Emptiness, but in front, this won't account for nine damage. You're taking three to your Nicholas mm -hmm. Tran. And again, double, I mean, Double Sonata, double Ninth Blade turn with that Deathly Duet to tie it all together into one of the most devastating turns you're going to see from a Viserai. Mm -hmm. yep. And Nourishing Emptiness, very, very heads up block while the opponent still has all the armor up. You know, we just saw Viserai string together such a massive damage turn. You also have to remember Viserai also has a fridge. That is six block an armor there, not even counting the Spellbound Creepers, which, you know, is actually a seventh block. So, you know, John Ho feeling right. very, very comfortable right that now. That dominate effect, you want to yeah. push that on-hit effect of the nourishing through, but your opponent's going to give you his armor. So at this stage of the game, it's not valuable. Yep. Mm. All right, is that Uvia getting developed here? We saw a Tome of Imperial Flame, which requires obviously two red cards to be pitched, otherwise you lose all the cards in your hand. So getting to draw two cards, that's why we have a Crown of Dominion. Jeremiah wants to be royal in using that card. So, Passing Mirage. the balance of justice is on. Let's see whether John Ho goes for aggressive line and, you know, activates it that right now. That would be now. so aggressive, no? It would be very aggressive because he hasn't blocked with it yet. But, you know, in a matchup like this, your opponent just put a big dragon on the field in the form of Uvia. You may be elect for that. Uh, in John Ho's hand, a Sonata Galaxia. Mm -hmm. the newest cards available and out in heavy hitters will, uh, again, allow you to search your deck for a Runeblade Aura. But... Yep. It needs some rune chance in play to sort of be cheapened in cost. Yeah, and here's where the previous turn, you know, the rune chant, get, the rune chant getting blown up by the Revel and Runeblood's effect, you know, not giving the discount of Sonata Galaxia can be one of those things where... It's called balance. Yeah. It's called game balance, right? <laughs> exactly. And similar with this rune flash, you know, John Ho is not getting any of the discounts that he wants off his cards because of you know, the lack going to this turn with the lack of rune chance. That is one of A the downsides of which right can happen. A yeah. full cost rune flash here. Mm -hmm. uh, paying, yeah, it's a one card, I guess two card four, really. John Ho, not very happy about this, but, you know, he has a life lead and he has all the armor in the world to try and come back. This is the rhythm of Runeblade, though. It's ebb and flow. You'll have a setup turn, a quiet turn, and then a massive turn. It's really about taking... It's a, it's, it's a syncopation in rhythm, essentially. Uh, and, and John it shouldn't be too upset about having a setup turn. He's only taken two damage to his game. He got to Arsenal a card. He would like to develop some rune chance, though. And a card he just drew, Movrian Skies, can definitely help to that effect. Especially when your opponent is helpfully putting bodies in the field <laughs> for you to get the Movrian Skies on his. That's a big from. body, though. Uvia yeah. has, a, has a booty on her. <laughs> yep, definitely. Now, John Ho probably not too upset about taking the setup turns, as you li rightly pointed out, but he's probably upset that he didn't manage to keep the Creepers around. In a matchup like this, your opponent doesn't really want to pitch right. the Arcane Barrier. Losing Creepers because you couldn't send Arcane damage because you were setting up doesn't feel that's, very, very good for him. That's the downside. Creeper says you need to deal Arcane damage to your opponent every turn now for each time you've sort of used this so john not unable to satisfy that condition loses that card that gives him go again out of kind of nowhere and the team 
is coming in. Here we go. Miragai, two Aether Ash Swings. Follow it up with a Snatch as a Chain Ender. Coming in for four. Threatening a card draw. Giving Nicholas Tran the ability to Arsenal. John says, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. John's saying, I'll give you one armor piece and a card from my hand. I could have given you balance and grasp and keep all my cards. But, you know, he's saying, ah, oh, this has become the Arc Knight. And next says blue in my hand. I kind of don't need it for what I want to do. Here's a blue Morphian Skies giving uh, John's next uh, attack go again. He's yep. going to use the Deadly Duet uh, to, to come in for this now. Now, does that become pitched for the Deadly Duet or for the Morphian Skies? Because that will inform how that card operates, no? Uh, yeah, it's for the Deadly Duet. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, so we get the Rune Chance. Yes, we get the Rune Chance from Deadly Duet. We get the Rune Chance from Vistri Trigger. We get the Rune Chance from Morphian Skies hitting. And that's exactly what John Ho wants to do. He wants Rune to... Hey. <laughs> he, he wants to kill dragons with physical damage and send arcane damage face as much as he can. Now, as you point out, Uvia, a bit of too much health. Jono's saying, oh, I guess I'm going to have to leave that there. You can have your Ash Rings and Arcane Barrier. Probably not pitching the Arcane Barrier anyway. So, you know, let me just We're leave, leave the Uvia on the field and send damage face. So again, Rune Flash now is discounted. Yes. Uh, it is free for four damage and will send those four Rune Shards hurtling over towards Nicholas Tran here. He does not want to pitch to Arcane Barriers. We discussed a deck full of reds doesn't feel great about doing that. And it appears that John is not really clearing that many dragons. Here and there, right, the Deathly Duet was used for an Aether Ashwing. So credit to him because he's still mindful of the potential for Nicholas's board to get overwhelming, to get overstacked with these dragons. But he knows he needs to put Nicholas on a timer sending this arcane damage in at face and you still have four damage on the board here with nicholas deciding how to block that if at all the answer mm. is absolutely not against roma you really need to strike the critical balance between being disciplined and clearing board and also pressuring the face and john ho is doing that excellently in this matchup so far and nicholas Tran has another reason not to pitch to ab and not to block and that's because he's holding another tome in hand ah. and you know the earlier tome it was actually really awkward he did the tome off of a small card and he drew a blue which means he was forced to pitch the only two reds he had yeah. in his hand and which is kind of why you really want to tome off of a big hand so you actually have the agency to decide what to pitch nicholas saying i do not want to be put I do not want to be put into that situation again where I accidentally draw a blue and I don't have agency to decide what I want to pitch. So he's saying, I'm going to take the damage here, try and get a big tome off to try and get back in this game because quite frankly, right now, it is not going well for him. There's a Dominia in the hand of Nicholas Tran there as well, which uh, again is a big frightening dragon with uh, an on-attack ability, not an on-hit, uh, that can be quite threatening here. So we are ticking down an Ash to develop an Aether Ashwing. Of course, Uvia will do that for you. She literally spawns those mm -hmm. Aether Ashwings at the start of your turn if you have the Ash to support their generation. Blaze Headlong here, looking like it's headed to the pitch zone. A card that needs a red card to be played already to give it go again. And instead, we're going to develop Yenderai. Yet another very durable dragon. Hard for Viserai to clear. Interestingly, Nicholas not choosing to tome after playing the Yenderai, he wants that red card in the pit zone already. And this is quite heads up because now he pitches two, and then there's two floating, and he can uh, activate Furnace and get that extra resource because he pitched a red card first in a Blaze Headlong. And then we're gonna okay. Yep. Play yep. here. Which furnace. means he goes exactly to four. That was, that was masterful sequencing that we just witnessed there. Hello. Instead of starting with the Tome, he's saying, I'm going to Yenderai first, have the red card in the pitch zone so that when I activate Furnace, it sees the extra card alongside the two I pitched for the Tome. Now I can resolve his Dominion. Favoring the extra resources to deploy a bigger dragon that's more expensive instead of having that extra agency in card selection. He knew he wanted the Dominion anyway. Yep. Pretty scary. This one, again, it will. Uh, you can look at your opponent's hand if you banish a red card. Uh, mm. And then you could choose one and get rid of it. What and, are we getting rid of? And you hate to see this. When you Dominia against a deck that doesn't have too many poppers, you usually just want to get that one pop out of the hand, and now you're uh. free to swing. <laughs> but the Vistrai has just shown two poppers to Nicholas Tran, and he is not happy about this. He took... That was a very risky line he took. He could have yep. drawn a blue uh, again off the Tome and not be able to resolve the Dominia because of it. He took that risk. He's saying, I need to get this Dominia out, and you try and get back in this game with that. But then John Ho just reveals two I'll poppers. Yeah, I mean, he's saying your risk was pointless. There's a Looming Doom in hand for John Ho, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, losing, uh, blocking a card there, and obviously having one banished by Dominia sucks, but he got rid of Dominia on block because of Phantasm, and we're priced into more of a setup turn once more for John. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say not the most compelling hand. It's like a Shrill of Skull form in blue. And yeah, we're going to pitch to our Grasp of the Ark Knight for a Rune Chant token, and we're going to attack with a Reaping Blade for three. So we started this matchup talking about the difference in weapon from uh, John Ho's list and what Jordan was running in Nebula Blade. And this is one of the advantages of Reaping Blade, where you can actually do grasp into weapon, which you cannot do with Nebula Blade uh, off of one card. 
Uh, and of course, Nebula Blade, if you haven't played the non attack, it's only coming in for one. Right. So it's really bad on a small hand, Nebula Blade. But Reaping Blade on the other hand, still very good on a small hand. Um, critically, John Ho on the previous turn again could have activated the balance. He was left with just two blues in hand, right. a Blooming Doom and a Blue yeah, Shrill. One more chance to do that now, yeah. in theory. So he could have to try and go for a more aggressive line, but you know, you are sort of at the mercy uh, uh, of what's at the top of a deck if you go for that line. So John Ho being a bit more disciplined, saying, I have the life total, you have one more tome left, I'll just save it for that. Um, and hopefully use it as a way to fix my hand or as a way to maybe draw into that crucial popper that, you know, I really might need to stop your turn. Yeah, again, John definitely needs Nicholas to be drawing extra cards in order to satisfy the condition on balance that would allow him to draw, and there's one more, theoretically, Tome of Imperial Flame left in Nicholas's deck, the card that lets him draw all that action. Uh, Kyloria will let you draw as well, mm -hmm. uh, in theory, but yep. uh, again, won't be enough cards to turn on that balance. So Yeah, it wouldn't be Kyloria and a Snatch, and they both hit, which John Ho is never going to let happen. Unlikely. So. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay. So, so Nicholas, be... again, transforming an Ash Ring, a start of the turn, going down to zero Ash. That is a scary position to be in as Jomai. However, he has played a red card this turn, which means he can activate Furnace to get that Ash back, should he choose to do so. I mean, Azvalai here presents forked damage, of course, uh, attacking for two, and then can actually split one arcane damage across any two targets. Prism could never. <laughs> <laughs> she would love that. Yeah. Second gets her close, but uh, they're not quite close enough. And in again comes the team. These are all free. Uh, and of course, we're having played a red card. They all have go again, and John just takes it. Nicholas saying, I'm going to play your own game against you with my split damage as well. I am sick of you sending Runeshan the physical at me. Here's my own arcane damage plus physical at you. Yendra Ice Wall comes in. Uh, again, Nicholas attacking with some of the smaller dragons to try and draw proppers out if they exist. And this is a disgusting chain end, honestly. Dust Up is oh so nice. No, it does not have go again. But uh, yeah, if it hits, you can uh, create an ash and transform an ash into an Aether Ash Ring. So about as much value as you could ask for on a 0 for 4 card here. A fantastic bookend to what is, frankly, a threatening turn, bringing John down to sub-22. Well, we say bookend, but remember, Nicholas Trent still has Snapdragon <gasps> Scalers up, true. and we have seen Snatch in his list. He could go for the bait where he snaps this and then plays a Snatch as the actual bookend, and that's what John Ho was thinking about, is yep. if I give Fall Block on armor here and he snatches me, then I won't have the armor anymore. John kind of got bailed out this. Uh, he just called the bluff saying, you don't have the Snatch. I'm just going to give you my armor here, and made a perfect read. Nicholas Trent says, yep, I'm just going to arse. It's one of the best targets for your armor block, right? Those on hit effects of whether either drawing a card or not. Tome of the Arc Knight here. Okay, we're going to roll the <laughs> dice a little bit. So again, you reveal the top oh. two, and if it's an attack action and a non-attack, mm -hmm. you get them. Yep. Unfortunately, it reveals two dread, attacks of the top. Yeah, Dread Triptych, and that's a really long one. Drawn to the Dark Dimensions, I think, mm -hmm. is the name of the card. Been a while since I was a Viz gamer, but they are both attack actions, and John gets neither of them. Yeah, although knowing, you know, John Ho and how he's been playing, he's not... He didn't need that to hit for him to do his turn. Looks like he has a Swarming Gloom Villain in hand, and I think I saw another Revel in Runeblood. So, you know, he's saying, okay, this doesn't need to hit. I just need to have started a turn with a non-attack that had go again so that my Gloom Veil gets go again, and I can play my Revel in Runeblood. Because critically, I don't have the Creepers anymore to try and cheat it in uh, for the action point. So he's saying, it would be nice if I hit the Tome, but even if I don't, I'm still going to Revel you this turn, yep. and that's going to feel amazing. That, yeah, that definitely hurts to, to deal with that level of uh, arcane damage. So Swarming, of course, uh, cares about the number of Rune Chants generally. Mm -hmm. create on this turn. So right now has go again, which is important. Yep. Uh, he's going to let John continue the turn. Doesn't gain any of those other bonuses there. That third mode is pretty insane, preventing arcane damage prevention. Uh, but rarely do we sort of see that. Normally it's one or two modes and swarming at a zero for four go again is obviously already very powerful. Here's a revel in rune blood. We are creating five rune chant tokens here. One off the visor ability, four off the revel, but they must be used this turn. Fortunately, it's pretty easy to send these across the board. <laughs> yep. It'll be very interesting to see where John sends this Reaping Blade. It looks like the way he's posturing, he's not sending an attack from Arsenal. He's trying mm. to decide where to send the weapon. He could send the weapon at the Azvalai, and the six rune shots will still go to the face. Uh, or he can just send a full nine damage to Adromai's face. Say, hey, you can have your little Azvalai. I'm gonna try and put. I'm gonna try and get you in lethal range as soon as I can, and that means you need to stop pitching to rune chants, and that's why I want you. That's where I tear your hand apart with you being forced to block very inefficiently. I think that's still a blue shrill of skull form in Arsenal. Yes, you're right. So yes. So not the most exciting card for, for John <laughs> to look to deploy here, and doesn't actually have a way to cycle that. No, obviously, he isn't using Crown of Providence or any of those other effects as far as we know. So that will be stuck there. And it'll feel a little bit mopey, but the way yeah. he's slid that Reaping Blade forward, 
I'm a little unsure about what he's targeting here, but first we need to answer the question of whether Nicholas takes six damage from Rune Chance. Yeah. Uh, given that Nicholas is potentially thinking on blocks, I'm guessing the Reaping Blade is going to the face because, you know, he's going to Asfly. You can't, you can't think on blocks, you just think on Arcane Barrier. Ooh, Sigil of Solace here okay. in Nicholas Trans Hand. You know, we spoke about how he can't really deal with Arcane Damage because he doesn't have blues to pitch. Sigil of Solace, though, functionally a blue into, into Rune Chance because yes. you just. Play this red and gain three life. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. It gives you that life. Also, it's really dirty when you swing with a uh, ether ash ring with no go again, and then you mm -hmm. play that at instant speed to give all your dragons go again. And your opponent normally has normally knows it's coming, but if you're me, it's surprise pick, surprise Pikachu face as you lose <laughs> your second round of the pro quest. <laughs> Not bitter. Not bitter. Yep. So looks like Nicholas Tran doesn't need to go for that cheeky line, just starting with a burn them all, but still hiding that you know he's actually not at seven, he's at ten, and that could really affect how John okay. Hope plans his blocks this turn. So both players now bringing some arcane damage uh, into their game plan. Burn them all will allow uh, Nicholas to send one arcane damage uh, on once per turn on his first dragon attack. It does chew through the graveyard because to keep burn them all in play, you need to banish uh, or uh, you need to banish cards from your graveyard. Uh, at an increasing rate turn by turn in order to keep that active. Still, we're later-ish in the game. There's a mm -hmm. full enough graveyard. Again, the, the pressure's starting to mount here, and John needs to find a way to end this. Yes, it looks like John found a lot of his poppers very early on. We saw the two Ninth Blades in the same hand, two Red Amplify the Arc Knights in the same hand. Vishrai doesn't run too yeah. many more poppers than those cards, so John... I don't think we have Runic Reclamation in this in this list, necessarily. Maybe uh, Sideboard Tech. Maybe. Kill I mean, Burn Them All. Yeah, it does kill Burn Them All, though the Icelander gone from the format, you know, really, uh, Insidious Chill was the main target for Runic Reclamation. Icelander gone, not too many auras hanging around the format, so... John Ho kind of feeling the pain of seeing the poppers early and not oy, getting oy, them oy. now. The army of dragons is coming in with that split damage, as you just talked about, with the Burn Them All and the Asvalai. To quote the legendary Matt Flake DeMarco, this is Death by a Thousand Cuts, uh, as a number <laughs> of these dragons are starting to swing in here. And he saw John's life total precipitously drop. There is. There's not only the 1-1 one, one little Ash Rings. Okay, Uvia represents one damage. Asvalai, of course, has the 2-plus Arcane. And Yenderai is pretty healthy at 3. So, big damage. Again, John is very much on a clock as well. This game has really turned very, very quickly. You know, just now we were staring at a 20 life lead for the Visrai player, but it now it's huge, suddenly, right? And now it's suddenly evened out with the board of dragons on the Dromai side. This is looking quite scary for John Ho right now. And he has to think. Do I have a hand that sort of functions well? Rune Blood Incantation is great, but at this point in the game, uh, giving you one rune charm per turn is good, but it's the kind of card you play that doesn't do much for you that turn it's more of a investment plan it drip feeds you rune charms which again are really important because they discount a lot of your attack actions that can really you know blow out of proportion if you're you know playing like Morian skies for example uh there are a lot of cards that can really play well with that something yep. vincet also especially the early builds uh mm -hmm. used a lot of it's also a really good card that pairs with Swarming Gloomvale. It means that you don't need to have played a non-attack. Oh, it's start, an aura. Yeah, it just yeah. creates an aura start of a turn for you. Swarming Gloomvale gets go again. Uh, very, very strong card. But critically, you do kind of want the game to last three turns. So you get full value from yes. it. But with the opponent representing, I don't know, like 10 damage on dragons every turn, <laughs> is it going to go that long? It's funny. There aren't too many games in which your opponent gaining life can draw a pursed set of lips like that out of John Holm. <laughs> but yeah, Sigil of Solace, when you're trying to race someone down and you're on a clock yourself, seeing them bump their life up by three can be a little frustrating. So Drawn to the Dark Dimension offered there on blocks by John. Mm -hmm. So, very, very minor thing here, but that does start being banished to the Burn Them All. Remember that Nicholas Tron does run Nourishing Emptinesses. So, Aha. if he's able to banish the red attacks with this Burn Them All, that Nourishing Emptiness can come can in dominate. with Dominate. And at this time, John doesn't have armor anymore. The first time, remember, we saw Nicholas Tron very expertly block with it, recognizing the armor. But now, John doesn't have the armor. That Dominate will be critical. And looks like Nicholas did draw the Nourishing Emptiness. Great call. Absolutely. And yeah, Nourishing only gets Dominate if there's no other attack action cards in the graveyard. So let's keep that in mind. Finally, the blue Shrill of Skull <laughs> form gets released into the wild. Uh, at the very least, again, uh, if you created an aura this turn, which uh, Rune Blood Incantation is, Shrill does get buffed. So it's five power attack here that's going to create a Rune Chant in the back. But more importantly, John got it out of his arsenal. Yep, and no arcane damage to speak of, though, and this is where Dromai is very happy. Nicholas is saying, oh, there's no arcane damage. Phew, just physical. I can deal with physical. <laughs> All my cards block three. That, that's easy. Uh, but so John Ho kind of needs to find a popper in his next hand to really try and survive the turn. Although I think I see a Chroma in Nicholas Tran's hand. This is, 
this is one of those moments which really makes you say how the turn tables because this is you know we saw an onslaught of rune chants from john ho's side at the beginning of the game but now we're seeing an onslaught of dragons from nicholas Tran's side saying you know you didn't kill me fast enough and this is exactly what Dromai will do when you don't kill her fast enough. She's going to say, now my dragons, my dragons is going to assault you. Exactly. Oh my goodness. Nicholas now doing some quick maths. Big Shack brings a tear to his eye. Mm -hmm. I think with uh, so much already, I mean, oh, how much damage is represented on the board? Let me do it. Uh, three, five, mm -hmm. seven. I'll let you eight, do the math. Nine, ten from <laughs> dragons. Burn them all gives you another one Kia. Mm -hmm. John has, uh, he's in trouble. He's facing lethal yep. damage on the next turn cycle. And yeah, so normally in this spot, you would, you know, in John's position, you're thinking, I just need to draw a popper next hand and have a turn back. But Nicholas Tran with a Chroma in hand, this is a perfect yeah. timing to find the Chroma. Then you tell John, you need two poppers in hand. And can you do that again? Oh, not you again. I mean, red apps. Saw, <laughs> amp, those Amplify the Arc Knights, they came, <laughs> they came clumped together here. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yep. We'll invoke Uvia block action here just to preserve life. And this is probably not the great time for John Ho to have the mopey turn that Viserai can have every now and then. So it is, yeah, send a pretty average blue attack with some rune shard generation, pocket a card. And if he could survive long enough, that looks like a disgusting hand he just drew. That looks like a non-popper hand. Like, there's no poppers in that hand. It is pretty aggressive if he's allowed to keep that hand. He won't. Uh, but he won't, exactly. So... This looks like it could be rough. And this is honestly exactly how you want to start turns where you are, you know, going to send an army of dragons. You start the turn with a non-phantasm attack that yep. has go again. Because, you know, if your opponent has the popper, any phantasm attack you send is just going to, you know, you kind of can get blown out. But you're saying, here's a three non-phantasm, and then the army of dragons is going to come in. And also very expertly hiding information here, saying, you know, I still have the Chroma in hand. So, and John Ho doesn't know about that. I mean, he doesn't even have the popper, so it's a little it bit is, of a moot point. It's redundant, yeah. Uh, but, you know, uh, Nicholas Tran playing very expertly around the hidden information that John Ho might have a popper. John here, his, his prospects of maintaining any number of cards going to the next turn starting to slim here. The worst thing you can do is spend cards blocking these one power Aether Ashwings. And it's likely John won't look to do that here. Some of these other dragons represent a sort of a better prospect. So again, when Chromai attacks or leaves the arena, you gain an action point. So this attack here, you can pop Chromai. Yes, it has Phantasm, but we have an action point left over for Nicholas to keep going with the rest of these dragons. And John, head in hands now. He realizes that that window to blow the Dromai out of the game has well and truly closed. He is on the defensive. Tempo favors very much the Dromai player here. And uh, Viserai just ran out of gas a little too early. Yep, and you have to wonder whether John was now regretting not popping the balance earlier when he could have to maybe just have a more aggressive turn early on. He was saying, I'm comfortably almost 20 life ahead. Let me just save this balance for a third tome. But little does he know, it looks like the third tome may not even happen this game. Yep. I mean, Nicholas doesn't need it. He might also realize he doesn't want to give an extra card to John. Also, like that, that Aether Ironweave, those couple of extra resources that it offers never really came into the game. John only getting one block value from that card another drawn dart to dart drawn to the dark dimension mm. excuse me put in front to block this chromai attack and here comes the little guys mm -hmm. many whelps left side <laughs> so john definitely thinking of his outs here he's thinking okay look let me prevent some damage here let me get rid of the chromai on my turn if i draw a popper on the next hand and my opponent doesn't have the chromai that's my way back in that's the out that it seems like john is playing for it is still very scary because of the arcane damage endgame that now Nicholas Tran has. We spoke about this entire time of a rune chance being the endgame for Vistry. Nicholas, though, now with Burn Them All and Asvalife also has an arcane barrier endgame. However, John does have AB, but that's AB2. Oh. So to stop one instance of arcane, you do need to pitch two into that... that um, uh, that oh wait no that's not directed carpus what am i saying no he just doesn't have yeah. ab no, oh my god yeah no he just doesn't have it i thought it was directed carpus made the same mistake that's what i did <laughs> yeah. Game, yeah i mean it, yep. it's a chess piece with purple effects uh -huh. you know what yeah. i mean <laughs> uh, the problem for so, this is that you you can't function on half hands very well at all like you need yep. non-attacks and attacks and a card often to pay for those john has them he has a sonata he has a uh, a swarming gloom veil and a blue to say nothing of what's in his arsenal here Maybe there's some redundancy. Maybe there's an attack action in John's arsenal, but he has to give up the Swarming Gloomvale, one of the most powerful cards that Viserai has mm. at his disposal. We are alive. We have survived the onslaught at two life. We've yep. got two cards. We know a blue. There's a Sonata in there. Not a lot of rune chance build up, but Incantation will create another one. Mm -hmm. And giving up the Gloomvale when you have the Incantation on the field is such a feels bad, because as we spoke about earlier, just natural go again that it just has already because of, because of the Incantation. Going down to two... When there's an Asphalai and a Burn Them All in the field and you have no Arcane Barrier, 
John Ho is facing lethal on board. He needs a way to deal with Asvali and also needs a way to deal with the Chromai so that drawing a popper actually gets him out of this predicament that he's in. What a situation here to have this game with you package for our first cast. I actually learned how to play Viserai from your uh, your content. So, oh. Yeah. <laughs> quite, quite a nice moment here. I was a little bit of a Viserai gremlin uh, for a time. Mm -hmm. That's uh, the total flashback. Yeah, it's, yeah big it's time. Viserai content a long time ago. Sonata Arcanics. Uh, unlikely to be pitched into here. Maybe John can afford to pitch two into it. Okay, so he'll be revealing the top four cards. Now we need two attacks and two non-attacks. Wow, Cryptic attack, attack, Crossing attack, being revealed attack, there. Non-attack. Only one of those attack actions mm -hmm. can be put into John's hand. He pitched two resources in order to see an extra card off Sonata Arcanics, and it did not pay off. Mm -hmm. it, cryptic Crossing. Yeah. What an <laughs> he's done. Oh. He is, yeah, he's going to concede the game Hold here. It. John realizes that, look, I'm not going to... Yeah, This is a popper I've drawn, but you have Chromai. I cannot stop you next turn as you try and run me over. And Nicholas Tran... We'll move to four and zero on Dromai. Again, a deck that many people expected to make a, more than just a splash here uh, at the Pro Tour in Los Angeles. John Ho with his pet deck, his you know absolute uh, first and last potentially love here in, in Flesh and Blood with the Viserai. Going down to three and one, still a lot of potential for him in this tournament to go a long way. But coming out of CC being three and one, I don't think I'd be too upset with that. We, the quality of player in the room is unreal. Definitely. And that end game over there for John Ho, I mean, you called it. He was in a rut in like three different ways. He needed to deal with Azvalai because that was presenting lethal. Yes. He had to deal with Chromai, and then he had to draw a popper as well on the turn after that to try and get out of that predicament. But that's because it was so expertly navigated by the Dromai player in that we have to give so much props to them. They were down like 20 life. A lot of Dromais would be feeling really, really behind that spot. But he played to his outs. He played for the Arcane Barrier endgame and just managed to clinch that at the end. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, Viserai getting some you know new cards here of, of late to sort of take him into a position of power. But many remember uh, when Rosetta Thorn was legal before Briar became Living Legend. That was obviously a weapon that was extremely efficient, presenting two and two <laughs> uh, damage. That, that split damage was really a big part of the Viserai game plan. And it was a time where Viserai felt quite favoured uh, into Dromai, the ability to present that split damage. But times have changed, and Dromai, she sits upon the throne of Volcor for a very good reason. We've got some time. We've got some more games for you. Let's jump into our backup matchup here. It's another Dromai matchup going up against KO. These are the two boogeymans of the format here. Cody Williams, a well-known player from that East Coast, going up against Matt Rogers. Uh, this is Team Runaways versus Team PCG Pass going at it here for you. I love having more games to watch. You know, normally in the past, we only see like one game per round, but now we're getting to see two games per round every round. You know, what an absolute treat seeing Cody Williams from Runaways. Oh, Looks like most of the excuse me, it's Dorinthia. It is Dorinthia, yes. A lot of the Runaways, from what I've heard, have brought Dorin Hatchet's Dorinthia to this event uh, rather than any other Dorinthia, any other hero. Me, uh, and Matt just, Rogers on the other side with a classic KO. Let me stretch up a little bit here and get uh, yeah get warmed up <laughs> for this game. It's one of the first decks I built in, in paper, actually, uh, mm -hmm. because very affordable, actually, uh, just as a side note, to put this together. Uh, again, Dorinthia... Uh, she has a lot of value available to her. So obviously her hero ability says if you uh, attack, if you hit with a weapon, you may attack with it again this turn. When you have two weapons, that is the potential for four attacks. You do need three instances of go again, which is not easy to generate, but still very powerful. And the hatchets get stronger after mm -hmm. they're used in succession. The first time I saw hatchets during there, I had to read the hatchets and it dawned on me that you don't, you can close the chain and still get the buff on the hatchet as long as the last attack you did this turn was the other hatchet. And that blew my mind. I was like, wow, wait, this, that's actually real? You can close the chain and still get the, yes. get the effect? And that makes cards like Hit and Run extremely, extremely powerful. Not only can you start your turn with it to get the go again, if you can get it in the middle, you get go again for that hatchet, give it the buff as well, and then come in for another hatchet to end the turn, attacking three times over the course of a turn. Assault and Battery here used, and uh, it will be a beat chest activation, which means that, uh, you know, if you discard a card of six or more power, you can create an agility token. So virtually, on Matt's turn, he's able to create a Might and Agility token here. Again, on turn zero, your opponent can draw back up after blocking, but you get to establish some form of semi-permanence on the board, some buffs that you can use when it comes back to you. We're opening with Hit and Run here. Now, if you use it to start the turn, it just confers Go again. If you're already attacked with a weapon this turn, that's where the buff comes in, but Cody needs to give this first hatchet, go again. 
I absolutely love playing Valen Dynamo into KO. Now, I've, I've been playing a bit of Kasai recently, and Valen Dynamo into KO just feels so good because you get to tell the KO, hey, yeah, you are generating one value again and again with your mind token. Well, guess what? I'm doing that too, just defensively, defensively on my Valen Dynamo. I am able to match your value because I'm gaining one life back every turn cycle, just like how you are gaining one damage, and that really evens the playing field. Cody placed uh, second recently at the calling in Hartford and also uh, 38th at our World Championship in Barcelona. A player I've watched many, many times on coverage here with uh, yeah, some really great results. Pro Tour Lille just bubbled uh, at ninth there. And at US Nationals back in 2021, he was in the top three. Now, I, I do want to point out Cody Williams' uh, chess piece over here. Now, Grains of Blood Spill was a card that you know, came out heavy hitters. A lot of Warriors have been playing it. It's a very, very strong card. You know, Temper 2 and lets you bring resources over to following turns. Cody Williams opting for Tunic, and I believe I see a Steel Blade Shunt in his hand as well, which tells us the sort of game plan he's trying to go for. A little more defensive, wants value from Steel Blade Shunt. It's also extremely powerful to have a Tunic counter on a turn where you go Hatchet, Blade Runner, Hatchet, Hit and Run, Attack. You need four Reese's for that. It is some of the most horrendously gross value that you can get with the buffs from the hatchets, and you need a tunic counter to do it off two cards. So that's a play pattern to look out for. I was talking with Nathan Crawford earlier on, and he's like, this is the, what I'm the most afraid of. This is one of the scariest things that Dorinthia can do in this hatchets build. And yeah, of course, also, deploy a steel blade shot without tearing your hand apart is great for mid-ranging. One downside, though, of running cards like Steel Blade Shun is something we just saw happen to Cody, where he effectively IP'd himself because he was holding a defense reaction. I couldn't quite see whether it was Fate Foreseen or Sink Below alongside the Steel Blade Shunt. So, you know, only yeah. managed to use two of his cards offensively there to hatch into two, into hatch into three. Not the best, but did refresh the dynamos. And to be honest, the longer this game goes, the better it is for Dorinthia because they're going to get way more value from the combination of the hatches and the dynamo than KO is. I mean, you can do like two card eights, uh, two card oh, nines yeah. almost, like it's just no one's business. Because mm -hmm. again, if you attack twice, add one value to whatever you've generated there because the Valiant Dynamo loses a, a counter and can be blocked with, again, here's the shunt. We're pitching for it though, as Tunic is still a long ways away and we are blocking much of this bear phase. If that's a red shunt here, we're putting seven in front of that. And while, you know, pitching for Shun can sometimes feel really bad, when you think about the numbers of it, it's really just you use two cards to block six. Yep. Which, you, you're, you're fine to it's do. Fine. Your, your hatches are in there. You're totally okay doing that. So it can feel bad not having the tunic up, but it's also totally fine to just play it over here. Yeah, and we are going to let the claw through, says Cody. Again, small hands for hatchets, Dorinthia, are easy. Uh, you know, one card uh, to pitch for, one card to confer go again. Your both your axes come in and you're almost always above rate, which is something Dawnblade Dorinthia doesn't necessarily do well. She starts below rate until she gets a counter. Blue hit and run. Gonna mm -hmm. give go again to this hatchet of body here. We have a blue in pitch. I think has a defense reaction yep. in the hand for Cody. Very, very defensive list coming out from Cody here. And you have to imagine the rest of Team Runaways as well, uh, probably deciding that this is the way they want to beat Chaos. But you have to imagine they have a different game plan entirely for Droma. <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, we talked about it. Hatchets yep. can work there, but yep. I have watched a large number of Hatchet Story versus KO games. It's disgustingly good into KO. KO is all about math and all about good value, mm -hmm. and Dorinthia potentially beats him on that axis, which I, I can't believe I'm saying that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but yeah, it's true. Again, that tunic counter, you know, we want to keep an eye for how that is going to be used here. Crucially, of course, a Hatchet of Mine is going to be coming in for four because we have a Brave Forge Braces activation. Chain was broken. It doesn't stop the hatches mm -hmm. from getting buffed. Once again, blue hit and run. Cody definitely feeling a little sad, you know, needing to start his turns with hit and run. He really would rather see something like a Blade Runner to really get extra damage. But he's still pretty happy with this. This was still a two card seven. You know, it was... Uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Exactly. <laughs> uh, well, once you include the Valen Dynamo value on top of it, it's a two-card seven off of two blues. There are not many decks in the game that can say they get seven points of value from two blue cards because that's you know, the value of a red, basically. So, you know, it's scary to think what Cody's going to do when he does draw the red bra that red Blade Runner. Uh, there's a number of other cards that could be extremely threatening here. Mm -hmm. You have the ability to close out games with Spill Blood, yep. uh, which is also a pretty nice opportunity counter, giving plus two and dominate to your axes for the rest of the turn. And if you can find some way of manufacturing three <laughs> or more, that uh, rarely happens, three axe attacks is the most reasonable, then, uh, yeah, you've gained, you know, plus six power from that, uh, that, that Spill Blood plus the dominate effect. It's, you're, it's still bad supremacy is similar, right? Mm -hmm. Those cards that give you that extra buff for the whole turn are yep. unreal in cases where you can get wide enough to use it. For Dory, it's a, it's a Twinning Blade triple Dawnblade attack. Uh, for Dawnblade, for Axes, of course, you don't need to, uh, to hit with your first attack to get to attack more. 
That's taking it. Give me that four. And I have to say, I just love the flexibility uh, of Hatchet's Dory. Like, you know, we've been talking about the, the fabled triple hit that's probably going to happen yes. at some point. But until then, the two hit turns are also perfectly serviceable, perfectly fine. You get a dynamo back. And then when you get the space, when Matt Rogers says, all right, maybe I have an, a weaker hand, or maybe I want to set up something, like play a Cosmos and set up something, Cody says, okay, cool. Now I've got the space. Now I'll swing three times with a Hatchet. And hand is Blade Flurry. So we're starting to see... Now, not a lot of attack reactions in these Hatchet Dorinthi deck. Maybe six. Um, you know, uh, Blade Flurry, of course. Uh, pretty powerful. Uh, one of the new mm -hmm. cards out in Heavy Hitters. Gives you plus two on your attack. and also says your next attack has plus two. Uh, it's, that's the only condition. So it's one of the few... Uh, it's the only unconditional zero for four attack reaction that Warrior has available to them. That's why it's very exciting for uh, Warrior players. It's a wild ride here, though, for Matt Rogers. Looks like gaining that go again with a pack hunt, I think, discarded. So uh, we will see a fateful scene cover up most of that damage. Mm -hmm. So interesting decision by Cody William there to use a fate foreseen from Arsenal. I believe he chose that because he has a sink below in hand as well. So he wants to opt on the top card before, you know, potentially sinking into it. But, it, you know, it is it has been noted that using a defense reaction from Arsenal means you're no longer protected against a pulping. Because one of the best plays against pulping is to have your D-react in Arsenal to just cancel the go again because you're blocking with two non-equipment cards. So Cody's saying, I value the opt more because I'm holding sink below. And I'm just going to hope you don't have the pulping to punish me for this. Oh, okay. This is a quite a wide Turn potentially. Wild Ride gained go again. That action point was used to activate Scabskin Leathers, which then gave Matt two action points. And Savage Feast will allow Matt to draw a card of, you know, to replace the discarded card. I think he would have liked to have ended mm -hmm. here with that swing big that ended up getting discarded, but mm -hmm. you're still sending another six power. You're still generating to that might token value uh, at times. And you might be able to bookend this turn with something. It might just be Claw, you know, but that's still pretty impressive. Wild Ride into Savage Feast into Claw. It's a good turn. Claw. <laughs> Get, getting an, a free action point out of nowhere, definitely a good turn, yes. I'd say so myself. Now, this claw actually does have go again uh, because a six has been discarded. That's true. Oh, so, yeah. my goodness. <laughs> another one. So I was going to say, maybe we see a cast bones as a bookend to this turn, but no, nah, Madro just says, here's another six damage. And put four yeah. attacks on a combat turn? <laughs> that should be illegal. Get his man cuffed. <laughs> Yep, very, very strong turn from Matt Rogers. They're definitely leaking some damage finally into Cody Williams, who's saying, uh, you know, Dynamos is really, really good, but you do need to keep cards to refresh it. You right. can't just put your whole hand down, and then you lose value on the Dynamos. You lose value because they're not sending damage. You lose Hatchet's value. So oftentimes, you know, to keep the to keep pace with the numbers game that Kira is doing, you kind of do have to take the damage, even when they do these sort of strong turns. This max of Blade Runner here. Uh, Cody with the ability to give his actions go again. Uh, yeah, it's a Blade Runner. Give his attacks go again in the reaction step. Blade Runner also buffs the next axe attack. Mm -hmm. So it's very efficient in this kind of shell. It's like, what, two damage here, and then the next axe will be three, so it's five, plus the three from red. Uh, two card, nine, because yep. you're refreshing your dynamo. Yuck! Yeah. <laughs> like, we spoke earlier when Cody had two blues, he was doing two card seven. Now you give him a red, and now it's a two card nine. Very, <laughs> very, very strong. Now, of course, on the KO side, we haven't seen a Blood Rush Bellow yet. And also, very important to point out, Cody was extremely vulnerable to a flashback right over there. Yes. Blade Runner... Has to be played on a reaction step. Flashback will get the card out of your hand before we get to reactions. Matt Rogers choosing not to use a flashback there, saying, you know what, fine, you can have a Blade Runner now. I will save it for later on when it's a little more critical. Maybe you're threatening that spill blood, as we were talking about earlier, maybe a Steel Blade Supremacy. He's being very disciplined with the use of a flashback here. And, you know, I mean, it just goes to show why he's out here on the 3-0 table. Dory is so susceptible to that flashback mm -hmm. uh, interrupting your turn. Uh, you really need, uh, you know, to link up those attacks, even on this sort of, this, this hatchet's build. But again, uh, you know, getting so much value for the cost of two cards is something that very few heroes in Flesh and Blood can do right now. And that's why you feel good about playing this into like a grindy mid-range matchup. Now, Matt, it never feels good to block a two power hatchet. A six power hatchet though, is one that you can block a little bit more elegantly uh, and not sort of lose out on value in doing so. And he'll do just that. Cast Bones put in front. Locking with a cast bone, saying, you know what, uh, it's a bit too much of a tempo loss for me to try and play that. I'm right now ahead on life. I can potentially match you in tempo. Or maybe he has another cast bones in hand. We'll have to see about that. That's the thing is, okay, no, it's going to be a bear fangs here, mm -hmm. getting the C and C off the top. So it's going to be coming in for nine if we had that might token. A lot of yellow bear fangs we've seen today. Even the wolf pack, you know, Michael Fung and Michael Hamilton, both of them, I believe, are sporting oh, these yellow. Yes, yeah, sporting these yellow bear fangs in their list. Now, you know, it is pretty. 
it is a good value proposition. It's eight damage, right? Seven might token makes a might token. Uh, at the same time, though, it doesn't block, and that can be really scary. You saw that kind of punish Michael Fung in his game against Katsu, and you know, to some extent, with his Dawn Blade during the, you get punished in this matchup. Too. Oh yes, yes. Um, but yeah, Matt Rose saying that. Yeah, this is definitely like, uh, this is different to what a Dawnblade Dorinthy would try and do in this matchup, which is just race. Uh, you, you probably just want to try and outscale. It's tough to beat her at that game, but KO does have the, the numbers in order to do that. So Cody keeps a three-carder, uh, which, is, which is interesting. It means we might have, you know, a go-again enabler, and then, you know, we can pocket a card for maybe a more powerful turn. But, but you are losing out on, on life here. You are leaking damage to these very efficient single attack actions that Matt Rogers is putting down at some point. You need to, you know, try and go up a gear. And that can be hard, actually, mm -hmm. for these, these Hatchets Dorinthia decks. They're very consistent, but they don't have the same peaks as some decks like KO, for example, uh, or Vizra, as we saw in that previous game here. It's a lot of the same. Your bread and butter, your Blade Runner to link your Hatchet attacks together, and maybe a pump at attack reaction speed. Mm-hmm. And the other thing about keeping a two-card there is that it insulates him somewhat for, against a flashback over there, because once again, he was vulnerable to it. You know, if Matt Rogers wanted to go for it, he, could, great point. Yeah. he could hit the 50-50 and get the go again out of there. But because you're holding two cards, most KOs will say, I don't want to play the 50-50, I'll just let you have it, and you can pocket that spill blood, I believe I saw on Cody's side over there. You know, we, we, we were talking about peaks and spiking turns from Durante and how most of the time, hatches list don't really spike. Spill blood is one of those cards that lets them spike. But Absolutely. I do have to point out, Spillblood in Arsenal is not exactly where you want it to be when your opponent's less flashback up. You typically want your reaction in Arsenal, your reaction gives you go again, so you know for a fact you can guarantee the go again. Yeah, t you know, taking the risk on losing that go again is big. Oh, this is a setup oh. play, if I've ever seen it. Take it on the chin. A new defensive card printed in heavy hitters that will prevent two damage, and if it does, it creates you an agility token. And in the hatchet deck that agility token can be worth anywhere from three to six or more damage it's go again without cody having to spend a card on it and yeah we have talked a lot about being insulated oh, from flashback God. take it on your chin best card to insulate you from flashback because i already have the agility i already have my go again i don't need my attack reaction arsenal i just I'm, I'm swinging twice this turn, both with Dominate. Your flashback is not going to stop me this turn. It's probably Cody's biggest turn here. Spillblood obviously giving plus two and Dominate to all of his axes until the end of the turn. And agility token means he already has go again, so this will be four Dominate. Now again, it's not efficient to play a Blade Runner here uh, because you already have that go again. If you dream of uh, you know attacking three times with axes and you would Dominate, that's very much a possibility. You want to maybe save that sort of a reaction speed go again plus pump for later down the chain. Mm -hmm. So something we you know, spoke about with the triple hit play is that you really want to have zero cost go against when you do that because then you can pay just one blue to swing all three hatchets. He has and, it. Yes, and he has. He has shift the tide of battle in hand. And I love that card for so many reasons in this matchup. Firstly, you get if you give your second hatchet go again, which means you can attack a third time, but you're likely going to make the agility as well, which is another zero cost go again on the following turn. Shift the tide of battle, massive upgrade for hatchets, Dory. It says you create an agility token every time I think you hit after that card. Now, it's ridiculous. <laughs> after one you just want the one agility token but that's great because mm -hmm. if matt's forced to give up cards here in seed tempo cody can keep layering the pressure on with these free go again effects we are trying to get in front though here apex bone breaker being given shift the tide of battle who the second <laughs> swing in the swing excuse mm -hmm. me which is a zero for three attack reaction speed card the requirement is that you have already attacked with a weapon this turn so on that second mm -hmm. swing as the name would indicate this is gas and we're not done we have go again, we have a guaranteed hit, and we have a tunic counter available. Yep, so there will be a third hit. Now, remember, Dorinthia's effect really only triggers once. It does say the first time your yes. weapon attack hits. So really, three is the maximum number of times Dorinthia can hit. But three times on the hatchets, you know, we spoke about the natural value you're getting from a hatchet, a plus one. You're, just, you're getting that twice in a turn and banking the agility for the following turn. This is an incredible spot for Cody because, again, the agility on the next turn means that he's not going to be uh, he, he's going to be insulated from the flashback. He doesn't need to go again from reaction yep. speed. What is this? A tw 17 damage dominate turn, I think. Uh, we had four, then seven, and then we have five, I think, to follow it up. So, yeah, yeah it'll be five. Six, yeah, Spillblood. Yeah. Yep, Spillblood. And that's a, you know, the benefit of Spillblood over something like uh, Steel Blade Supremacy. Steel Blade Supremacy, you do need to target one weapon. Yes, so it's, target it's not, weapon, that's yes, right. Yes, it's not both the axes get a plus two, it's just one of them, and you need that one to hit, so Durantia triggers on that one, so you can attack with that again. But Spillblood just says, no, nope, both the axes just plus two until end of turn. If you're going to swing thrice with it, you're, you just basically got a one cost plus six damage. Oh, that Rogers. 
Uh, obviously, a very celebrated and decorated player in his own right. Calling Sydney back in 2019, he took second. Then he was national champion in 2020 and 2022, respectively, coming second the year prior. New Zealand, as we know, is the cradle of flesh and blood. It's where the game first originated from, and many of its inhabitants are feared when it comes to this game. Recently, as well, some great results. Fourth calling Singapore, top eight at Baltimore and Auckland callings. Top eight at Nationals this year in, uh, in New Zealand. And 21st place at calling Barcelona. This guy always cashes one of, uh, I mean, I've heard him called Mr. Fab on a couple of mm -hmm. occasions. This guy, a big event, you can guarantee you'll see this gentleman in attendance. Mm -hmm. This is an incredible turn from Cody Williams there. And the, the beauty of that turn was not only was it a strong turn, he's also set up for the following turn. And, you know, you were looking at, token. Yeah, we're looking at life totals, and you know it might look like Matt Rogers is slightly ahead, but remember, Cody Williams still hasn't used any of those armor pieces, and critically hasn't popped Balance of Justice. We haven't seen a Blood Rush Bellows yet, but once we see it, the Balance of Justice is going to end up blocking, you know, two to five on that turn. So, oh, buddy. Cast Bones comes down, looking at the top six cards. And again, each time you find a six, you get a Might Token. If you have six or more Might Tokens upon resolution, you get an Agility Token. This is the way to take an off turn as KO. And Matt Rogers has got full value. Okay, so I honestly expected Cody Williams to take a bit more of a moment to look at those six cards and memorize them. Yeah. Uh, but I guess he's just incredibly is eidetic memory or something. He just looked at them and I was like, all right, no, it's cool. I got it. Um, I mean... But I do want to point out, that was a very, very good cast ones. I saw two blues in there and a Savage Feast and an E-Strike. Both those cards incredible when you have the agility because you can just pick, draw a card on the E-Strike or your Savage Feast just draws you a card. So just... And the perfect resources too. Two blues, four reds. That's kind of exactly what you want to see. You're very likely to draw at least one of those blues in these next four cards hand. And you know you're going to draw into one of the reds probably after you do your Easter Egg or Savage Feast. That was a very, very fortunate cast bonus from Matt Rogers. Cody Williams clocking in for another honest day of hatcheting. He's off to the <laughs> woods to try and cut down KO's habitat. Once more, we're representing a axe here that will likely be given go again. Ooh, okay. Uh, agility First. already oh, gave agility, it go again. Of course. Yep. <laughs> so, so we said the blade flurry in, which is uh -huh. going to give that extra plus two. And on the next attack, that plus two will be present as well. So big axe energy. So currently, no go again being presented. There was no hit and run in between. Uh, the first hatchet and this one, and also Cody Williams, because he used the resource on Braveforge bases, kind of telegraphing that he isn't going to give this hatchet go again yep. with, like, say, a Glint the Quicksilver or something. So Matt Rogers knows, likely, last uh, attack coming here. And once again, we see the reason why Cody, with a slightly more defensive list, more defense reactions, you give him the tempo, you draw a take it on a chin, and a defense reaction doesn't feel very, very good. I tend to feel that trying to play defensive against KO is, is a bad idea in most cases. Dory cannot play defensive and then present disruptive effects that ask for cards. She cannot force Kato to discard. She cannot f force him to do anything weird, block with equipment in a way he doesn't want to. She can only just show some numbers. And in a case like this where, you know, Matt Rogers' first attack next turn is going to get buffed by six and it will have go again naturally. Cody's holding on to six points of damage uh, of block in his hand virtually, but to take it on a chin and a sink below, I think, Mm -hmm. That's not enough. Three, I mean, three damage a block per card on average there is not going to protect you from the storm that's about to come. KO is winding up for a haymaker. Definitely. And Matt Rogers should, put, yeah, that's an E-Strike being blocked. And Reasonable. with the agility on the field, that tells us that he probably has a Savage Feast as the card draw, as the thing to pair with the agility, <laughs> the, the best card to pair with the agility. So hit for 12, we'll go again. Yeah. Draw, draw a card. <laughs> that is, that's, that is atrocious. All right, here we go. Matt Rogers. Ooh. It is time to unleash. The spirit bomb has been generated over the last couple of turns as the denizens of Earth have given their energy to New Zealand's favorite son. I mean, assuming that James White is the father in this situation. Otherwise, sorry, Matt, you're definitely coming second there, big fella. Okay, runner runner with an agility token in play means that, mm -hmm. hey, we're going to keep making them. Next turn, there'll be an agility ready to go too. Yep, and this is the other very good card to pair the agility tokens. We were talking about E-Strikes and Savage Feast. Well, runner runner, you know, Matt Rogers saying, you know what? My Savage Feast can go in Arsenal or something. Oh, I know I'm going to draw it maybe in the next uh, in the next two cards. The, I'll still have the agility guaranteed for that. So, you know, we can just catch, uh, catch the agility then and for now just roll it over. And this runner runner coming in for a whopping 12 damage. Yikes. Uh, so far, too, put it in front of that. Cody Williams is going to start to find his life total dwindling awfully quickly here. Mm -hmm. uh, and Just, yeah, being able to keep that agility token up. It's much like, you know, Cody was probably very happy with that shift the tide of battle to create an agility token. He also has taken on the chin, which will keep that possibility there. I think we just sunk a spill blood. Yes. 
uh, Sinker Spell, because I believe he doesn't have a blue in his hand. That's a yellow uh, Blade Runner. So, you know, he won't have, and the tunic is not up, so he won't have resources to swing both hatchets and pay for Spill Blood. So he's saying, all right, you know, let me just get rid of it. Let me just be disciplined. I know it's my spike card, but if I can't support it, I'm not going to try and force it, particularly not when my opponent just put 12 damage on the combat chain and has go again. We, I feel like we've had a chance to really see power turns from both players here. Matt Rogers, obviously, is far from done, but we probably saw like one of the more ideal setups that uh, Dorinthia can offer there from Cody. Mm -hmm. And Matt Rogers takes a tunic counter and sends a command and conquer against a player without an arsenal, so it's mm -hmm. obviously not the most exciting prospect here. But, you know, Cody, going gi to give a dynamo block here. Probably won't fully block this out because dynamos with the one block makes this less efficient. That's mm -hmm. that red Blade Runner being put in front. Take four, he says. And we spoke earlier about how, you know, putting a defense reaction in Arsenal can really insulate you against something like a pulping from the, from the KO side. But one fork that KO does put you into is that because they have all these Arsenal disruptive effects in the form of CNC, in the form Same of packing, packing yeah. you're kind of incentivized to get rid of Arsenal as soon as you can. And we've seen Cody do that. You know, he played that Fate Forsage from Arsenal earlier. He's playing the Taker and Chin on the first chain link this time, freeing up the Arsenal before the Arsenal disruption comes in. But that does leave him open to something like a pulping. So, you know, it's just that fork that KU puts you in and you just have to, you know, hope that it lines up the way you want it to. Cody Williams came pretty well out of that turn cycle, actually. Could have been a lot worse. 18 damage sent his way, which is definitely not the peak of what <laughs> KO can offer uh, on some of those sort of turns. But Matt obviously not trying to, you know, play any games with his, uh, with his scab skins at all. So he's another Blade Flurry again. I mean, Cody's getting that value once again. A nice big buff to take this axe up to four and give the next a buff too. Yep, and he's very quickly putting Matt Rogers in the position where Matt Rogers needs to block oh, and against a warrior. Oh, this is so good. <laughs> you do not want to be in the position where you have to block against warrior. All the reprise will be turned on and you have to play around attack reactions in a way that's very difficult, especially when they're dual wielding because they can just save the attack reaction for the other uh, hatchet swing instead of the first one that you block. So it is, it can be very scary once Matt gets the, that low life totals, but you were talking about peaks from KO and I just, I cannot stress enough that we still haven't seen a Blood Rush battle. That's right. Have not seen that card, a power card indeed. This story list, by the way, it's not new. Hatchet story has been around for a long, long time. But agility tokens have turned this from a pretty solid value deck into something that can really make a player's li eyes light up when they hear about the math that you can generate. <laughs> Here's that Savage Feast. Mm -hmm. The Savage Feast that we spoke about earlier that was, you know, revealed off the cast bones. Very, very prime attack to pair with the agility token. Now, very critically, he discarded the beast within of that Savage Feast, so he ended up drawing two cards from that. Mm. But critically, it wasn't actually two card draws in from a rule standpoint, which means Cody Williams' Balance of Justice he actually isn't that. turned on. Right point, yep. yeah. Because beast within just puts it into your hand. Savage Feast is one that says draw a card. So effectively getting two card draws, but not turning on balance. That is just the amazing turn. Yeah, Matt, Matt Rogers, Rogers so far. Uh, you know, really needs to make sure he differentiates drawing a card and putting a card in his hand. Um, you know, maybe put your hand back on top of your deck and then draw an extra card uh, than you had before. That's a great way. I'm kidding. There's no way of doing that. <laughs> but they are obviously very different game actions to take. And what are we peeking at here? Have a look at that beast with it. Yeah, he's yeah, probably he's checking. checking. <laughs> great call. Yeah, Cody is on the same wavelength as you here. Uh, We're just, following up with a wild ride. Just making sure the beast within doesn't say draw on it, knows that, you know, try and check where the balance is, you know. You've got to, you've got to take the card with your other hand, I think. That's how you can indicate <laughs> Reach across the table. Yep. <laughs> um, and now I do want to point out, you know, as we talk about this equipment, the headpieces, the balance of justice, the flashback is still on the field. Now, the past few turns, Cody has always had the agility. He had the, um, the shift the title battle make the agility. He had two back-to-back -back turns of take it on the chin. Both those turns, Matt Rogers didn't have a good flashback usage. But now, as we get to his low life totals, Cody Williams, without the agility token, you know, kind of vulnerable to that flashback. There is a Warrior's Valor, probably a blue, and a Blade Runner in hand here. So Cody can do the thing. But whether or not he can actually make something happen or really strike fear into the heart of Matt Rogers here is, is another question entirely. Claws coming in. I think he actually... Oh. So like he activates balance there. Yeah, it looked like he did activate... Oh, right, from the wild ride. Yes. It's not the beast within. Drawing discard, yep. yep. Yep, and that's one of the scary things, you know, that a lot of your brute cards just say draw discard. You're not... Going up in a card, but it does say draw a card Savage on beast. that. And wild ride, give it yep. to you there. So, yep. So yep. Cody Williams, you know, check the beast within. Says, "Oh man, I couldn't draw." Oh, but wait, you gave a wild ride, and what that does, it means he has two cards now. Once again, insulated from the flesh bag a little bit because Matt Rogers will have to go for the fifty-fifty to get rid of the go again, and so have a guarantee. A balance of justice doing quite a bit of work there, uh, insulating from the flesh bag. 
Uh, but also note that now he won't have it for the Blood Rush turn. Yes. Cody can't uh, play out both of these Blade Runners and, and attack as well. He just doesn't have the resources for it. But like you said, it's actually having some redundancy on a turn where mm -hmm. Matt might try and bounce off that flesh bag to, to gain a distinct tempo advantage. That is extremely heads up. Many people would just, oh, he's got it. Oh, man. He's going for the first like, Let me shuffle these both cards to the same. Bozo, which ones are going to be? <laughs> uh, I, do, I do love that, though. Cody, a lot of players would have blocked three mm -hmm. with that extra card that blocked that mm -hmm. more to maintain life total. But Cody understands just how detrimental <laughs> suffering the blade <laughs> Matt's like yeah I gotta you wait till he sees what the card he, he banished he'll be absolutely yeah. molding <laughs> anyway we've got two power here uh, Blade Runner's gonna confer plus two to the next attack and give go again here and Cody he cannot be evicted from Value Town because he is the freaking mayor mm -hmm. and he's wondering whether he wants to cash in the tuning for one extra damage oh no he can't because the first sword did, the first hatchet didn't That's right uh, but I did see him peak of the tuning there a little but yeah not uh, not available to activate Brave Forge Braces because, of course, it requires that you have hit with a weapon that turn. <laughs> Two card sevens for days, baby. That's all we do out here. You know, I, I love games like this where we, you know, we harp a lot on the discipline of both players of when they pop their headpiece. We're talking about how on a Blood Rush Bellows turn, Cody wants to pop that Balance of Justice. We see it popped on a, on a Savage Feast Wild Ride turn instead. And Matt Rogers said, you know, you want to use that flashback on a turn where you kind of cancel it, go again. He's taking what he thought was a 50-50. In fact, was actually a 0% chance because he has two oh, players. I on love his it. Head. I love and it. I just love once we get into these sort of positions. You know, even earlier today in the game between Michael Hamilton and Alan Lau, we saw Alan Lau use his flashback on a CNC instead of something like a Blood Rush Bellow um, on Mike, uh, uh, you know, against Michael Hamilton. And it just, just goes to show at this high level of play when both players are being incredibly disciplined with their equipment usage, sometimes you're down to a spot where you just need to use a flesh bag on a 50-50. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Get some value for it. Hope to, to find something there. Mm -hmm. I just think it's such an elegant way that Cody has navigated this situation. Favor Runaways, by the way, no slouches. These guys, uh, incredible team uh, of players. And now we get to play the post flashback, post balance of justice game. Just, just absolutely incredible. And at least for now, I think Cody is very, very slightly ahead. Remember, he's going to refresh the dynamos. He's putting, he's got five damage on the combat chain right now. Is going to Arsenal. Is going to have a, you know, a five card hand potentially in the following turn. So he's sitting quite pretty right now. We don't have a turn counter, so I can't really estimate the amount of value that's been accrued by Valiant Dynamos. But I'd put it <laughs> in the ballpark of. Six or yep. seven block value yep. when he's gained from that. Yep, I would say so as Which well. Which is normally mostly good equipment, gives you five value at best. <laughs> so that card has been absolutely bonkers. Here's eight and a lightning strike from Matt Rogers. Yep, I, I like to think of it as basically cancelling out a Chaos Hero ability. Yes, cancelling out the mind token generation. It's exactly. a great point. Just saying, no, you get plus one, I get plus one life. All right, cool, we're even. And now, can the rest of your cards match my cards? And I have hatchets, good sir. That's it. Mm -hmm. Does Matt have the gas here? Again, fatigue probably not on the cards here. Mm -hmm. uh, both both decks need to sort of leak some degree of damage to to do it themselves. Still by shunt here. Uh, again, we have a tunic counter up, so that could actually be. Is that a cracked bauble? Uh, I think I think it's a proxy for heart of uh, heart of finder, probably. right? Yeah, surely. <laughs> <laughs> what am I talking about? Uh, in this incredibly uh, defensive list, probably one. You know, <laughs> yeah. great bauble doesn't block, so you know, <laughs> it's not great. Yeah, a lot of defensive uh, cards. He actually gives up the power card here, the hit and run. You got, uh, I take it on the chin and a shunt in hand. Oh, sorry, Spores yes. of War. Mm -hmm. um, which, again, gives you that non-conditional go again. Um, so, odd to see that go here, but hey, we'll get a agility token. Mm -hmm. So, we don't need spoils, even though it has a nice little buff. Yeah, so this is one of those turns, which is actually quite a puzzle from a Durantia side. You want to make sure you get as much value as possible. If you just steal Blade Shunt and take it on a chin there, not only are you not getting Dynamo value, you're also going to stay at the same life total and not get Heart of Fandal value. Ah. So he's, he navigated a turn very, very well, saying, all right, I'll give him my Unconditional Go again, because I've taken on a chin anyway. I'm going to get my Dynamo value, go a little lower than you, get my Heart of Fandal value as well. And, you know, you spoke about him being the mayor of Value Town. This is why. This is why. He's saying, I get Heart of Fandal value, Valent Dynamo value and the offensive value from my hatchets. And again, this focus, we discussed it with Brian a little bit during the Michael Hamilton matchup. This is, you know, that incremental value advantage over a large number of turn cycles can, I mean, can deterministically, deterministically, excuse me, give you uh, that winning result you're looking for in many cases. Now, no buffs on these axes except the inherent one on Hatchet of Mind. So it's two, then it's three, but we have some and cards hanging around here still. Yeah, not paying into Brave Forge Braces basically telegraphs to Matt Rogers that there is that third hatchet is going to come in. Remember, it did hit. Dorinthia triggered on that first hatchet. It will be able we to... We know the again. Arsenal card. It's the <laughs> yep. redundant Blade Runner from the Fleshbag turn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, are going, <laughs> we are going wide, folks.
Yep, it's going to be Blade Runner with Tunic into the hatchet and then get to Arsenal last card, which I believe is a Steel Blade shunt. And, you know, there's a nice parallel story going on here. We spoke about the Might tokens and the Valent Dynamo. There's also a parallel story on dealing damage on your opponent's turn in the form of Steel Blade shunt from the Dorinthia side and Reckless Swing from the Brute ah, side. So you have right. to, you know, both players are thinking about that. Matt Rogers has seen uh, Steel Blade shunt from Cody Williams, and Cody Williams obviously knows there's some Reckless Swings in Matt Rogers' list as well. So we attacked two, three, then... Now, that should, should be four, four, I believe. Uh, looks like... Hmm? It should be four because of the hatchet and the blue Blade Runner. Looks like potentially missed there by Cody Williams over here. Uh, yeah. And of course, this is... Uh, we are watching a replay. Remember that this is the, <laughs> the backup match. Can you believe that, Uber? This is the backup match. We already... We already went through a game earlier, the Visrai Dromai game. This is a back. I completely forgot. Hey, we, we are buying time for the draft set up right now. That's what we're doing. I, and I am, I'm, I, I am happy that a pig covered in poop right now. I'm not gonna lie to you, folks. It is. This is exactly where I want to be. Yeah, I mean, look, Hatchet of Body says whenever you attack with this, if Hatchet of Mind was the last attack this turn. Uh, the Hatch of the Body gets plus one to end of turn, by the yes. way, remains. So this should be coming in for four. Looks like it was a bit missed, but again, we are watching a replay, so we are unable to try yeah. and fix the board state. Uh, let's just hope that this does. Yeah, oh, oh, oh there guy. we go. Let's go. <laughs> uh, yes, we spoke and we time traveled back. Actually. He almost lost the election for mayor of Value Town. He almost got <laughs> usurped there, but he has managed to hold on by really, uh, you know, playing to his biggest constituents. That's us, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and we yep. have decided to, uh, you know, as the power of the people to to put him back in that position. So, yeah. big four here. Looks like Ethan managed to fix the time travel machine, go back and fix the board seat I for us. <laughs> I love that. Really amazing. But Cody Williams, I mean, he first surfaced uh, with a third place finish at Nationals USA in 2021. So this guy, I mean, he knows his way around uh, our flesh and blood game. That's for sure. Very experienced, very hardworking player. Very much so. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, second and a half. And yeah, I think we, we talked about that sort of earlier on here. So this guy, he, he gets it around. I mean, we talk a lot about West Coast. I'm here on the West Coast. We, we have a lot of players we really like. But East Coast is, who might, might be a different story. Uh, those guys are on another level. Yep. And Matt Rogers, you know, quickly approaching that scary point against Warrior. Five life means that, you know, any three power attack reaction on an unblocked hatchet is going to be, you know, just yeah, you straight kill you yep. unless you have the defense reaction. And here we see why he chose that risky line. He's finally got a Blood Rush battle resolved. Okay. There's block value here in Brave Forge Braces, Final Spring Tunic, and Valiant Dynamo. Three block value at this late stage of the game is pretty darn good. It's a whole card's oh. worth. And double oh. blood rush. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. We are going to be drawing so many cards here. Mm-hmm. And Cody Williams is saying, oh no, I popped my balance already. I have no balance. I need some balance on this turn. Oh. You just resolved two oh. blood rushes. Okay, all of the brute attacks from Matt Rogers are getting plus four this turn. Mm. The Blood Rush Bellows all have go again because we're discarding sixes. Uh, that is absolutely terrifying. Matt Rogers now, off a smaller hand, having blocked a little bit, how wide can you go with this plus four buff? I think more than one attack and you are <laughs> doing devastating things. Let's start with a claw here for a casual seven. And I believe that's two cards remaining in Matt Rogers' hand. Uh, is that two? I can't tell if it's like stacked up together. I think if my math is right, it should be two cards. Let's see. Um, but you know, my math could totally be wrong. Uh, it looks like he's flicking cards. Yeah, so it is two. Uh, which means he could represent, you know, if he has a go again attack somewhere. Ooh, danger. Mm -hmm. Still Blade Shun is something you mentioned. If it yep. blocks a weapon attack, deal one damage to the attacking player. Yep. Could he getting full value from a Steel Blade Shun? Not something that happens very often. Right. Oftentimes the claws going to come in for three or That's five. Seven one value defense reaction. Exactly. Oh, and Matt Rogers didn't have the go again attack there. Just coming up. Riled up. Riled up. Getting plus one because a six has been discarded this turn. Getting plus four from a Blood Rush as well. He's, you know, we have to call out a bit of the discipline there. Um, oh, no. He, he couldn't have gone three wide anyway, unless. Yeah, yeah, no, he didn't have the cards. Be, yeah, he just didn't have the cards. So just coming up blue, riled up. Cody Williams catching a bit of a break from this double blood rush turn. Still by chunt. My favorite moment is playing that off a tunic counter into a weapon attack where it's mm -hmm. covering everything into Anathos, my preferred, because, mm -hmm. you know, Guardians, you can suck one. Uh, <laughs> he, 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 seven. Seven damage off a tunic counter. So one card seven is really nice. Mm -hmm. uh, this riled up coming in for. 10, I believe, uh, 6 from its own effect, and then plus 4 from the Blood Rush Bellows. Uh, Cody Williams, you know, debating whether to put a tunic. And I remember, you know, he looks like he's at 8, but really against a deck with Reckless Swing, you're actually at 6. six. Yeah. <laughs> so Cody Williams definitely does not want to yeah, go down you to have the to threshold. You have to treat 2 life like 0, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's one of the things that you only really learn once you're on the receiving end of it. Mm -hmm. uh, learning Flesh and Blood and picking it up here. So Cody, 
yeah, might have to be just a touch more conservative than, than we'd otherwise see here. We've got, what, one, two, three, four, five blocking this 10 power attack. So go to three. <laughs> go to three. Just exactly one above the reckless swing range. Okay. I like that. Yep. And keeping two cards, we know what this is going to be. It just depends what they go against Source is. If it's once again, you know, something like a hit and run as a go against Source, that's not, that's not too bad for Matt Rogers to deal with. But if it's that Blade Runner, he gets, you know, the two, two damage hatchet into six damage hatchet. And, uh, is that an Overpower? Oh, he's oh, big. Okay. But yeah. knowing that that card exists and how many copies of Overpower in their deck, that is the kind of card that can put you over the top in a big way. And that is a red mm. hit and run getting used pre attack. So you lose that plus three that you would otherwise have on it. But hey, we need that go again. Yep. And remember, because of the two floating, if the first hatchet hits, that means Cody can actually activate Braveforge and send the second hatchet. So really, if Matt Rogers, you know, blocks two, and he was posturing blocking with Tunic and the Bonebreaker there, just to stop the extra one damage, you effectively get three points of value because you prevent a Braveforge Braces yeah. uh, uh, activation as well. Yeah, it's plenty to be had here. Yeah. Matt Rogers, honestly, probably feeling quite quite decent right yeah. now because Cody Williams effectively is at one. <laughs> Matt Rogers here. Probably can speculate there's some number of still bad shunts lurking in this deck. Very unlikely there are yellow copies yeah. uh, in this deck. That is, like, If you see someone pitch a yellow shunt, mm -hmm. they, they probably are sociopaths. Yeah. Uh, you know, and just, <laughs> just, I mean, probably the only person that would do that not that he's a sociopath. Charles Dunn would do that, but I know oh, yep, yep. you know what you're getting with Charles. Yep. He's there for uh, a long time. Not well, a good I mean, time. he'll flip up Decimator Axe into you anyway. So, yep. yeah, so, so Yellow Shuns makes a lot of sense. I, you know. I, you know, I, I let him have it because he's national champion. Oh, uh, looks like Matt Rogers did let that first hatchet okay. uh, come in, which means he, you know, the Braveforge does get activated. But, and here we see why. He's saying, I'm going to block four on your next hatchet anyway, but I'm going to get the one value back on my Bonebreaker because of the Might Token. And the Clash and of Agility is one as well. Into Warrior, these Clash cards do so much work. They have so few attacks. I don't believe we've seen a single attack from Cody Williams' deck so far. So, you know, like, <laughs> Matt Rogers needs to reveal an attack from his, which he has, you know, a plethora of. Absolutely. And that's a free Agility with two Might Tokens. Matt Rogers feeling pretty good right now. Here it is, Enlightened Strike to start the chain with an agility. Oh, that's seven go again. Yeah, and I and I missed what he revealed. And this is the the really good um, uh, sort of synergy between your clash cards and your draw oh, cards. Oh, it's so big! Because you know what you're going to draw with the E Strike. But it looks like Matt Rogers, because of that, says, you know what? I don't want the card I revealed. I know what it was, uh, what it is. I don't really want it. I'm just going to pick plus two on this E Strike and then just send as much damage to you as possible. Put you in the reckless swing range if I can. You're going to be there anyway. This is a six power Clash of Agility coming up after. Uh, that one here. So Valiant Box for one. Sigil okay is great here. You're still going to yep. take a little bit of damage here. This looks like it's coming in for, yeah, I take it. You do reckless swing range achieved. So Both players, frankly, teetering on the edge, but Matt's got to feel a damn sight more comfortable here. We have stressed a lot about Reckless Swing. Does he even have um, it? Well, no, it's not what he has it. We just saw a Sigil being played from Cody Williams, a card very, very good into Reckless Swing, because you're on the root side thinking, oh, I've got them. I've got the Reckless. This is it. This is game over. And they respond with a Sigil of Solace. And now, you tear your hand apart to some degree to get that Reckless out, right? Exactly. And take it on the chin as well can be a really, really funny just way to respond up. to Reckless Swing. But I believe we have seen all three from Cody Williams already. So, you know, that won't be available. But the Sigil of Solace, though, we have not seen three of those. Overpower in hand here for Cody. If he gets a chance to use that, it represents a blowout mm -hmm. uh, for Matt Rogers. But first, we have to figure out what happens with this potentially wide turn as it's Wild Ride to start with. And Cody's wants now, the agency. He wants to decide which card gets discarded to this. Now, here's the thing. We haven't seen all the Blood Rushes or all the Cast Bones. You know, these Wild Rides aren't 100% guaranteed hits unless, of course, Matt Rogers on fewer Blood Rushes and Cast Bones. If you've seen the three and three, it's not guaranteed hits, but it's a pretty, pretty good chance. Cody at one, so has to mm -hmm. give two cards for each of these. The Might Token makes this yellow Wild Ride a red one. Oh, and coming in with the Claw as well. That is this diabolical. He's got two floating still as well. Yeah, we I don't think you get out of this in one piece. We could be looking at the beginning of the Ooh. end, and that's another six damage. Looks like that's game. Very well played for Matt Rogers. Can go just wide enough here to send a Claw in that would be lethal and then have a six power attack. Beautiful showing here from your multiple time New Zealand national champion up against our second place from calling heart for Cody Williams. What a banger of a backup match. And we got to see two decks that care so much about generating great value from the cards that they keep and also offer some up on block. 
That was a fascinating game. I really enjoyed that. Masterful play from both those players. As you spoke about, there's a lot of grindy. The early turns were a lot grindy, but we saw spike turns from both players. That massive spill blood turn from Cody Williams, the massive cast bones turns from Matt Rogers. And it was just a beautiful, it's so beautiful to watch that you have these grindy games, but there's also spikiness within them and also the equipment usage. I just, I'm blown away by the discipline and the skill involved in the, in the equipment usage in that game. That's the level of gameplay that we are used to, we're being treated to, we're going to get more of over the course of this weekend. Draft is underway. Uh, we are going to be covering that for you guys in just a moment. We'll also have your standings after four rounds of classic constructed play during the break. So bear with us. Give us some time to prepare all of that stuff. We're going to go to a break here, catch our breath after the mayor of Value Town ultimately was ousted by the foreign interloper. And we'll be back with more of your Pro Tour Los Angeles as we head into the heavy hitters draft rounds right after the break.
Welcome back, everybody, to Pro Tour Los Angeles. The draft is underway. Some of the best players in the world are, believe it or not, in the feature match area, getting recorded, getting ready for you all to take a look at the draft. Not post-draft, but pre-draft. We are going to be able to watch the draft right after it transpires and take a look at the deck construction of one of the players in our featured pod before, featuring them throughout the draft round, something that I know everybody's been excited about, everybody has been yearning for, me included, my friends, and I'm so excited to announce we get to show it today. It, How are you feeling about that? How are you feeling about the day? I'm feeling so good that we finally get to watch these top players draft at a high level and that like this. You know, it has been, as you said, it's been demanded by the community for a long time. We <laughs> want to see you know the top players the you know the podcast we listen we want to see those players actually drafted out in a high stakes level event and we finally get to show it i am so hyped to see how the players draft and navigate this format I, I've, I've mentioned this a couple times to to friends throughout the weekend, but one of my first times personally ever watching a flood and blood, flesh and blood event was a Tales of Aria limited calling. And I remember asking in the chat, like, can we watch the draft next time? <laughs> and then they showed it, the, the next uh, limited calling that we got to watch. And I just sat enraptured staring at the screen because I was still pretty new. And I was very aware that I was getting to watch some of the best players in the world at their craft show me what it what it means to draft at a high level and we're going to be able to watch that with all of you and our our featured draft player let me just tell you has some very recent high level limited accolades so we will we'll get into that in a little bit i don't want i will slow the roll a little bit but someone who's done very well at a recent limited event will be uh recorded for all of our enjoyment in a wow. moment you're keeping it from me too. Even I don't know that as well. Okay, I'm Live I'm in suspense. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, in suspense. Uh, yeah, don't don't spoil me either. I want to be surprised along with the viewers uh, for that. And as for the rest of the day, I mean, the CC rounds were such a blast to watch. Just the fact that we got to watch two round, uh, two games per round as well, and each one of those rounds were absolute bangers. It was just so good to watch. Two for the price of one. We have an agility token on the stream, folks. We're getting an extra action point whenever we want it. It's, it's thanks to our incredible friends over here in the coverage booth. And, and just from the game's perspective, I mean, it has just been immaculate is that is that is that is that too expressive i feel no i don't think so i feel that's extremely appropriate yeah i mean the 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 breadth of heroes we've gotten to watch the the exacting nature of the gameplay and the just the high level of everything i mean listen ko and dromai very clearly the most represented mm -hmm. but those dorinthia decks are out there absolutely popping off and let me tell you when you look at the cc heroes at the top of the standings it is certainly not just a bunch of ko and dromai mm -hmm. and as you know more than just the heroes i think you know gem has kind of favored us quite a bit for the, you know, the viewers watching at home in the coverage team because it's also given us amazing players to watch. We saw Michael Hamilton and Alan Lau in round three of Swiss. We Come saw on. Against each other. Round four of Swiss, we saw Cody Williams, Matt Rogers, all these big names just playing off against each other in the early rounds of Swiss. I mean, not only has Gem favored us, but also just goes to show the, how stacked the field is here, Sam. Oh my gosh. I mean, that personally, that is what I am feeling as, mm -hmm. as a broadcaster and just as a fan. This, this <laughs> feels like such a treat. Every mm -hmm. game that is being presented, I'm just like, it's a, it's a veritable who's who of talent. We were looking at the standings, talking to our producer over there, Ethan, and we were remarking that it's, it's hard to find a screen where you don't recognize a number of incredibly talented names. Flesh and blood, as the game continues to grow, we get to continue to follow these incredible players as their narrative grows, as, say, their legend grows and now here at the pro tour legends abound absolutely and you know alongside that the diversity of heroes as well you know we spoke about how dromai is kind of the second most represented i mean we saw that dromai is the second most represented but we only watch one dromai game so far just because she might be the second most represented but there's so many heroes she's just, even though she's the second most represented it's just a small sliver of the pie chart. There's yeah. so many. There's the Dorinthias, there's the katsus there's the kanos the azaleas all just vying for the seat of dominance that's <sighs> <Such> incredible. <laughs> 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 all right. All eyes now turn to draft. This is one of my favorite things about these high level tournaments is we have two different, incredibly different expressions of skill that these players are asked to present to the world. We have to ask them, do you got it? And do you got it in CC? And do you got it in limited? We are going to get ready to watch the draft of these incredible players and then watch the three rounds of the incredibly skill expresses and, and, and in some ways somewhat vo volatile high-level draft format. But mm -hmm. before we get into it, let's go ahead and hear from some of the creators of the games themselves. Let's go ahead and get some tips and tricks on pack one, pick ones from the devs over at Legend Story Studios before the pros get into their draft. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> 
Hello friends, Brian Gottlieb here coming to you from Legend Story Studios down in Auckland. Our beautiful new-ish studio, still only a few months old. We're moving in, we're getting comfortable and we're bringing you the hottest content around including some pack one, pick one from our latest set, Heavy Hitters. If you've been in your store, your local game store, playing RTNs, playing Armories, you know this set is awesome for limited. You're out there having a great time just like I have been. And we wanna give you a few tips and tricks if you're looking to succeed. And let's not forget about our players heading out to the Pro Tour. Of course, Pro Tour LA just around the corner. They're going to be there. They're going to be battling. They're going to be playing Heavy Hitters Draft. They're also going to be using this beautiful Grandra Valahai play mat. That is, of course, the player's play mat for the Pro Tour. You're seeing it for the first time on display here. But let's get into the action. Let's do a little pack one, pick one here. Of course, this represents us just starting off our draft, figuring out how things are going to go, and making that very first pick that's going to kind of set the tone for how we're going to go ahead and do everything else. So we'll get our tokens out of the way here, and then we'll break things down by class, warrior, Brute, Guardian, of course, the three classes and heavy hitters. We'll get our hybrid cards separated out of the way. Equipment pulled aside, generics, more hybrid, and then we have more hybrid in our foil slot. So a pretty thin pack as far as equipment goes here. I do see a nice rare option here that allows us to stay very open. Of course, three for seven is critical in this format. Wage gold used very effectively by quite a few heroes. Moving on to our hybrid classes. Again, just kind of starting with things that leave us a little bit more open before we commit to a single class. We're seeing things, uh, you know, good options here. Batter not broken, a nice prevention effect. Very good at combating that out of nowhere damage that war Warrior is capable of creating and you get that my token as well so bolsters the offensive output of your next turn rising energy a solid glue card I'm not really considering first picking it most of the time but I am happy to have it in my decks so I think the open options are okay I love to stay open when it comes to heavy hitters draft however two really really powerful options here in the class section we have agile engagement and assault and battery available to us uh, warrior attack reaction brute attack and both of these critically capable of producing agility agility so so important for extending turns in this format getting wide and absolutely maximizing your damage output choosing between these two cards always tough it's it's a really really close pick for me but i am going to hone in on these two as my options and i honestly think you can do this one on personal preference if you're a warrior stand go ahead and take the agile engagement get ready to play some olympia get ready to play some kasai if you're a brute person assault and battery you really can't go wrong with a 3-7 especially one with a lot of upside me personally i'm a brute guy i'm gonna go assault and battery as my pack one pick one for this very first pack What's up, guys? It's Callum. Uh, we're going to get into a little pack one, pick one, and ooh. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Uh, okay, this pack is stacked. This is sweet. So, some very good cards in a lot of different directions here. Obviously, I'm a huge fan of making agility tokens in this format. Assault and Battery is one of my favorite cards. If I'm gonna go, uh, this is a real premium common. Uh, however, oh, Warrior is probably my favorite class to draft and Agile Engagement, another incredibly high pick card. Wage Gold's interesting because it allows you to stay open. This new universal keyword's very sweet there. And just the three for seven with the, the gold wager. Gold's obviously very important in this format and a lot of strategies. But then there's this, this, this is this so, the thing is, this goes into Brute and Guardian, so you're leaving yourself somewhat open. And it is really nice against these attack reacts. Um, let's just have a little quick look at the rest of the pack. There's a nice little Rising Energy is also very good. Lead with speed even. Yeah, there's some good uh, sort of warrior cards. I'd be tempted to take this and ship the rest. The thing is, this this is one of the few ways of, of getting a sort of pseudo defense reaction and it uh, creates a little might token. Oh, it's very tempting. Hmm. You know what? I think I gotta stay open. I think I'm gonna go wage gold. Three for seven, stay open, ship this really good pack to my left, see what comes. Hopefully, yeah, can go any direction. Hey guys, it's Jason, Jason Lai, the superior one, and we'll just jump straight into it. Uh, first, we'll split off our class cards and our hybrid cards, and then we'll just put the yellows and blues down at the bottom. Glory Seeker, not really a priority pick for equipment. So here we're looking at 
seeing if we want to stay open or if we want to send a signal and take a class card. These yellow cards are probably not making the cut. Lead with speed is normally very premium, but in a pack like this, you kind of just want to take a very good card to set the tone for your deck. We can essentially stay semi-open by either taking a hybrid card or by taking wage gold. In this pack in particular, we probably don't have to stay very open. We can probably send these over to our left and just take Agile Engagement. It doesn't really seem to be a good warrior card in the pack and you can send a very clear signal and also this is just one of the best warrior cards in my opinion. So we'll send these over to our left to the next player and we'll take Agile Engagement. I would first pick Assault and Battery. Assault and Battery. So we're gonna put Assault and Battery. I'm gonna go for Wage Gold in this one. Take the Wage Gold. Pick one, pack one. Agile Engagement read. Agile Engagement. Hey guys, it's your boy, Jacob Pearson. I'm here with pack two, so let's see what's good. Test of Vigor, fine card. A red engaged swift blade. Red beast mode, ah, it's not my favorite red. We see there's, there's a stand ground there for Guardian. Some decent blue Guardian cards. So the first thing that strikes me out of this pack is that there's no like really, really like hunky-dory like slam pick. Test of Vigor is good in Guardian. Warrior, yeah, it's still a block four, but a lot of the time as Warrior, you're gonna be losing the clashes, at least if you're choosing to play Kasai. Sometimes Olympia can uh, be a bit more on the attack heavy side of things, and maybe sometimes you win the clashes, but it's not really that reliable. And giving your opponent a Vega token can be quite detrimental as well. And the only other like power card in this pack is really this red engaged swift blade. Everything else here is, is pretty mid tier. Staying ground is really solid equipment. All these dual token equipment are really, really good in the format. Um, just being able to get three points of value sometimes over the course of the game. In fact, if I take these early, I'm really looking at getting the token generators, the, the blues in the format that defend for two and make one of each of your classes respective token. They're really, really good to combo with these. It's very good to pay attention to how many that you have in your deck. And oftentimes you can get them pretty late in packs, um, Especially if you're looking at the Guardian one. So yeah, not a lot to say about this pack. Not really sending many signals to the left either, no matter what we do. Um, there's probably likely to be a Guardian to our left. Staying ground, we see some decent Guardian block threes. So, and obviously this, this test of Vigor here. So I think I like taking the Warrior card, passing along a reasonable Brute card, some reasonable Guardians, and it seems like a pretty safe lane if we go down taking the strongest card in the pack, which in fact is Engage Swift Blade Red. So that's gonna be my my pick one, pack one. Hey guys, Anthony, I'm one of the game devs here for pack one, pick one for heavy hitters. We're having a look at the packs. I think picking the Guardian equipment for me is probably gonna be like my pick because it's good in both Guardians and Temper 2 is very strong in this format, especially with a lot of two blocks and yeah. Hey, it's Jason here and we're with another pack and we are going to see what the better cards are. Here is a, a sample of a pack where there is just no really good brute card. You can put the pound town and force KO, but unless I missed something, I don't think that is a very good idea. So here I would actually pick the test of vigor and see if I will go Guardian Warrior depending on what I get past. I would take the test here. We're definitely taking engaged with blade here. We're just gonna take the stand ground here. I might just stay very open and think lunging press. Swift blade here. I will go with engaged swift blade. Engage swift blade for my pick. Hi everyone, it's Carol. All right, let's have a look at pack three. Some great equipment straight off the bat. Command respect is a great uh, guardian card. We've got pound town. Pack call for Brute. Holden, this is a great card for Olympia. It's got the wager. Rising energy is okay. I think here we can, depending on, on the mood, I think out of these, I think the Command Respect and Pound Town are just a little bit stronger. But we do have this great equipment. I love a three for seven, so I'm just gonna lock in. Ah, oh, but the equipment is so powerful. Actually, I'm gonna pick a gauntlet of mine. This card is just great, and it still keeps us a little bit open, and we can get the person next to us to make the hard decisions of what they wanna pick out of these four, probably. All right, it's your boy Tom, back at it again with another pack one, pack one, pack three, heavy hitters booster draft. All right, so gauntlet of might is pretty good. First pick, Vigor Girth as well. It's good to get your draft started for some equipment, so we might go for one of those. Pound Town, Command Respect, decent picks here. But we're probably looking to take a piece of equipment here. 
Vega lane or the Might lane. Personally, I do want to be Warrior if I have my pick. We might be having a bit of a competition for the Warrior in pack two, but I think we'll just take the risk and go for the Vega girth here. Pack one, pack one. Hey guys, Rohan here for pack three. Let's jump into it. These equipments are really good. We have two of them here. Pound Town, if this was the other one, I'd really be looking at it, Agility's Clutch, but less so for Might, even though it's still decent for this pack. I am going to go with Gauntlet of Might. Pack one, pick one. So I'll play Gauntlet of Might. Gauntlet of Might. Gauntlet of Might is my selection. We're gonna go for the raw numbers. Pound Town gives you two Might tokens, very good. Rising Energy is my pack one, pick one. Holden, it's gonna be my pick one. I think that's gonna be my pack one, pick one. All right, friends, that is pack one, pick one. Let us know down in the comments below if you agreed with our picks. If you could do better than the devs, you tell us why. Can't wait to see you out there in your LGSs at Pro Tour LA drafting heavy hitters.
Welcome back to the Pro Tour, everybody. <laughs> we are getting ready for the draft rounds, but before we take a look at the draft, I think it's time that we take a look back at the CC standings and take a look at just what, what is the picture of the competitive landscape headed into this draft. Let's take a look at these players who are going to be setting themselves up to go on to day two, depending on how this draft can go. So we're going to look through these standings. We take a look at some of these players who had a tougher start to their day before we move on to that coveted 4-0 slot. And let's take a look at the heroes that are moving on to these draft rounds. Look at this. Ryan Rich. Azalea? Yep. Ryan Rich all the way at the top. Spearheading, you know, the standings on Bolton of all heroes. And just right there, we saw... Such a wide range of heroes. Bolton, Azalea, Dromai, Chaos. There was a Vistrai up there too. Jordan with the Nebula Blade Vistrai yeah. we saw on stream. 4-0. 4-0 right now. Yeah, let's take, so we can look here. You see Michael Hamilton right there. 3-1, Justin Koo. We saw him take that, mm -hmm. you know, get blown up by Kano. But clearly <laughs> the rest of, the games, rest of his games have gone quite well. Looking yeah. at this screen, Ben Hannon, name that I see. Zane Johnson as well. Two incredible American players. Charles Dunn as well with Michael Dalton on. I think a very similar mm -hmm. uh, Dory list as well as Josh Lau. Let's take a look at all of these three ones. We can see Michael Fung up there with Rihanna Legrau. She's a, a local mm -hmm. player to me. I want to shout out Chu Heng as well, my fellow Singaporean. Out Tark, there, 3-1 on let's Kano. Go. Yeah. Tark Patel and Pablo Pintor. Pablo Pintor 3-1 mm -hmm. on Reinar, which is mm -hmm. fantastic to see. Roger Bode, you can see there on the right part of your screen. 2-2 after the CC rounds, as well as Easton Douglas, our world's semi-finalist. Taking a look at this screen here. These are all the players at 2-2 two and two Rhea after Adams the CC rounds. Uh, currently a 2-2. Two -two. We saw her have a rough game into Levaya and potentially probably another rough game some other, uh, at some other point in the CC. Mara Ferris as well. Two points on the Dromai, the Queen of Dragons. Currently doing 2-2. Two, two. Yuki Lee Bender as well. 2-2 two, two on KO. This deck, it giveth. This deck taketh away. You can see Thomas Dowling, our calling mm. Sydney uh, finalist, who went ahead and was not able to bring uh, yep. Dash IO to this tournament, it looks like. Guy Cohen as well. We saw just now on the screen. 2-2. Two, two. Gordon Coves, fell another fellow Singapore, and also at 2-2. Two, two. Zach Bunn, 2-2 two, two on Viserai. Of yep. course, we know how much he loves that deck. Take a look at the right side of your screen there. Brody Spurlock doing his best Pablo Pintor impression, trying to take a 2-2 two, mm -hmm. two start to the CC rounds and turn that into a top 8. And then now these are the players having a little bit of a tough First start to the day at one and three. It's going to be pretty challenging to make your way into the top eight if you start the tournament at one and three. But listen, mm -hmm. if there's one thing I'm never going to do, <laughs> it's learn how the breakers work. I'm going to leave that <laughs> to everybody else. So maybe mm -hmm. all of these people are going to be, maybe this is your top eight right here. Mm -hmm. Nathan Crawford, Alexander Vora as well, moving through on these slides in the one three bracket. Uh, you know, still definitely live to make day two. Top eight would be a little tougher. Majin Bay as well in the one three bracket. Let's see how they do. I saw Sasha Mar Markovic as well in the one three. How would, he was in Kano. Sorry, he was in KO rather than Kano. Yeah, a lot of brutes here at the bottom because a lot of brutes at the top. That's what mm -hmm. happens when you're one of the most represented heroes and one of the most represented classes here at the tournament. And what a CC landscape we have got before us. I mean, the mm -hmm. diversity we've been... I'm feeling a bit like a broken record at this point, but yeah. that's because when you look at the last couple of years of Flesh and Blood, what we have before us here is just incredibly exciting from a competitive landscape and from a viewership perspective. There are way too many heroes on that starting screen with the 4-0 people for me to <laughs> even like list them all down before you know I change slides. I, I saw an Azalea, a Bolton, a KO, a Dromai. Yeah. That's pretty good. I know there's a Viserai in there, yeah. and a Reinar as well, so it's, 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 it's way too many. Yeah, a Reinar 4-0, a Viserai 4-0, two, two Boltons, I think, 4-0. Mm -hmm. um, this is an incredibly exciting time to be a Flesh and Blood fan. And now, let's just start to talk about draft. We simply have to. It's time, folks. We're getting ready to watch the draft rounds, and I think maybe it's time. I reveal to you, I reveal to the world, who we're going to be following here in this draft, and it is... Francesco Giorgio, who is oh. the reigning champion from Calling Liverpool, which, if you cast your mind back, was heavy, him heavy hitters limited. So a SEAL champion and a draft champion who we now get the pleasure of watching navigate an, a similar high-stakes draft here at the Pro Tour. Who's also 4-0 in CC right now as well. That cannot be understated. It's going to be such a treat to watch him both navigate the draft portion and watch him play the games because we are going to try and follow him as much as we can through the dark through the draft games. And let's go ahead and follow him as he begins to draft, folks. It's time to check out the draft that just transpired here at the Pro Tour Los Angeles. The players are developing and registering their deck lists. And so now it's time for us to see what our featured drafter and featured player, Francesco Giorgio, 
reigning calling Liverpool limited heavy hitters champion. Let's see exactly how he navigates the draft before us. This is just such a treat. Mm -hmm. And opening up these, you know, fancy Legend Story Studios envelopes, <laughs> and you know those cards are stamped. And it's also you know, it's a little bit of a collectible piece going on. You know, people are like, oh, I need that stamped foil piece from the draft uh, out here in Los Angeles. And it's just going to be so exciting to see how he navigates this. So let's take a look at the pack here. See a Golden Sun immediately. See a Red Agile Windup, a Red Wild Ride, some very powerful Brute and Hybrid cards that do work in Brute and Warrior as well. But that Golden Sun can't be overstated the evasive damage and limited and also the red test of strength as well now th this is a bit of a pickle because you see red test of strength and golden sun both very good cards in victor but you can't take both obviously so you take one and you send the other down and that could potentially be a bit of a signal for someone else going to victor and then now you're you know you're a little sad because you want to be in victor too if you pick up the golden sun so, yeah you pick up the golden sun you pass a test of strength to your left and perhaps you create a victor right there as they say oh great a test of strength this will help make me a gold and then all of a yep. sudden pack two you're being passed a lot of cards where guardians cards might be missing but with those nice powerful the wild ride the agile wind up as well that could send a different kind of signal in the agile wind up it is a dual class card it is a big seven power attack yes it only blocks two but interestingly in a format that a lot of people say really matters how many three blocks you can draft francesco giorgio who we know knows what he's doing taking a two block to start off this draft. Yeah, I think one thing that uh, was a bit tough for him to do was take a pick while also, you know, sending a signal that, you know, that lane isn't very open. If you pick the Golden Sun, you send Test of Strength. You know, Test of Strength actually, you know, can go into many decks. It doesn't necessarily a Victor signal, but it can push someone into it. And if you take the Yellow Wild Ride and you send a Wind Up, well, that could push someone else into Brute. So, you know, you pick the Wind Up and now you're open into both Brute and potentially Warrior because that previous pack wasn't very strong for Warrior. So maybe you could say, oh, maybe I, you know, go into Warrior a little bit, and I won't be making Warriors down the line for me because that pack wasn't amazing for Warrior. Now, taking a look here, he's already taken an Agile wind-up. So now the question is, how often do you want to try to put... How early do you really want to try to put yourself in the lane? If you send a raw meat down the table, a very powerful card, mm -hmm. something that when I've drafted, sometimes I've aggressively grabbed the raw meat and then pause but aggressively grabbed it, and then it, <laughs> I, I do get one later in the tournament when I don't expect it. Yeah, and... Uh, yep, and picking up the bear fangs red there, again, passing down the raw meat. So that is, once again, you know those tricky spots that you can get into early on in the draft where you want to pick the good card, but you also don't want to send a good card in the same class. So, you know, he picked the bear fangs. Could be a bit of a hedge, to be honest. We're still very early on. He's still not locked into Brute or Warrior, despite, you know, what he's picked, the Agile wind-up and the bear fangs. And Francesco here has now passed a Golden Sun, a Test of Strength, and a Red Engage Swift Blade, right? Mm -hmm. So he has passed some very powerful signals to the players immediately to his left. He's probably not drafting guardian he's maybe not drafting warrior yeah. so potentially really trying to put the signal out early and and definitively that he is going to be in brute and not wanting these players to try to steer into his lane yep uh, he's also passed a raw meat to, to be fair so he's, he sent you know sort of like guardian warrior and brute signals sort of being slightly it's, open it's but sometimes yeah, it's, challenging yeah, you just can't yeah you, you you sometimes wish you would you know you you want the players next to you to read your signals sometimes yep. and be like hey i'm passing you a guardian card you're supposed to take it and you're supposed to become guardian but players here have different sensibilities and different ideas and sometimes you you can send all the signals you like but at the end of the day you're still wi at the whim and whimsy of these players and the draft mm -hmm. Blue Assault and Battery, the pick there for Francesco there. Looks like at this point, he's probably firmly cementing himself into the Brute, saying, you know what, I did pass a raw uh, a raw meat down, uh, but uh, given that the pack that was passed to me had red bear fangs and raw meat in it, maybe, you know, it's probably safe for me to go into Brute. Also, Brute, one of the more deeper classes in this format in that the table can support, you know, three Brutes. It can't really support three Guardians, but three Brutes, so... It can comfortably support, so you could be safe going to Brute, even if it is slightly contested. Also showing uh, us here at home, Francesco, who won the calling in Liverpool, drafting Kasai, at least in his... Uh, uh, yeah, drafted Kasai at least that one time in the top eight, showing that he is willing to take the good cards, start rather open and even in that first pack, and now getting rather rewarded with some really powerful cards. Another two block, but a powerful lead with might that's going to make you a might and give plus three to your next attack, and is a non-attack action for Centauri Sabres in the format, which can be absolutely relevant. I am fascinated seeing uh, Francesco happy to take these two block cards early in pack one. 
Yeah, especially if, you know, it looks like the default brute choice is usually KO. And so, you know, if you're going to end up in later parts of the pack, end up with those, you know, non-attack actions, the bone breaker bellows, the stuff that people don't really want, then you're already going to have quite a few, you know, non-fives in your list. So picking one early is definitely a bit of an aggressive choice. It almost makes me wonder whether he's maybe also just hedging to potentially be Reinar instead of committing to be KO. Because lead with power going to be good in both decks, whereas the red attack that he passed kind of generally... Uh, the Pound Town that he passed, generally just better in KO rather than Rhino. This Ball Breaker here, let me tell you, it is a underrated card, I mm. think. I think people aren't seeing it that often. It is a rare weapon, so you don't see it in as many drafts. But that additional plus one value, if you're able to discard a card with six or more power, that with a might token, I mean, the atta Mandible mm -hmm. Claw for four already feels very, very powerful, but the Ball Breaker can get that consistently. And in a format with as many two blacks as this one, Ball Breaker can put in some serious work. And Ball Breaker also synergizes very well with the Bone Breaker Bellows. Uh, you know, we, he did pass uh, over a blue Bone Breaker Bellow, and, you know, currently holding on, a, uh, holding on to a yellow one, which he might pick as well. And we spoke about how potentially he's maybe, you know, just leaving his Reinar option open, uh, open, doesn't want to commit too hard to KO. Ball Breaker definitely supports Reinar very, very well. Especially in conjunction with Bonebreaker Bellows. Yellow Bonebreaker Bellow here, a nice three block non attack action. I have found in my drafts, I'm almost never disappointed drafting that card, even the yep. blue, even somewhat early. It's blue, it blocks three, it's a non attack action into these Kasai decks. And look, what we were saying, right, what I was saying right at the beginning, sometimes these chess pieces, you think you have to draft them super aggressively, but mm -hmm. often in these drafts, they'll come all the way around the table, even when you don't expect it. Yeah. However, raw meat in a Reiner deck, which it looks like, you know, the lead with power and a Bonebreaker Bellow, sort of leaning towards Reiner a little bit. Raw meat, significantly less powerful in Reiner compared to KO because you don't get the free might generation. And oftentimes it can be difficult to have both tokens out to really get the value from the raw meat. So, but of course, Francesco by no means is locked into Reiner at this point. You know, he could easily still be KO and have just have some powerful non-attacks in the I, form of the Bonebreaker Bell and the lead with power. I'm almost never disappointed to see, especially Bonebreaker uh, in, in my KO deck, even though it is a miss off the top. If you're mm -hmm. able to navigate yourself into an end game or second cycle situation where you know it's not the top card of your deck, mm -hmm. sometimes you have to play aggressively in first cycle in this format, especially with the amount of two blocks. But Ball Breaker is certainly nice in KO, just like it is in Reiner. And we see it looks like a yellow Pound Town. That's a card that blocks three, mm -hmm. and a card with a big old power in the bottom left corner. Some other fine Brute cards yep. in that pack. Blue, blue Bone Breaker Bellow really showing Francesco might have found his lane rather early and comfortably sitting within it. Mm-hmm. This is just expert navigation of the draw format. They're recognizing that he is in the brute seat. He, uh, I still believe he is, you know, very, very open to be either Reinar or KO. He's by no means locked, but he's definitely supposed to be one of the brutes. And again, you know, you see two fantastic blue cards that either brute is uh, happy to run, a Clash of Agility and yeah. a blue pack. And they're just very, very happy with that solid choices. This late into the pack, Francesco still having, you know, a bit of his pick of the litter. He had two blue three attacks he could have easily just put into his deck. And he's saying, oh. Nice. It's great to still have choices when I'm six cards in, uh, when the pack only has six cards remaining. And the Clash of Agilities, you know, you want blues that block three in any format, but Clash of Agility can every now and then just give you some random powerful spike turns as well with that agility generation. Yellow lead with speed, not going to be your favorite when you're considering it comp compared to its red counterpart, but listen, mm -hmm. plus two value, plus two damage, and that agility token in these decks, there's a way to turn on the raw meat. Yep, definitely. And also, you know, synergize as well with the ball breaker he picked up as well. You know, the two cost weapon. I got Claw does that too, but you know yeah, the, the, the one cost pumps go go very well with the with the two cost weapon. Absolutely. A nice little just keep one card to pitch, maybe the lead with speed in the arsenal. There we got a yellow wild ride grabbed. Francesco, I think maybe skewing a little aggressively in this deck, right? We're seeing mm -hmm. a couple no blocks. We're seeing a way to get go again. Now that he has the ball breaker, a little extra go again beyond um, the Mandible Claw here, very important. Look at that. That's another not bad pickup. Yeah, again, there were two Brood cards remaining there. Now, of course, he's, he picked the, the Beast Mode uh, instead of the Blue Bear Fangs. So, so Blue Bear Fangs, even in KO, that's not a 6. Yeah, and <laughs> it doesn't block at all. Yeah, exactly. So picking the Beast Mode there, you know, on, on the yellow, you know, it is it will be a 6 in KO. So if you're at the, if you're sitting in Francesco, look at that. If you're uh, sitting in Francesco's seat here, mm -hmm. how are you feeling? I'm feeling pretty good. I think I found my seat, uh, and I have, you know, I found that I'm brute, and I read that well, and I'm getting brute cards. It's the fact that, you know, like, when there's four cards left in the pack, there's still brute, two brute cards remaining. That means I definitely read my seat correctly. Yeah, and, and, and maybe also 
created his seat directly, right? Mm-hmm. Like we were talking about passing those powerful signals to his left about which class he was in. Here are some really good Guardian cards. Here are some pretty good Warrior cards on a silver platter to his drafters to the left mm-hmm. so that they're looking at these cards saying, wow, the Brute cards are starting to be taken. Mm-hmm. Even later in the pack, they might be saying, oh, now there's a lot of Brute cards, but I've already taken these Warrior cards. I've already taken these Guardian cards. Yep. The question is, did either, did any of these players to Francesco's left make a late pack pivot that mm-hmm. Francesco's now going to feel in this second pack? And do the Brute cards dry up at all? How many Brutes are to his left? But if packs one and three are pretty good, often in packs in pack two, you can still fill out the curve with some generics or some powerful cards in their own right. Definitely. And it'll be very interesting to see which Brute hero Francesco mm-hmm. ends up on. It is still pretty open, I think, like whether it's Reinar or Keo. Um, and that's just going to be you know, uh, something that he's probably still just going to figure out. He's going to see, you know, based on the next two packs, what he's going to pick up. And that'll determine which brute he ends up in. Because remember, the specializations are very, very strong in this set. If you get the KO specialization, that can often determine that you want to be in KO, even if you've so far been in Reinar. And that is one of the benefits of staying open within the same class. It's like, you know, he's brute, but he's picking both Reiner and KO cards, saying if he gets a specialization down the line in the next two packs, then then that will really cement which brute he's in. We'll see also if he ends up drawing a bunch of uh, drafting a bunch of those wild ride type effects, mm-hmm. the draw and the discard and the go again, because the discard not only would it make a might if in KO, but it also would make the ball breaker even more effective. You can really build a ball breaker deck, especially if you get it early enough. Mm-hmm. You know you have the ball breaker. You know you're going to get this plus one damage throughout the turns. So if you really go ahead and skew your deck to draw, discard, hit the six, make a might, attack with the ball breaker, that can overwhelm a lot of decks in this format. 100%. Looks like they have opened the second pack and getting ready to flip it over, and there we go. Let's see, we see a big bop, yellow assault and battery, big old thunk, blue at agile windup, not honestly a bad card at all. See the flat trackers, that's a good card to grab early, mm-hmm. over the top, yellow assault and battery as well. That flat tracker is looking real good to me if I'm Francesco here. Flat tracker is easily pack one, pick one ball, and this is getting him pack two when he's already in Brute. This is an absolutely very valuable pickup over here. Yeah, the Agile Windup, if you're in KO, that's, again, not a bad card at all. Makes you the Might and the Agility if you discard it on your own turn, and it's a blue six in KO. But the Flat Trackers, I talked about the raw meat passed around the table, and listen, sometimes Flat Trackers can also swing around the table in its own right, but Flat Tracker is just such a powerful card, and it is a dual-class card, but it looks so Francesco, valuing the Agile Windup instead. That is extremely <laughs> spicy. I wow! I, I I cannot believe we just saw that. You know, we just spoke about how flat trackers pack one, pick one a ball. But you know, he's picking the blue agile wind up over here. And and I think with that pick, definitely leaning towards KO is is to imagine. where his mind is at. Especially you know, just passing over the red trade in. Red trade in actually kind of spicy in Reinar. For actually, sure. I mean, because, part yeah. part of the real engine of that deck, right? Yeah, exactly. Because you get to pick, and you know, Reinar doesn't have that many you know sixes, obviously, because he doesn't have Kyo's hero ability. So trade in, you get to pick, and you get to. Guaranteed discard is six. Drawing extra card, get the Intimidate off. Passing it over tells us Francesco's mind is currently at very firmly in the KO camp. Not a lot of Brute in this pack at all. You can see the Wage Gold with the powerful Universal keyword, the Yellow Bone Breaker Bellow. Mm. Seeing which cards he might want to try to grab on the wheel. Honestly, I'm I'm never too bummed to grab a single starting stake. It's a three-block non-attack playing into Kasai. That can feel quite nice. That Wage Gold, though, just a big old three for seven. That is yep. Universal. In yep. case any of the cards care about bumping up brute attacks, so that is going to go ahead and be the pick here for Francesco. Shuffle up the pack, pass it to the right. This is now the question: How many of these packs are going to have kind of a dearth of brute cards? Are there brutes on the left that Francesco wasn't able to feel as much, given that he was passing in that direction in the previous pack? You definitely want some number of three for sevens in your list as well. Just you know, very, very strong draft card, uh, draft cards, especially in this format where a lot of cards block two. So just saying a three for seven is actually very difficult for the opponent to even block six of it with two cards. Normally they can only block like five of it if they are, uh, you know, blocking two cards. Normally they just block three and actually leak a bunch of damage. Yeah. See a wage might here. Can see a nice blue three block in that assault and battery that is a six in the KO deck. That's something I'm going to be trying to keep track on for the rest of this game. Does Francesco end up getting a fair amount of three blocks, or does he kind of contain, continue to be on this more lean, aggressive two block, no block, but quite aggressive game plan, more focused strategy? I think that's something to watch throughout this pack two and three. Mm-hmm. Can it just be another three for seven in the wage might? Wager the might token is super powerful. The break point does a lot of work. Mm-hmm. And extra might tokens as well. I mean, you know, KO makes plenty, but on a turn where you're sending wage might, you're actually not triggering KO's ability. So wage might actually gives you access to the might token. Uh, despite of that, which, you know, he has a raw, uh, the raw meat in his list already, so, you know, he needs to be able to generate these tokens to get value out of the raw meat. 
players here waiting for the draft to be called to pick up those cards. It, I, I mean, it, we're still pretty early in the rotation on this pack too, but certainly looking like less easy pickings on brute cards this go around. Probably a brute or two to his left, which means if you're in this position, you're happier to have that be your pack two versus your pack one and three. But even looking at this pack initially, seeing a lot of guardian, a lot of warrior. There is a yellow wild ride. Mm -hmm. It would be a six in the KO deck but not a lot of true action, which shows you why he was aggressively drafting the Bear Fangs, even the, the, the Wage Gold early. Want to make sure you have those red attacks when your second pack might be a little harder to find the true gas. Definitely. Second pack is sort of where you find your resource cards or, your, you know, just little, little role players. Like Yellow Wild Ride, honestly, pretty solid role player in care. You're not too happy to pick it up, but you're not incredibly sad either. You know, you still go again. Um, it still turns on your Ball Breaker or your Claw if you're going to choose for the Claw. So... You know, and it's still a six. Wild Ride, you know, would kind of put, uh, yeah, it would make sense if you're really starting to try to build around the Ball Breaker. And I think that's such a luxury of finding one of those rare equipment pieces or rare weapons early, is you're able to build around that game plan rather than if you get it late, sometimes you're like, mm -hmm. oh, great, here's my nice rare weapon. But if you haven't been drafting towards a game plan like you can actuate early on, it's a little more strategy to a little more challenging to build that cohesiveness. But Francesco got that nice and early. He's able to keep it in mind through all of his picks. Players just about waiting to pick up the next one. Looks like we have... Ooh, smash ooh smashbacks, nice. Horn. So especially with raw meat, that's just a one card that turns on your raw meat completely. And, yeah. you know, you really want to be able to turn it on twice over the course of the game to get full value out of it. First time blocks for two. Second time you need two tokens again, blocks for one. But red wild ride yeah. in this pack as well. It's, it's, it might be too powerful to pass up. Much better pack for Francesco. Even the rising speed there. You draw and discard, you can turn that on and get the go again here. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, though, for Francesco, I think we're gearing ourselves up for quite the aggressive little package. A lot of these pearls, a lot of these no blocks, but a lot of the draw and discard. <laughs> a lot of might tokens, a lot of ball breaking. Yep, I was going to say that, you know, he's he's got some really aggressive picks. The past few picks, you know, the Wage Mines, the Wage Gold, the Wild Rides, and uh, very, very strong cards on offense, terrible on defense. So, you know, <laughs> he, he really needs to try and uh, assemble his deck in a way that he can hold temp that he can gain tempo and hold it. Another starting stake, so rewarded for not grabbing early. A little KO specialization there, but it, he, let's go ahead and give that a read. Yeah. A little KO specialization, another nice natural six in the pound town. You can see the yellow lead speed. So these later packs, pick, uh, later packs pack two, are a little better for our, for our hero here in Francesco. Mm -hmm. However, you have to imagine, you're not, you're not going to be getting many of these on the wheel, given where we are in the rotation. And did just go ahead and grab that blue block three KO specialization. If that doesn't tell you where he's thinking he's going to be, <laughs> now it does. Yeah, so blue block three on a non-attack, obviously going to be very, very good into the Warriors. But of course, remember the risk that this is KO and you just put a non-six into the deck. But of course, you will block three with it and it's a blue. Pretty solid. And you know, probably not going to see it played out, to be honest. <laughs> Playing it out, you basically get an, a Scabskins activation at the cost of the card. <laughs> um, can be very, very risky, but... Again, blue block three on a non-attack. Can't be too sad about that. Pack call as well here. The nice thing about, the, I mean, yes, they're yellow cards, but so they don't give you nearly the amount of resources, but the yellow sixes that are sixes naturally, if you're ever revealing to clashes, mm -hmm. all of a sudden you've got a bunch more sevens in the deck, and that really can make differences in many points of this format. Looks like yellow lead with speed was the pick over there. Uh, so once again, putting... Quite a few more misses uh, into his KO deck. You know, there's quite a few uh, misses from the KO perspective and also quite a lot of block twos uh, in this list. Oh, another red uh, wild ride and a smashback Alehorn. Kind of a similar pack to a couple packs ago. Yeah, big deja vu mom a moment happening. But again, Francesco, you know, really has navigated his seat very well. It almost feels like there's probably what, maybe only one other brute at the table at most two given how late the smashback alehorn and wild ride have showed up and there's there's two there's more than two but there's definitely two major styles of brute drafting in this format right you can really go for the draw discard the no blocks the powerful natural go agains on these cards or you can draft those bone breaker bellows you can draft the three for sevens really play a more grindy value game with these ko lists mm -hmm. francesco in both in his own decision making and what he's been passing seems to be skewing a little more aggressively and I think he's, you know, got his finger... On, yeah, he's got looking at the Rally of the Rear Guard. And even though there was, you know, um, like a blue wild ride in there or something, the Rally of the Rear Guard can really help offset the risk he's taken putting all these non-blocks uh, in, in the list. And of course, Yellow Rally of the Rear Guard is still a 6 for KO. Yeah. One of the rare defensive pieces in this set. You got this, you got Reinforce the Line, and let me tell you, you ain't got much else. A Bonebreaker mm -hmm. Bellow coming around. Again, really nice. Three block. Mm -hmm. Non-attack action. You'd like it to be probably blue or red, but at this point, 
Mm -hmm. I think you're happy to get it here. I think that's yeah. something we should also keep track on. How many of these kind of awkward yellow cards end up mm -hmm. being difference makers later in the game? Maybe it'll be totally fine, but maybe the point of value lost either in pitch or in effect will come back to haunt him. 100%. He's still got a choice to make. I probably lead with speed over the money way I'm out. This KO doesn't really need gold that much, but uh, he's, uh, he's never you know, sad about having agilities. Although his list with the number of wild rides he has, I wouldn't be surprised if he has many turns where he already has the agility um, and it kind of gets doubled up with the wild ride go again. I think something that you pointed out that's super prescient is these little one-cost pumps with the ball breaker can be perfectly fine plays on their own, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Little only one card out of the deck, six power attack with the, or five power Looks like two back-to-back -back headpieces for Francesco over there. You know, he picked up the Sheltered Cove into the Headliner Helm. Uh, potentially, you know, into the Warriors, maybe you opt for the Cove a little better so you actually have something to combat the attack reactions that they have. Um, but, you know, into maybe something like the Guardian or the Broodmare, maybe you just go for the Headliner Helm. Maybe also depending on whether you end up going first or second. Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and count his red and yellow cards and see how many we've got here as he's moving through. Um, people at home can join us. The other thing I want to take a look at is kind of what are the major needs of this deck so far? Let's see if he gives us another look through. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get a true count, but he's got a, a healthy amount of blues already. Yep. One, two, three, four. Looks like it's around eight reds, uh, if my count uh, is correct. And then the number of yellows is a little higher than that. Quite a few yellows. Quite a few uh, yellows, right? Yeah, yeah. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, it's a, also around the eight range. About eight yellow, eight red range. So while you're looking through this package, tell me if you're in Francesco's seat, kind of what are your what are your major needs of this deck, do you think? Like when you're looking at the deck here, when you're looking at our notes, and you're imagining for this pack three in a perfect world, what are we still needing to really make this deck sing? A few more pitch cards. Uh, he is a little lower on the blues, and also hopefully a lot of them being sixes, you know, even through KO's ability, because, uh, you know, with the number of wild rides he has, it's... It, uh, I'm getting a little nervous with the amount of like non attacks that he has, like you know, the lead with speeds, um, the the bone breaker bellows, and of course the chaos specialization as well. You know, the number of wild rides he has, he really do doesn't want to miss on those. And so ideally, I think he needs some blues that you know are base five power, so that it becomes sixes with chaos ability. Time for pack three. This is the make it or break it pack. These players putting themselves in prime position to be the leader of the pack headed into day two. The 3-0 player out of this pod is going to be one of our most featured players to start the next day. So let's go ahead and check out this first pack here. Ooh, a little foil Ooh. demanding performance. Some Stacked. warrior player is going to be happy to see that momentarily. But that pound town's got to look real nice if you're Francesco here. Or even that rising speed. Yeah, looks like not too many options for him. You know, Blue Bear, Bear Fang is definitely not something you want to base for. It's, it's not even a six for Chaos ability. So looks like Pound Town might be the you know only potential pick here. And I think right now he's looking through the rest of the pack, trying to see if there's something in here that he might potentially wheel. Because that is a little something you need to always think about. Like, what can you wheel from this pack? Um, and, you know, that can influence later decisions as well. Any consideration to take that commanding performance just so the Warrior player doesn't have it? Not, uh, not because it's foil, just because that card's pretty good. You ha you're not happy to see that played against you, even though the Pound Town is going to be the pick there for Francesco. I think I, if I was trying to hit draft Warrior, I would have rather taken that red Agile engagement because I'm mm. more scared of a 1 for 3 and the reaction step for... rather than the, uh, <laughs> rather than the before reaction step. step. Yeah, for, for exactly. Sure. For sure. Uh, but, of course, you know, foil stamped commanding performance there. Uh, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> Gauntlet of Might available and another raw meat as well. Yellow Agile wind up and a test of strength. So I'm curious mm. if we're going to see any uh, flat trackers come back around because we've seen some opportunities to take some more blue cards if we're Francesco here. Mm. We haven't seen another flat trackers in this draft. Yeah, again, I think it looks like he's deciding between the blue pound town and the uh, test of strength. Oh, and also a blue pack call. Remember, we spoke about this. He needs some blues that are sixes through KO's ability. The, the cards that he seems to be seriously concerned about on a pack call, exactly, uh, looks like. I think he went. He was so close to picking it, and yeah, that that is the, that does look like what he's trying to do because he, you know, recognized that he does need those blue sixes for Chaos ability to support the wild rides that he has on his list right now. As well as it's so helpful to know the top card of your deck if it is a six, mm -hmm. or it's you know you put it to the bottom and increase your chance of hitting a six with all these draw discard effects that we know Francesco is playing. So I actually think blue pack call one of the best cards he could have grabbed, even though it seems rather innocuous, doesn't seem rather powerful in his deck specifically. It I'm probably 
happy to see that at this point. Definitely. At this point, he is he sort of has the power that he needs with the number of wild rides that he has. What he needs is the consistency to get them off, and for that, he needs the resources to make that happen, and you know the five, six powers uh, in the deck to make sure that the wild rides don't whiff. Another Gauntlet of Mites are rewarded for not taking it in the previous pack. Another one coming back around, as well as a yellow lead with power, and then the pack hunt. This one is not going to become a six with KO's ability. Only a four power there in its bottom left corner. Just checking out the other cards in the pack, seeing what's going to be in the decks surrounding him as well. Another yellow lead with power as well. Looks like he's feathering between those three picks. Mm. And it's going to be another blue block three. So even though the early picks, rather aggressive, a lot of pearls, a lot of two blocks, healthy amount of block threes. I wouldn't say it's yep. like the biggest you've ever seen, but <laughs> a, a, enough that it's cer he's certainly not just going to get cheesed. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I mean, say certainly, and then he's going to draw a hand of no blocks. Yeah. But I, I'm giving him the caster curse. I'm so sorry, Francesco. But you have, you're have you giving yourself a good chance to have three blocks when you need him. Absolutely. And passing along Gonthal Might, he has, uh, you know, picking, he's been picking the equipment less aggressively than some other people, you know, might recommend. You know, he, remember, he did pass the flat trackers too in pack two, and then passing a Gonthal Might, the. Uh, looks like his equipment right now is, you know, mostly the, the ball breaker, of course. Uh, but he has like the headliner helm and the sheltered cove, but other than, and the raw meat, of course. But you know, his leg, his leg slot and arm slot currently empty, if I'm, if I recall his picks correctly. So that could also be something he's looking to, you know, fix. And I think that's why he is, you know, feathering that overcome adversity. I believe. Overcome adversity, strong card can only defend if they have. Popped an agility token on the turn, but it looks like, oh, what's he going to do? Yellow pack on overcome adversity. Going to be the overcome adversity. Agility tokens, so strong in the format. You know you're going to be facing them down throughout your draft, and that's just a healthy two block for you when you are. Yeah, it's, it's one of those cases where, you know, his deck currently doesn't block very well, but you want to block more when your opponent has an agility, so overcome adversity sort of, you know, fixes that hole for you on your equipment piece. Absolutely can see a rising power, so if you've drawn a card, gets plus one. Nice in these draw discard type of decks. Set it up in the arsenal and get ready for a big powerful turn where you hit a wild, wild ride into a rising power. Not much else in terms of powerful red attacks for Francesco in this pack. Just seeing probably what else is in there for the rest of the players. Not even that much in the form of blues that, you know, that is the hole he's trying to fill so far. He's picked up two blues this pack, but, you know, when we did the count earlier, I think he's still... Just a little shy of the number of blues that you'd want in a functional KO deck, especially when you are trying to go wide off of cards like Wild Ride. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes you might even be hoping to draw and discard into a blue. Mm -hmm. One thing I'm considering right now when thinking about his high yellow count is if you draw and discard and find yourself with a yellow in hand instead of a blue or a red, you can put that into the ball breaker, which is nice. Mm -hmm. Yep, that is very nice. And it looks like he's feathering the blue wage agility of course, you know, another... Blue, potential, quote-unquote, six, yep. and that is going to be the card chosen, even though it's only a two-block. Mm -hmm. That power, potential for KO, and the resource proving too tempting for Francesco. Yep. Looks like he's navigated his draft really well. You know, the, he's been... He sort of made the read that early on is when he can pick up the power cards, and he sort of just had the trust or the faith that he's going to find the resources later on. He's going to find the five, the blue fives that he needs later on in the draft. And, you know... That's really worked out for him. He, he he made the call, and it is exactly how it's working oh, out. Oh, I was so excited for a second, but it's Monstrous Veil, the Reinar specialization, as well as another yellow Agile windup mm. and a smash back Aelorn. I mean, this this is a fantastic pack, right, if you're Francesco. I mean, if it was the uh, Knucklehead, you'd be, you'd be jumping mm -hmm. up and down and dancing, and your draft, <laughs> the judges would have to say, please sit down, sir, you're disrupting the integrity of the draft. But the smash back Aelorn, Aelorn here, yes, it doesn't draw and discard to KO, but once again, just turns on the raw meat and gives you the agility. And I mean, that's, that's when you have the raw meat, that's just an enormous amount of value off your blue card. Mm -hmm. Definitely. But of course, again, putting another miss there, I think he had a bit of a decision there between the blue agile windup and the smash back Aelorn. Of course, sorry, the yellow agile windup. I think it was the blue agile windup we just see in Windmill Slam that because you know, when you <laughs> Clearly discard, he likes it. He well, took it over the flat trackers. Well, when you discard uh, you know, a blue agile windup, you're actually getting the same value as the smash back Aelorn anyway because of KO's ability. So I think blue, he would have just Windmill Slammed it because it was a yellow and he was a little, you know, he's still feeling a little tight on resources. He just picked the blue that also functionally when you play it is like discarding a windup. All right, let's see. Next pick here for Francesco. Looks like a blue adrenaline rush was the pick uh, on the previous pack. 
yeah, and, and you can feel the pressure from Francesco. He's saying, "Oh man, I'm still low on my blue count. This isn't. This is not even close to a six from Chaos ability. But I just, I just need the resources. I have so much go again. I have these yellow lead with speeds that create agility. I have these wild rides that make, that make me want to go wide. Do I have the resources to support it? And we see again with that bare fangs being picked over there. It's hard to do everything. It's hard to make mm -hmm. a perfect draft in any game in any format. And we're seeing Francesco have to find some things. But you, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. if you're looking for blues, a blue mm -hmm. three block six in the pound town. Again, mm -hmm. he's close to jumping up and down and getting the judges to give him a little warning. So one thing, though, about, uh, you know, he, you know, we spoke about how he hasn't drafted you know, too many equipment pieces. One thing that does let him do is sort of have some selection in the 30 that he presents. You know, he, mm -hmm. he doesn't have too much equipment uh, in the sideboard, so he can say, okay, some of these blue non-attacks uh, that you know, aren't sixes, I can just leave them out because I just, I simply have the cards. Since most of his cards, you know, can go in his deck. He has read that he's in the brute seat and he doesn't have a lot of, uh, picks that are you know illegal to run in a brute deck, so he does have a bit of that flexibility. Maybe one of his only picks, a little blue agile engagement, no legal brute cards in those three to <laughs> choose from. Yep. Blue rising speed, that is a blue card. It only yep. blocks two, doesn't discard decayo, but is a blue. Let's see what the final card is. Going to be another blue. It's the adrenaline rush. Mm. Even though Francesco has maybe some blue weaknesses. He, he did get a couple blue legal cards to play just there right at the end. They're not your favorite ones to play, but they do pitch for three. Francesco here and. It, I mean, get, gr grade the draft for me, for me, my friend. What are you Ooh. seeing in this deck? <laughs> uh, so I see very good offensive power. Uh, it's The blocking side of it is a little, just ever so slightly suspect. He has quite a few no blocks in there and quite a lot of two blocks. Although, to be honest, that is quite expected in this draft. Uh, it's very difficult to get uh, a draft deck that has a lot of block threes in, uh, in the heavy hitters format. Uh, so I think uh, when it comes to gameplay, what he needs to try and do is maximize value from his equipment, Those, uh, the raw meat that he has, overcome adversity that he has. He needs to make sure he gets as much value from them uh, as possible, and he needs to try and play in a way where he managed to get tempo and really just keeps it because he has the agility generation to support that. And the go against the wild rides, the lead with speeds. He's able to support you know, holding tempo when he does get it, but he does need to you know, succeed and navigate himself in a way that he can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go ahead and take a look at the entire draft pod here and how it all shook out, how these players ended up in their heroes. So here we are. This is the pod three. Uh, three, three brutes guardians? here. And yeah, three guardians. Yep, two yeah. Betsy's and a Victor. Looks like, yeah, we've got a couple. Uh, looks like all three KOs. Francesco almost for sure is going to be on the KO. Mm -hmm. um, even, yep. even though it looks like a little young Reinar <laughs> action there. We have to imagine yeah. he's on the KO. So mm -hmm. that is, uh, we'll see momentarily. But we can see Lucas over there in Kasai. Maximilian Klein from Germany in Kasai. Pro Tour uh, Baltimore, I believe, top eight. Mm -hmm. Thomas Battaglia there, the lone victor of the pod. But a couple Betsy's, I think, for the Warriors here. Yeah. To be the two of Warriors. You have to imagine those are going to be some strong draft decks. Yeah, they are slipping good right now because, I mean, the draft plot typically supports, you know, two of a Guardian, maybe. And uh, three of Warrior is totally fine for a draft plot to support three of Brute, uh, almost certainly so. But to be the two of Warrior, you must be feeling really good because not only uh, do you have a stronger... Uh, stronger pool of cards, you're more likely to face either a Guardian or a Brute, and that's what Warrior wants to wants to be at, because those decks block with attack actions, and remember, Centauri Saber is going to get buffed when you block with attack actions, so when the six other decks yeah. in the pod, they're going to be buffing your Centauri Sabers, you must be feeling really, really good. And when the Warrior decks are the three ofs, then all of a sudden mm. they all have to rely a little more on attack actions and not as much mm. on these attack reactions because they come at much more of a premium when there are three players vying over them. If there are two players, especially multiple seats apart from each other. Mm -hmm. We have a little more time to pick those attack reactions. So even though we're going to be following Francesco, I am excited to see how Lucas and Maximilian do at the end of this draft because I think perhaps the strongest place to be in heavy hitters, two of Warrior. It, yep. just, it just might yep. be. But for Francesco here, something I want to point out, we saw how good that pack one was for him in terms of just powerful red attacks. He was being passed to by a Brute, packs one and three, mm -hmm. which tells you some really... There were some really powerful Brute cards in at least that first pack. Yeah. And third, or Daniel started off a little more open, a little more generic before moving into his KO lane and showing why pack three didn't look as exciting for Francesco. Yeah, and I also want to point out that flat trackers that was passed in pack two either went to Daniel on the KO or Lucas on the Kasai. Both heroes that definitely won that, pa that flat trackers. You know, one of those two probably really you know, jumped up in the seat as you were talking about when they saw that flat trackers being passed uh, that Francesco, you know, kind of generously uh, sent over. 
Let's go ahead and I'm just going to report this. We don't have this on the graphic here, but I want to talk about the CC heroes that all these players are playing. So, so Lucas is on Azalea. Daniel uh, is on KO. Francesco on KO. So they're playing KO. Right. They played KO all day today, baby. <laughs> uh, Maximilian is also on Warrior. I believe he's playing Great Axe Dorinthia. I, I, I'm okay. almost 100% sure. To Charles uh, Dunn Special. To Charles Dunn Special, exactly. Shing is on Victor, also playing Guardian today. Mm -hmm. Arthur is on Dromai in CC, but playing KO here in the draft. Chris is on Victor as well. So you actually have a lot of players here playing mm -hmm. the heroes in the same class as their CC deck. So, I mean, you've played at very high levels. Is there something <laughs> Is there something to making sure that you're like in the same rhythm, in the same kind of attack block patterns in your draft and in your CC games if you can? Do you think that subconsciously influences how you draft at all? I think you tend to sort of have a little bit of a bias towards the hero you're more familiar with. And typically you put a lot more practice in the CC. So, you know, you just have a bit of a bias. And, you know, if you read that your seat, you know, supports the hero that you're comfortable playing in CC, you are potentially more likely to go into it. But I think players at this level are by no means bound to that. You know, if they see that their seat is a Guardian seat, but they are playing KO in CC, I firmly believe that they have no problem just playing the Guardian itself. And we know we saw that Francesco, yeah, he's playing Brute in CC, but that was definitely a Brute seat that he was in. For so, sure. You know, yeah. yeah. I, it was one of the, my favorite things about Heavy Hitters Limited that I've seen is how often pods end up three or four Guardians. Mm -hmm. It happens so much more than you might think. These yeah. cards, not necessarily all of them super highly desirable, but these packs, it feels as though players don't want to be the fourth hero in anything, yeah, right? So right. They, they think everyone's going to fight over the brute cards. They think everyone's going to fight. And I'm not, you know, prescribing that onto these players per se. Only three guardians is, is totally natural, yeah. totally reasonable. But I played in the pod the other day. I was one of four guardians. And I was like, how did this happen, <laughs> man? Why are we all fighting over these guardian cards? And I think there is, again, a subconscious element of not wanting to be that fourth warrior, that fourth brute. Is everyone playing Prism? Right, like in mm -hmm. old monarchies, is yep, everyone yep, gonna yep. try to play Kasai? So you have playing Fi and Uprising. Yeah, exactly. Yep. <laughs> so you have pods like this where you only have three guardians. Yes, you only have three brutes, but that leaves two warriors. Yep. And if you can be that two of, I think of any class, you're sitting really pretty in these heavy hitters games and preparing to get ready to go ahead and push your ticket to try to get to that 3-0. So before we get into the actual games, let's go ahead and once again part the mist veil. Take a look at the future of flesh and blood in the trailer for part the mist veil before we see Francesco's deck in action for. Round Round five of the Pro Tour here in Los Angeles. Don't go anywhere. Welcome, traveler. You must be starving. Please, come inside. I think we can satisfy your appetite. Anything you like. Intimacy, or perhaps ecstasy. <laughs> Come a little closer, I won't bite. Tell me, what do you desire? Pleasure is but the shallow illusion. Walk the true path, and you shall see clear. Those who seek may discover Formless, perfect, the serene, unchanging, infinite. Eternally present. Eternally boring. Why don't we play rough? Embrace the solitude. Embrace the sensation. Look within. Look at me! Just a breath. Just a taste. Enough! A tiger does not fall prey to the snake. The tiger walks its own path. Though 
those who flow as life flows know they need no other force. The heavy is the root of the light. The unmoved, the source of all movement. The center is unbound and free. Walk the path. Seek the truth.
Welcome back to Los Angeles, everyone. It is getting ready. It is getting time for round five here, the first of three rounds of draft, and we're going to be following Francesco Giorgio as he tries to take the draft deck that we all just got to watch and take it down and take down this pod with the 3 -0. Samuel Byrne, Pankaj Bajwani, talk to me about how you're feeling. Well, we just saw the undefeated in CC draft pod. We saw yeah. one of the heroes there, like one of the players there. Now we're going to see them all vying to claim that coveted undefeated spot yeah. going to the next day. And only one of these eight players is going to be, you know, getting a 7-0. Of course, as the other undefeated pod, they're going to have another 7-0 there. But just two 7-0s at the end of today, Sam. I'm extremely excited to see who it's going to be. And not only that, we really set ourselves up to look ahead to day two at whichever heroes sit 7-0 are two heroes that you know if they can make it through the second draft, which is how we start tomorrow, mm -hmm. those are the heroes that are going to be looking ahead towards CC as some of these most dominant heroes. Let's go ahead and take a look at round five here. It is time to begin the draft rounds of this pro tour we have arthur if, if he's from france or perhaps mm -hmm. uh versus francesco giorgio of the uk this is going to be a fantastic ko mirror let's get into it ko mirrors and now these two are the ones the ko's across from each other arthur you know ostensibly probably has the slightly better ko deck because francesco was the one who had a ko to his right whereas arthur i believe had a guardian to his right. So, you know, from that perspective, it seems like Arthur maybe likely has a better KO deck. And of course, we do have access to uh, both deck lists. And, you know, we obviously saw Francesco, you know, do his old draft. And we were doing a little bit of math uh, as we were prepping for this uh, for this coverage. And from our calculations, it seems like Arth uh, Francesco very likely has to present at a minimum of nine misses in his KO deck if he's running a lean 30. And Arthur needs to uh, present a minimum of 11 misses uh, in his 30. But of course, Arthur has fewer of those wild rides. Maybe, you know, it'll affect him a bit less. What I'm curious about, yes, there are a bunch of misses. Yes, there's mm -hmm. chances that these draws and discards won't hit. But if they do, and Francesco does present the ball breaker, mm. does that extra point of value throughout the game end up helping our reigning calling Liverpool champion? Definitely. This is going to be quite a volatile matchup. It's honestly going to come down to, you know, a few clashes, a few random draws and discards off the top. And of course, ultimately, who gets to uh, leverage more value out of KO's hero ability, who's able to generate those mind tokens again and again. I'm also, uh, and I also believe Arthur does not have a flat track because neither of these heroes, uh, neither of these players have the flat trackers. So, you know, it's going to come down to how they can really leverage the, uh, the cards in the deck and sam you were right he did present the ball breaker on the side of francesco francesco just some some accomplishments for our featured drafter battle hardened leads back in 2022 first place battle hardened antwerp may 2023 first place calling liverpool just this year first place and let me tell you world's calling world's premier calling in madrid third place and, and, and I'm looking at this list, a lot of other top 10 mm -hmm. finishes at premier events. I mean, I'm, I'm counting upwards of 10 top 10 finishes at battle-hardened events and higher, including our recent, most recent limited calling in the world. Mm -hmm. He is your champion. Let's see how he navigates this draft. It's time for round five here at the Pro Tour. We are in to the draft portion of the event. Let's get into it. So starting with the equipment on both sides, looks like Arthur came out slightly ahead on the equipment side. Both of them sporting the raw meat, both of them having one of those adversity pieces, which are both very, very live in this matchup. Overcome adversity and face adversity. You know, KO does random draws and discards all over the place. The face adversity will be turned on. KO also loves having agility tokens, so the overcome adversity on the other side going to be very, very turned on. Now it's going to come down to, you know, the other, the, grand, the grandstand leggings, the ticket puncher, and the headliner helm, you know, the ones where you can only use when you are actually lower on life. Let's see which, you know, whether they're able to leverage those pieces of equipment. Because remember, that is one of the really exciting things about Heavy Hitters Draft is playing around the equipment. Because not only, you know, do some of your pieces get turned on based on what your opponent does, there's also a card called Down But Not Out, which is <laughs> something you always need to play around. So lead with speed here, making the agility token, giving the next attack plus two on the turn, setting a pound town to the bottom of the deck here. And it looks as though we're going to pitch a wild ride into the ball breaker. So this one is coming in for a total of five, thanks to the lead with speed, continuing the one floating. And now with that pound town and the wild ride, you know once you get to second cycle, if you draw that wild ride and you're, it's the you know final card drawn on the hand, you know the pound towns are on the top of the deck, so you know there is at least a hit on top. Once you get to second cycle. Speaking of down but not out, Arthur does have one in his list and he has it in his opening hand right now. And Francesco, you know, has put a token uh, on the field. But of course, Ar uh, Arthur right now with the 
higher equipment and also he would need to take a damage to try and turn around so he probably just you know won't do that uh but you know down by now, we could probably see that you know get parked in the arsenal and then you know arthur can go ahead and you know navigate his turn to be able to turn that on on the following turn and with this, a couple, a bunch of yellow cards on the field. One yeah. <laughs> pitched, one played, two blocked with, and now, uh, I don't know if it was yellow. I think it was a yellow Agile mm -hmm. uh, windup that was discarded at the end of Francesco's turn. So an agility token for Arthur. A couple Marvel KOs there for our viewing pleasure. We can see not an incredible hand for Arthur. See a blue trade in. Looks like these three of Brute decks had some trouble getting all gas. A little bit of breaks mm -hmm. in those lists, but that down but not out. Let's see if it heads to the arsenal. Let's see if it heads to the bottom. Let's see how Arthur wants to start this turn. Agility token going to create some optionality for him here. Both players sitting on agility, but only one with a ball breaker. <laughs> Arthur definitely starting, you know, like exactly where he wants to be. Probably won the die roll and chose to go second, and also getting to go into his turn with an agility already set up. You know, that's that is very, very strong. But of course, holding three blue cards hey. and a down but not out that isn't live doesn't doesn't feel very good. I almost wonder whether he wants to, you know, cash in this trade-in and maybe, like, get a card off the top that maybe he get that's maybe a bit more offensive. Or maybe he just opts to send the blue pack hunt and smash back Alehorn to both set up for the following turn and also turn on the raw meat. Yeah, I mean, if you are discarding with the trade-in, you'd love to discard a six, right? Because mm. wouldn't the Mandible Claws then eventually put in some... Or the Mandible Claw in this case <laughs> be able to do something? Looks like we're going to start with... Almost the card go back to hand, and it's going to be uh -huh. the Mandible Claw to start. We are pitching the blue trade in, so putting a nice little one attack to the bottom of the deck. That is a miss for the mm. second cycle top seed, so we'll see uh, if that ever comes back in this game. Looks like Francesco's just going to take it, head on down to 17. Also something that, you know, is slightly irrelevant, it may not come up, but the fact that Francesco, you know, attacked in the first turn. Now, fatigue isn't something uh, this format really comes down to very often because, um, because of the fact that, you know, KO has all these non-blocks and also a bunch of Two blocks and also can be pretty aggressive. But, you know, the two cards that you got out of uh, Arthur's deck, you know, it may not be completely irrelevant. And we have to see whether, you know, it comes down to that. Just like how maybe that, you know, the two misses he's put in his pitch stack right now in the form of that trade-in, the smashback ale run, you know, we, we're going to need to see whether that, you know, comes back and bites him. Yeah, look at this. Overcome adversity and the headliner helm. Going to go ahead and block for a total of three here. So Francesco's going to head down to 16 after taking the one from the pack hunt. Be set up for his own turn with a full five card hand and an agility token. So let's see exactly how he wishes to string that all together. The agility will pop here, pitching a blue into Pound Town. Looks like we're going to go ahead and beat wow. Chest as well, which will, I believe, create a might token mm -hmm. on the turn. Yep, uh, create two my tokens, one off the Pound Town, one off Chaos ability, of course. And Francesco, very, very skillful use of the equipment there, recognizing that, you know, his equipment was on, uh, on that second attack. So might as well cash them in now because he's about to use an agility and potentially put these put his opponent lower than himself. So he's just saying, let me cash the equipment now. Not only am I getting the value from it, I'm also playing around a potential down button. Of course, he doesn't know Arthur has one in his arsenal right now, but you know, it's just a card you play around constantly when you play this format. Also, big ol' seven attack with go again. Yep. And that means the ball breaker is turned on, Sam. We spoke about this a lot. The moment he picked it up in his uh, in the in his pack one, very early on. Now the ball breaker is going to come in for four. You know, a little bit better than you know, a mandible claw. <laughs> Absolutely. And two might tokens for your next turn. No agility, so Francesco will have to find the go again. But that's kind of what he built his deck around. If someone he's drawing discards, he just has to hope he hits it when he needs. This is going to be a block for three. Looks like Arthur's going to head down to sixteen. Mm-hmm. And now his equipment is turned on. The Ticket Punch and the Grandstand leg plays are both turned on uh, right now. It looks like it looks like they're just making sure the life totals are correct, making sure that I think he was trying to bank on him being lower. Uh, uh, perhaps you know, life total wasn't updated and he made a block depending on what the life totals represented. Looks like it might have been a bit of a missed um, representation of the life totals. And let's see. You know, we're, we're going to let the judges sort that one out. Shout out our judges, by the way. Absolutely amazing. They worked tirelessly throughout this entire event. Yeah. Pound Town making two might tokens as well. I thought um, my opponent was at um, 17 health points. So I blocked three uh, to get at 16. But actually, he was at uh, 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 yep. 16. And if I had figured it out, I, would have, I wouldn't have blocked. Hmm. Looks like there's a bit of a misrepresentation of the life totals there. Judge is going to help us sort that one out. And, you know, we'll just let them do the resolution over there. Uh, meanwhile, let's continue talking about his equipment pieces. So, 
You know, uh, it looks like Arthur does want to get rid of his equipment to turn on that down but not out that we know he has in his arsenal. But one critical thing is that the raw meat over there actually kind of makes it a bit awkward. So the other three pieces are all blade break. You can get rid of them pretty easily. Mm -hmm. But the raw meat has temper and you do want to get value out of it. So you need to block yeah. with it twice before you can get rid of it. And then your down but not out is live as long as the opponent hasn't used their raw meat yet. So honestly, the down but not out in his arsenal if it gets to a state where both players are down to zero equipment, if, you know, we've seen Francesco aggressively use, use his equipment, if he gets down to no equipment, he's never going to be under threat of the down but not out. And that can leave that Arsenal in our, on Arthur's side of the field kind of stuck there or, you know, just being forced to use as a four-power attack. I was about to say, then you're spending a couple turns with that down but not out in the Arsenal trying to get to that board state, trying to get to that game state. Mm -hmm. And that can be a lot of turns where you'd like to have that Arsenal open. It looks like they are going to continue with the game. This is a ball breaker coming in 4-4 four, four, thanks to the Pound Town discard. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I'm just very confused right now. You need help? Okay. I just logged to this and I, I figured I, I'm confused and I... I, don't, I have not blocked this. You don't want to block this? Yes. Looks like once again, just you know, yeah. figure out a resolution here. Also, kind of want to point out those very, very sleek Marvel KOs our, our players have, uh, you know, uh, are using that. You know, very, very, just adding just a little bit more flair to, to the Proto LA coverage out here. Absolutely. Making sure both players know exactly yep. at what point in the game we are. And it looks like Arthur was putting cards down. Maybe hadn't actually passed through yep. blocks. Francesco maybe making an assumption that perhaps the blocks had happened, but now it looks like they are going to go ahead and continue to resolve mm -hmm. that attack. And that can definitely happen. You know, two things. Firstly, you know, playing on stream at a high stakes event and also at the same time a judge call just happened. It can be a little confusing. It looks like uh, Arthur wanted to not block the ball breaker at all. Uh, and just, you know, that's, yeah. So it ends up taking four from the ball breaker over there. And we're back to normal play here. You know, totally, totally something that can happen uh, in. Uh, in high stakes event like this. Absolutely, and now it's time for a big old bone breaker. Bello gonna go ahead and discard the pack hunt for the beat chest, making at least one, but theoretically two mites, mm -hmm. if we remember the KO trigger as well. And then the mandible claw is gonna get pumped up by the bone breaker Bello. So it, it, it would be one mite uh, because the KO triggers uh, and bone breaker Bello just gives plus five. Because oh, yes, the yes, there it, is, there it is. Yes, yes. Yeah. So uh, Metal Ball coming for eight with go again. But of course, we know <laughs> the Arsenal is just a, a down but not out. So probably not using the go again here. Imagine if you had cast spawns at the end of this. Woo! <laughs> hey, hey, this is but, draft. This is draft. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but once again, uh, you know, the raw meat not live. So Arthur, you know, he could still block with it right now when it's, when it's only blocking for one and get it out of the way so the down but not out is live if he's also able to go lower than uh, Francesco. He misses out on a couple points of value. Uh, from not being able to block with the raw meat twice. But, you know, that might be good enough for the value he might make up from the down but not out being overpowered and probably getting him all the tokens. Francesco going to go ahead and take a total of five after blocking with one card. And now it's time for the wild ride. This is what we talked about. This is what his deck was somewhat built yep. around. If he can discard a six here and get the go again, that means that ball breaker is going to be coming in with that plus one point of value. But we know there are a number of misses in the deck. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, this is, can be quite risky holding these many cards. And you know, with the number, yeah, we know he has a minimum of nine misses in his list. Let's see what he hits. And it is a clash of agility, which I believe is a four. So that oh, is a miss. That's a miss. Wild ride not going to have the go again here. Not going to be able to connect with the might token from the KO ability. A relatively huge swing in this game because not only is that the lack of the go again, that's the lack of the plus one value of the might token as well. Yep. This is just going to be yeah, eight damage is nothing to scoff at. But two cards in hand at the end of this, that's not where you want to be at any point in Flesh and Blood. Yep. And, you know, to be honest, there is a bit of a silver lining for him because had this, if this had go again, we totally could have seen Arthur, you know, just cash in all his equipment on the second attack, which would turn on the down but not out because he would, you know, then go lower life and not have any equipment. But because it doesn't have go again, Arthur doesn't quite have that line. So, you know, down but not out, it's going to be stuck in Arsenal for a little bit more, it seems like. But, you know, he's still happy that a wild ride missed. Base adversity going to go ahead and get put on the field. It's time for a test of agility. It's a bare face. Oh. Absolutely yep. going to go ahead and head on over to Francesco here. So even though you lost <laughs> this go again on this turn, certainly got one ready for the next one. Yep. Uh, Arthur kind of evening out the, play, the playing field out here. You know, the whole um, 
variant side of both these matchups saying okay fine you know you, you lost a go again i'm i'm gonna be a bro and just uh give you a go again <laughs> yeah <in> yep. <laughs> and you can see <laughs> in, the, the playing field. in the hand there i believe it was a wage gold and a yellow wild ride so there were two hits mm. when that wild ride was played and yep. a miss was drawn off the top there are a bunch in the deck and that is the danger that's, and that's mm -hmm. part of being a three of in the brute pod you do have a lot of misses that you're going to end up having to play and sometimes you can put yourself in exactly the position you want to be but the top of your deck has other things to say Looks like Arthur right now just sending a wage goal, holding on to a wind up. Now that's a you know that's a very very strong play to end your turn with a wind up because remember you're gonna make the might off of KO as well, which turns on your raw meat. So it looks like our Arthur is posturing that he's, he's gonna be able to block two on the raw meat on this following turn. Again, still not able to cash in his other equipment pieces. I almost wonder if he's trying to navigate to a point where the overpower from Don but not Art is not to guarantee the tokens, but it's just to kill Francesco <laughs> completely. Abs yeah. Absolutely. The overpower, especially uh, on the red cycle of that card, can go so powerful in a format where there are uh, mm -hmm. you know, a dearth of defensive options. The question is, if both players end up at a place with no equipment, then the card yeah. is not on, right? You have to have actually less. You can't have equal. And zero yep. and zero, that's equal. Yep. Uh, I believe that's a yellow done, but not out in his arsenal, which would, which would come in for seven. And based on the deck list that's been presented, I believe that's a yellow one, uh, would come in for seven, which still, you know, depending on how much damage uh, Francesco takes, would still totally easily present lethal. Oh, looks like Francesco just said take seven. <laughs> and, you know, once again, we spoke about how a lot of the skill expression in this format is playing around your opponent's equipment. Uh, playing around your own equipment and the opponent's equipment. So, you know, Arthur is showing here, oh, I'm going to present two tokens. I'm going to make two tokens, get my raw meat value. But at the same time, Francesco just looking at Arthur's side of the field saying, you know what, you have those equipment pieces that matter, that care about you being lower life than me. I'm going to take all this damage so that you don't get to cash in those pieces. And here we go. Bear Fangs with an agility token. This is huge. If you hit a six, mm. not only do you get the plus two, you get the plus one from the might. This is a three points of damage discard here. Mm -hmm. Survey says it's going to hit. All right, that's mode is going to give the plus two. It's going to get the might token. This is mm. coming in with go again. This is a huge attack coming in for Francesco with go again. Thanks to the agility token. Thanks to Arthur's Test of Agility. <laughs> yeah, and that is, you know, one of the massive risks of playing cards like Test of Agility. Now, if you're familiar with Yuki Lee Bender, you know, top eight of Worlds last year, a very, very strong draft player. She's got a podcast, and on the podcast, she's mentioned how she hates playing Test of Agility, <laughs> and it's exactly for this reason. She's like, you know, Block 4 is awesome and everything, but when it gives your opponent agility, when there's a <laughs> chance to give your opponent agility, she just... She's been burned by that card too many times to cut it from his list, almost uh, to like n end up not drafting it. So I wonder whether you know Arthur's gonna take that lesson home too after what's happened here today. I think this game would look so different if Arthur's first hand going second wasn't three blues and that yellow down, but not out, because Francesco is sitting at a pretty comfortable four. Mm -hmm. That damaging turn, especially with an agility set up when you're going second and have all the tempo, can be so much more effective than it was. And Francesco might have had to give a card at this point. But now, even though he went first in the matchup and you kind of give up your agency and tempo, Arthur was not able to punish. And now Arthur's had to take a total of eight, eight on the turn. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And uh, go ahead and go down to two. Yep. Took that eight. But now his uh, Ticket Puncher and Grandson Eclipse are both on. So, you know, he's actually... At four, if you count the two life over there, and of course the two on the raw meat as well. So actually kind of at six uh, with the life sort of being on the equipment pieces, which is kind of exactly where you want it to be. Now so rising power. Getting plus one because a card has been drawn by Francesco. Yep. Looks like the equipment is probably very likely going to be cashed in over here. Now remember, raw meat will not be destroyed because it, it is currently blocking for two and the tempo will put a minus one on it. So raw meat won't be destroyed, which means the down but not out in Arthur's arsenal definitely won't be turned on after this, but maybe on the following turn he could turn it on and come in for an overpower to potentially close the game out or get that very, very close Exactly to what you were describing as well, because if this raw meat was gone, mm -hmm. it would be live, would it not? It would be live right now. Unfortunately, won't threaten lethal because Francesco's uh, raw meat was also blocking for one. But gives uh, you an agility, yep. gives you a <laughs> lot of powerful Every tokens. Token. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. So Arthur going all the way down to one. Now, you know, Francesco, aside from the equipment, can also turn off a potential down but not out with the life total. Remember, you, you spoke about how if both are equal, the yep. down but not isn't out it, it isn't on. If Francesco goes down to one over here, regardless of whether Arthur is able to get rid of his raw meat, that down but not out is never going to be on. Powerful play here from yeah. 
from Arthur going into the red zone is an adrenaline rush, getting the plus three because he has gone down to one, getting the plus one from the might token, getting the go again from the agility. This is eight with go again. Francesco all the way down to four and only has his raw meat currently blocking for one. Very, very strong play coming from Arthur. Yeah, you know, and uh, Adrenaline Rush, a card that a lot of people are pretty low on. You know, it's not something that's spoken of very highly because you know, it is kind of hard to get that, um, get the condition off because because of all the equipment pieces like grandstand leg plates and stuff, we've seen both players expertly navigate to turn each other's equipment pieces off. And when you turn those equipment pieces off, you kind of automatically get turning Adrenaline Rush off, and that's why people are a bit lower on this card. But you know, Arthur here expertly going down all the way to one, turning his own card on, and I believe he has a trade in in hand. Uh, not entirely sure what color that trade in is, but definitely representing, regardless of the color, at least three more damage. If it's red, just comes in for three. If it's any other pitch, you just pitch into a claw, comes in for three. Looks like four block being presented along with the Rami, which only blocks for one, mm -hmm. which would go ahead and put Francesco down to one, which would, again, turn off the mm -hmm. down but not out that has been sitting in Arthur's arsenal since turn one. <laughs> yep. Both players now at one, and critically, Francesco with no equipment left on the board after this combat chain resolves. And with, yeah, meaning that Arthur's down but not out is just a two-cost, four-power attack. Now, of course, you know, once we get into the, um, the stages of the game where you're sort of trading two cards each, um, still having just an extra card could potentially be what swings it in your favor, but Arthur's definitely a little sad uh, that he couldn't uh, resolve a down but not out that was live. Let's see how these two might tokens really impact this turn here because Arthur has gone down to one and it's just going to be the ball breaker coming in 4-5. Mm -hmm. Means two cards at the minimum have to be presented in front of the ball breaker here. No agility but a gold token. Mm -hmm. Gold token could also be very, very critical. You know, oftentimes that can be almost like half an energy potion. Like you pitch a blue into it, you draw another blue, and that could, you know, end up critically like giving you maybe an extra claw swing or something like that. You know, it could almost functions like a tunic counter in some sense. But Arthur in this hand did not draw enough resources. Definitely not happy about the way about the hand texture right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Mighty Windup can get you two Might Tokens on your own turn. There's no real way to get the go again. The Bone Breaker Bellow as well, if you had the ability to keep some more cards and keep some more pitch, can do a lot of work in making Might and in giving a big old pump like we saw earlier in this game. But the question is, if you keep the yellow and attack with the Mandible Claw, if you discard the Mighty Windup on that same chain, right? Mm. Is that enough attacking for mm. three? Yeah, you, forcing Francesco into position, like, do you have the three block to just cover this up with one card? I almost wonder whether here is where the down but not out can come in, because it is a two for four in the end, and four means Francesco has to give you two cards, whereas if you just send the claw, there's a chance Francesco only gives you one card, and in this critical endgame pieces, you want to make sure you get as many cards from your opponent as possible. Now, of course, aside from just sending the down but not out for four, which would take two cards, you could also crack the gold token and gamble a little. A little. You know, you are playing KO, you're playing a brute. When you're, you know, when in Rome, behave that that whole saying when you're a brute maybe play into the variance <laughs> you know cash in the gold maybe maybe you could do something with that showcase of our global game here in round <laughs> five we see a frenchman taking on some a, a, a brit this is a this mm -hmm. is a, a tale as old as time <laughs> mm -hmm. francesco of course italian descent living in the uk represented by that little flag on the on the uh, screen there maybe by calling him a brit mm. he will curse me till the end of my days <laughs> i cannot speak to it so Arthur over here would have loved to just be able to send a three for seven uh, from this hand, but you know, not having the blue unfortunately won't be able to do that. So you know, maybe he goes for Arsling a three for seven instead, and saying, okay, fine, I'll just send a two card four at you. Still gets two cards from you, but then I have a three for seven in Arsenal, which means I'll be able to block with three cards in my following turn, mm. and then have the blue to send that and maybe swing tempo back my way. That's a really good sequence, mm. given that the four breakpoint would you know guarantee the couple cards. Mm -hmm. Also, oh, looks like he's cracking the goal. He's going for the bit of a gamble. Let's see if he draws that blue that he needs. It is a yellow. So we, oh, the down but down out, two Plus, or three? Plus two, right? Oh, it, no, it's it three. It three. costs three. Yep, it totally costs three. So, which means he would need to pitch both of these to send that. Ah, that is... Ah, uh, yes, I absolutely misspoke earlier. I, I, for some reason, I thought it cost a two, and it cost three. That is... I did, I did too. It's not a great spot for Arthur right now. That... Ah, that's, that's incredibly rough when you just need the blue. Now, at this point, you can pitch the yellow, come in for three, and then once again, make a couple might tokens by discarding that mighty windup. Yeah. But at this point, with three cards in hand, let's see what Francesco's able to do. You know, put the bone breaker to the bottom. Now you know at, at least there's not that miss on top. You don't know what the next mm -hmm. card is at this point. Sorry, 
And Artha definitely wishes that that was an agile wind up instead, because then the raw meat would end up blocking for one again. Yeah. But unfortunately, it's two my tokens of raw meat not be blocking. And I want to point out the difference in that weapon over here. So over there, because there was a claw, Francesco knew that in the reaction style, there was no way it goes up to four. But if Francesco does the same play that Arthur just did against him, the ball breaker can, on the reaction step, actually go up to four points. Yeah. And that's something Arthur has to be very, very scared of. Yeah, absolutely. A little attack reaction in its own right. We see a smashback Alehorn. We see an adrenaline rush. And we see a red agile windup. So hard to get all the value out of this hand unless mm -hmm. you attack with the adrenaline rush and discard the agile windup. But attacking with the agile windup asks for three cards. Yep. Whereas the agile with the adrenaline rush only asks for two. Yeah, both players at one over here. The Arsenal and Arthur side still on the down but not out. It's a little bit awkward at this point. And looks like Francesco is playing the wage gold from his Arsenal and going to Arsenal his other three for seven. Oh, well, I mean, potentially he could even discard that windup. I think he's probably going to see how Arthur blocks this and says, okay, if you, you know, put like four cards in front of this because maybe you drew too many two blocks or, you know, just not enough. Uh, to make two blocks or not enough three blocks, Absolutely. then I might just discard this wind up and make an agility for the following turn since you won't be pr pressuring me at all. Uh, but if you, you know, represent that you're going to hold some cards, you have two mind tokens, then uh, I might be pricing just arsling this three for seven. And that'll be a very strong play on the following turn as well. So Francesco here setting himself up for a very, very flexible uh, turn cycle. Yeah, really. The really tight end game here as both players sit at one. This is round five. This is an incredibly impactful round here in the Pro Tour. Both players currently undefeated. Both would like to stay that way. Both players at one as well. Rally the rear guard needs another discard in order to keep Arthur alive. Yep, gonna end up blocking for seven exactly. And then going to his turn, he does have a bit of a decision. He could just send Claw for five, or you could send the down but not out in his arsenal for six. And now, you know, five and six, it might seem like, oh, both of them just only take two cards. But remember, in this format, a lot of cards block two. Sometimes that six might end up taking three cards instead of two. Um, and that could definitely be the difference maker over here. So let's see what he likes to do. Claw for five or the arsenal for six. And we know there's a three for seven in Francesco's side of the field. No my token, though. So you know, that will just be a three for seven. Also, fair amount of two blocks, fair amount of no blocks. Oh, yeah. Francesco's deck. So we'll yeah. see if this six power attack is threatening enough. Let's see if we can take a look on Francesco's hand. We know he has, you know, four wild rides in his list. That's quite a few no blocks. So let's see how many he has right now. Both players checking number of cards in deck, probably also tracking pitch stack. They should know, you know, where the cards. Let's see if we can take a look at his hand. Looks like he has blocking cards here. Yeah, plenty. The rear guard. But, you know, we spoke about this. You know, those th oh, that's this three is, two blocks this in there. This is pretty awkward, isn't it? And here's where the difference between sending Claw for five uh, versus sending um, uh, Down Banana for six is actually a key difference maker over here. The five would have only taken two cards, but as we spoke about, number of two blocks in this list means that when you send six, sometimes you actually get three cards instead of uh, instead of just the two. So that's, you know, that's really, really good for Arthur over there. Very heads up play by him, just saying, I hope they have too many two blocks or too many no blocks. I'm just going to three cards from them and stuff, just two. And the main difference so far in this endgame is, end is Francesco found the pitch card necessary to attack with this big three for seven. When that turn a couple turns ago, Arthur was not able to. Let's see. We do find a couple blocking yep. cards here, enough to go ahead and go in front of this. We're coming right down to the wire. We talked about this game not often ending in fatigue, but heavy hitters, it does yep. often come down to very few cards in deck. <laughs> not because fatigue is the main game plan, but because when you get down to these tight numbers, especially at this high level, it, it, it often comes down to just have to block with a number of the cards in your hand, and then those cards are out of your deck. Yeah, and especially when you have so many two blocks, right? That was a seven power thing. Um, that was a six power thing. That, you know, Francesco had to block with three cards and similar uh, on Arthur's side. Going ahead and arsenaling, trying, probably just hoping that Francesco can't convert the big hand, but of course we see the wild ride over there. Oh, but the wild ride didn't work out so well the last <laughs> time Francesco went for it. We do have the lead with speed, which is going to make the next turn quite powerful. Let's see if Francesco is able to take all, some, you know, most if not all of the cards out of Arthur's hand and then close the game out with that agility token. Next attack is going to get plus two and we're just going to go for it. The wild ride, it's time to draw and discard. And like you said, there is a world in which Francesco is aware of exactly the pitch stack and exactly what that card is. Let's go ahead and find out. Survey says it is a pound That's town. It. Wild so. ride is going to have go again, going to create a might token. And thanks to that lead with speed, this is coming in for seven with go again. And that means the ball breaker yeah. online. 
Does he have the resource for it though? Because I believe yep. that Yellow Palmton he just discarded was the one that was in his hand when he played the Wild Ride. So that card in his hand is a random draw off the top. Now I do believe we are at second cycle, so very likely that's a resource card. Very likely to send a ball breaker, but you know, until we see it come down on the combat chain, we're just we're just gonna be left guessing for a little bit. Three, four, five. Six, seven, eight being committed to the chain here. Mm -hmm. Looks like that it is, is a blue, a blue off the ball top. breaker coming in for four. Ball breaker, the plus one value is enough to do it. That's going to close out the game. Francesco Giorgio moves on, continuing his undefeated run here at the Pro Tour and showing even with a deck that has some high variance and some potentials to not hit its highest ceilings, can find a way to close out the game here and moves on to 5-0. Oh. Incredibly tight gameplay from Francesco over there, and we just really have to commend him on his equipment blocks over there. Very, very expertly navigated. You know, he got rid of his equipment pieces super early on, even cashing the raw meat for just one value, I believe, saying, you know what, I don't want to play into any down, for bottom, uh, down but not out. Shenanigans, I'm just going to cash in his equipment, and he got, you know, full value from the, uh, from the lower-than-life, you know, equipment cycle uh, very early on as well. I just, that equipment player was... Spectacular. Yes, and also major shout-outs to Arthur, an incredible run mm -hmm. so far, and has, you know, some, yep. some powerful cards in his own right. We'll have to see how he does at the end of the draft when we check in with all of our players at the end. I will say, I do think something we mentioned literally when the game began was majorly impactful throughout this particular game. When you're trying to play towards that powerful down-but-not-out play yeah. and you arsenal it early, I mean, that was that was like the whole game that it just chilled out in the arsenal. It got yeah. baked to perfection, but by the time it came out, perhaps it was a bit overdone. Yeah, and also when it came out, uh, I mean, he, he had the blue for the turn that did come up with the previous turn where he was stuck on not having a blue and cracked a goal to try and fish for the blue. Unfortunately, didn't find it. But also before that, Francesco missed on the wild ride. So, you know, I think in the end, these sort of variance plays do balance themselves out in this game simply because of how long it goes, how many turn cycles you see. You know, sometimes some people miss on the wild ride, sometimes some people miss on the resources. In the end, balance out. And like you said, that raw meat, if you had found mm. a chance to block with it just a turn or two earlier, yeah. there was an opportunity. But again, the resources, the resource cost wasn't there, but you're happy to pitch two cards into a down but not out if it's going to give you all the tokens. So yeah. it's some interesting interplay with that card. I do. It is funny how it really goes ahead and like defines some of these games. If people are playing towards it, if people are playing around it, it's something you just have to be aware of and respect. And for Arthur there, just not quite able to string it together. And for, for Francesco, yes, you had that very unfortunate Fortunate draw and discard on the wild ride, mm -hmm. but just enough fortunate moments to go ahead and close out the game. 100%. For us, we're going to go ahead and take a quick break before our esteemed co-casters come in and close out the day with you all. This has just been a dream come true for everyone here at the booth. I hope mm -hmm. a dream come true as you've gotten to watch all of these just unbelievable games. It's all coming down to this for day one. Two more rounds before we have our couple lone 7-0 players and we get to look ahead to day two. Everything yep. gets to ratchet up from here. It's also always such a treat when the player you have been following uh, from the draft actually wins their first match and potentially is in the you know standings to be that 7-0 at the end of the day. It's always such a treat to watch. You know, we saw him draft and we got into his head. Oh, we tried to. You know, he's a bit more <laughs> brilliant than us. Um, but, you know, we got to see that and, you know, let's see. Let's see whether Francesco can take it all the way. He's going to have to take down those warriors. I got my eye. Oh, yeah. I got my eye on those two of warriors, man. Uh -huh. How many attack reacts do they have? We're going to find out momentarily, so don't go anywhere, folks. we got two more incredible rounds of Flesh and Blood coming up for you right after this.
We are in the thick of things, folks. Heavy hitters draft is well and truly underway with one round of draft already down. We saw Francesco Giorgi, of course, come out with a very close win there on his KO deck that is moderately functional. Looks pretty solid. It's okay. Couple, yeah, a couple okay. decision points in that last game that were interesting and, of course, are down but not out. Stuck in the arsenal. Never able to realize it's true glory. I'm Mitch Leslie here joined by Brian Gottlieb. We've had a chance to sort of have a look at how the draft process went. Uh, there was obviously a, an off-stream match we recorded there. Uh, Shing Sang, I think, was involved in that one. He, he's the solo bets. Oh, actually, no, there Three. are two betsies in this uh, pod. Two yeah. betsies, one victor. Right. Three in guardians in the pod. I, I think this was probably talked about by Sam and Pankage as well. It, it is an interesting pod. We have a two-warrior pod, which means that there's a heck of a lot of gas that's really just up for grabs between those two warrior players. Yeah, and you see it when you look at these deck lists. We are going to be seeing uh, Francesco taking on a warrior this round. We're going to continue to watch his journey throughout this draft. and. He's got his work cut out for him. This deck from Maximilian Klein looks absolutely bonkers. Just solid, solid warrior cards all over the place. A near-perfect equipment street. Sweet, good majestics as well. Yes. Just really, oh. really impressive. Stuff. Maximilian Klein as well. Uh, he's a warrior player in Classic Constructed as yeah. well. Uh, I, have, I have seen him and I've watched some of his footage as a Dorinthia player. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's really well-traveled as well. 24th World Championship Barcelona. Uh, fourth in the Nationals over at Germany. It's German National, of course. And the winner of Battle-Hearted Utrecht. So, yeah, so fine uh, finishes under his belt and looking to get that really marquee finish. And that's what this weekend is all about, trying to get that first marquee finish under your belt. Yeah, and I love this matchup because it's a fantastic showcase of some of the talent out of Europe, right? Something we don't always get to see, especially at sort of uh, North American Battle Hardens and Callings here. Both these players, really decorated individuals in those scenes. I mean, we, I'm sure we talked about Giorgio. He has a number of like Battle Hardens under his, like one Battle Hardens under his belt. So it's, yeah, it's worth delving a little bit more into like how this pod kind of evolved, right? Because both of the KO decks, or two of the KO decks rather, Daniel Carreras being the other KO player in the pod, um, the, the two, the last tour we saw, one of them was a lot of bear fangs, right? Uh, I think Arthur had a large number of bear fangs, whereas Francesco had a large number of those wild rides. There's like two, two pieces of the puzzle that you really kind of want to put together in a perfect world, but you're not surprised to see a, you know, three or four brute pods. So living that dream is, is, is hard to do. It's a rare thing. It's, it's tough. And you really do have to sort of sort out your lane and figure out what is going to give you the best chance of being in one of those open seats. And, and not to say any of these uh, three hero draft seats did anything wrong. Like that is how these things break down. It is going to always be two, three, three in a perfect world. In a worse world, there's going to be four, two, two splits, uh, five, two, one splits. Like all of them are on the table. But I, I think it was really interesting watching Francesco's draft process. I really felt like he was trying to look for a reason to get into Reiner. That was the impression I was getting from those early picks, particular when he moved in on that ball breaker. I, I think that's so, so important for really amping up those Reiner. And I, I'm looking for some of those alternate weapon suites when I do consider Reiner. And of course, Reiner, not as prevalent in heavy hitters draft as KO. You expect the default brute to absolutely be KO. But there are opportunities to get into Reiner's. And I think they just didn't really materialize for Francesco. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think you're very served by staying open to the possibility of two brutes. But the KO deck didn't really come together either, and that's no. the problem. The best part is, both the KSVs from the previous round actually wanted to be in Reinar. Yeah. Because Arthur had no less than three or four Bonebreaker Bellows to manage to come across those cards, where ultimately that's what we kind of feel forced Francesco away from that Reinar direction, is that, you know, I really need these high-quality beat chest cards yeah. that kind of make sense and sort of are the glue that bring my deck together. I've said, like, Pound Town is great. Assault and Battery is also great here, but we digress because it's time to welcome a warrior into the mix. It's going to be Francesco Giorgio going up against Maximilian Klein. Both of these individuals, excuse me, at 5-0, and oh, and I'm going to be honest with you, I love Maximilian's draft. It is very, very good from you know a purely a warrior perspective. Uh, we're going to see his equipment suite as well soon, and hopefully some of these power cards that he is sitting on Cards even like these powerful reactions as well. Like keep an eye out for fatal engagement, for example, agile engagement. Because obviously warriors on rate, they're not always there, right? A lot of it's one for three attack reactions with some upside. But that's a hood of red sand here. Uh, able to be picked up by Maximilian, of course, and it gives you the ability to, to sort of draw a card. It doesn't require, it's an attack reaction, so you kind of have to have attacked first, but still quite powerful. Looks like we're going to beat some chess with a pound town here. Francesco. Yeah, looking to set up effectively for that next turn. Pound Town on turn one, uh, one of my favorite plays. You often get that double might set up very cleanly. 
And that lets you go ahead and try and reclaim the tempo that you may have lost by going first in these kind of matchups. I Look, we're kind of downplaying Francesco's chances right now. That's yes. not fair. He won that last round. Obviously an extremely skilled limited player. Of course, a calling champion in this heavy hitters draft format. So if anyone can find a way out of this scenario, it is definitely going to be Francesco. I just think that the scales are stacked against him. It, it will make for an even more inspiring story should he find a way through this very, very impressive Kasai deck from Maximilian Klein. So Maximilian here, uh, a, a hand that I definitely like the look of, for sure. There's a lead with heart there, of course. It looks like a rising speed and a fatal engagement. That one fatal engagement red. Very powerful card. It's a three block as well, and it gives you that plus five if an attack action is used to block that attack. It doesn't have to be a weapon swing. It could be also an attack action card that gets buffed by it, which is why it makes its way into some Dorinthia decks. It can really power up CNC, for example. So we'll Not see the block. Interestingly, Max Klein choosing to take a point of damage here. Going to go ahead and leak one on that first turn, really prioritizing those two cards in hand, wanting to keep them for the next go-around. Look, this is quite savvy in a lot of instances. I, I think there are worlds where Kasai can actually transition very well into a fatigue deck, and you're going to want to have all your cards to do so. Warriors block really quite well. Yes, they do. Uh, you know, in fact, it's actually Guardians that block a little weaker because they, they sort of have one of their rares, I think, a two block here. So... Uh, you know, you would normally think they'd be the, the blockers, but not so much. There's a commanding performance in here for Maximilian Klein. What a grab to get in draft. Threatening the arsenal with the opponent to block with an attack action. And hate to break it to you, KO fans, but you are looking at a large number of attack actions in that deck. We're going to open out with the lead with Hard. It's a three pump, creating a Vigor token on the back. Love all of these hybrid do a pump, create a token effects in this format. I think they... Just smooth turns out so effectively. Also smoothing out the turn. Commanding <laughs> the performance. <laughs> Francesco going to go ahead and take a read. And I don't blame you, Francesco. You don't expect to face that one in every single draft. But the impact is large here. Uh. Flat Tracker is going to be cashed in as well. So setting up not only for this turn, but for future turns. Create that agility token now. This might just be a tall turn here. And that's not a bad look. I'll be honest with you. That is eight damage. Potentially going up to nine if there's an attack action card. Use the block to block this and of course doing so would mean francesco must divest himself of that arsenal card and he says you know what ship it my this friend such a brilliant start from maximilian klein because not only did he set up for the next turn he super disincentivizes francesco from defending here because of that commanding performance you really do not want to give up a card in arsenal so it was almost preordained that francesco is going to go ahead and just accept the bill here take that big eight damage and now maximilian heading into the next turn with a nice life lead with both Vigor Tokens. and Agility set up, really good position so far for Max Klein. I like a lead with speed here in the yellow variety, conferring a plus two bonus, creating an Agility token here and making this Pound Town look a little bit more imposing. As Francesco also looks to go a little tall here. Doesn't really have the density though to be beating any chest here, but still, Pound Town is fine. We can do without the Might token. It's hefty. Yeah, this is a big one. A, a nice little clap back here from Francesco. And if, if Max has a powerful hand here, if the blues and reds lined up nicely, uh, this, this could be a quick one, honestly. Very big numbers. A lot of heavy hitting, I would say, Mitch, being Indeed. done thus far in this match. Indeed. Paint the arena red, as they say. Yeah, that, that's got to be 11. Something uh, absurd coming off that yeah. pound town. Close to, anyway. So cool, uh, yeah, that's 7 plus 2 plus 2. We have a take the upper hand being used to block here. Powerful attack reaction, but requires there to be a wager on the attack. Something that Kasai is not as sort of uh, priced into as maybe Olympia is. Uh, can, still, uh, can still be powerful to bring those effects into your list. Maximilian also, look, has a Vigor token. So parting with some of those cards in hand to block doesn't hurt him so badly. He can sort of subsidize his turn to a degree here. And we're just showing a Centauri Sabi here off the Vigor token. So... He's keeping back maximum information from Francesco in a deck that likes to bring those attack reactions along. Francesco now is left guessing. Yeah, and I think a totally reasonable decision from Max there, of course, that very effective defending card in the test of vigor. And you got to spend that one. You can't arsenal it, of course. So totally fine to play a little mid-rangey on this turn cycle. Going to go ahead and defend a bit and still offer a nice clap back with the help of that agility and that vigor. As you said, maximum deception here. And as your opponent's life total gets lower and lower, that becomes more and more difficult to play around when you're sitting across from a warrior. Francesco is one of the few bone breaker bellows he was able to draft. 
You know, the, one of the reasons why he went away from that Reinar direction. Will be a good pump. So in between, we have a Goblet of Blood Run Wine, creating a Vigor and Agility token. So Maximilian guaranteeing very cost-effective go again for those Centauri Sabres here. And he's actually going to throw down the Vigorous Wind-Up. He's going to get it out there for seven. Yeah, that three for seven play, uh, all the classes enjoy this play. There's nothing wrong with just three for seven. Very card efficient, very powerful. Looking to maybe leak a little damage here through to Francesco. May have been reaching for an overcome adversity there. Francesco does have a hand that probably can go a little bit wide. That bone breaker bellow has snuck its way back into his hand here. Obviously, great to see a, you know, a, a three block there on sort of that non attack uh, pump with beat chest. Francesco has to consider his resource curve here because he would love to try and get two attack actions or at least two attacks headed in Maximilian's direction. That obviously ball breaker can be quite powerful if it's just powered up, that plus one. As I mentioned, Max's start ab about perfect, but I do think Francesco has done a nice job weathering the storm. If this turn is impactful, he's kind of worn through a lot of what Max has to offer. Finally off that five card hand, is able to use equipment effectively here should he want to. So uh, not a bad setup. Instead, going to go ahead and cash in that headliner helm, get the guaranteed defense while the life total is low. Save that overcome adversity for yet another turn. Yeah, a lot of people sort of say when you have conditions, you know, for your your adversity equipment, uh, obviously that's, you know, conditional on certain tokens popping through your opponent that turn. Try and use them straight away. But Francesco wants to hold a little bit of that back here. Yeah, and he knows the next turn he's going to have another opportunity to go ahead and use those adversities with the agility token already on the table. So a little bit of information available to Francesco there. I'm just going to go ahead and do a little rising power, a nice little two for six with go again. So a nice start to the turn thus far. Resource floating. Maybe we have a ball breaker follow up. Maybe we have something bigger. Let's see if Francesco gets the offense rolling. Once more, Maximilian, with a vigor and agility token in play, can really opt into that mid-range game and still have a very functional turn. That agility token is worth kind of two points of damage when it enables that second Centauri saber to be swinging, and it's often even more than that. Maximilian asking for time in the round here. Plenty, gentlemen, is the answer. Um, That's an interesting question, right, Mitch? When I hear my opponent ask that kind of question and then pull forward two blocks, I go, well, okay. <laughs> What's your plan here, guy? What are you trying to exactly. do to me? Exactly. Are we pivoting into the fatigue direction? It's a great question. Wage might comes across here. Looks like Francesco does want to put it on the line. And why not? Your opponent's got two cards left in hand. So if Love you want it. that might token, you won't be able to make use of it on your turn. Well, at least you might be able to throw a Centauri Saber off, uh, you know, a Vigor token, but you won't have enough to pay for that second attack yielded to you by the agility token. Love wager as a mechanic. Maybe that's a little uh, unfair of me for me to weigh in as I obviously <laughs> had a hand in help creating it. But honestly, it's just about the play experience. It is so, so rewarding to put your opponent to the test to find spots where they are vulnerable to those wagers. My favorite thing to do with these wagers is to use them to dictate your opponent's play. Force them into decisions that you know they do not want to make. And that can mean giving them a token in some instances. But if that's working to your overall strategic advantage, that's what you'll see the best players in this limited format do routinely. Yeah, if you want to incentivize your opponent and have you know, strip their cards away, then uh, it's great. I mean, wage agility is, is powerful even in, in Classic Constructor for a similar reason. Like, you block that out, you probably can't make use of the token. It doesn't stick around like a Quicken token, for example. Right. It pops at the start of your turn. That's so we right. kept a card here. Yeah, I think it's a, another draw swords in Max's hand, and these two tokens are going to go ahead and pop agility and vigor at the ready. I expect this to be a bit of an off turn for Max, maybe just some saber action and... Trying to activation. save, yeah, save draw swords for a future. That, that seems totally fine. And you're still really asking Francesco, are you going to go ahead and give me a gold? Because that's a big deal on a future turn. Maybe you get a card out of Francesco on the cheap here. Something that Warriors are only very recently getting access to is these really meaningful on hits that can be easily applied to their weapons after the last couple of sets. I mean, even like Iron Song, uh, like Versus, for example, uh, you know, obviously that, that arm piece equipment we've seen. CC at times, and here it's like, yeah, I want you to give me something, and Francesco says, well, this is as good a time as any to give you a very cheap block, but because you can attack twice here, and, I, and that that gold-generating effect of Kasai's maintains for the entire turn. This is the next time you hit with a weapon, so Francesco still needs to offer something up there to shut that down. 
That was quite well defended by Francesco, was able to use that adversity equipment, which he saved on a prior turn, by the way, very, very wisely. Yeah. I think I've, I've seen why Francesco is a calling champion now. Uh, just skills absolutely on display, making very smart decisions thus far in this game and kind of clawing his way back into it after somewhat of a rough start and maybe with a lower power deck overall, but really, really tight play. I'd love that. Like the idea that you don't just throw that equipment that you could face an onkit from Kasai at any point in the game. Uh, and want to have that equipment so you don't have to give up tempo in order to keep her off gold. Extremely astute. Of course, Adrenaline Rush here is on. So that is a nice little two for seven once more as Francesco is at less life. And again, Max might have to throw two at this one or card and a piece of equipment. Wood of Red Sand might even get in there as well here. Starting stake thrown into the block. Nice that's a three block. That's quite handy. Down to nine. Three blocks, very valuable in heavy hitters whenever you find them. I think it's worth finding a good use for them. And especially if you're looking to kind of offer this type of hybrid approach that I, I do feel Max is still straddling right now. I think he does want to kill Francesco, wants to offer damage, but he's also always asking himself, is there a world where I can just run Francesco out of threats? Okay, so uh, engage Swift Blade here after the draw swords. The draw swords essentially subsidizing your Kasai sword attacks because Max has drawn a card. Those are free. So it almost pays itself back in that sense. And the Engage Swift Blade basically confers a hot streak esque effect onto that Centauri Saber. You want to give me an attack action card? I am going to hit you again. It's a pretty huge moment for, for Francesco to find a non attack action to defend with. And it is the oh, lead that's with speed. So put annoying. In front. And look at Max's face. You can see the frown creep in. Is able to go ahead and cash in that Hood of the Red Sand. Good time for that. But I think that was the perfect card for Francesco to have in that spot. Yeah, uh, obviously Maximilian would like to have an arsenal here, so he will he will be able to give the on hit to the Centauri Saber. Oh, ah. ah, yes, we need to banish uh, a red and yellow from our graveyard in order to do this. Very relevant here is, of course, Kasai has another method Absolutely. that requires uh, the red and yellows to be banished, so that's fine. That's all. And what people overlook about this equipment is obviously the battle worn text on there. Uh, only a one block, yes, but still holds its own amongst these. Uh, sort of specialized equipments uh, for that on here. So we get a car, we get an Arsenal. Francesco says he's happy at one. What's the crackback looking like? Not a bad hand. Looks okay so far. Lead with power into something like a wild ride or even a maybe more threatening card from Arsenal. Let's see what the Arsenal is. Ooh. It is Bear Fangs. That's the one I was looking for. Is he going to hit? That is absolutely dirty. There Let's are see. some misses in this deck. This is a big reveal. Do we have a plus two for this? It's we going to be do. the wild ride. Yeah. Red wild ride. So Bear Fangs is mighty big. There's a plus five in general, so it's an 11. Yeah, offering lethal against Max Klein. We know we're going to get a card here. If not, multiples. Nice return from Francesco here. Here's the thing we got to talk about there, Uber. Uh, uh, Max will survive this turn, certainly. The big problem for Francesco is he now has to play a game against a warrior at one life. And what that means is you kind of have to just leave yourself in a position, you make a defensive play, and you go, if you have the attack reaction, I can't beat you anymore. If you just commit to giving two cards on every single one of those saber attacks, you can't you come lose. out ahead. It, it will, you have to take a gamble at this point. It will essentially fatigue yourself by damage and never really be able to put any threatening uh, effects in front of your opponent. 11 damage here. Now, this is not a, I wouldn't say it's not an incredibly attack reaction heavy list here. We have the Blade Flurry. We have an, uh, you know, an Agile Engagement as well. The Fatal Engagement already got blocked with. They take the upper hands, probably doing a lot of blocking here. So there's a Vigorous Engagement in yellow in Max's deck as well. So Vigor Girth I here. believe he has it in hand right now. I ah. think he has the yellow Vigorous Engagement. Okay. And again, if there's any sort of... Oh, have yeah, a look at there that. There it yep. is. Yep. Another starting stake to block with here. Great on turn zero. Incredible, rather. Uh, and then having a, a, a card that is relevant for the purposes of your banish effect and also blocks three. All very good. A fine defense there from Max is going to fall to two. But this he's got the initiative right now. This is an extremely threatening turn from Max if you're sitting in Francesco's seat. And I, I do think Francesco's going to just, just have to gamble at some point in this yep. turn. You either have it or you don't, as they say. Sometimes you need to make your opponent have it when it comes to those attack reactions. But Max keeping three cards and a beautiful looking lead with speed. That's of the red variety. It's going to give a plus three to your next attack and create a agility token. It is an unbelievable card. Checking to see if we could possibly squeeze in a Kasai activation here is Max. 
One resource floating, ready to go on those Centauri sabers. You've probably done enough to incentivize blocking here, given that you've got your opponent to one. So, edge ahead. Yeah, edging so ahead nice. as well. And just going to play this turn face up. Oh, that is good. going to get the handshake. And Maximilian Klein leverages the early advantage to go ahead and offer enough damage to take that match. Is that just the hand from Maximilian that doesn't block sufficiently? He seems to have been... More than happy to extend the hand there, just seeing two three-power pumps on that on that attack. That's also a play, by the way, that you would be able to make use of. Take the upper hand on, right? There is a, a wager effect there. But look, uh, in a deck that features, uh, I don't know, four copies of Wild Ride, every now and then you might just be looking down the barrel of a no-blocking hand. Is what it is. And Max knows the composition of Francesco's deck, is able to play towards those no blocks being present. And I love the idea of just uh, put up a lot of face up damage, either take your entire hand or just kill you. Simple I'll, math. I want to throw it back to one of the first turns in that game where Maximilian gets to put down that commanding performance and basically, you know, put Francesco in a position where he cannot block. Yep. The, the value loss is too great. Not only does he lose cards from his hand in blocking that attack, but he loses the card in his arsenal that he covered quite heavily. That basically gives you that eight-point life lead. And all of a sudden, Max says, oh, we can race for a couple turn cycles. Like, I, I kind of Great. fancy myself in this situation. I have vigor and agility tokens two turns in a row. Mm -hmm. so even if I give you a card here and there and preserve some degree of life, I have more than enough resources to continue to pressure and threaten you. These are both aggressive decks. Uh, neither of them, you know, I mean, the Warrior deck doesn't always have that above-rate play, like a Bear Fangs, for example, but has that evasion, has ways to push damage over the line, has on-hits that have to be respected, whereas the KO sort of runs out of gas. We get a backup match, though. Let's do it. Let's do more heavy hitters draft rounds. I, I will sit here all day and call heavy hitters matches. If you all want to roll in from watching the broadcast, just have a seat in the feature match. I'll sit here and commentate your drafts. I don't care. I love it. Now, Daniel Karius is the, the last KO in this pod that we're, we're sort of yet to see. Chris War is on Betsy. Uh, and uh, again, it's a deck that he's got a couple big bops, a couple bigger than bigs here. Uh, pretty nice overall. And yeah, Daniel Karius here has managed to get himself three copies of Bear Fangs. He's got a wild ride in here as well. So pretty robust uh, deck, I'd say. He, he actually sort of grabbed a monstrous veil uh, yeah. and didn't, wasn't really able to turn that into anything. I like the raw meat here. I do think Daniel ended up with the best of the KO decks in this pod. And uh, we expect these Guardians to maybe be on the weaker side. I think Guardian is a class that really wants to play with only two drafters. We'll have to see if that is reflected in Chris's deck. Chris at 4-1, if you're wondering why we don't just have another 5-0 match here from our previously undefeated pod. Uh, there was a draw in the last round. So actually no other undefeated match to decide who will uh, move on here. So... We'll follow this one closely. We'll see who makes it out of this. Just going to start things off with a little aggression from the Guardian side. And Chris, nice big attack for nine to kick off our match. Again, yeah, that, that one has a cheeky little tower ability there that can be quite devastating. But uh, not in many cases do you get to see that activated. Betsy, of course, unlike Victor, wants to push damage via evasion. Uh, obviously, she wants to be wagering. We do not see a, you know, a good time chapeau here. But Betsy still has plenty of ways to wager. On the other side here, we see a money where your mouth is to open things up here. This will wager a gold token and might prove to be a quite a tempting prospect for the Betsy here, even though, again, you don't have a sort of gold outlet in that chapeau. Yeah, pretty effective attack here for 11 as a first salvo from Daniel Correas. Of course, one of those immensely talented Sunflower Samurais coming all the way from Spain have been a fixture of our pro scene ever since PT1. Pablo Pintor putting the team on the map oh with my that God. historic victory. Going 0-2 and, and then re recovering to win the whole thing. One of the most compelling stories in competitive flesh and blood. And Pablo has a mentality of a champion. And you know he surrounds himself with like-minded individuals. Absolutely. So Sunflower Samurai outfit is nothing to sneer at. Yeah, Betsy a little bit different than a traditional Guardian. I think often has trouble defending all that well. She doesn't not, block well. <laughs> not loaded with three blocks and some damage is going to go ahead and leak here. From this wager. So it will be won by the KO player, I think. Here's a mandible claw to follow up that wage mine. So pretty robust turn in general here. And Chris is happy to ship the rest of that damage. You'll notice a Miller's Grindstone pick up here for, for Betsy. Uh, obviously, in, in, in matchups where you, you're at risk of losing that clash, it can feel a little less satisfying as it is a weapon that becomes weaker by one every time you lose a clash but winning one is great you obliterate that top card of your opponent's library yeah it's, it's an interesting weapon i i actually often don't care when my miller's grindstone gets worn down if it stays alive for a couple of turns it's probably done the job i was looking for honestly 
weapons not all that important in heavy hitters, broadly speaking, but especially in Guardian. Uh, and again, uh, it still has an on hit, even if it is weak, right? So your opponent starts to look at this like two power attack, and like, do I really care to block this? You know, you can have a mandible claw here. And we open with a mandible claw. Something smells a little fishy, Brian. Yeah, I don't buy it. Yeah. You're up to something, Mr. Carreras. This worked in uh, week one of <laughs> this format, but it has gotten less efficient as time has gone on. You do expect it. there will be a discard okay. of a wind-up here, which is, look, it doesn't have to be a deceptive play to be a great play. It's a completely fine way to start your turn. And things progressing quickly on the brute side here are going to be followed up with a bear fangs. Uh, that is definitely the perfect way to bookend this. Pack call off the top into the graveyard, which means we are getting that plus two. So this is, you know, a very respectable 11 damage turn here. Uh, more, rather, excuse me, 12, because we had a might token pop. Bloody Oval going to be put in front here. Uh, and some more equipment. Betsy, again, not huge on the blocking. Would love to be able to spare resources on a wagered attack to give it that plus one on overpower, which is a hero ability. Yeah, she's really got to go ahead and find that evasive damage like now, like you really want to get your opponent where in the, they're in the 9 to 12 range out of nowhere, just a massive overpowered attack. And that's how you steal games as Betsy, but the window is tight as far as that goes. Chris is not playing on right the same way that Daniel is right now. And Betsy, by and large, isn't always designed to do that. She's designed to get around blocking potential with overpower, not necessarily play a great numbers game like Victor, for example, can. Having that plus one is really impactful for, you know, cards like Concast, you know, these cards that say, hey, if you're hitting above your base power, you're going to get an extra disruptive effect. That works really well. But you have to keep a lot of cards in order to deploy the big Guardian attack and activate her ability. They have to be wagered too. So this Adrenaline Rush comes in. Daniel just games it perfectly, gets perfect, one life for life behind. Turn. Might token in there. A beautiful one card eight. Thanks this is a spot where Daniel had to push big damage because the problem is that Chris is set up with the five card hand. And if he's able to leverage that with Daniel at six life, that could just mean a dead brute. But Daniel has the absolute secret sauce here coming in for seven on the back end as well, setting up decently for the next go around. And that flat tracker's activation gave you bare fangs into assault and battery here. So beautiful. Perfect to keep your opponent on the back foot. Chris can't do very much on small hands. Again, that Miller's grindstone has shrunk a little bit. Erosion. Yeah. And just has to give up the whole hand and has nothing going on this turn. Going to draw back up. Oh, buddy. Can Daniel keep the pressure rolling? Can he go ahead and find some more cards from Chris's hand? It just gets harder and harder, and it is going to be a three for seven assault and battery coming off for Daniel. It's, I mean, we're looking down the barrel of another 14 plus damage turn. If that was a bear fangs in hand there for Daniel, we're looking at 15. You can't, you can't block that effectively. We have a silver token uh, on the board virtually. It looks like Chris is going to cash in that uh, headpiece there, the glory seeker. Pay three to draw a card. Yeah, maybe just looking for more defensive options. Has to find more three blocks, but we do see a hand pretty rich with two blocks, and that is not the best scenario to trouble. be in. Might token going to be set up for the future. Chain is closed, and the follow-up, it yep. is bear fangs, and it's going to be for eight as well. A massive bear fangs. Are these two blocks in hands? Because if so, that's a wrap. Absolutely yep, bloody that's, dead. That's going to do it. And a very, very effective display of just... Absolute brutality from Daniel Caress as the third brute in the pod, by the way. Yeah, which is pretty absurd. But again, look, I mean, you sometimes see up to four of them here. Uh, it's also a heavy Guardian pod. Three Guardians in this pod. We've seen Xing Sang suffer as a result of that as well. Uh, you know, they're a little bit of a, a, a tough game as well to watch, I think, for Mr. War uh, coming out. And again, if he can't match the rate, he cannot match the rate of KO. He doesn't block that well either. Needs to be on the front foot. Needs to be set up these big bops, these these you know mod these damage modifying effects with wages and make that damage unblockable. Because your opponent, the brute, wants to block with some cards normally. They can't make use of their full hand in many situations unless, of course, they have those agility tokens, which is why flat trackers. I think that's why we're so surprised to see Francesco pass on that yeah. uh, sort of during the draft. And maybe he was so hedged into the Reinhardt game plan, he was sort of thinking of, of you know, Maybe using more of his cards to beat chest effects and not yeah, to power I'm, a wider turn? I'm honestly not sure. I, you know, I have all the faith in Francesco in the world. Yes. As we said, a calling champion, certainly an incredible drafter. My amateur self 
I'm taking that flat track one every time. Yep. Every time. Like, I think flat trackers is so, so critical. And, like, I can kind of talk myself into his position because he was extremely wild ride heavy at that juncture. So he's just saying, you have enough I go again. Yeah, yeah, I have enough go again. I want to play a wild ride and then I want to play something else. And maybe I'm hedging between Reinar a little bit and I don't care as much about flat trackers and Reinar. And that's all good. I respect that entirely. Uh, but I, I do think you saw the power of a flat tracker to just go ahead and maintain tempo there. And now we've been set up for an absolute banger of an all European finals oh, for this draft. Yeah, I mean, that's amazing. Daniel Correa will be going up against Maximilian Klein, both at what, five and oh now? Six, six and oh. Six, six and, and oh, baby. Trying to go to seven and oh on the day. Big, big matches coming up. We have one deck, the one warrior of two in the pod, the other, the one brute of three in the pod. That's going to be an exciting What An explosive way to round out our draft rounds here at Pro Tour Los Angeles. That's a match you want to be here for because, I mean, coming 7-0 out of day one is incredible. It's a great huge, feeling to have, and that's huge. going to really inform who we watch and keep an eye on tomorrow. So stick around more as our stories develop here from Pro Tour Los Angeles. I'm Mitch Leslie, Brian Gottlieb. Stick around. We sure will.
Welcome back, everybody. We are, of course, heading into our last round of draft, our last round of the day here from the Los Angeles Convention Center. And things are shaping up pretty nicely in the pod. Pod two is what we've been observing. We just saw Maximilian Klein manage to get the win there over yeah, Francesco, of course. That was uh, a you know, really important game. And then we saw Daniel Correas, the final brute, unobserved brute from that pod, find a win against Chris War, which sets us up for our two matchup of those undefeated players yeah very excited for this clash of european titans i love the idea of somebody else from sunflower samurai maybe getting the chance right to exactly the spotlight a little bit and look pablo literally one of the best champions our game could ever ask for just the kindest most gracious person and does nothing but lift up his teammates every chance he gets but you know, like, they kind of are like, oh, I can't yeah. <laughs> for a little while. Can I just get that win? And it's going to be interesting to watch that develop down the stretch as Daniel Correa is off to an extremely strong start. I mean, we were talking a bunch about the deck he built, and honestly, it was just extremely solid. It yeah. wasn't really too heavily biased in any one direction. There's a great density of three blocks in there. Uh, we, we really like how it played out, of course, uh, you know, in that previous show against Chris, just basically put Chris in a position he couldn't do anything about it. Uh, having a couple of turns in a row with agility tokens and basically having a Bear Fangs bookend on both of those occasions meant that you could give every card and still not be able to block that damage. You are leaking and giving up full tempo. That is a scary position to be in as you're yeah. slowly being folded into a pretzel by the brute player. And it's a situation you want to avoid by having good pressure in that early game. A card that did that against Francesco Giorgio was commanding performance out of Maximilian Klein's Kasai deck. We're going to see him, of course, take on Daniel in this next game. And that is an extremely powerful warrior deck in a two-warrior pod. Yeah. So definitely, uh, you know, that's a list to be feared by Max. In, in my opinion, this is still Maximilian Klein's draft to lose. Sure. I, I think he's got the best-looking deck in this draft. There's a reason we play the games, though. Absolutely not a foregone conclusion. And if you've played Heavy Hitter's Draft, you just know what KO can do to you. It can kind of tear you to pieces either quickly or slowly, as you said, just continually offering 14 damage across multiple turns. Heavy Hitter's a format notorious for not having the most block value on the back end. 60% of, 66% uh, of commons are two block or less. It's a really big deal. A really big deal for decks that put out consistent damage. So it's going to be critical that Max finds some windows to go ahead, take that tempo back. I think you calling out commanding performance is a card that could potentially do so. Very, very astute. Another card which can just start to get there on numbers, Blade Flurry. I think that's a card I really want to watch. It'll allow Max to go ahead and just lock up that tempo and immediately put Daniel Correa's in a position where he's just playing from behind the entire time. Such a unique card because it actually gives the Warrior the ability to be on, actually above rate on an attack action. It is the only card that really allows you to do that. Outside of, I guess, like a, a fatal engagement, um, you know, like obviously having that big plus five is very nice to have, but zero for four at reaction speed is hitherto unheard Huge of. Deal. Yeah. Huge deal. And it, we've seen that influence over Classic Constructed as well, where it's kind of ushered in this new Aurea, or era of warrior dominance. Oh, yeah. like, the SoCal Dories were scrabbling for play sets of yeah. those immediately. You know, we have our like, buy and sell channel and everyone was trying to get their hands on them. And so, Unquestionably, yeah. the hottest card out of heavy hitters, one that every single warrior player needs to get their hands on sooner rather than later. Yeah, and it still has a conditional effect, I guess. It's spread over two attacks, but with Kasai, you're getting two attacks. You're doing it. Make you sure you do. Yeah, you yeah. you basically that that is guaranteed to happen here. So really powerful card. We saw like a hood of red sand here. I, I do love like the warrior specialization headpieces in this set, yeah. right? Prize Galia as Very well. Strong. Because they're reactions. You know, again, like your opponent can't do much about them. If we do not have defense reactions outside of those instant speed, two damage prevention cards, like slap happy taken on the chin, for example. Mm -hmm. That's it. And that's what makes Warrior so powerful, even if these reactions conditionally are, you know, one for three. So, like, you know, below rate technically, but all of them have upside. Yep. All of them tend to create these tokens. There's a zero for three and take the upper hand that just requires a wager to be there. It is extremely scary. And that level of evasion and the ability to dump a full hand is very important for Warriors because yes, Guardians is. of Brutes sometimes cannot make full use of those cards. So that's something to keep in mind. Let's head down to the feature match area here for our last Round of draft. That's right. It's going to be a battle for the title of Undefeated and 7 and 0 heading into day two of Pro Tour Los Angeles. Daniel Correas of Spain going up against Maximilian Klein of Germany. Huge, huge stakes here. If you've ever had that dream run in a day one of a Pro Tour, you know what it means to go to bed with 
sort of a lighter heart, nervous but confident. There's a level of just absolute faith that starts to settle into your game at that moment. You're like, I belong here. This might be my moment to go ahead and etch my name on that immortal trophy of Pro Tour champions. And the stakes could not be higher on day one. Absolutely. Having a buffer moving into day two where yeah, it doesn't get any easier for either of, of these players, right? Even coming out of this, coming out of today, six and one is very, very good. Four and three, uh, it conditionally means you're live for, for day two. So you can absolutely recover from there. Ask Daniel's teammate, Pablo Pintor. Obviously, Daniel, of course, uh, you know, competed at the world premiere calling in Madrid in 2022 and won that calling. So has some accolades uh, to his name as well. Battle Harden and Bologna found a fifth place in New Jersey, a calling in New Jersey. What a fantastic event that was, placed third. So no stranger to the spotlight, no stranger to these high stakes matches here. And even though we're early in the piece, in this draft phase, our first draft phase of the Pro Tour, Daniel has to be happy with the fact that he's brought himself to this point, drafted his seat, finds a strong brute deck, one that can really put down a hurting here. And uh, yeah, he and Maximilian, uh, there's gonna be sparks flying this matchup, people make no mistake. Maximilian also, we saw in his previous game, was able to confer some really important on hits to even just a single Centauri Saber. A two damage attack that has to be respected and blocked inefficiently quite often by his opponents. It makes a big, big difference. And the on hits are limited in this format, but they absolutely matter. They force your opponent into difficult decisions time and time again. Well, it looks like we have... Maximilian, oh, a lead with speed. And you know what? On turn O, look, you, you maybe want to hope to try and force some damage on a turn like that. Fortunately, he's going second, so he'll be able to keep that one going. Getting an agility token off the bat is great. Daniel, though, hmm. We have a naked mandible claw being shown here. And again, there are some, some tricks you can play here. Yeah, and it is going to be respected by Max using that draw sword mm. defensively. Of course, there is the windup. Go again now granted to this Mandible Claw. A couple of mites available. Love to see that on turn zero. Is there going to be a follow-up here? I would think that might just be it. He's probably more interested in, in developing uh, that might, that extra might token here than, than really going wide on a turn that Maximilian can block and then just draw up happily after. But, hey, I've been wrong before. We are going to send an attack here. Let's try, let's try this one instead. Rising power coming on out. Yeah, so Daniel content to go ahead into this next turn cycle without an arsenal. And I, I think that says a lot about what the game plan is here. Just valuing going ahead and stripping cards from right. Max in this scenario. I also think cleaning up the hand a little bit. This was not a strong hand for Daniel. A lot of blues, a lot of yellows. Going to go ahead and get some of those out of the mix. I'm not over the moon about Maximilian's hand, having just seen what he's put in front here. So, yes, um... Look, fatigue can be a condition that occurs. I mean, I was hearing Hayden talk about an Arsenal pass recently. He probably logged about 20, 25 drafts, and he probably had like a two or three that actually, uh, no, one, I think, where like fatigue actually became an issue. Yeah. And it's usually fatigue by damage. By damage. Ex exactly yeah. what I was going to say, Mitch. It's such a, a different way that fatigue happens in this heavy hitters format. It is because you are being bombarded with and and damage, a block it. seven damage over and over and over and it's so so hard to overcome you just commit card after card and next thing you know your deck's empty yeah lead with speed here and a rising energy will follow it up of course getting that plus three buff from lead with speed so this is a very respectable seven power attack but even more importantly we have an agility token to smooth out maximilian's next turn this will still demand respect from the spaniard both players with a little bit of setup in this instance on Daniel's side, do you want to decide whether to commit a couple cards here? You assume the clapback is something like those traditional two-card brute plays. You want to pitch a card, play a card, get a buff from those my tokens. You are set up well for that. Pitch a blue, play assault and battery. Two-card nine, not bad at all. But do you want to save an arsenal for the next turn, or do you want to leak four damage? I think that's the real question for Daniel Correa's right now. And a big part of that is, okay, well, I might have to use flat trackers if I'm going to keep an arsenal. Because the only reason I'd really be priced into that is if I want to maybe block a little bit and have your know, two attacks next turn. Or say I'm blocking heavily here and then uh, just keep a card, keep that arsenal card and then just yeah, deploy that one attack action and be able to get a lot of value on defense here. This is actually a really big decision. This is where games of limited are won and lost is on decisions like this and is going to go ahead and just defend with a single card and let some damage come through. So life total drops by four. 
my expectation is that Daniel will prioritize going into the next turn cycle following this two card nine with an arsenal. Perhaps we see flat trackers added to the mix as well. Maybe not because there is a trade in available as the arsenal card, possibly. It's also, if you are concerned about you know wanting to block your opponent effectively, that raw meat can get powered up. You can obviously turn that into a two block here by trading in these equipment to, to sort of. That's the trifecta. That's the trifecta, Mitch. When you're set up like that, it feels very, very good. And look, Ooh, we actually all had it wrong beating. here. Yeah, it's going to be a beating of the chest, and that's ah. going to set up a might and agility on the next turn. So I think that was a, another very, very clean option for this cycle. I thought battery so nice in that regard. Uh, you know, getting you double the value, of course, as KO wants to be discarding cards to this beat chest. Anyway, we talk a lot about Bone Breaker Bellow, for example, being kind of a bit more in the Reinar direction because he will intimidate for those discards and it's a nice little pump, but KO still very much wants to beat chest every now and then. Here's a great example of that. Powerful attack. We've stacked up Might Tokens and we're going to have a smoothed out turn even with the might token on top of that. So two attack reactions put in front. Hey, not many of those attack reactions block for three. And Maximilian is just part of with two of them. That's a big deal. And this turn is even better than it appears at first glance for Daniel, because now on this turn cycle, that raw meat is fully charged up. But critically, Daniel has the opportunity to fully charge that raw meat again, meaning he yes. can get three points of value out of that chest. That's a huge, huge swing just on raw numbers. It's basically like a knucklehead level of block, right? Absolutely. Okay, here is the play pattern for Kasaya. We're going to send a Centauri Saber that has go again, of course, that agility token developed. And what a tidy little block that is. Beautiful. No plus one on the Saber. We're going to eat all of it with that raw meat. Yeah, unquestionably, that's what Daniel was playing towards. And I think navigated that first turn cycle very very well set himself up to be ahead on these next few turn cycles edge ahead a nice follow-up here I'm a big fan of it here. being able to wager that agility token is important uh it's something that normally daniel would cover but having won himself uh already he's not that interested uh in what that might provide another cool wrinkle about those wagers right being able to punish your opponent for having the agility. It all, exactly. almost works as a balancing mechanic like where you civic are steps, able to actually in the, in the same more. vein, yeah. right? Civic steps to sort of offer your opponent a quicken when they already have go again or can't make use of it adequately. Yeah, absolutely. And one card left back in the hand here for Maximilian, but none floating. It would have to be another take the upper hand, uh, which we know he has extra. It's more likely that's an Arsenal card. Chain was closed here, so an option to use that chess piece a second time on the same turn cycle. That and feels great. Yeah, Daniel's going to take advantage of that, and I love it, because that means you can now space out that gauntlet of might and that flat trackers a little bit more effectively. You don't have to commit them on the same turn. really just gives you a little bit more flexibility as you head into the late game. Yeah. And there are some edge cases in where you just value the block that those two equipment pieces give you as they are one-block blade break equipments 100 percent. i defend with those pieces quite often and I, I think it's something that is hard to do you yes. feel bad in the moment I mean, go a little might right you know you're losing one value from a might token to block one that feels less bad but i mean agility yeah. in, in this deck it can represent more than four points of value right giving you that like chance to have a second attack so you you've got to you've got to be careful with that Look, the best players use cards in unorthodox ways. I go back to our match uh, between Alan Lau and Michael Hamilton, where Alan Lau cashed in a flesh bag for just no for intimidation. Just for two block, yeah. Just, just blade break two, that's what he needed, and ultimately went on to win that match off the back of that decision. You see that type of play from top-level players all the time. Ah, okay. So we test of strength here. Interesting card, obviously, for a warrior to bring. There are attack actions that can allow Maximilian to win out in those clashes, but I'm pretty afraid of, you know, pulling KO into one of those. A four block, though, is very tidy, very elegant. Yeah, you kind of get paid back, right? You don't feel good about giving up the might, uh, but you do have a chance of winning, and you defended for four, so... I mean, that test of strength is a gold token generation, though. Test of strength is the gold token generation. Right. Thank you, Mitch. So that's amazing for you. I am... Less amazing for the KO, right? I am very happy to have you around. You know, one of the problems with working on the dev side is that you're a whole year ahead a plus? Well, yeah. that, that too, but also I know these cards by so many different names. So I know the real names and the fake names. Ah, at this I see. Point, and it's hard to keep track. Thank you for bearing with me, Mitch. Thank you for bearing with me, fans. Very much appreciated. How about this? Follow it up with a yellow wage might. All right, plenty of... It's being put on the table. No wager here, though, by the looks of things. Again, putting a six-power wage card in front of your opponent feels a little 
a little too easy for them to cover that up if they wanted to. Okay. It's really been taken. He's been taking damage. It looks like Daniel is going to pass on the wager here. Yeah, it's just a two-card block. It's probably maybe you don't want to risk losing that out. So just get a wider turn here. And we go. All right. Embrace adversity. Test of strength put in front here. The clash. We bounced on the clash. Yep. No, no winner. One, no one won the clash. Again, rare that Kasai can do it, but my goodness, you get a gold token for it, you are absolutely cheering. Yeah, you're pretty it's, happy it's with it. It's resource neutral bounce. for you, right? That oh, yeah. You pay two for the gold token. It subsidizes your savers by one each, so you are yeah net zero on that exchange, and you get a card. It's pretty nice. A Kasai with a gold in the arena feels very different from a Kasai without one. Absolutely. They have so much more range, so much more threat when they have that gold at the ready. So I think Daniel, very happy do not have given away a gold there. Maybe expected to win as a KO clashing against the Kasai. But if you've played enough heavy hitters, you've had these go the wrong way for oh, you many absolutely. times. I, I actually love the suspense leading up to a key clash, especially the ones that can really decide those games. Yeah, yeah, uh, clashing for all the marbles. We saw it from the start of this format down in Queenstown. Many, many determinative clashes. Uh, some of the most exciting games of limited flesh and blood ever recorded on camera thus far. Obviously, we still have a full day of limited left. On the other side. Maximilian really Klein here. Looking for a Texas smash, as All Might would call it, appearing on his sleeves. Got the Goblet of the Blood Run Wine, so another great little setup here on a very respectable uh, turn. I mean, that card can be a turn ender, or you can obviously open with it here and make use of those extra two resources. Like the Lunging Press inclusion, Edge Case can be used to obviously win some of those wages. Just poke over a little bit. I never see it coming. Yeah, I always have my alarm bells up when I see that lunging <laughs> press. Pitch. Get pitched, yeah. I'm like, that one's coming back to ruin my day at some point in the future. Here's a rising speed for you. Uh, again, if you draw a card this turn, it gets going again. Another reason why gold is pretty damn good for Kasai. Yeah, a card I really like in Kasai. I think it empowers many of your most powerful turns. Card I like for that as well. Performance bonus being pretty... Pretty tidy out of the arsenal to potentially get your card drawn. Uh, the salt and battery just going to be committed to the defense here. And I, I think we've used this word a lot over the course of these draft games, but kind of a mid rangey approach from both these players. Neither really swinging for the fences, just looking to make good defensive plays when they can and get their value along the way. Yeah, Daniel at some point wants to respect that. Uh, reaction potential from Maximilian and even if he can't fully block an attack out at least preserve life by presenting some blocks uh, assault and battery we'll see what we can do right I mean that beat chest effect is very relevant when Kayo wants to get a little more girthy on that combat chain here's the flat trackers makes Lighting sense agility very nice and, and again you can yep just follow up here with uh, a red wage might another solid mid-range turn with the threat around the corner of something a little bit more threatening, a little bit more uh, dense on that combat chain with the agility token now active. Having to think on this wager, and I expect the arsenal after this, I, I think it was a bear fangs. And you can just see the writing on the wall for what Daniel is playing towards, trying to put Max to a tough decision on this wage might. If this damage leaks, maybe going to try and push through for lethal next turn. If it doesn't, you just have a solid setup turn and you are kind of in that safe range. Look, eight, you probably have to commit a card to defense to not completely rule out dying. Um, but uh, looking at this hand, maybe that's not even true. Maybe you could just go <laughs> ahead and take it this go around, and that would be a absolute soul read. Yeah, M Max is holding on to two, three blocks there and holding back to two blocks. So you can see. Also, there's a way. You can put the Hood of Red Sand in front. It's a battle-worn one block, right? Looks so it's good, a really yeah. nice way to cover the break point and, and win yourself uh, out that wager if it is actually made. It is not, so still blocking that out. Totally fine. The Hood of Red Sand will persist. And here's our Agility and Vigor tokens being popped here. Again, you can just throw a Saber forward with Go again with this and show your opponent nothing about the texture of your hand, which is just as well as Maximilian is sitting on a little bit of a combat trick. And that's to say nothing of what could be in that arsenal. Feels so good to start <laughs> the turn that way as Kasai. You just have all the options available this. to you. He wants that He wants that agility token off the agile engagement. He's trying to incentivize an attack action block here from Daniel by saying, hey, you're going to give me a gold or not? 
Just Daniel's gotta know. Constant push pull you face from this Kasai deck. Am I supposed to defend this with my cards? Am I not supposed to defend it? <laughs> There's never any good answers. Warrior's back, baby. Get used to it. Absolutely feels like classic warrior gameplay. There's that Saber offering the on hit. We know agility at the ready for Daniel. That means you want to keep at least two of those cards in your hand. At least. Maybe three if you can get away with it. An agile engagement doesn't require a hit to generate that agility token. Oh, he's copping it. Okay. He says go again, so there's more where that came from. He wants more information. He wants to see a bit more what Max is sitting on, but... Just... Yeah, Max wants more cards. He wants to go ahead and use that yeah. coat of red sand, power up this turn a little bit, maybe even use that gold along the way. It's a great point, because he's sitting on a blue here. So, I mean, he can quite happily pay one into this. Okay, so he's going to throw down... That's a vigorous engagement there. Yeah, so just wouldn't looking be, for the damage. Yeah, wouldn't be creating uh, that sort of vigor token here, but Hood of Red Sand comes down. Great point, Brian. Yeah, we're going to get a card here. He's sitting on a blue. Put your money where your mouth is. So paying for this stuff is yeah, it's easy enough to do. He's got plenty of resources. This is the danger zone now. Yeah, four facing two cards in hand, resource floating. That Saber's going to come in without any information given up, and now you have to think about your defenses very carefully. Starting Very state. carefully. That is... Oh, that's an agile engagement. Agile engagement. Okay. It's an extra two. Here it she would comes. represent lethal on a no defense here. And we're going to make sure we create that gold token. Yeah, almost <laughs> skipped by that. That could be critical down the road. Good on you, Max. I wonder if this influences this turn at all, or if you're trying to bank that gold for the next turn. You probably around. want to subsidize both attacks, so probably using it at the so. start of the turn feels a bit better. Assume you've already drawn a card from Hood of Wet Red Sand as well, so it's just more about upgrading your hand quality and maybe looking for another attack reaction. Yep. But I, I like the way Max is going about this. I think he already is forcing Daniel to make some hard decisions. Daniel really wants to strip a hand worth of cards here. Look at what he's sitting on. I see that bear fangs. I think he's got double bear fangs, honestly. <laughs> and he obviously popped his flat trackers without knowing he'd draw this kind of hand out, which is lined up nicely for him. But Max has quite a safe life total at 11. Even with double bear fangs, if they both hit, we're looking at a swing back of 16. That's a huge number. Only represents a two-card block, actually. That's... Not so bad for Max, especially with that gold token at the ready, subsidizing the next turn, potentially. Nice to have that life buffer. And again, Daniel maybe not wanting to block, either because he was not wanting to give engagement value, but more likely just because he wanted to try and hit hard. Now what do you do about this one? This is two. Up to three if there's an attack action blocking. The Gauntlet of Might gets in that. It's only a plus two attack reaction in that hand. Yeah, and did did Daniel make the perfect read here? Is this going to be the end of the blocks and just enough to get him out of lethal range? He's going to be at one after this. He's. I mean, to be fair, he knows the deck list. He does. Uh, and he also knows that Vigorous and Agile engagements are only in yellow in Maximilian's deck. It's a lot of good information. And... Is Daniel going to be able to go ahead and make this block? He's also making it impossible to use a fatal engagement here. Yeah, it actually covers up a lot of options. Oh, I from hate Max. it when they deny reprise with the equipment. It's just so frustrating. Clever, Daniel. Very, very clever. Yep. Try playing against the reprise. And look at that <laughs> smile from Daniel. He knows he kind of got it right in this instance. Going to fall to one and a massive hand a coming legend. back. That is, that is a sick read. Knowing that there's no wages, so don't worry about it. Take the upper hands. He's countered the attack reactions. My G. I guess, yeah, Blade Flurry can't even blow him out. He has covered every single angle. Beautiful. Just. That, that is a 6 0 at the Pro Tour type play right that is there from Daniel. Absolute cinema, Brian. Beautiful stuff. And now, Daniel's still with his work cut out for him. Has to go ahead and offer massive damage on this turn, I believe, if he's going to go ahead and reset the tempo and start to take on the aggressor's role against Max. All right, we're discarding. Okay, Down town. we're blue. clean. We've done it. <laughs> Squeaky, in fact. Here's an eight damage attack headed in Maximilian's direction. You'll notice as well, Max, did an arsenal that yeah. last turn. Yeah, that's an interesting one. It was a starting stake, right? I think just prioritizing that three block value, potentially. I respect it. 
What's a blade flurry in his hand, though? He gets to come back. It could be... Oof, it could be curtains. He just needs to get this with one card in hand, and he feels like he's in such a good spot. Is it odd to you, maybe, or that we don't see Maximilian flip those flat trackers? It's interesting. And, like, you know, now that you know the, the texture yeah, of the yeah, hand, obviously, you're 20, like... 20. <laughs> yeah. You would love to have that going into this next turn with the gold at the ready. You keep, you know, a couple cards, and you are offering an impossible nightmare for your opponent to defend. Starting Snake Blade Flurry, engaged Swift Blade. Sitting in there in a rising energy yellow. Very Kasai hand, that. <laughs> yeah, make sure we can re represent the extra reaction to point here. My expectation for the end of this turn is Mandible Claw into Bear Fangs, offering just oh. preposterous value. Uh, a total of 19 attack on the turn. And I think keeping an arsenal still and being able to offer something similar on the next go. So Maximilian is just going to go ahead and take this eight, look to collect oh, some more man. information, and it is just going to be bare fangs oh. here on the follow-up. But it missed critically oh, on, Max. on the discard. No way at this juncture. Oh my god, now the one block flat track is kind of relevant for Max. Like you, you have the mechanisms to give a card and stay alive at one. The one downside being obviously you didn't arsenal, so you are playing with one less card overall after giving up a block here, but my goodness, what a reprieve for our Kasai player here. An absolutely critical miss from Max there would have broken to a much more difficult 8 power. It is only going to be 6 in this instance, though. That is a one-off Bonebreaker Bellow for Daniel. Valuing a blue 3 block, as you would understand, but it's a non-attack action. It does not have an attack value. Here we go. Starting state looks like it's going to join Vigor Girth and Flat Track is on this block. One damage. <laughs> Very few misses in Daniel's deck, but unfortunately, that's brute life, man. That's oh. the way it goes. Long day for these guys. Seasoned as they are, this is the Pro Tour. They are leaving it all out there from game one. And obviously, we are now in our last round of play for the day. And again, you know, like these guys, slight flush of the cheeks there they are very much trying to focus on those cards and making the right decisions and maybe max you know keeping back that starting stake in hand maybe it pays off or do i use the flat trackers do i go for greed what is the shoulder devil telling me and he's put that equipment back in its An slot interesting decision because i how many more turns are you going to play like that is the question i, I think it becomes almost impossible for daniel to survive a turn where you have agility just because he has to commit so many resources to defending those sabers but do you even get to that point? Do you just have to take this block value and assume this is critical to making sure you can enact your game plan? I co-signed the decision here to preserve the card, yeah. A yellow in hand for Max, obviously that rising energy, so trade that gold token in, maybe smooth that here. If you draw a blue here, you're off to the bloody races. You're already getting those free saber attacks. You need to go again. Uh, a source of go again here. Yeah, and it's a, it's a triple Ooh. red hand. Okay, not the worst. You can definitely threaten an arsenal here because your opponent is going to block you 100%. Right, the commanding performance comes down. And hey, let's get more value for uh, you know an attack. Let's force Daniel to put some stuff in front of it. But I want to see a break point here. I think that's going to be really important. Engage Swift Blade. Gives you go again. If you're blocked by an attack action card. Huge. That is sick. Don't get blinded by the Majestic. This is what matters right now. We know this what that is last card matters. is, Brian. Yes, we do. Yes, oh, we buddy. Do. Does he have it or not? Three cards put in front of this Saber. That doesn't feel good. Yeah, we are blocking for eight here. That's an Agile wind up on top, I think. Or at least seven. So either way, that Blade Flurry. And there's the Blade hey, Flurry. And there. that's going to get the fist bump. A very, oh. very clean play from Maximilian Klein. Beautiful stuff there. What a hand to draw for the last round. You don't need to worry so much about having a blue in your hand because you popped that gold. You kept the yellow in order to do so. And you have the two most powerful cards, not just in your deck, not just in the pod, the two most powerful cards available to Warrior full stop that you drafted for that purpose. And you point them straight at your opponent one after another. Beautiful stuff here. And that engaged Swift Blade is incredible in that spot where oh, your absolutely. opponent must block. What do you do? You have, no, you have no options left. It's, again, classic warrior. Like, I, I'm damned if I do, damned if I don't. And what a stunning finish here on day one for Maximilian Klein from Germany. Warrior aficionado, uh, draft extraordinaire, shown as a perfect piece of flesh and blood gameplay over the course of the day. Daniel Correa, though, no slouch, gave us a great game in a KO deck, one Beautiful. of three. I'm over the moon about that matchup. That was a ton of fun. And uh, we...
we're generous folk. You know, we're here for the people. Brian is especially for the people. As anybody who's ever That's tweeted, what they all say on Twitter, <laughs> they're like, that guy's for the people. That's for the people. Yeah. Hey, you, you got Luminaris Angels Glow, so you'd be nice to this guy. We have a backup match here uh, in our feature area uh, from a different pod here to cap us off for the day. We've got yeah. Matt Rogers featured in this game as well, someone who we haven't been able to check in on as much as we would have liked. So curious to see how he's doing in general. Going up against Teeth of Bow, of course, of the United States here. Uh, I believe of uh, Team Magnolia. Yeah, both these players doing extremely well. 6-0. And they are coming from Pod 1. We've been following Pod 2 the entire time. So these players poise. Whoever comes away from this draft match looking to sit at the top of the standings at this Pro Tour. So both Matt and T. Tebow from, yeah, that same pod, of course. And it features th two Warriors, three blue Brutes, and three Guardians. So another three Guardian pod. Seeing quite a few of those pop up here and there now. T, of course, on that sort of Kasai list that we've been really enjoying watching here. Looking at the equipment suites we have. Yeah, okay, so I like the Glory Seeker in Kasai. It's great. I mean, sometimes you just need to draw a card and you might be paying one yep. more for it. That seems... I think it's solid. Obviously got a little bit of pace on this one, folks. At 1.5 speed here, but... That will be our turn zero from T, demonstrating pitch order. You know, looking at the equipment suite from Matt, it's one of the first things I <laughs> take a glance at when I have a player who's doing extremely well in a draft. I assume a nice equipment suite probably has a lot to do with that. Uh, not really. In this case, not all that impressive on Matt's side. Locks five, conditionally? Yeah. You don't have onboard ways to make the tokens that power up that raw meat. Uh I lost to that shelter COVID. Uh, COVID in a matchup that went to sort of close to fatigue, running okay, out of cards. I, I think so the like, card's fine. I, I'm not a I'm not a sheltered cove hater. I'm happy to play it, but overall, this build out doesn't look that impressive. Yes, but let's see what's in the main deck itself here. Bear Fangs is a pretty good card to have. It's a clash of agility that is going to be giving it that nice little plus two with a might token created on the back, and I'm sure that's quite where Matt is quite happy to be at this stage. Yeah, it's looking thus far like a potential. IP penalty, what we refer to mm -hmm. when the player can't use all the cards in their hand, but of course could have a wind-up at the ready. Nope, is it going to be an unused card in this instance? Just going to take that nice bear fangs value and draw back up. Yeah, it does happen. I mean, we, we talked about this, right? Warriors are much more adept at using their entire hand than, than brutes are, right? If you don't have an agility token, yeah, get IP'd a little bit. Victor has the same issue. Sometimes you can just fall past against the Victor and have a setup turn, and yep. he can't exactly punish you for it. Warrior, though, Tends to have outlets for every one of their cards as those, uh, you know, a lot of those cards can come in reactions or pre pumps. We have two with the agility token on the backside, and another two here from that second Centauri. Yeah, Rogers taking the first flurry here. Looks like taking the second as well. Eee. It is going to be buffed up a little bit. So some damage leaking through. Yeah, a little vigorous engagement, I think, there. Take the plus three. Don't really care so much about whether or not we create the vigor token because damage is damage. Step one is. Mandible Claw. Surely nothing happening here. Just a nice, clean Mandible Claw attack. I believe buffed up by a Might coming in for four in this instance. Yeah, Matt. That will be the end of the turn after that hit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll be done you only get one action point. Like, yeah. obviously. Oh. oh, I see. That makes so much more sense here. Matt choosing not to IP himself two turns in a row. Love to see that. Double Might token created. A little wind up there is getting discarded away. T, obviously they're more than happy to take that. And yet another wind up on the board. This one of the red variety, so a little bit more threatening. Looks great. Nice little output here. Coming in for a total of 11 and also setting up well for the next turn. Two my tokens at the ready. The draw sword's being put in front here. Slap happy as well. Okay. We've got to prevent some of that damage and get ourselves a Vigor token for having done so. Vigor token could be quite powerful in Kasai. I'm always happy to pick that one up along the way. I want to talk a little bit about T. Thibault, though, T's been around the scene for a very long time, had some very strong finishes early on in sort of the competitive cycle of flesh and blood. Hasn't quite broken all the way through yet. Again, we've talked about this time and time again. These players looking for their chance to go ahead and make their names known, make themselves a fixture of that flesh and blood pro scene. And I know for T, it's been a long time coming. Now, what is the thought here for Matt seeing a Centauri Sabre just inched forward. He, a starting stake will get in front of it. Yeah, clean defense there. You'd love to see it. It is going to be double engaged upon, it looks like. <laughs> That's filthy stuff. How much of that damage is coming from absolutely bloody nowhere? Tough to deal with. Now we're starting to see maybe why T 
why they had such success through some of their earlier rounds here. They are they're hiding a lot of damage up their sleeve. Yeah, absolutely. Matt did Yuck. luckily dodge double vigor creation by defending with that starting stake. So that worked out fairly well as, as far as, you know, taking five damage out of nowhere goes. But I don't think a disastrous turn for Matt. It's acceptable. So pound Town. With a Pound Town coming in for nine in this instance. You know, a beat chest here. It's a less attractive option than a beat chest on a assault and battery, for example. But still always nice to create two might tokens, as we saw with the wind up being discarded, just like that. A lot of extra value coming up here for Matt Rogers, oft, oft named one of New Zealand's favorite exports here, our global flesh and blood events. You know, I think this is a big pro tour for Matt Rogers, too. Uh, Matt Rogers is someone very much in the conversation for a long time as the best flesh and blood player right up there with the Pablo Pintors, Michael Hamilton's frankly doesn't get mentioned in the same breath anymore as those guys obviously very very strong performances in the early days of flesh and blood but you know maybe stepped away a little bit to focus on his something business. like his business PCG yep. grading of course or maybe lost a step it's something you always have to consider it can maybe happen to the best of us played a bunch of dash yeah played a bunch of dash that's also <laughs> a problem from time to time but I, I think it means a lot to Matt to go ahead and just reclaim that throne, to be back in the discussion with the Pablo Pintors, with the Michael Hamiltons of the world, and maybe get that Pro Tour top eight that has eluded him thus We're far. We're talking a multiple time national champion of the most respected region in flesh and blood. Yeah. Um, I think he won, it was like 2020 and then 2022, I think. Uh, obviously missed a year there, came close, but always part of the conversation and then this this team pcg pass uh stacked with talent and short shorts if you've seen brendan patrick around the arena today i think it's a great look personally so lead with speed here from t that is a, the yellow variety so again create a, a gld token and give yourself a little plus two on that first hit yeah, another nice start from t here Nine and eight life, respectively, here. So we're arguing the pointy end of things. And in fairness, Matt does not have a lot of equipment to virtually sort of uh, couch his life total. Working his way into that warrior danger zone where you yes. worry about just getting blown up out of nowhere. <laughs> well, he's been about... there already. <laughs> yeah. he's, he's been sat there all game. His T sent three attack reactions, nine points worth of damage at, at reaction speed at Matt already this game, which is eventually it's going to start to get on your nerves and matt's saying you wouldn't do that again would you uh, surely surely you've used up all of your explosive potential at this point it's a centauri saber attack with no go again and some card left in arsenal with one floating it looks like roger's going to go ahead and use some damage prevention here yep. battered not broken coming out of the arsenal there we go. So that is, of course, your brute and guardian yeah, to damage pretension. Hey, look at another turn. Mark token. Yo! This turn from Matt. It's just a very, very simple but effective 10 damage represented here. How much incremental value has he gained from these might tokens over the course of the game? A lot of time for KO, it's like maybe one or max two, like, you know, a turn cycle. He's finding these might tokens from everywhere. Couple under the, the washing machine in the back pocket. Yeah, Matt. That jacket you haven't worn since your sister in law's reception. Love when you find a little change in the pocket like that. And I think that kind of sums up Matt's approach to playing this hero. He really does look to extract a lot from that KO hero ability. And I think he's, his play style looks a little different than some of the other KOs we've seen thus far. Right. Uh, low on agility, to be honest with you. Yeah. Wants to, wants to go tall, wants to yeah, mid-range quite heavily. But you can absolutely win if you have enough three blocks, right? You really need to have the three blocks if you want to opt into that sort of block two, send one kind of style. Draw swords here with an agility token. This is a bit frightening now. T, they're also opting into Kasai's on hit ability, threatening to create a gold token on the next weapon hit. It is all there for T. This is a beautiful start to the turn. If you're Rogers, you're sweating from oh, chain yeah. link number one. You have to figure out T's range right now, and all of your blocking decisions are critical. I, yeah, we think you'd want to try and block this out as much as possible, but I don't think Matt has that luxury. It's a gold token created for T. Oh, that's pretty good. If you're drawing a card this turn, that rising speed is, uh, ooh, that hits a little different. You're going to have to be blocking a little bit more, Mr. Rogers. Yeah, a little go again being offered here. So good. Couch, like, bookend with this with a Centauri Saber that's free, by the way. 
Ah, it's, he's living a good life. And n critically, no value from that raw meat thus far in Rogers' chest zone. This point, just, might as well eat it for game. extra calories. Yeah, think about this game, Mitch. If there is a might creator and a flat tracker sitting right there in the equipment zone, it's just a completely different context, night and day. Yeah, you feel much better about actually just blocking that on hit out from the first Centauri saver. But no. T, I mean, I'll be straight up. T, T threatens to run away from the game from this point out, and Matt knows it. Yep. That is a very pensive look on his face. Has to give cards here. Has to give cards here. That means Matt's threat becomes very, very low on the next turn. That means when the clapback comes, it is deceptive. It is unpredictable. And again, asks you to gamble. He doesn't just have to give a card here. He yeah, may have to give a card at the end of the turn. I mean, it's only a two damage Centauri save a swing, but oof, going to one. No. Yeah, there's, there's seven more damage being represented throughout this turn. Depending on how you can defend, it could be even how worse. How low does this hand even block, right? Great question. Unknown. Un like, there is a world where Matt is just dead, possibly, if this hand is not an appropriate blocking hand. Both these players playing for seven and zero. Defending five here. Uh, Going to take taking two it from yep. the Sabre. What is the clap back? T at four. Now with a gold token there. Man, he can do whatever the heck he wants. Is Matt just drawing here? Is, is that how this turn is going to go? Does he actually have no clapback and just has to face down T with a full grip? That is a nightmare scenario for Matt Rogers. And it is just a draw up oh, and pass. No. And the ball is fully in T's court at this moment. And they're swinging for the fence. 100%. We are talking about a deck that's already showed us a number of those attack reactions. Gold gets popped here, replaces itself, <laughs> makes those Centauri Saber swings absolutely free. Pitcher Blue lead with Heart here with a plus two and a Vigor token behind it. Oh, yes, that engaged Swift Blade. <laughs> Where do you go from here? This is a bit of a problem. Rising if energy, you're Rogers. It, it is rising energy coming out, but I, I, somewhat critically, no go again here thus far. There is, of course, that engaged Swift Blade, and, and there is really no combination of cards Rogers could have to let him fully defend this and not give go again. It, it, it's a big problem. Is that a yellow engaged Swift Blade? So plus two, plus two. I think it's then, blue. Okay, I, I believe right. that's blue. So we're looking at an attack for eight, eight. here. Is my belief. And if it is defended, it will get go again. That, I mean, that card, uh, that engaged Swift Blade, looks even better on those attack actions. <laughs> yeah, and, and we know what happens once the go again happens. There is free Centauri Sabres coming along with it. So you will need potentially a three block to cover that up at one life. I, I just don't know if there's a combination of cards here for Rogers. There is that Sheltered Cove. I want to call that card out as potentially important. Yes, I mean, it's a good answer to a Centauri Saber that if you blocked with a two-block attack action would go over by one and kill you. That is one way of just shutting that down without having to put a card in front of it and, and you know, put you at risk of it being buffed. But yeah, it is a grim scene facing Matt Rogers here. And shuffling his cards, hoping to see a different combination, a different line, perhaps, a way out of this situation as T... I slowly led him around the paddock down to that one life. Look, maybe, maybe Rogers can find a way out of this turn. How does he find a way out of the next turn? I, I just don't know what he's supposed to do at this point. You kind of, you can fall to one life against a warrior and then you get a window and you have to act on that window and Rogers just drew up. That's not sufficient action. He needed to do far more on that last cycle. And I think he's been kind of in the blender for a few turns now. See that hand is like money where your mouth is. Doesn't block very well at all. No fear there. Okay, that's okay. an interesting one. Money where your mouth is. Yeah, Not covered up. Okay, Rogers does keep a card here. Goes back to the arsenal scenario. But again, let's run it back one more time. Critically, no gold this go around for T. There is a vigor available. Acting as a virtual gold maybe to kick off this turn. Yeah, half a gold for Centauri Saber purposes. And How about hey, a draw sword? You can't draw. Yep. Oh, buddy. 
Another engaged swift blade. Oh, that could be the absolute death knell at this point. You do not want to see that engaged swift blade come out. Two cars in hand for T. They've been pretty cagey about demonstrating those to the cameras, so we are just as much in suspense as you are. And you, if you saw the look on Matt Rogers' face, it was like, all right, I get it. I, I understand. <laughs> I've, what's been here, I've been here a few times. Yep. All right. Salt and Battery gets in front. Pound Town gets in front. Sheltered Cove also, because yep. you need to account for that increase in power of the Centauri Sabre. And that is the fatal engagement. Matt Rogers, seeing if he's got anything to answer that. And the answer is a big fat N O T Tabo advances to 7 and 0 with a fantastic flawless showing here in draft on day 1 love to see it from T again somebody who's been on the cusp of breaking through for so long with a 70 start representing the United States here at the Pro Tour. Yeah, great looks. I mean, Matt obviously has to have done a fantastic job to get here. He, you know, gets through that draft round pretty comfortably. He'll end the day at 6 and 1 and feel pretty decent about his chances tomorrow. He drafts the list with only two equipment pieces and still is able to find great success in that pod. But we looked once again at a warrior deck from a two warrior pod. And that is a very frightening thing to see. Very, very strong, of course. And Do uh, not let them get away with it. You can't let them get away with it. Oh, they will man. run the draft over. Absolutely terrifying stuff here. Uh, and it looks like warriors just getting a little sort of uh, underdrafted in some cases today. Standings, we're going to talk about those in just a moment. I kind of want to throw it back to before the draft started. We got to see some fantastic CC play, but I want to talk about what our standings were coming out of that round. Some of the players, of course, we know how they fared since that fourth round. Some we don't, but I think it's a great opportunity to talk about the heroes in Classic Constructed, Brian. Yeah. They got off to a great start here at PTLA. Yeah, and, uh, you know, the, the list is extremely, extremely diverse of heroes that have converted to a 4-0 thus far. It is KO leading the pack. Uh, KO has picked up, I believe, five 4-0s thus far. But then we get to some <laughs> a little bit more unexpected finishes. Oh, classic Dorinthia conversion, just quietly. Yeah, one Dorinthia. And Dorinthia was the third most played deck in this tournament. So that uh, not really the type of conversion rate you wanted to see out of what many were expecting to be the breakout deck of this Pro Tour that hatches Dorinthia build. Uh, I, I don't even know if a single person representing that build was able to carry it to a 4-0 thus far. Well, let's head back up to the top and look at those three Azalea 4-0s. He's incredible, yeah. Seeing Azalea, uh, be able to make it so far. I think we got some Azalea gameplay today on stream, but it was an ill-fated matchup of Justin Q uh, against a very powerful uh, sort of Kano deck that kind of blew them out. Bolton here as well. Pretty well res represented at two of those. I mean, not a huge part of the field. Like, two Boltons is a big deal. Just like two Reinars and two Dash is also a big deal. It's so funny. I mean, there are a lot of people that have a really tough time getting on board with Bolton and what he's able to do. Some people uh, swear by him. The numerical va the numerical value, though, is is incredible. Some of the plays you can make up of, off of a Tunic counter just kind of mind-boggling in terms of how they throw the, the value proposition of the game sort of on their head. Reinar with two four O's. That's what we love to see. So many people said KO definitely won out the most here. He's definitely, you know, looking the best from heavy hitters. Reinar got a lot of tools, as did Via. We're seeing two Reinars converting here. It's a great look after. I don't think that was, it was like tw 12 Reinars maybe represented in total. Not a huge amount of representation. Yeah. Uh, two 4 0 Reinars and Pablo Pintor also went 3 1 on Reinar through those constructed rounds. So, very, very impressive performance from Reinars thus far. Yeah, loving this list. Dash always seems to be a factor here. She's got some real proponents out there and still very powerful. Let's talk standing zone total. We've had uh, three rounds of drafts as well. Um, yep. we can see we're going to start on the back end here. And while yeah. we do that, before we get to the top of the standings, I, I do want to mention that Viscerai 4 Oh, Who had Viscerai oh. on their watch list as we head in to this event? Just it shows how much diversity there is in this metagame. How if you know a hero, if you work on a hero, you can do absolutely anything. And it's so, so impressive to see Viscerai convert. And also, there's Viscerai's at 3-1 as well. Like, uh, just an out-of-left-field performance from a much maligned Runeblade in this tournament. And now we're going to head to the top of our standings as we look who has started off this tournament just absolutely flawlessly. Of course, we know T, T, -T at though. the top. And then you see Maximilian. Maximilian. But Elias Karamanis, also from Germany, so a huge performance from Germany thus far, sitting also at 7-0 on Leviah. There's uh, Austin Summers there, five points on Prism. Dagan Wyatt, who actually uh, went up against Hayden Dale in round one and managed to find a win, Dorinthia versus Dromai. That matchup ended up being 
Going further down the list here, Michael Fung, five points, still looking uh, quite comfortable there. Rob Seigel, by the way, out of the absolute woodwork here with a great showing here on day one. Definitely still in the mix as we go further down the list. A lot of recognizable names. Sam Sutherland, the dash extraordinaire. Uh, you know, winner, I think, was calling Auckland, if I'm not mistaken. Nick Butcher also in there. Uh, again, we are seeing some big names. Local friend of mine, Marcus Brown there uh, at four wins. Fantastic stuff from him. And uh, yeah, we are. I'm happy to let this roll through a second time. Unfortunately, this is not something we have manual control over. Uh, this yeah, we, stroll, <laughs> we, so. we, we, could, we could stick around away for it. Shin Inoue there as well. A uh, friend of mine at four wins there on that Dorinthia. We are seeing a couple of those pop up. Mara Farris here as well. Yeah. Uh, managed to come out for three. All these players live for day two. Yuanji yep. Lee bouncing back nicely after a rough start in Constructed. I believe potentially 3-0-ing that draft to go ahead and punch a ticket into day two. You'd love to see it. Simon Nielsen also Ooh, hanging in there. 3-0 in draft, able to recover from, again, a rough start. For these players, however, the Pro Tour has ended. It is yep. time for the calling. Uh, see some more big names. Lucas Oswald, unfortunately, failing to make day two. Raya Adams instance. there as well. She, unfortunately, not able to hang on here. Um, Obviously, bringing that prism list that she's created a great a bunch of great content on. Jacob Bale there, uh, not making it on Kasai here. Hayden hey, Dale, here. No, but Chan. He's falling short, not making day two here. Yeah, uh, you know, rough day. I mean, Hayden, you know, sort of talking about it on Arsenal Pass, said he has actually been kind of locked on his choice for a few weeks heading into this tournament. He feels like that was that sort of positions him much better, but obviously some bumps along the way here. Uh, All right, let's, let's get ready to speed read. Yeah, we're going to do it one more time. Here we go. We get another okay. shot at it. And one more time, we uh, come around to the top of our standings here. Okay. Yeah, Matt John Rogers. Ho. John Ho with six wins. Yep. That's that the mid-range of Israel list. We saw Justin Koo still here. Six wins. Love to see that from Justin. Six wins for Peter Ward as well. Pablo Pintor at six wins. Yeah, a lot of big names. And then we go to the five wins. We see Shing Sang, of course, our world's runner-up. Alan Lau, David Yao. So Hong Kong lurking. Hong Kong I always lurking. Viet Pham. How about uh, Michael mix? Fung? Five wins as well. He's done well. Uh, Fino Black's hit, Charles Dunn, of course. Tarek Patel at five wins. Oh, man. That's <laughs> some incredible names. I mean, our, some big names. Our yeah. four, three, and above are looking incredible here. So, again, uh, you can find the live blog over at fabtcg.com. That is going to give you uh, an inanimate list. So you don't have to sort of wait for things to come back around. Just like your favorite DVD screensaver, we get really excited when it hits the corner of the screen perfectly. We've got to make something like that for uh, Flesh and Blood. Just maybe like, yeah, maybe around, Victor's yeah. fat head just like, you know, rolling around the Good. screen. I like it. We can make that happen. Yeah, quite satisfying. What a day it's been, Brian. I mean, I, uh, I'm tickled pink. We've got to see in some incredible CC action, uh, a, a very diverse field of heroes represented and then the draft has been compelling. We got to watch, follow along with Fran Francesco's draft there. Saw him to saw him put a great deck together. We got to see uh, you know Matt Rogers and, and T fight it out there in that sort of other pod go head to head. So we are we are positioned for an absolute firecracker of a day two. And remember, uh, you know obviously uh, X and three better All alive back. for day two. A large portion of our field will still be out there brandishing their weapons of choice on the battlefield. Yeah, we're going to kick things off with three more rounds of draft tomorrow. Of course, we'll be bringing you all of that draft action, covering the draft as we did today. So you see how the absolute best in the world are going to go ahead and try and punch their ticket to something like a 10-0 record. And Oof. then those footsteps are going to start creeping in. You're going to start thinking about top eights. We'll follow the entire march to that top eight with four rounds of Classic Constructed coming down the stretch. Not an overstatement to say it's been a consummate pleasure to be with you so far here from the Los Angeles Convention Center. Tomorrow we kick off with our second lot of draft into some CC rounds to head towards our top eight. So don't be missing that one. We'll be seeing you guys bright and early, 9 a.m. PT. Don't miss it. Pro Tour LA Day 2 kicks off them. But until then, get some rest. Keep battling out there, lovers of Fab. We'll see you soon. Welcome, traveler. You must be starving. Please, come inside. I think we can satisfy your appetite. Anything you like. Intimacy. Or perhaps, ecstasy. Come a little closer. I won't bite. Tell me. What do you desire?
Beware the tongue of the snake. Her fangs shall soon follow. Pleasure is but the shallow illusion. Walk the true path, and you shall see clear. Who seek may discover formless, perfect, the serene, unchanging infinite, eternally present, eternally boring. Why don't we play rough? Embrace the solitude. Embrace the sensation. Look within. Look at me. Just a breath. Just a taste. Enough! A tiger does not fall prey to the snake. The tiger walks its own path. Those who flow as life flows know they need no other force. The heavy is the root of the light. The unmoved, the source of all movement. The center is unbound and free. Walk the path. <laughs>